January of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665, by Samuel Pepys. January 1664-1665 January 1st, Lord's Day. Lay long in bed, having been busy late last night, then up and to my office, where upon ordering my accounts and papers with respect to my understanding my last year's gains and expense, which I find very great, as I have already set down yesterday. Now this day I am dividing my expense to see what my clothes in every particular hath stood me in, I mean all the branches of my expense. At noon a good venison pasty and a turkey to ourselves without anybody so much as invited by us, a thing unusual for so small a family of my condition. But we did it, and were very merry. After dinner to my office again, where very late alone upon my accounts, but have not brought them to order yet, and very intricate I find it, notwithstanding my care all the year to keep things in as good method as any man can do. Past eleven o'clock home to supper, and to bed. Second. Up. And it being a most fine hard frost, I walked a good way toward Whitehall, and then being overtaken with Sir W. Penn's coach, went into it, and with him thither, and there did our usual business with the Duke. Thence, being forced to pay a great deal of money away in boxes, that is, basins at Whitehall, I to my barber's, Jervis, and there had a little opportunity of speaking with my Jane alone, and did give her something, and of herself she did tell me a place where I might come to her on Sunday next, which I will not fail, but to see how modestly and harmlessly she brought it out was very pretty. Thence to the Swan, and there did sport a good while with Herbert's young kinswoman without hurt, though they being abroad, the old people. Then to the Hall, and there agreed with Mrs. Martin, and to her lodgings, which she has now taken to lie in, in Bow Street, pitiful poor things, yet she thinks them pretty, and so they are, for her condition, I believe, good enough. Here I did ce que je voudrais avec her, most freely, and it having cost two shillings in wine and cake upon her, I away, sick of her impudence, and by coach to my Lord Brunker's, by appointment, in the piazza, in Covent Garden, where I occasioned much mirth with a ballet I brought with me, made from the seamen at sea to their ladies in town, saying Sir W. Penn, Sir G. Askew, and Sir J. Lawson made them. Here a most noble French dinner and banquet, the best I have seen this many a day, and good discourse. Thence to my booksellers, and at his binder saw Hook's book of the microscope, which is so pretty that I presently bespoke it, and away home to the office, where we met to do something, and then, though very late, by coach, to Sir Phil Warwick's, but having company with him, could not speak with him. So back again home, where thinking to be merry, was vexed with my wife's having looked out a letter in Sir Philip Sidney about jealousy for me to read, which she industriously and maliciously caused me to do. And the truth is, my conscience told me it was most proper for me, and therefore was touched at it, but took no notice of it, but read it out most frankly, but it stuck in my stomach, and moreover I was vexed to have a dog brought to my house to lie in our little bitch, which they make him do in all their sights, which, God forgive me, do stir my jealousy again though of itself the thing is a very immodest sight. However, to cards with my wife a good while, and then to bed. Third. Up and by coach to Sir Phil Warwick's, the street being full of footballs, it being a great frost, and found him and Mr. Coventry walking in St. James's Park. I did my errand to him about the felling of the king's timber in the forests, and then to my lord of Oxford, justice in air, for his consent thereto, for want whereof my lord privy seal stops the whole business. I found him in his lodgings, in but an ordinary furnished house and room where he was, but I find him to be a man of good, discreet replies. Thence to the coffee-house, where certain news that the Dutch have taken some of our colliers to the north, some say four, some say seven. Thence to the change a while, and so home to dinner and to the office, where we sat late, and then I to write my letters, and then to Sir W. Batten's, who is going out of town to Harwich to-morrow, to set up a lighthouse there, which he hath lately got a patent from the king to set up that will turn much to his profit. Here very merry, and so to my office again, where very late, and then home to supper and to bed, but sat up with my wife at cards till past two in the morning. Fourth, lay long, and then up and to my lord of Oxford's, but his lordship was in bed at past ten o'clock, and lord help us, so rude a dirty family I never saw in my life. He sent me our word my business was not done, but should against the afternoon. I thence to the coffee-house, there but little company, and so home to the change, where I hear of some more of our ships lost to the northward. So to Sir W. Batten's, but he was set out before I got thither. I sat long talking with my lady, and then home to dinner. 
then come mr moore to see me and he and i to my lord of oxford's but not finding him within mr moore and i to love in a tub which is very merry but only so by gesture not wit at all which methinks is beneath the house so walked home it being a very hard frost and i find myself as heretofore in cold weather to begin to burn within and pimples and pricks all over my body my pores with cold being shut up so home to supper and to cards and to bed fifth up it being very cold and a great snow and frost to-night to the office and there all the morning at noon dined at home troubled at my wife's being simply angry with jane our cook-maid a good servant though perhaps hath faults and is cunning and given her warning to be gone so to the office again where we sat late and then i to my office and there very late doing business home to supper and to the office again and then late home to bed sixth lay long in bed but most of it angry and scolding with my wife about her warning jane our cookmaid to be gone and upon that she desires to go abroad to-day to look a place a very good maid she is and fully to my mind being neat only they say a little apt to scold but i hear her not to my office all the morning busy dined at home to my office again being pretty well reconciled to my wife which i did desire to be because she had designed much mirth to-day to end christmas with among her servants at night home being twelve night and there chose my piece of cake but went up to my vial and then to bed leaving my wife and people up at their sports which they continue till morning not coming to bed at all seventh up and to the office all the morning at noon dined alone my wife and family most of them abed then to see my lady batten and sit with her a while sir w batten being out of town and then to my office doing very much business very late and then home to supper and to bed eighth lord's day up betimes and it being a very fine frosty day i and my boy walked to whitehall and there to the chapel where one dr beaumont preached a good sermon and afterwards a brave anthem upon the hundred and fifty psalm where upon the word trumpet very good music was made so walked to my ladies and there dined with her my boy going home where much pretty discourse and after dinner walked to westminster and there to the house where jane welsh had appointed me but it being sermon time they would not let me in and said nobody was there to speak with me i spent the whole afternoon walking into the church and abbey and up and down but could not find her and so in the evening took a coach and home and there sat discoursing with my wife and by and by at supper drinking some cold drink i think it was i was forced to go make water and had very great pain after it but was well by and by and continued so it being only i think from the drink or from my straining at stool to do more than my body would so after prayers to bed ninth up and walked to whitehall it being still a brave frost and i in perfect good health blessed be god in my way saw a woman that broke her thigh in her heel slipping up upon the frosty street to the duke and there did our usual work here i saw the royal society bring their new book wherein is nobly writ their charter and laws and comes to be signed by the duke as a fellow and all the fellows hands are to be entered there and lie as a monument and the king hath put his with the word founder thence i to westminster to my barber's and found occasion to see jane but in presence of her mistress and so could not speak to her of her failing me yesterday and then to the swan to herbert's girl and lost time a little with her and so took coach and to my lord crews and dined with him who receives me with the greatest respect that could be telling me that he do much doubt of the success of this war with holland we going about it he doubts by the instigation of persons that do not enough apprehend the consequences of the danger of it and therein i do think with him holmes was this day sent to the tower but i perceive it is made matter of jest only but if the dutch should be our masters it may come to be of earnest to him to be given over to them for a sacrifice as sir w rawley was thence to whitehall to a tangier committee where i was accosted and most highly complimented by my lord bellasus our new governor beyond my expectation or measure i could imagine he would have given any man as if i were the only person of business that he intended to rely on and desires my correspondence with him this i was not only surprised at but am well pleased with and may make good use of it our patent is renewed and he and my lord barclay and sir thomas ingram put in as commissioners here some business happened which may bring me some profit thence took coach and calling my wife at her tailor's she being come this afternoon to bring her mother some apples neat's tongues and wine i home and there at my office late with sir w warren and had a great deal of good discourse and counsel from him which i hope i shall take being all for my good in my deportment in my office yet with all honesty he gone i home to supper and to bed tenth lay long it being still very cold 
and then to the office where till dinner and then home and by and by to the office where we sat and were very late and i writing letters till twelve at night and then after supper to bed eleventh up and very angry with my boy for lying long abed and forgetting his lute to my office all the morning at noon to the change and so home to dinner after dinner to gresham college to my lord brunker and commissioner pett taking mr castle with me there to discourse over his draught of a ship he is to build for us where i first found reason to apprehend commissioner pett to be a man of an ability extraordinary in anything for i found he did turn and wind castle like a chicken in his business and that most pertinently and mr like and great pleasure was to me to hear them discourse i of late having studied something thereof and my lord brunker is a very able person also himself in this sort of business as owning himself to be a master in the business of all lines and conical sections thence home where very late at my office doing business to my content though god knows with what ado it was that when i was out i could get myself to come home to my business or when i was there though late would stay there from going abroad again to supper and to bed this evening by a letter from plymouth i hear that two of our ships the leopard and another in the straits are lost by running aground and that three more had like to have been so but got off whereof captain allen won and that a dutch fleet are gone thither which if they should meet with our lame ships god knows what would become of them this i reckon most sad news god make us sensible of it this night when i come home i was much troubled to hear my poor canary bird that i have kept these three or four years is dead twelfth up and to whitehall about getting a privy seal for felling of the king's timber for the navy and to the lord's house to speak with my lord privy seal about it and so to the change where to my last night's ill news i met more spoke with a frenchman who was taken but released by a dutch man-of-war of thirty-six guns with seven more of the like or greater ships off the north fallen by margate which is a strange attempt that they should come to our teeth but the wind being easterly the wind that should bring our force from portsmouth will carry them away home god preserve us against them and pardon our making them in our discourse so contemptible an enemy so home and to dinner where mr holyard with us dined so to the office and there late till eleven at night and more and then home to supper and to bed thirteenth up betimes and walked to my lord Bellassus's lodgings in lincoln's inn fields and there he received and discoursed with me in the most respectful manner that could be telling me what a character of my judgment and care and love to tangier he had received of me that he desired my advice and my constant correspondence which he much valued and in my courtship in which though i understand his design very well and that it is only a piece of courtship yet it is a comfort to me that i am become so considerable as to have him need to say that to me which if i did not do something in the world would never have been here well satisfied i to sir phil warwick and there did some business with him thence to jervis's and there spent a little idle time with him his wife jane and a sweetheart of hers so to the hall a while and thence to the exchange where yesterday's news confirm though in a little different manner but a couple of ships in the straits we have lost and the dutch have been in margate road thence home to dinner and so abroad and alone to the king's house to a play the traitor where unfortunately i met with sir w pen so that i must be forced to confess it to my wife which troubles me thence walked home being ill satisfied with the present actings of the house and prefer the other house before this infinitely to my lady batten's where i find peg pen the first time that ever i saw her to wear spots here very merry sir w batten being looked for to-night but is not yet come from harwich so home to supper and to bed fourteenth up into whitehall where long waited in the duke's chamber for a committee intended for tangier but none met and so i home into the office where we met a little and then to the change where our late ill news confirmed in loss of two ships in the straits but are now the phoenix and none such home to dinner thence with my wife to the king's house there to see volponi a most excellent play the best i think i ever saw and well acted so with sir w pen home in his coach and then to the office so home to supper and bed resolving by the grace of god from this day to fall hard to my business again after some week or fortnight's neglect fifteenth lord's day up and after a little at my office to prepare a fresh draught of my vows for the next year i to church where a most insipid young coxcomb preached then home to dinner and after dinner to read in rushworth's collections about the charge against the late duke of buckingham in order to the fitting me to speak and understand the discourse anon before the king about the suffering the turkey merchants to send out their fleet at this dangerous time when we can neither spare them ships to go nor men nor king's ships to convoy them 
at four o'clock with sir w pen in his coach to my lord chancellor's where by and by mr coventry sir w pen sir j lawson sir g askew and myself were called into the king there being several of the privy council and my lord chancellor lying at length upon a couch of the gout i suppose and there sir w pen began and he had prepared heads in a paper and spoke pretty well to purpose but with so much leisure and gravity as was tiresome besides the things he said were but very poor to a man in his trade after a great consideration but it was to purpose indeed to dissuade the king from letting these turkey ships to go out saying in short the king having resolved to have one hundred and thirty ships out by the spring he must have above twenty of them merchantmen towards which he in the whole river could find but twelve or fourteen and of them the five ships taken up by these merchants were apart and so could not be spared that we should need thirty thousand sailors to man these hundred and thirty ships and of them in service we have not above sixteen thousand so we shall need fourteen thousand more that these ships will with their convoys carry above two thousand men and those the best men that could be got it being the men used to the southward that are the best men for war though those bred in the north among the colliers are good for labour that it will not be safe for the merchants nor honourable for the king to expose these rich ships with his convoy of six ships to go it not being enough to secure them against the dutch who without doubt will have a great fleet in the straits this sir j lawson enlarged upon sir g askew he chiefly spoke that the war and trade could not be supported together and therefore that trade must stand still to give way to them this mr coventry seconded and showed how the medium of the men the king hath one year with another employed in his navy since his coming hath not been above three thousand men or at most four thousand men and now having occasion of thirty thousand the remaining twenty six thousand must be found out of the trade of the nation he showed how the cloths sending by these merchants to turkey are already bought and paid for to the workmen and are as many as they would send these twelve months or more so the poor do not suffer by their not going but only the merchant upon whose hands they lit dead and so the inconvenience is the less and yet for them he propounded either the king should if his treasure would suffer it by them and show the loss would not be so great to him or dispense with the act of navigation and let them be carried out by strangers an ending that he doubted not but when the merchants saw there was no remedy they would and could find ways of sending them abroad to their profit all ended with a conviction unless future discourse with the merchant should alter it that it was not fit for them to go out though the ships be loaded the king in discourse did ask me two or three questions about my news of allen's loss in the straits but i said nothing as to the business nor am not much sorry for it unless the king had spoke to me as he did to them and then i could have said something to the purpose i think so we withdrew and the merchants were called in staying without my lord fitzharding come thither and fell to discourse of prince rupert and made nothing to say that his disease was the pox and that he must be fluxed telling the horrible degree of the disease upon him with its breaking out on his head but above all i observed how he observed from the prince that courage is not what men take it to be a contempt of death for says he how chagrined the prince was the other day when he thought he should die having no more mind to it than another man but says he some men are more apt to think they shall escape than another man in fight while another is doubtful he shall be hit but when the first man is sure he shall die as now the prince is he is as much troubled and apprehensive of it as any man else for says he since we told him that we believe he would overcome his disease he is as merry and swears and laughs and curses and do all the things of a man in health as ever he did in his life which methought was a most extraordinary saying before a great many persons there of quality so by and by with sir w pen home again and after supper to the office to finish my vows and so to bed sixteenth up and with sir w batten and sir w pen to whitehall where we did our business with the duke then side to westminster hall and walked up and down among others ned pickering met me and tells me how active my lord is at sea and that my lord hinchingbrook is now at rome and by all report a very noble and hopeful gentleman thence to mr povey's and there met creed and dined well after his old manner of plenty and curiosity but i sat in pain to think whether he would begin with me again after dinner with his inquiry after my bill but he did not but fell into other discourse at which i was glad but was vexed this morning meeting of creed at some by questions that he demanded of me about some such thing which made me fear he meant that very matter but i perceive he did not thence to visit my lady sandwich and so to a tangier committee where a great company of the new commissioners lords that in behalf of my lord bellasses are very loud and busy and call for povey's accounts but it was a most sorrowful thing to see how he answered to questions so little to the purpose but to his own wrong 
All the while I sensible how I am concerned in my bill of a hundred pounds and somewhat more, so great a trouble is fear, though in a case that, at the worst, will bear inquiry. My Lord Barclay was very violent against Povey, but my Lord Ashley, I observe, is a most clear man in matters of accounts, and most ingeniously did discourse and explain all matters. We broke up, leaving the thing to a committee of which I am one. Povey, Creed, and I stayed discoursing. I much troubled in mind seemingly for the business, but indeed only on my own behalf, though I have no great reason for it, but so painful a thing is fear. So, after considering how to order business, Povey and I walked together as far as the new exchange, and so parted, and I by coach home. To the office a while, then to supper and to bed. This afternoon, Secretary Bennett read to the Duke of York his letters, which say that Allen has met with the Dutch Smyrna fleet at Kales, and sunk one, and taken three. How true or what these ships are, time will show. But it is good news, and the news of our ships being lost is doubted at Kales and Malaga. God send it false. 17th. Up and walked to Mr. Povey's by appointment, where I found him and Creed busy about fitting things for the committee, and then sweet to my Lord Ashley's, where to see how simply, beyond all patience, Povey did again, by his many words and no understanding, confound himself and his business to his disgrace, and rendering everybody doubtful of his being either a fool or knave, is very wonderful. We broke up all dissatisfied, and referred the business to a meeting of Mr. Sherwin and others to settle. But here it was mighty strange, methought, to find myself sit here in committee with my hat on, while Mr. Sherwin stood bare as a clerk, with his hat off to his Lord Ashley and the rest. But I thank God I think myself never a whit the better man for all that. Thence with Creed to the change and coffee-house, and so home, where a brave dinner, by having a brace of pheasants, and very merry about Povey's folly. So and on to the office, and there sitting very late, and then after a little time at Sir W. Batten's, where I am mighty great, and could, if I thought it fit, continue so. I to the office again, and there very late, and so home to the sorting of some of my books, and so to bed, the weather becoming pretty warm, and I think and hope the frost will break. 18th. Up, and by and by to my booksellers, and there did give thorough direction for the new binding of a great many of my old books, to make my whole study of the same binding, within very few. Thence to my Lady Sandwiches, who sent for me this morning. Dined with her, and it was to get a letter of hers conveyed by a safe hand to my lord's own hand at Portsmouth, which I did undertake. Here my lady did begin to talk of what she had heard concerning Creed, of his being suspected to be a fanatic and a false fellow. I told her I thought he was as shrewd and cunning a man as any in England, and one that I would fear first should outwit me in anything, to which she readily concurred. Thence to Mr. Povey's, by agreement, and there with Mr. Sherwin, Auditor Beale, and Creed, and I, hard at it very late about Mr. Povey's accounts, but such accounts I never did see, or hope again to see in my days. At night, late, they gone, I did get him to put out of this account our sums that are in posse only yet, which he approved of when told, but would never have stayed it if I had been gone. Thence at nine at night, home, and so to supper, vexed, and my head aching, and to bed. Nineteenth. Up, and it being yesterday and to-day a great thaw, it is not for a man to walk the streets, but took coach and to Mr. Povey's, and there meeting, all of us again agreed upon an answer to the Lord's by and by, and thence we did come to Exeter House, and there was a witness of most base language against Mr. Povey from my Lord Peterborough, who is most furiously angry with him, because the other, as a fool, would need say that the twenty-six thousand pounds was my Lord Peterborough's account, and that he had nothing to do with it. The Lords did find fault also with our answer, but I think really my Lord Ashley would fain have the outside of an exchequer, but when we come better to be examined. So home by coach with my Lord Barclay, who by his discourse I find do look upon Mr. Coventry as an enemy, but yet professes great justice and pains. I at home after dinner to the office, and there sat all the afternoon and evening, and then home to supper and to bed. Memorandum. This day and yesterday, I think it is the change of the weather, I have a great deal of pain, but nothing like what I used to have. I can hardly keep myself loose, but on the contrary I am forced to drive away my pain. Here I am so sleepy I cannot hold open my eyes, and therefore must be forced to break off this day's passages more shortly than I would and should have done. This day was buried, but I could not be there, my cousin Percival Angier. And yesterday I received the news that Dr. Tom Pepys is dead at Impington, for which I am but little sorry, not only because he would have been troublesome to us, but ashamed to his family and profession. He was such a coxcomb. Twentieth. Up into Westminster, where having spoke with Sir Phil Warwick, I to Jervis, and there I find them all in great disorder about Jane, her mistress telling me secretly, 
that she was sworn not to reveal anything, but she was undone. At last, for all her oath, she told me that she had made herself sure to a fellow that comes to their house that can only fiddle for his living, and did keep him company, and had plainly told her that she was sure to him never to leave him for anybody else. Now they were this day contriving to get her presently to marry one Hayes that was there, and I did seem to persuade her to it, and at last got them to suffer me to advise privately, and by that means had her company, and think I shall meet her next Sunday, but I do really doubt she will be undone in marrying this fellow. But I did give her my advice, and so let her do her pleasure, so I have now and then her company. Thence to the swan at noon, and there sent for a bit of meat, and dined, and had my baiser of the fee of the house there, but nothing plus. So took coach, and to my lady's sandwiches, and so to my bookseller's, and there took home Hook's book of microscopy, a most excellent piece, and of which I am very proud. So home, and by and by again abroad with my wife about several businesses, and met at the new exchange, and there to our trouble, found our pretty doll is gone away to live, they say, with her father in the country, but I doubt something worse. So homeward, in my way buying a hair and taking it home, which arose upon my discourse to-day with Mr. Batten at Westminster Hall, who showed me my mistake that my hare's foot hath not the joint to it, and assures me he never had his colic since he carried it about him. And it is a strange thing how fancy works, for I no sooner almost handled his foot, but my belly began to be loose and to break wind. And whereas I was in some pain yesterday and t'other day, and in fear of more to-day, I became very well, and so continue. At home to my office a while, and so to supper, read, and to cards, and to bed. 21st. At the office all the morning. And thence my Lord Brunker carried me as far as Mr. Povey's, and there I light and dined, meeting Mr. Sherwin, Creed, etc., there upon his accounts. After dinner they parted, and Mr. Povey carried me to Somerset House, and there showed me the Queen Mother's chamber and closet, most beautiful places for furniture and pictures. And so down the great stone stairs to the garden, and tried the brave echo upon the stairs, which continues a voice so long as the singing three notes, concords, one after another, they all three shall sound in consort together a good while most pleasantly. Thence to a Tangier committee at Whitehall, where I saw nothing ordered by judgment, but great heat and passion and faction, now in behalf of my Lord Bellasus, and to the reproach of my Lord Tiviot, and dislike, as it were, of former proceedings. So away with Mr. Povey, he carried me homeward to Mark Lane in his coach, a simple fellow I now find him, to his utter shame in his business of accounts, as none but a sorry fool would have discovered himself, and yet in little light sorry things very cunning, yet in the principal the most ignorant man I ever met with, in so great trust as he is, to my office till past twelve, and then home to supper and to bed, being now mighty well, and truly I cannot but impute it to my fresh hair's foot. Before I went to bed I sat up till two o'clock in my chamber reading of Mr. Hook's microscopical observations, the most ingenious book that ever I read in my life. 22nd, Lord's Day. Up, leaving my wife in bed, being sick of her months, and to church. Thence home, and in my wife's chamber, dine very merry, discoursing, among other things, of a design I have come in my head this morning at church, of making a match between Mrs. Betty Pickering and Mr. Hill, my friend the merchant, that loves music, and comes to me a Sundays, a most ingenious and sweet-natured and highly accomplished person. I know not how their fortunes may agree, but their disposition and merits are much of a sort, and persons, though different, yet equally, I think, acceptable." After dinner walked to Westminster, and after being at the abbey, and heard a good anthem well sung there, I, as I had appointed, to the trumpet, there expecting when Jane Wells should come, but anon comes a maid of the house, to tell me that her mistress and master would not let her go forth, not knowing of my being here, but to keep her from her sweetheart. So being defeated, her way by coach home, and there spent the evening prettily in discourse with my wife and Mercer, and so to supper, prayers, and to bed. 23rd up, and with Sir W. Batten and Sir W. Penn to Whitehall, but there finding the Duke gone to his lodgings at St. James's for altogether, his Duchess being ready to lie in, we to him, and there did our usual business. And here I met the great news confirmed by the Duke's own relation, by a letter from Captain Allen, first of our own loss of two ships, the Phoenix and Nonsuch, in the Bay of Gibraltar, then of his, and his seven ships with him, in the Bay of Calais, or thereabouts, fighting with the thirty-four Dutch Smyrna fleet, sinking the king solomon a ship worth a hundred and fifty thousand pounds or more some say two hundred thousand pounds and another and taking of three merchant ships two of our ships were disabled by the dutch unfortunately falling against their will against them the advice captain w poole and antelope captain clark the dutch men of war did little service captain allen did receive many shots at distance before he would fire one gun which he did not do till he come within pistol shot of his enemy the Spaniards on shore at Calais did stand laughing at the Dutch. 
to see them run away and flee to the shore, thirty-four or thereabouts against eight Englishmen at most. I do purpose to get the whole relation, if I live, of Captain Allen himself. In our loss of the two ships in the Bay of Gibraltar, it is observable how the world do comment upon the misfortune of Captain Moon, of the Nonsuch, who did lose in the same manner the satisfaction, as a person that hath ill luck attending him, without considering that the whole fleet was ashore. Captain Allen led the way, and Captain Allen himself writes that all the masters of the fleet, old and young, were mistaken, and did carry their ships aground. But I think I heard the Duke say that Moon, being put into the Oxford, had in this conflict regained his credit, by sinking one and taking another. Captain Seal of the Milford hath done his part very well, in boarding the King Solomon, which held out half an hour after she was boarded, and his men kept her an hour after they did master her, and then she sunk, and drowned about seventeen of her men. Thence to Jervis's, my mind, God forgive me, running too much after some folly, but ill not being within, I away by coach to the change, and thence home to dinner and finding Mrs. Bagwell waiting at the office after dinner, away she and I to a cabaret where she and I have eat before, and there I had her company toot, and had mon plaisir of elle. But strange to see how a woman, notwithstanding her greatest pretences of love à son mari, and religion, may be thank you. Thence to the court of the Turkey Company, at Sir Andrew Ricard's, to treat about carrying some men of ours to Tangier, and had there a very civil reception, though a denial of the thing as not practicable with them, and I think so too. So to my office a little, and to Jervis's again, thinking of our rencontre Jane, mais elle n'était pas dedans. So I back again into my office, where I did with great content, ferrer a vow to mind my business, and laisser aller les femmes for a month, and am with all my heart glad, to find myself able to come to so good a resolution, that thereby I may follow my business, which, and my honour thereby, lies a-bleeding. So home to supper, and to bed. 24th. Up and by coach to Westminster Hall and the Parliament House, and there spoke with Mr. Coventry and others about business, and so back to the change, where no news more than that the Dutch have, by consent of all the provinces, voted no trade to be suffered for eighteen months, but that they apply themselves wholly to the war. And they say it is very true, but very strange, for we used to believe they cannot support themselves without trade. Then home to dinner, and then to the office, where all the afternoon, and at night till very late and then home to supper and bed, having a great cold got on Sunday last, by sitting too long with my head bare, for Mercer to comb my hair and wash my ears. 25th. Up and busy all the morning, dined at home upon a hair pie, very good meat, and so to my office again, and in the afternoon by coach to attend the council at Whitehall, but come too late, so back with Mr. Gifford, a merchant, and he and I to the coffee-house, where I met Mr. Hill, and there he tells me that he is to be assistant to the secretary of the prize office, Sir Ellis Layton, which is to be held at Sir Richard Ford's, which, methinks, is but something low, but perhaps may bring him something considerable, but it makes me alter my opinion of his being so rich as to make a fortune for Mrs. Pickering. Thence home and visited Sir J. Minnes, who continues ill, but is something better. There he told me what a mad freaking fellow Sir Ellis Layton hath been, and is, and once at Antwerp was really mad. Thence to my office late, my cold troubling me, and having by squeezing myself in a coach hurt my testicles, but I hope will cease its pain without swelling, so home out of order, to supper and to bed. 26. Lay, being in some pain, but not much, with my last night's bruise, but up and to my office, where busy all the morning, the like after dinner till very late, then home to supper and to bed. My wife mightily troubled with the toothache, and my cold not being gone yet, but my bruise yesterday goes away again, and it chiefly occasioned, I think now, from the sudden change of the weather from a frost to a great rain on a sudden. 27th. Called up by Mr. Creed to discourse about some Tangier business. And he gone, I made me ready, and found Jane Welsh, Mr. Jervis's maid, come to tell me that she was gone from her master, and is resolved to stick to this sweetheart of hers, one Harbing, a very sorry little fellow, and poor, which I did in a word or two endeavour to dissuade her from. But being unwilling to keep her long at my house, I sent her away, and by and by followed her to the exchange, and thence led her about down to the three cranes, and there took boat for the falcon, and at her house looking into the fields, there took up, and sat an hour or two talking and discoursing. Thence, having endeavoured to make her think of making herself happy by staying out her time with her master and other counsels, but she told me she could not do it, for it was her fortune to have this man, though she did believe it would be to her ruin, which is a strange, stupid thing, to a fellow of no kind of worth in the world, and a beggar to boot. Then so ate a boat again, and landed her at the three cranes again, and I to the bridge, and so home. And after shifting myself, being dirty, I to the change, and thence to Mr. Povey's, and there dined. 
and thence with him and creed to my lord Bellasus, and there debated a great while how to put things in order against his going, and so with my lord in his coach to Whitehall, and with him to my lord Duke of Albemarle, finding him at cards. After a few dull words or two, I away to Whitehall again, and there delivered a letter to the Duke of York about our navy business, and thence walked up and down in the gallery talking with Mr. Slingsby, who is a very ingenious person, about the mint and coinage of money. Among other things, he argues that there being seven hundred thousand pounds coined in the rump time, and by all the treasurers of that time, it being their opinion that the rump money was in all payments, one with another, about a tenth part of all their money. Then, says he, to my question, the nearest guess we can make is that the money passing up and down in business is seven million pounds. To another question of mine, he made me fully understand that the old law of prohibiting bullion to be exported is, and ever was, a folly and an injury, rather than good arguing thus that if the exportations exceed importations then the balance must be brought home in money which when our merchants know cannot be carried out again they will forbear to bring home in money but let it lie abroad for trade or keep in foreign banks or if our importations exceed our exportations then to keep credit the merchants will and must find ways of carrying out money by stealth which is a most easy thing to do and is everywhere done and therefore the law against it signifies nothing in the world Besides that it is seen that where money is free there is great plenty, where it is restrained, as here, there is great want, as in Spain. These are many other fine discourses I had from him. Thence by coach home, to see Sir J. Minnes first, who is still sick, and I doubt worse than he seems to be. Mrs. Turner here took me into her closet, and there did give me a glass of most pure water, and showed me her rock, which indeed is a very noble thing, but a very bauble. So away to my office, where late, busy and then home to supper, and to bed. 28th. Up into my office, where all the morning, and then home to dinner, and after dinner abroad, walked to Paul's churchyard, but my book's not bound, which vexed me. So home to my office again, where very late about business, and so home to supper and to bed. My coal continuing in a great degree upon me still. This day I received a good sum of money due to me, upon one score or another, from Sir G. Carteret, among others to clear all my matters about colours, wherein a month or two since I was so embarrassed, and I thank God I find myself to have got clear by that commodity fifty pounds and something more, and earned it with dear pains and care and issuing of my own money, and saved the king near one hundred pounds in it. Twenty ninth, Lord's Day. Up into my office, where all the morning, putting papers to rights, which now grow upon my hands. At noon, dined at home. All the afternoon at my business again. In the evening come Mr. Andrews and Hill, and we up to my chamber, and there good music, though my great cold made it the less pleasing to me. Then Mr. Hill, the other going away, and I to supper alone, my wife not appearing. Our discourse upon the particular vain humours of Mr. Povey, which are very extraordinary indeed. After supper I to Sir W. Batten's, where I found him, Sir W. Penn, Sir J. Robinson, Sir R. Ford, and Captain Cock and Mr. Penn, Jr. Here a great deal of sorry, disordered talk about the Trinity House men, they are being exempted from land service. But, Lord, to see how void of method and sense their discourse was, and in what heat, insomuch as Sir R. Ford, who we judged some of us to be a little foxed, fell into very high terms with Sir W. Batten, and then with Captain Cock, so that I see that no man is wise at all times. Then to home to prayers, and to bed. Thirtieth. This is solemnly kept as a fast all over the city, but I kept my house, putting my closet to rights again, having lately put it out of order in removing my books and things in order to being made clean at this all day and at night to my office there to do some business and being late at it comes mercer to me to tell me that my wife was in bed and desired me to come home for they hear and have night after night lately heard noises over their head upon the leads now it is strange to think how knowing that i have a great sum of money in my house this puts me into a most mighty affright that for more than two hours I could not almost tell what to do or say, but feared this and that, and remembered that this evening I saw a woman and two men stand suspiciously in the entry in the dark. I calling to them, they made me only this answer. The woman said that the men came to see her, but who she was I could not tell. The truth is, my house is mighty dangerous, having so many ways to be come to, and at my windows, over the stairs, to see who goes up and down. But if I escape to-night, I will remedy it. God preserve us this night safe." So at almost two o'clock I home to my house, and in great fear to bed, thinking every running of a mouse really a thief, and so to sleep very brokenly all night long, and found all safe in the morning. Thirty-first. 
up and with Sir W. Batten to Westminster, where to speak at the house with my Lord Bellasus, and am cruelly vexed to see myself put upon businesses so uncertainly about getting ships for Tangier being ordered, a servile thing, almost every day. So to the change, back by coach with Sir W. Batten, and thence to the Crown, a tavern hard by, with Sir W. Ryder and Cutler, where we alone, a very good dinner, thence home to the office, and there all the afternoon late. The office being up, my wife sent for me, and what was it but to tell me how Jane carries herself, and I must put her away presently. But I did hear both sides, and find my wife much in fault, and the grounds of all the difference is my wife's fondness of Tom, to the being displeased with all the house beside to defend the boy, which vexes me, but I will cure it. Many high words between my wife and I, but the wench shall go, but I will take a course with the boy, for I fear I have spoiled him already. Thence to the office, to my accounts, and there at once to ease my mind, I have made myself debtor to Mr. Povey, for the hundred and seventeen pounds five shillings, got with so much joy the last month. But seeing that it is not like to be kept without some trouble in question, I do even discharge my mind of it. And so if I come now to refund it, as I fear I shall, I shall now be ne'er a whit the poorer for it, though yet it is some trouble to me to be poorer by such a sum than I thought myself a month since. But, however, a quiet mind, and to be sure of my own, is worth all. The Lord be praised for what I have, which is this month come down to one thousand two hundred and fifty-seven pounds. I stayed up about my accounts till almost two in the morning. End of January February of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665, by Samuel Pepys. February, 1664-1665. February 1st. Lay long in bed, which made me, going by coach to St. James's by appointment, to have attended the Duke of York and my Lord Bellassus, lose the hopes of my getting something by the hire of a ship to carry men to Tangier. But, however, according to the order of the Duke this morning, I did go to the change, and there, after great pains, did light of a business with Mr. Gifford and Hublin, for bringing me as much as I hoped for, which I have at large expressed in my stating the case of the King's Fisher, which is the ship that I have hired, and got the Duke of York's agreement this afternoon after much pains, and not eating a bit of bread till about four o'clock. Going home, I put into an ordinary by Temple Bar, and there with my boy Tom, eat a pullet, and thence home to the office, being still angry with my wife for yesterday's foolery. After a good while at the office, I with the boy to the sun behind the exchange, by agreement with Mr. Young the flag-maker, and there was met by Mr. Hill, Andrews, and Mr. Hublin, a pretty serious man. Here two very pretty savoury dishes, and good discourse. After supper, a song, or three or four, I, having to that purpose carried Law's book, and staying here till twelve o'clock, got the watch to light me home, and in a continued discontent, to bed. After being in bed, my people come and say there is a great stink of burning, but no smoke. We called up Sir J. Minnes, and Sir W. Batten's people, and Griffin, and the people at the madhouse, but nothing could be found to give occasion to it. At this trouble we were, till past three o'clock, and then the stink ceasing, I to sleep, and my people to bed, and lay very long in the morning. Second. Then up into my office, where till noon, and then to the change, and at the coffee-house with Gifford, Hublin, the master of the ship, and I read over and approved a charter party for carrying goods for Tangier, wherein I hoped to get some money. Thence home, my head aching for want of rest and too much business. So to the office. At night comes Povey, and he and I to Mrs. Bland's to discourse about my serving her to help her to a good passage for Tangier. Here I heard her kinswoman sing three or four very fine songs and in good manner, and then home and to supper. My cook maid Jane and her mistress parted, and she went away this day. I vexed to myself, but was resolved to have no more trouble, and so after supper to my office, and then to bed. Third. Up and walked with my boy, whom, because of my wife's making him idle, I dare not leave at home, walked first to Salisbury Court, there to excuse my not being at home at dinner to Mrs. Turner, who I perceive is vexed, because I do not serve her in something against the great feasting for her husband's reading in helping her to some good penance, but I care not. She was dressing herself by the fire in her chamber, and there took occasion to show me her leg, which indeed is the finest I ever saw, and she not a little proud of it. Thence to my Lord Bellasus, thence to Mr. Povis, and so up and down at that end of the town about several businesses, it being a brave frosty day and good walking. So back again on foot to the change, in my way taking my books from binding from my booksellers, 
My bill for the rebinding of some old books to make them suit with my study cost me, besides other new books in the same bill, three pounds, but it will be very handsome. At the change did several businesses, and here I hear that news is come from Deal, that the same day my Lord Sandwich sailed thence with the fleet. That evening some Dutch men of war were seen on the back side of the Goodwin, and by all conjecture must be seen by my Lord's fleet, which if so they must engage. Thence being invited to my uncle White's, where the Whites all dined, and among the others pretty Mrs. Margaret, who indeed is a very pretty lady, and though by my vow it cost me twelve pence a kiss after the first, yet I did adventure upon a couple. So home, and among other letters found one from Jane that is newly gone, telling me how her mistress won't pay her her quarter's wages, and withal tells me how her mistress will have the boy sit three or four hours together in the dark telling of stories, but speaks of nothing but only her indiscretion in undervaluing herself to do it. But I will remedy that, but am vexed she should get somebody to write so much because of making it public. Then took coach and to visit my lady Sandwich, where she discoursed largely to me her opinion of a match, if it could be thought fit by my lord, for my lady Jemima, with Sir G. Carteret's eldest son. But I doubt he hath yet no settled estate in land. But I will inform myself and give her my opinion. Then Mrs. Pickering, after private discourse ended, we going into the other room, did at my lady's command tell me the manner of a masquerade before the king and court the other day where six women, my Lady Castlemaine and Duchess of Monmouth being two of them, and six men, the Duke of Monmouth and Lord Arran and Monsieur Blanfort being three of them, in visits but most rich and antique dresses, did dance admirably and most gloriously. God give us cause to continue the mirth. So home, and after a while at my office, to supper and to bed. Fourth. Lay long in bed, discoursing with my wife about her maids, which by Jane's going away in discontent, and against my opinion, do make some trouble between my wife and me. But these are but foolish troubles, and so not to be set to heart. Yet it do disturb me mightily, these things. To my office, and there all the morning. At noon being invited, I to the sun behind the change, to dinner to my lord Bellassus, where a great deal of discourse with him, and some good. Among others at table he told us a very handsome passage of the king sending him his message about holding out the town of Newark, of which he was then governor for the king. This message he sent in a slug bullet, being writ in cipher, and wrapped up in lead, and swallowed. So the messenger come to my lord, and told him he had a message from the king, but it was yet in his belly. So they did give him some physic, and out it come. This was a month before the king's flying to the Scots, and therein he told him that at such a day, being the third or sixth of May, he should hear of his being come to the Scots, being assured by the king of France that in coming to them he should be used with all the liberty, honour, and safety that could be desired. And at the just day he did come to the Scots. He told us another odd passage, how the king, having newly put out Prince Rupert of his generalship upon some miscarriage at Bristol, and Sir Richard Willis of his governorship of Newark, at the entreaty of the gentry of the county, and put in my lord Bellassus, the great officers of the king's army mutinied, and come in that manner with swords drawn, into the market-place of the town where the king was, which the king hearing says, I must to horse, and there himself personally, when everybody expected they should have been opposed, the king come, and cried to the head of the mutineers, which was Prince Rupert, Nephew, I command you to be gone. So the prince, in all his fury and discontent, withdrew, and his company scattered, which they say was the greatest piece of mutiny in the world. Thence after dinner home to my office, and in the evening was sent to by Jane that I would give her her wages. So I sent for my wife to my office, and told her that rather than me talked on, I would give her all her wages for this quarter coming on, though two months is behind, which vexed my wife, and we begun to be angry. But I took myself up and sent her away, but was cruelly vexed in my mind that all my trouble in this world almost should arise from my disorders in my family, and the indiscretion of a wife that brings me nothing almost, besides a comely person, but only trouble and discontent. She gone, I laid at my business, and then home to supper and to bed. Fifth, Lord's Day. Lay in bed most of the morning, then up and down to my chamber among my new books, which is now a pleasant sight to me, to see my whole study almost of one binding. So to dinner, and all the afternoon with W. Hewer at my office, and dorsing of papers there, my business having got before me much of late. In the evening comes to see me Mr. Shepley, lately come out of the country, who goes away again to-morrow, a good and a very kind man to me. There come also Mr. Andrews and Hill, and we sang very pleasantly, and so they being gone, I and my wife to supper, and to prayers, and bed. Sixth. Up and with Sir J. Minnes and Sir W. Penn to St. James's, but the Duke is gone abroad. So to Whitehall to him, and there I spoke with him, and so to Westminster, did a little business, and then home to the change, 
where also I did some business, and went off and ended my contract with the kingfisher I hired for Tangier, and I hoped to get something by it. Thence home to dinner, and visited Sir W. Batten, who is sick again, worse than he was, and I am apt to think is very ill. So to my office, and among other things, with Sir W. Warren, four hours or more till very late, talking of one thing or another, and have concluded a firm league with him in all just ways to serve him and myself all I can, and I think he will be a most useful and thankful man to me. So home to supper and to bed. This being one of the coldest days, all say, they ever felt in England, and I this day, under great apprehensions of getting an egg from my putting a suit on that hath lain by without airing a great while, and I pray God, it do not do me hurt. 7th. Up into my office, where busy all the morning, and at home to dinner. It being show of Tuesday, had some very good fritters, all the afternoon and evening at the office, and at night home to supper and to bed. This day Sir W. Batten, who hath been sick four or five days, is now very bad. So as people begin to fear his death, and I am at a loss whether it would be better for me to have him die, because he is a bad man, or live, for fear a worse should come. 8th. Up in my coach to my Lord Peterborough's, where anon my Lord Ashley and Sir Thomas Ingram met, and Povey about his accounts, who is one of the most unhappy accountants that ever I knew in all my life, and one that, if I were clear in reference to my bill of a hundred and seventeen pounds, he should be hanged, before I would ever have to do with him. And as he understands nothing of his business himself, so he hath not one about him that do. Here late, till I was weary, having business elsewhere, and thence home by coach, and after dinner did several businesses, and very late at my office, and so home to supper, and to bed. Ninth, Up into my office, where all the morning very busy. At noon home to dinner, and then to my office again, where Sir William Petty come, among other things, to tell me that Mr. Barlow is dead, for which, God knows my heart, I could be as sorry as is possible for one to be for a stranger, by whose death he gets a hundred pounds per annum, he being a worthy, honest man. But after having considered that when I come to consider the providence of God by this means unexpectedly, to give me a hundred pounds a year more in my estate, I have cause to bless God, and do it from the bottom of my heart. So home late at night, after twelve o'clock, and so to bed. Tenth. Up and abroad to Paul's churchyard, there to see the last of my books new bound. Among others, my court of King James, and the rise and fall of the family of the Stuarts. And much pleased I am now with my study, it being methinks a beautiful sight. Thence, in Mr. Gray's coach, who took me up, to Westminster, where I heard that yesterday the King met the houses to pass the great bill for the two million five hundred thousand pounds. After doing a little business, I home, where Mr. Moore dined with me, and even our reckonings on my Lord Sandwich's bond to me for principal and interest, so that now on both there is remaining due to me two hundred and fifty-seven pounds seven shillings, and I bless God it is no more. So all the afternoon at my office, and late home to supper, prayers, and to bed. Eleventh. Up into my office, where all the morning, at noon to change by coach with my Lord Brunkard, and thence after doing much business, home to dinner, and so to my office all the afternoon, till past twelve at night, very busy. So home to bed. Twelfth, Lord's Day. Up into church to St. Lawrence to hear Dr. Wilkins, the great scholar, for curiosity, I having never heard him, but was not satisfied with him at all. Only a gentleman sat in the pew I by chance sat in, that sang most excellently, and afterward I found by his face that he had been a Paul's scholar, but know not his name, and I was also well pleased with the church, it being a very fine church. So home to dinner, and then to my office all the afternoon, doing of business, and in the evening comes Mr. Hill, but no Andrews, and we spent the evening very finely, singing, supping, and discoursing. Then to prayers, and to bed. Thirteenth. Up unto St. James's, did our usual business before the Duke, then side to Westminster, and by water, taking Mr. Stapley, the rope-maker, by the way, to his rope-ground, and to Limehouse, there to see the manner of stoves, and did excellently inform myself therein, and coming home did go on board Sir W. Petty's experiment, which is a brave, roomy vessel, and I hope may do well. So went on shore to a Dutch house to drink some mum, and there light upon some Dutchmen, with whom we had good discourse, touching stoving and making of cables. But to see how despicably they speak of us for our using so many hands more to do anything than they do, they closing a cable with twenty that we use sixty men upon, thence home and eat something, and then to my office, where very late, and then to supper and to bed. Captain Stokes, it seems, is at last dead at Portsmouth. 14. St. Valentine. This morning comes betime Dick Penn, to be my wife's Valentine, and come to our bedside. By the same token, I had him brought to my side, thinking to have made him kiss me, but he perceived me, and would not. So went to his Valentine, a notable, stout, witty boy. 
I up about business, and opening the door, there was Bagwell's wife, with whom I talked afterwards, and she had the confidence to say, she came with the hope to be time enough to be my valentine, and so indeed she did, but my oath preserved me from losing any time with her, and so I and my boy abroad by coach to Westminster, where did two or three businesses, and then home to the change, and did much business there. My lord Sandwich is, it seems, with his fleet at Alborough Bay. So home to dinner, and then to the office, where till twelve almost at night, and then home to supper, and to bed. Fifteenth. Up into my office, where busy all the morning. At noon with Creed to dinner to Trinity House, where a very good dinner among the old soakers, where an extraordinary discourse of the manner of the loss of the Royal Oak coming home from Bantam, upon the rocks of Scilly. Many passages therein very extraordinary, and if I can I will get it in writing. Thence with Creed to Gresham College, where I had been by Mr. Povey the last week proposed to be admitted a member, and was this day admitted, by signing a book and being taken by the hand by the President, my Lord Brunkard, and some words of admittance said to me. But it is a most acceptable thing to hear their discourse and see their experiments, which were this day upon the nature of fire, and how it goes out in a place where the air is not free, and sooner out where the air is exhausted, which they showed by an engine on purpose. After this being done, they to the Crown Tavern, behind the change, and there my lord and most of the company to a club supper, Sir P. Neal, Sir R. Murray, Dr. Clark, Dr. Whistler, Dr. Goddard, and others of most eminent worth. Above all, Mr. Boyle to-day was at the meeting, and above him Mr. Hook, who is the most, and promises the least, of any man in the world that ever I saw. Hear excellent discourse till ten at night, and then home, and to Sir W. Batten's, where I hear that Sir Thomas Harvey intends to put Mr. Turner out of his house and come in himself which will be very hard to them, and though I love him not, yet for his family's sake I pity him. So home and to bed. Sixteenth. Up and with Mr. Andrews to Whitehall, where a committee of Tangier, and there I did our victuals business for some more money, out of which I hoped to get a little, of which I was glad. But, Lord, to see to what a degree of contempt, nay, scorn, Mr. Povey, through his prodigious folly, hath brought himself in his accounts, that if he be not a man of great interest, he will be kicked out of his employment for a fool, is very strange, and that most deservedly that ever man was, for never any man that understands accounts so little ever went through so much, and yet goes through it with a greater shame and yet with confidence that ever I saw man in my life. God deliver me in my own business of my bill out of his hands, and if ever I foul my fingers with him again, let me suffer for it. Back to the change, and thence home to dinner, where Mrs. Hunt dined with me, and poor Mrs. Batters, who brought her little daughter with her, and a letter from her husband, wherein, as a token, the fool presents me very seriously with his daughter for me to take the charge of bringing up for him, and to make my own. But I took no notice to her at all of the substance of the letter, but fell to discourse, and so went away to the office, where all the afternoon till almost one in the morning, and then home to bed. 17. Up, and it being bitter cold, and frost and snow, which I thought had quite left us, I by coach to Povey's, where he told me, as I knew already, how he was handled the other day, and is still by my Lord Barclay, and among other things tells me, what I did not know, how my Lord Barclay will say openly, that he hath fought more set fields, than any man in England hath done. I did my business with him, which was to get a little sum of money paid, and so home with Mr. Andrews, who met me there, and there to the office. At noon home, and there found Llewellyn, which vexed me, out of my old jealous humour, so to my office, where till twelve at night, being only a little while at noon at Sir W. Batten's to see him, and had some high words with Sir J. Minnes about Sir W. Warren, he calling him cheating knave, but I called him, and at night at Sir W. Penn's, he being to go to Chatham to-morrow. So home to supper, and to bed. Eighteenth. Up and to the office, where sat all the morning, at noon to the change, and thence to the Royal Oak Tavern in Lombard Street, where Sir William Petty and the owners of the double bottom boat, the experiment, did entertain my Lord Brunkard, Sir R. Murray, myself, and others, with marrow-bones, and a chine of beef of the victuals they have made for the ship, an excellent company, and good discourse. But above all, I do value Sir William Petty. Thence home, and took my Lord Sandwich's draught of the harbour of Portsmouth down to Ratcliffe, to one Burston, to make a plate for the King, and another for the Duke, and another for himself, which will be very neat. So home, and till almost one o'clock in the morning at my office, and then home to supper, and to bed. My Lord Sandwich and his fleet of twenty-five ships in the Downs returned from cruising, but could not meet with any Dutchman. Nineteenth. Lay in bed, it being Lord's Day, all the morning talking with my wife, sometimes pleased, sometimes displeased, and then up and to dinner. All the afternoon also at home, and Sir W. Batten's, and in the evening comes Mr. Andrews, and we sung together, and then to supper, he not staying, 
and at supper hearing by accident of my maids they are letting in a roguing scotch woman that haunts the office to help them to wash and scar in our house and that very lately i fell mightily out and made my wife to the disturbance of the house and neighbours to beat our little girl and then we shut her down into the cellar and there she lay all night so we to bed twentieth up and with sir j minnes to attend the duke and then we back again and rode into the beginning of my lord chancellor's new house near st james's which common people have already called dunkirk house from their opinion of his having a good bribe for the selling of that town and very noble i believe it will be near that is my lord berkeley beginning another on one side and sir j denham on the other thence i to the house of lords and spoke with my lord bellassus and so to the change and there did business and so to the sun tavern having in the morning had some high words with sir j lawson about his sending of some bail goods to tangier wherein the truth is i did not favour him but being conscious that some of my profits may come out by some words that fell from him and to be quiet i have accommodated it here we dine merry but my club and the rest come to seven shillings sixpence which was too much thence to the office and there found bagwell's wife whom i directed to go home and i would do her business which was to write a letter to my lord sandwich for her husband's advance into a better ship as there should be occasion which i did and by and by did go down by water to deptford and then down further and so landed at the lower end of the town and it being dark entrez en la maison de la femme de baguel and there had sa compagnie though with a great deal of difficulty néanmoins enfin j'avais ma volant d'elle and being sated therewith i walked home to redriff it being now near nine o'clock and there i did drink some strong waters and eat some bread and cheese and so home where at my office my wife comes and tells me that she hath hired a chambermaid one of the prettiest maids that ever she saw in her life and that she is really jealous of me for her but hath ventured to hire her from month to month but i think she means merrily so to supper and to bed twenty first up into the office having a mighty pain in my forefinger of my left hand from a strain that it received last night in struggling avec la femme que je mentioned yesterday we were busy till noon and then my wife being busy in going with her woman to a hot-house to bathe herself after her long being within doors in the dirt so that she now pretends to a resolution of being hereafter very clean how long it will hold i can guess i dined with sir w batten and my lady they being nowadays very fond of me so to the change and off of the change with mr waith to a cook-shop and there dined again for discourse with him about hamacos and the abuse now practised in tickets and more like every day to be also of the great profit mr fenn makes of his place he being though he demands but five per cent of all he pays and that is easily computed but very little pleased with any man that gives him no more so to the office and after office my lord brunkard carried me to lincoln's inn fields and there i with my lady sandwich good lady talking of innocent discourse of good housewifery and husbands for her daughters and the luxury and looseness of the times and other such things till past ten o'clock at night and so by coach home where a little at my office and so to supper and to bed my lady tells me how my lord castlemaine is coming over from france and is believed will be made friends with his lady again what mad freaks the maids of honour at court have that mrs jennings one of the duchess's maids the other day dressed herself like an orange wench and went up and down and cried oranges till falling down or by such accident though in the evening her fine shoes were discerned and she put to a great deal of shame that such as these tricks being ordinary and worse among them thereby few will venture upon them for wives my lady castlemaine will in merriment say that her daughter not above a year old or two will be the first maid in the court that will be married this day my lord sandwich writ me word from the downs that he is like to be in town this week twenty second lay last night alone my wife after her bathing lying alone in another bed so cold all night up enter the office where busy all the morning at noon at the change busy where great talk of a dutch ship in the north put on shore and taken by a troop of horse home to dinner and creed with me thence to gresham college where very noble discourse and thence home busy till past twelve at night and then home to supper and to bed mrs Blank come this night to take leave of me and my wife going to tangier twenty third this day by the blessing of almighty god i have lived thirty-two years in the world and am in the best degree of health at this minute that i have been almost in my lifetime and at this time in the best condition of estate that ever i was in the lord make me thankful up and to the office where busy all the morning at noon to the change where i hear the most horrid and astonishing news that ever was yet told in my memory that de reuter with his fleet in guinea hath proceeded to the taking of whatever we have forts goods ships and men 
and tied our men back to back and thrown them all into the sea, even women and children also. This a Swede or Hamburger is come into the river, and tells that he saw the thing done. But, Lord, to see the consternation all our merchants are in is observable, and with what fury and revenge they discourse of it. But I fear it will, like other things in a few days, cool among us. But that which I fear most is the reason why he that was so kind to our men at first should afterward, having let them go, be so cruel when he went further. What I fear is that there he was informed, which he was not before, of some of Holmes's dealings with his countrymen, and so was moved to this fury. God grant it be not so. But a more dishonourable thing was never suffered by Englishmen, nor a more barbarous done by man, as this by them to us. Home to dinner, and then to the office, where we sat all the afternoon, and then at night to take my final leave of Mrs. Bland, who sets out to-morrow for Tangier, and then I back to my office till past twelve, and so home to supper, and to bed. 24. Up into my office, where all the morning, upon advising again with some fishermen and the water bailiff of the city, by Mr. Coventry's direction, touching the protections which are desired for the fishermen upon the river, and I am glad of the occasion to make me understand something of it. At noon home to dinner, and all the afternoon till nine at night in my chamber, and Mr. Hayter with me, to prevent being disturbed at the office, to perfect my contract book, which, for want of time, hath a long time lain without being entered in, as I used to do from month to month. Then to my office, where till almost twelve, and so home to bed. 25th. Up and to the office, where all the morning. At noon to the change, where just before I come, the Swede that had told the King and the Duke so boldly this great lie of the Dutch flinging our men back to back into the sea at Guinea, so particularly and readily and confidently, was whipped round the change, he confessing it a lie, and that he did it in hopes to get something. It is said the judges, upon demand, did give it their opinion that the law would judge him to be whipped, to lose his ears, or to have his nose slit, but I do not hear that anything more is to be done to him. They say he is delivered over to the Dutch ambassador to do what he pleased with him. But the world do think that there is some design on one side or other, either of the Dutch or French, for it is not likely a fellow would invent such a lie to get money, whereas he might have hoped for a better reward by telling something in behalf of us to please us. Thence to the Sun Tavern, and there dined with Sir W. Warren and Mr. Gifford, the merchant. And I hear how Nick Colborn, that lately lived and got a great estate there, is gone to live like a prince in the country, and that this Wadlow, that did the like at the devil by St. Dunstan's, did go into the country, and there spent almost all he had got, and hath now chased this Colborn out of his house, that he might come to his old trade again. But, Lord, to see how full the house is, no room for any company almost to come into it. Then same to the office, where dispatch much business, at night late home, and to clean myself with warm water. My wife will have me, because she do herself, and so to bed. 26th, Sunday. Up into church, and so home to dinner, and after dinner to my office, and there busy all the afternoon, till in the evening comes Mr. Andrews and Hill, and so home and to singing. Hill stayed and supped with me, and very good discourse of Italy, where he was, which is always to me very agreeable. After supper, he gone, we to prayers, and to bed. 27th. Up into St. James's, where we attended the Duke as usual. This morning I was much surprised and troubled with a letter from Mrs. Bland, that she is left behind, and much trouble it cost me this day to find out some way to carry her after the ships to Plymouth, but at last I hope I have done it. At noon to the change, to inquire what wages the Dutch give in their men of war at this day, and I hear for certain they give but twelve guilders at most, which is not full twenty-four shillings, a thing I wonder at. At home to dinner, and then in Sir J. Minnes' coach, my wife and I with him, and also Mercer abroad, he and I to Whitehall, and he would have his coach to wait upon my wife on her visits, it being the first time my wife hath been out of doors, but the other day to bathe her, several weeks. We to a committee of the council to discourse concerning pressing of men. But, Lord, how they meet! Never sit down, one comes, now another goes, then comes another, one complaining that nothing is done, another swearing that he hath been there these two hours, and nobody come. At last it come to this, my Lord Annesley, says he, I think we must be forced to get the king to come to every committee, for I do not see that we do anything at any time but when he is here. And I believe he said the truth, and very constant he is at the council table on council days, which his predecessors, it seems, very rarely did. But thus I perceive the greatest affair in the world at this day is likely to be managed by us. But to hear how my Lord Barclay and others of them do cry up the discipline of the late times here, and in the former Dutch war, is strange, wishing with all their hearts that the business of religion were not so severely carried on as to discourage the sober people to come among us, and wishing that the same law and severity were used against drunkenness as there was then, saying that our evil living will call the hand of God upon us again. 
thence to walk alone a good while in St. James's Park with Mr. Coventry, who I perceive has grown a little melancholy and displeased to see things go as they do so carelessly. Thence I by coach to Ratcliffe Highway to the plate-makers, and he has begun my Lord Sandwich's plate very neatly, and so back again. Coming back I met Colonel Atkins, who in other discourse did offer to give me a piece to receive of me twenty, when he proves the late news of the Dutch, they are drowning our men at Guinea, and the truth is I find the generality of the world to fear that there is something of truth in it, and I do fear it too. Thence back by coach to Sir Philip Warwick's, and there he did contract with me a kind of friendship and freedom of communication, wherein he assures me to make me understand the whole business of the treasurer's business of the navy, that I shall know as well as Sir G. Carteret what money he hath and will needs have me come to him sometimes, or he meet me, to discourse of things tending to the serving the king. And I am mighty proud and happy in becoming so known to such a man, and I hope shall pursue it. Thence back home to the office, a little tired and out of order, and then to supper and to bed. 28th. At the office all the morning. At noon dined at home. After dinner my wife and I to my Lady Batten's, it being the first time my wife hath been there, I think, these two years, but I had a mind in part to take away the strangeness, and so we did, and all very quiet and kind. Come home, I to the taking my wife's kitchen accounts at the latter end of the month, and there find seven shillings wanting, which did occasion a very high falling out between us, I indeed too angrily insisting upon so poor a thing, and did give her very provoking high words, calling her beggar and reproaching her friends, which she took very stomachfully, and reproached me justly with mine. And I confess, being myself, I cannot see what she could have done less." I find she is very cunning, and when she least shews it hath her wit at work, but it is an ill one, though I think not so bad, but with good usage I might well bear with it, and the truth is I do find that my being over solicitous and jealous and froward and ready to reproach her do make her worse. However, I find that now and then a little difference do no hurt, but too much of it will make her know her force too much. We parted, after many high words, very angry, and I to my office to my month's accounts, and find myself worth one thousand two hundred and seventy pounds, for which the Lord God be praised. So at almost two o'clock in the morning I home to supper and to bed, and so ends this month, with great expectation of the Hollanders coming forth, who are, it seems, very high and rather more ready than we. God give a good issue to it. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. March of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665 by Samuel Pepys. March 1664-1665. March 1st. Up, and this day being the day that, by a promise a great while ago, made to my wife, I was to give her twenty pounds to lay out in clothes against Easter, she did, notwithstanding last night's falling out, come to peace with me, and I with her, but did boggle mightily at the parting with my money, but at last did give it her, and then she abroad to buy her things, and I to my office, where busy all the morning. At noon I to dinner at Trinity House, and thence to Gresham College, where Mr. Hook read a second very curious lecture about the late comet, among other things proving very probably that this is the very same comet that appeared before in the year 1618, and that in such a time probably it will appear again, which is a very new opinion, but all will be in print. Then to the meeting, where Sir G. Carteret's two sons, his own, and Sir N. Slaining, were admitted of the society, and this day I did pay my admission money, forty shillings, to the society. Here was very fine discourses and experiments, but I do like philosophy enough to understand them, and so cannot remember them. Among others, a very particular account of the making of the several sorts of bread in France, which is accounted the best place for bread in the world. So home, we're very busy getting an answer to some question of Sir Philip Warwick, touching the expense of the navy, and that being done, I by coach at eight at night with my wife and Mercer to Sir Philip's and discoursed with him, leaving them in the coach, and then back with them home, and to supper and to bed. Second, begun this day to rise betimes before six o'clock, and going down to call my people, found Bess and the girl with their clothes on, lying within their bedding upon the ground, close by the fireside, and a candle burning all night, pretending they would rise to scar. This vexed me, but Bess is going, and so she will not trouble me long. Up and by water to Burston about my lord's plate, and then home to the office, so there all the morning sitting. At noon dined with Sir W. Batten, my wife being gone again to-day to buy things, having bought nothing yesterday, for lack of Mrs. Pierce's company, 
and thence to the office again, were very busy till twelve at night, and vexed at my wife staying out so late, she not being at home at nine o'clock, but at last she is come home, but the reason of her stay I know not yet. So shut up my books, and home to supper, and to bed. Third, up and abroad about several things, among others to see Mr. Peter Honeywood, who was at my house the other day, and I find it was for nothing but to pay me my brother John's quarterage. Thence to see Mrs. Turner, who takes it mighty ill I did not come to dine with the reader, her husband, which, she says, was the greatest feast that ever was yet kept by a reader, and I believe it was well. But I am glad I did not go, which confirms her in an opinion that I am grown proud. Thence to the change, and to several places, and so home to dinner, and to my office, where till twelve at night, writing over a discourse of mine to Mr. Coventry, touching the fishermen of the Thames upon a reference of the business by him to me, concerning their being protected from press. Then home to supper, and to bed. Fourth, up very betimes, and walked, it being bitter cold, to Ratcliffe, to the plate-makers, and back again. To the office, where we sat all the morning, I, with being empty and full of air and wind, had some pain to-day, dined alone at home, my wife being gone abroad to buy some more things. All the afternoon at the office, William Howe come to see me, being come up with my lord from sea. He is grown a discreet but very conceited fellow. He tells me how little respectfully Sir W. Penn did carry it to my lord on board the Duke's ship at sea, and that Captain Minnes, a favourite of Prince Rupert's, do shew my lord little respect, but that everybody else esteems my lord as they ought. I am sorry for the folly of the latter, and vexed at the dissimulation of the former. At night, home to supper and to bed. This day was proclaimed at the change, the war with Holland. Fifth, Lord's Day. Up, and Mr. Burston bringing me by order my lord's plates, which he has been making this week. I did take coach and to my lord's sandwiches and dined with my lord, it being the first time he hath dined at home since his coming from sea. And a pretty odd demand it was of my lord to my lady before me. How do you, sweetheart? How have you done all this week, himself taking notice of it to me, that he had hardly seen her the week before? At dinner he did use me with the greatest solemnity in the world, in carving for me and nobody else, and calling often to my lady to cut for me, and all the respect possible. After dinner looked over the plates, liked them mightily, and indeed I think he is the most exact man in what he do in the world of that kind. So home again, and there after a song or two in the evening with Mr. Hill, I to my office, and then home to supper, and to bed. Sixth. Up and with Sir J. Minnes by coach, being a most lamentable cold day as any this year, to St. James's, and there did our business with the Duke. Great preparations for his speedy return to sea. I saw him try on his buff coat and hat piece covered with black velvet. It troubles me more to think of his venture than of anything else in the whole war. Thence home to dinner, where I saw Bess go away, she having of all wenches that ever lived with us received the greatest love and kindness and good clothes besides wages, and gone away with the greatest ingratitude. I then abroad to look after my hammockos, and so home, and there find our new chambermaid Mary come, which instead of handsome, as my wife spoke, and still seems to reckon, is a very ordinary wench, I think, and therein was mightily disappointed. To my office, where busy late, and then home to supper and to bed, and was troubled all this night with a pain in my left testicle, that run up presently into my left kidney, and there kept aching all night, in great pain. 7th. Up and was pretty well, but going to the office, and I think it was sitting with my back to the fire, it set me in a great rage again, that I could not continue till past noon at the office, but was forced to go home, nor could sit down to dinner, but betook myself to my bed, and being there a while my pain begun to abate, and grow less and less. Anon I went to make water, not dreaming of anything but my testicle, that by some accident I might have bruised as I used to do, but in pissing there come from me two stones, I could feel them, and caused my water to be looked into, but without any pain to me in going out, which makes me think that it was not a fit of the stone at all, for my pain was assuaged upon my lying down a great while, before I went to make water. Anon I made water again very freely and plentifully. I kept my bed in good ease all the evening, then rose and sat up an hour or two, and then to bed, and lay till eight o'clock, and then eighth. Though a bitter cold day, yet I rose, and though my pain and tenderness in my testicle remains a little, yet I do verily think that my pain yesterday was nothing else. And therefore I hope my disease of the stone may not return to me, but void itself in pissing, which God grant, but I will consult my physician. This morning has brought me to the office the sad news of the London, in which Sir J. Lawson's men were all bringing her from Chatham to the Hope, and thence he was to go to sea in her, but a little other side the boy of the Nower, she suddenly blew up. 
about twenty-four men and a woman that were in the roundhouse and coach saved, the rest being above three hundred drowned, the ship breaking all in pieces with eighty pieces of brass ordnance. She lies sunk with her roundhouse above water. Sir J. Lawson hath a great loss in this of so many good chosen men, and many relations among them. I went to the change, where the news taken very much to heart. So home to dinner, and Mr. Moore with me. Then I to Gresham College, and there saw several pretty experiments, and so home into my office, and at night about one I home to supper and to bed. Ninth. Up and to the office, where we sat all the afternoon. At noon to dinner at home, and then abroad with my wife, left at the new exchange, and I to Westminster, where I hear Mrs. Martin is brought to bed of a boy, and christened Charles, which I am very glad of, for I was fearful of being called to be a godfather to it. But it seems it was to be done suddenly, and so I escaped. It is strange to see how a liberty and going abroad without purpose of doing anything do lead a man to what is bad, for I was just upon going to her, where I must of necessity have broken my oath or made a forfeit. But I did not, company being, I heard by my porter, with her, and so I home again, taking up my wife, and was set down by her at Paul's school, where I visited Mr. Crumlum at his house, and, Lord, to see how ridiculous a conceited pedagogue he is, though a learned man, he being so dogmatical in all he do and says. But among other discourse we fell to the old discourse of Paul's school, and he did, upon my declaring my value of it, give me one of Lily's grammars of a very old impression, as it was in the Catholic times, which I shall much set by. And so, after some small discourse, away, and called upon my wife at a linen draper's shop, buying linen, and so home, and to my office, where late, and home to supper, and to bed. This night my wife had a new suit of flowered ash-coloured silk, very noble. Tenth. Up and to the office all the morning. At noon to the change, where very hot, people's proposal of the city giving the king another ship for the London, that is lately blown up, which would be very handsome, and if well managed, might be done but I fear if it be put into ill hands, or that the courtiers do solicit it, it will never be done. Home to dinner, and thence to the committee of Tangier at Whitehall, where my Lord Barclay and Craven and others. But, Lord, to see how superficially things are done in the business of the lottery, which will be the disgrace of the fishery, and without profit. Home, vexed at my loss of time, and thereto my office. Late at night come the two Bellamys, formerly petty warrant victuallers of the navy, to take my advice about a navy debt of theirs, for the compassing of which they offer a great deal of money, and the thing most just. Perhaps I may undertake it, and get something by it, which will be a good job. So home, late to bed. 11th. Up and to the office, at noon home to dinner, and to the office again, were very late, and then home to supper and to bed. This day returns Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes from Lee Road, where they have been to see the wreck of the London, out of which they say— the guns may be got, but the hull of her will be wholly lost, as not being capable of being weighed. Twelfth, Lord's Day. Up, ah, and borrowing Sir J. Minnes' coach, to my Lord Sandwich's, but he was gone abroad. I sent the coach back for my wife, my Lord a second time dining at home on purpose to meet me, he having not dined once at home, but those times, since his coming from sea. I sat down and read over the Bishop of Chichester's sermon upon the anniversary of the King's death, much cried up, but, methinks, but a mean sermon. By and by comes in my lord, and he and I to talk of many things in the navy, one from another in general, to see how the greatest things are committed to very ordinary men, as to parts and experience, to do. Among others, my lord Barclay. We talked also of getting W. Howe to be put into the muster mastership in the room of Creed, if Creed will give way. But my lord do it without any great gusto, calling Howe a proud coxcomb in passion. Down to dinner, where my wife in her new lace whisk, which indeed is very noble, and I am much pleased with it, and so my lady also. Here very pleasant my lord was at dinner, and after dinner did look over his plate, which Burston hath brought him to-day, and is the last of the three that he will have made. After satisfied with that, he abroad, and I after much discourse with my lady, about Sir G. Carteret's son, of whom she hath some thoughts for a husband for my lady Jemima, we away home by coach again, and there sang a good while very pleasantly with Mr. Andrews and Hill. They gone, we to supper, and betimes to bed. Thirteenth. Up betimes, this being the first morning of my promise upon a forfeit not to lie in bed a quarter of an hour after my first waking. Abroad to St. James's, and there much business, the king also being with us a great while. Thence to the change, and thence with Captain Taylor and Sir W. Warren, dined at a house hard by for discourse sake, and so I home, and there meeting a letter from Mrs. Martin desiring to speak with me, I, though against my promise of visiting her, did go, and there found her in her child-bed dress, desiring my favour to get her husband a place. I stayed not long, but taking Sir W. Warren up at Whitehall home, 
and among other discourse fell to a business which he says shall if accomplished bring me a hundred pounds he gone i to supper and to bed this day my wife begun to wear light-coloured locks quite white almost which though it makes her look very pretty yet not being natural vexes me that i will not have her wear them this day i saw my lord castlemaine at st james's lately come from france fourteenth up before six to the office where busy all the morning at noon dined with sir w batten and sir j minnes at the tower with sir j robinson at a farewell dinner which he gives major holmes at his going out of the tower where he hath for some time since his coming from guinea been a prisoner and it seems had presented the lieutenant with fifty pieces yesterday here a great deal of good victuals and company thence home to my office where very late and home to supper and to bed weary of business fifteenth up and by coach with sir w batten to st james's where among other things before the duke captain taylor was called in and sir j robinson his accuser not appearing was acquitted quite from his charge and declared that he should go to harwich which i was very well pleased at thence i to mr coventry's chamber and there privately an hour with him in discourse of the office and did deliver to him many notes of things about which he is to get the duke's command before he goes for the putting of business among us in better order he did largely own his dependence as to the office upon my care and received very great expressions of love from him and so parted with great satisfaction to myself so home to the change and thence home to dinner where my wife being gone down upon a sudden morning for my lord sandwich's daughters to the hope with them to see the prince i dined alone after dinner to the office and anon to gresham college where among other good discourse there was tried the great poison of macassar upon a dog but it had no effect all the time we sat there we anon broke up and i home where late at my office my wife not coming home i to bed troubled about twelve or past sixteenth up into the office where we sat all the morning my wife coming home from the water this morning having lain with them on board the prince all night at noon home to dinner where my wife told me the unpleasant journey she had yesterday among the children whose fear upon the water and folly made it very unpleasing to her a good dinner and then to the office again this afternoon mr harris the sailmaker sent me a noble present of two large silver candlesticks and snuffers and a slice to keep them upon which indeed is very handsome at night come mr andrews with thirty-six pounds the further fruits of my tangier contract and so to bed late and weary with business but in good content of mind blessing god for these his benefits seventeenth up into my office and then with sir w batten to st james's where many come to take leave as was expected of the duke but he do not go till monday this night my lady wood died of the smallpox and is much lamented among the great persons for a good-natured woman and a good wife but for all that it was ever believed she was as others are the duke did give us some commands and so broke up not taking leave of him but the best piece of news is that instead of a great many troublesome lords the whole business is to be left with the duke of albemarle to act as admiral in his stead which is the thing that do cheer my heart for the other would have vexed us with attendance and never done the business thence to the committee of tangier where the duke a little and then left us and we stayed a very great committee the lords albemarle sandwich barclay fitzharding peterborough ashley sir thomas ingram sir g carteret and others the whole business was the stating of povey's accounts of whom to say no more never could man say worse himself nor have worse said of him than was by the company to his face i mean as to his folly and very reflecting words to his honesty broke up without anything but trouble and shame only i got my businesses done to the signing of two bills for the contractors and captain taylor and so come away well pleased and home taking up my wife at the change to dinner after dinner out again bringing my wife to her father's again at charing cross and i to the committee again where a new meeting of trouble about povey who still makes his business worse and worse and broke up with the most open shame again to him and high words to him of disgrace that they would not trust him with any more money till he had given an account of this so broke up then he took occasion to desire me to step aside and he and i by water to london together in the way of his own accord he proposed to me that he would surrender his place of treasurer to me to have half the profit the thing is new to me but the more i think the more i like it and do put him upon getting it done by the duke whether it takes or no i care not but i think at present it may have some convenience in it home and there find my wife come home and gone to bed of a cold got yesterday by water at the office bellamy come to me again and i am in hope something may be got by his business so late home to supper and bed eighteenth up into the office where all the morning at noon to the change and took mr hill along with me to mr povey's where we dined 
and shewed him the house to his good content, and I expect when we meet we shall laugh at it. But I having business to stay, he went away, and Povey and Creed and I, to do some business upon Povey's accounts all the afternoon till late at night, where God help him, never man was so confounded, and all his people about him in this world as he and his are. After we had done something to the purpose, we broke up, and Povey acquainted me before Creed, having said something of it also this morning at our office to me, what he had done in speaking to the Duke and others about his making me treasurer, and has carried it a great way, so as I think it cannot well be set back. Creed, I perceive, envies me in it, but I think, as that will do me no hurt, so if it did, I am at a great loss to think whether it were not best for me to let it wholly alone, for it will much disquiet me in my business of the navy, which in this war will certainly be worth all my time to me. Home, continuing in this doubtful condition what to think of it, but God Almighty do his will in it for the best. To my office, where late, and then home to supper, and to bed. 19th. Lord's Day. Mr. Povey sent his coach for me betimes, and I to him, and there to our great trouble do find that my Lord Fitzharding do appear for Mr. Brunkard to be paymaster upon Povey's going out, by a former promise of the Duke's, and offering to give as much as any for it. This put us all into a great dump, and so we went to Creed's new lodging in the Mews, and there we found Creed with his parrot upon his shoulder, which struck Mr. Povey coming by, just by the eye, very deep, which, had it hit his eye, had put it out. This a while troubled us, but not proving very bad, we to our business consulting what to do. At last resolved, and I to Mr. Coventry, and there had his most friendly and ingenuous advice, advising me not to decline the thing, it being that that will bring me to be known to great persons, while now I am buried among three or four of us, says he, in the navy. But do not make a declared opposition to my Lord Fitzharding. Then I to Creed, and walked, talking in the park an hour with him, and then to my Lord Sandwich's to dinner, and after dinner to Mr. Povis, who hath been with the Duke of York. And by the mediation of Mr. Coventry, the Duke told him that the business shall go on, and he will take off Brunkard, and my Lord Fitzharding is quiet too. But to see the mischief, I hear that Sir G. Carteret did not seem pleased, but said nothing when he heard me propose to come in Povey's room, which may learn me to distinguish between that man that is a man's true and false friend. Being very glad of this news, Mr. Povey and I in his coach to Hyde Park, being the first day of the tour there, where many brave ladies, among others, Castlemaine lay impudently upon her back in her coach asleep, with her mouth open. There was also my Lady Kerngai, once my Lady Anne Hambleton, that is said to have given the Duke a clap upon his first coming over. Here I saw Sir J. Lawson's daughter and husband, a fine couple, and also Mr. Southwell and his new lady, very pretty. Thence back, putting in at Dr. Hawes, where I saw his lady, a very fine woman. So home, and thither by my desire comes by and by Creed, and lay with me, very merry and full of discourse, what to do to-morrow, and the conveniences that will attend my having of this place, and I do think they may be very great. 20th. Up, Creed and I, and had Mr. Povey's coach sent for us, and we to his house, where we did some business in order to the work of this day. Povey and I to my Lord Sandwich, who tells me that the Duke is not only a friend to the business, but to me, in terms of the greatest love and respect and value of me that can be thought, which overjoys me. Thence to St. James's, and there was in great doubt of Brunkard, but at last I hear that Brunkard desists. The Duke did direct Secretary Bennett, who was there, to declare his mind to the Tangier Committee, that he approves of me for treasurer, and with a character of me to be a man whose industry and discretion he would trust soon as any man's in England and did the light my lord sandwich so to whitehall to the committee of tangier where there were present my lord of albemarle my lord peterborough sandwich barclay fitzharding secretary bennett sir thomas ingram sir john lawson povey and i where after other business povey did declare his business very handsomely that he was sorry he had been so unhappy in his accounts as not to give their lordships the satisfaction he intended and that he was sure his accounts are right, and continues to submit them to examination, and is ready to lay down in ready money the fault of his account, and that for the future, that the work might be better done, and with more quiet to him, he desired, by approbation of the Duke, he might resign his place to Mr. Pepys. Whereupon Secretary Bennett did deliver the Duke's command, which was received with great content and allowance beyond expectation, the Secretary repeating also the Duke's character of me. And I could discern my Lord Fitzharding was well pleased with me, and signified full satisfaction, and whispered something seriously of me to the secretary. And there I received their constitution under all their hands presently, so that I am already confirmed their treasurer, and put into a condition of striking of tallies, and all without one harsh word or word of dislike, but quite the contrary, which is a good fortune beyond all imagination. Here we rose, and Povey and Creed and I, all full of joy, thence to dinner, 
they setting me down at Sir J. Winter's by promise, and dined with him, and a worthy fine man he seems to be, and of good discourse. Our business was to discourse of supplying the king with iron for anchors, if it can be judged good enough, and a fine thing it is to see myself come to the condition of being received by persons of this rank, he being, and having long been, secretary to the Queen Mother. Thence to Povey's, and there sat and considered of business a little, and then home, where late at it, W. Howe being with me about his business of accounts for his money laid out in the fleet. And he gone, I home to supper and to bed. News is this day come of Captain Allen's being come home from the Straits as far as Portland, with eleven of the king's ships and about twenty-two of merchantmen. Twenty-first. Up, and my tailor coming to me, did consult all my wardrobe how to order my clothes against next summer. Then to the office, where busy all the morning. At noon to the change, and brought home Mr. Andrews, and there with Mr. Shepley dined, and very merry, and a good dinner. Thence to Mr. Povey's, to discourse about settling our business of treasurer, and I think all things will go very fair between us, and to my content, but the more I see, the more silly the man seems to me. Thence by coach to the mews, but Creed was not there. In our way the coach drove through a lane by Drury Lane, where abundance of loose women stood at the doors, which, God forgive me, did put evil thoughts in me, but proceeded no further, blessed be God. So home, and late at my office, then home, and there found a couple of state cups, very large, coming, I suppose, each to about six pounds apiece, from Burroughs, the slop-seller. 22nd. Up, and to Mr. Povey's about our business, and then I to see Sir Phil Warwick, but could not meet with him. So to Mr. Coventry, whose profession of love and esteem for me to myself was so large and free, that I never could expect or wish for more, nor could have it from any man in England that I should value it more. Thence to Mr. Povey's, and with Creed to the change, and to my house. But it being washing day, dined not at home, but took him, I being invited, to Mr. Hubland's, the merchant, where Sir William Petty, an abundance of most ingenious men, owners and freighters of the experiment, now going with her two bodies to see. Most excellent discourse. Among others, Sir William Petty did tell me that in good earnest he hath in his will left such parts of his estate to him that could invent such and such things as among others, that could discover truly the way of milk coming into the breasts of a woman, and he that could invent proper characters to express to another the mixture of relishes and tastes, and says that to him that invents gold he gives nothing for the philosopher's stone, for, says he, they that find out that will be able to pay themselves. But, says he, by this means, it is better than to give to a lecture, for here my executors, that must part with this, will be sure to be well convinced of the invention before they do part with their money. After dinner, Mr. Hill took me with Mrs. Hubland, who is a fine gentlewoman, into another room, and there made her sing, which she do very well, to my great content. Then to Gresham College, and there did see a kitling killed almost quite, but that we could not quite kill her, with such a way. The air out of a receiver wherein she was put, and then the air being let in upon her revives her immediately. Nay, and this air is to be made by putting together a liquor in some body that ferments, the steam of that do do the work." Thence home, and thence to Whitehall, where the house full of the Duke's going to-morrow, and thence to St. James's, wherein these things fell out. One, I saw the Duke, kissed his hand, and had his most kind expressions of his value and opinion of me, which comforted me above all things in the world. Two, the like from Mr. Coventry most heartily and affectionately. Three, saw among other fine ladies Mrs. Middleton, a very great beauty I never knew or heard of before. Four, I saw Waller, the poet whom I never saw before. So very late, my coach home with W. Penn, who was there, to supper and to bed with my heart at rest, and my head very busy thinking of my several matters now on foot, the new comfort of my old navy business, and the new one of my employment on Tangier. 23rd. Up into my Lord Sandwich, who follows the Duke this day by water down to the Hope, where the Prince lies. He received me, busy as he was, with mighty kindness and joy at my promotions, telling me most largely how the Duke hath expressed on all occasions his good opinion of my service and love for me. I paid my thanks and acknowledgment to him, and so back home, where at the office all the morning. At noon to the change. Home, and Llewellyn dined with me, thence abroad, carried my wife to Westminster by coach, I to the Swan, Herbert's, and there had much of the good company of Sarah, and to my wish, and then to see Mrs. Martin, who was very kind, three weeks of her month of lying in, is over. So took up my wife and home, and at my office a while, and thence to supper and to bed. Great talk of noises of guns heard at deal, but nothing particularly whether in earnest or not. 24th. Up betimes, and by agreement to the Globe Tavern in Fleet Street to Mr. Clark, my solicitor, about the business of my uncle's accounts, and we went with one Jeffreys to one of the barons, Spellman. 
and there my accounts were declared, and I sworn to the truth thereof to my knowledge, and so I shall, after a few formalities, be cleared of all. Thence to Povis, and there delivered him his letters of greatest import to him that is possible, yet dropped by young Bland, just come from Tangier, upon the road by Sittingburn, taken up and sent to Mr. Pett at Chatham. Thus everything done by Povy is done with a fatal folly and neglect. Then to our discourse with him, Creed, Mr. Viner, myself, and Points, about the business of the workhouse at Clerkenwell, and after dinner went thither, and saw all the works there, and did also consult the act concerning the business and other papers, in order to our coming in to undertake it with Povy, the management of the house, but I do not think we can safely meddle with it, at least I, unless I had time to look after it myself, but the thing is very ingenious and laudable. Thence to my lady Sandwich's, where my wife all this day, having kept Good Friday very strict with fasting, here we supped and talked very merry. My lady alone with me, very earnest about Sir G. Carteret's son, with whom I perceive they do desire my lady Jemima, may be matched. Thence home, and to my office, and then to bed. 25th. Lady Day. Up betimes, and to my office, where all the morning. At noon dined alone with Sir W. Batten, where great discourse of Sir W. Penn, Sir W. Batten being, I perceive, quite out of love with him, thinking him too great and too high, and began to talk that the world do question his courage, upon which I told him plainly I have been told that he was articled against for it, and that Sir H. Vane was his great friend therein. This he was, I perceive, glad to hear. Thence to the office, and there very late, very busy, to my great content. This afternoon of a sudden is come home Sir W. Penn from the fleet, but upon what score I know not. Late home to supper, and to bed. 26th, Lord's Day and Easter Day. Up, and with my wife, who has not been at church a month or two, to church. At noon, home to dinner, my wife and I, Mercer staying to the sacrament, alone. This is the day seven years which, by the blessing of God, I have survived of my being cut of the stone, and am now in very perfect good health, and have long been. And though the last winter hath been as hard a winter as any have been these many years, yet I never was better in my life, nor have not these ten years gone colder in the summer than I have done all this winter, wearing only a doublet, and a waistcoat cut open on the back, abroad a cloak, and within doors a coat I slipped on. Now I am at a loss to know whether it be my hair's foot, which is my preservative against wind, for I never had a fit of the colic since I wore it, and nothing but wind brings me pain, and the carrying away of wind takes away my pain, or my keeping my back cool. For when I do lie longer than ordinary upon my back in bed, my water the next morning is very hot, or whether it be my taking of a pill of turpentine every morning, which keeps me always loose, or altogether, but this I know with thanks to God Almighty, that I am now as well as ever I can wish or desire to be, having now and then little grudgings of wind, that brings me a little pain, but it is over presently, only I do find that my back grows very weak, that I cannot stoop to write or tell money without sitting, but I have pain for a good while after it. Yet a week or two ago I had one day's great pain, but it was upon my getting a bruise on one of my testicles, and then I did void two small stones, without pain though, and upon my going to bed and bearing up of my testicles I was well the next. But I did observe that my sitting with my back to the fire at the office did then, as it do at all times, make my back ache, and my water hot and brings me some pain. I sent yesterday an invitation to Mrs. Turner and her family to come to keep this day with me, which she granted, but afterward sent me word that it being Sunday and Easter day, she desired to choose another and put off this, which I was willing enough to do, and so put it off as to this day, and will leave it to my own convenience when to choose another, and perhaps shall escape a feast by it. At my office all the afternoon drawing up my agreement with Mr. Povey for me to sign to him to-morrow morning. In the evening spent an hour in the garden walking with Sir J. Minnes, talking of the chest business, wherein Sir W. Batten deals so unfairly, wherein the old man is very hot for the present, but that zeal will not last, nor is to be trusted. So home to supper, prayers, and to bed. 27th. Up betimes to Mr. Povis, and there did sign and seal my agreement with him about my place of being treasurer for Tangier, it being the greatest part of it drawn out of a draught of his own drawing up, only I have added something here and there in favour of myself. Thence to the Duke of Albemarle, the first time that we officers of the navy have waited upon him since the Duke of York's going, who had deputed him to be admiral in his absence. And I find him a quiet, heavy man, that will help business when he can, and hinder nothing, and am very well pleased with our attendance on him. I did afterwards alone give him thanks for his favour to me about my Tangier business, which he received kindly, and did speak much of his esteem of me. Thence, and did the same to Sir H. Bennet, who did the like to me very fully, 
and did give me all his letters lately come from hence for me to read, which I returned in the afternoon to him. Thence to Mrs. Martin, who, though her husband is gone away, as he writes, like a fool into France, yet is as simple and wanton as ever she was, with much I made myself merry and away. So to my Lord Peterborough's, where Povey, Creed, Williamson, Auditor Beale, and myself, and mighty merry to see how plainly my Lord and Povey did abuse one another about their accounts, each thinking the other a fool, and I thinking, they were not either of them in that point much in the wrong, though in everything, and even in this manner of reproaching one another, very witty and pleasant. Among other things, we had here the genteelest dinner and the neatest house that I have seen many a day, and the latter beyond anything I ever saw in a nobleman's house. Thence visited my Lord Barclay, and did sit discoursing with him in his chamber a good while, and he mighty friendly to me about the same business of Tangier. From that to other discourse of the times and the want of money, and he said that the Parliament must be called again soon, and more money raised, not by tax, for he said he believed the people could not pay it, but he would have either a general excise upon everything, or else that every city in corporate should pay a toll into the king's revenue, as he says it is in all the cities in the world, for here a citizen hath no more laid on them than their neighbours in the country, whereas as a city it ought to pay considerably to the king for their charter. But I fear this will breed ill blood. Thence to Povey, and after a little talk home to my office late, then to supper, and to bed. 28th. Up betimes and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and I did most of the business there, God wot. Then to the change, and thence to the coffee-house with Sir W. Warren, where much good discourse for us both till nine o'clock, with great pleasure and content, and then parted and I home to dinner, having eat nothing, and so to my office. At night supped with my wife at Sir W. Penn's, who is to go back for good and all to the fleet to-morrow, took leave and to my office, where till twelve at night, and then home to bed. Twenty-ninth. Up betimes and to Povis, where a good while talking about our business, thence abroad into the city, but upon his tally could not get any money in Lombard Street through the disrepute which he suffers, I perceive, upon his giving up his place, which people think was not choice, but necessity, as indeed it was. So back to his house, after we had been at my house to taste my wine, but my wife being abroad, nobody could come at it, and so we were defeated. To his house, and before dinner, he and I did discourse of the business of freight, wherein I am so much concerned, above one hundred pounds for myself, and in my over-hasty making a bill out for the rest for him, but he resolves to move Creed in it, which troubled me much, and Creed by and by comes, and after dinner he did, but in the most cunning, ingenious manner, do his business with Creed, by bringing it in by the by, that the most subtle man in the world could never have done it better. And I must say that he is a most witty, cunning man, and one that I am most afeard of in my conversation. Though in all serious matters of business, the eeriest fool that ever I met with. The bill was produced, and a copy given Creed, whereupon he wrote his introture upon the original, and I hope it will pass. At least I am now put to it that I must stand by it and justify it, but I pray God it may never come to that test. Thence, between vexed and joyed, not knowing what yet to make of it, home, calling for my Lord Cook's three volumes at my bookseller's, and so home, where I found a new cook-maid, her name is, that promises very little. So to my office, where late about drawing up a proposal for Captain Taylor, for him to deliver to the city about his building the new ship, which I have done well, and I hope will do the business, and so home to supper, and to bed. 30th. Up, and to my Lord Ashley, but did nothing and to Sir Phil Warwick, and spoke with him about business, and so back to the office, where all the morning. At noon, home to dinner, and thence to the Tangier Committee, where, Lord, to see how they did run into the giving of Sir J. Lawson, who is come to town to-day to get this business done, four thousand pounds about his mole business, and were going to give him four shillings per yard more, which arises in the whole mole, to thirty-six thousand pounds, is a strange thing, but the latter by chance was stopped, the former was given. Thence to see Mrs. Martin, whose husband being, it seems, gone away, and, as she is informed, he hath another woman whom he uses, and has long done, as a wife, she is mighty reserved, and resolved to keep herself so till the return of her husband, which a pleasant thing to think of her. Thence home, and to my office, where late, and to bed. 31st. Up betimes, and walked to my Lord Ashley, and there with Creed, after long waiting, spoke with him, and was civilly used by him. Thence to Sir Phil Warwick, and then to visit my Lord of Falmouth, who did also receive me pretty civilly, but not as I expected, he, I perceive, believing that I had undertaken to justify Povey's accounts, taking them upon myself, but I rectified him therein. So to my Lady Sandwich's to dinner, 
and up to her chamber after dinner, and there discoursed about Sir G. Carteret's son, in proposition between us two for my Lady Jemima. So to Povey, and with him spent the afternoon very busy, till I was weary of following this, and neglecting my navy business. So at night called my wife at my lady's, and so home. To my office, and there made up my month's account, which, God be praised, rose to thirteen hundred pounds, which I bless God for. So after twelve o'clock home to supper and to bed. I find Creed mightily transported by my lord of Falmouth's kind words to him, and saying that he hath a place in his intention for him, which he believes will be considerable. A witty man he is in every respect, but of no good nature, nor a man ordinarily to be dealt with. My Lady Castlemaine is sick again, people think, slipping her filly. April of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys by Samuel Pepys April, 1665 April 1st All the morning very busy at the office preparing a last half-year's account for my Lord Treasurer. At noon, eat a bit and step to Sir Phil Warwick, by coach to my Lord Treasurer's, and after some private conference and examining of my papers with him, I did return into the city and to Sir G. Carteret, whom I found with the commissioners of prizes dining at Captain Cox in Broad Street, very merry. Among other tricks there did come a blind fiddler to the door, and Sir G. Carteret did go to the door, and lead the blind fiddler by the hand in. Thence with Sir G. Carteret to my Lord Treasurer, and by and by come Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes, and anon we come to my Lord, and there did lay open the expense for the six months past, and an estimate of the seven months to come to November next, the first arising to above five hundred thousand pounds, and the latter will, as we judge, come to above one million pounds, but to see how my Lord Treasurer did bless himself, crying he could do no more than he could, nor give more money than he had, if the occasion and expense were never so great, which is but a sad story, and then to hear how like a passionate and ignorant ass Sir G. Carteret did harangue upon the abuse of tickets, did make me mad almost, and yet was fain to hold my tongue. Thence home, vexed mightily, to see how simply our greatest ministers do content themselves to understand and do things, while the King's service in the meantime lies a-bleeding." at my office late writing letters till ready to drop down asleep with my late sitting up of late and running up and down a days so to bed second lord's day at my office all the morning renewing my vows in writing and then home to dinner all the afternoon mr tasborough one of mr povey's clerks with me about his master's accounts in the evening mr andrews and hill sang but supped not with me then after supper to bed third up and to the Duke of Albemarle and Whitehall, where much business. Thence home and to dinner, and then with Creed, my wife, and Mercer, to a play at the Duke's of my Lord Orrery's, called Mustapha, which being not good, made Betterton's part and Ianthus, but ordinary too, so that we were not contented with it at all. Thence home and to the office a while, and then home to supper and to bed. All the pleasure of the play was, the King and my Lady Castlemaine were there, and pretty witty Nell, at the King's house, and the younger marshal sat next us, which pleased me mightily. Fourth, all the morning at the office busy, at noon to the change, and then went up to the change to buy a pair of cotton stockings, which I did at the husband's shop of the most pretty woman there, who did also invite me to buy some linen of her, and I was glad of the occasion, and bespoke some bands of her, intending to make her my seamstress, she being one of the prettiest and most modest-looked women that ever I did see. Dined at home and to the office, where very late, till I was ready to fall down asleep, and did several times nod in the middle of my letters. Fifth. This day was kept publicly by the King's command, as a fast day against the Dutch war, and I betimes with Mr. Tooker, whom I have brought into the navy to serve us as a husband to see goods timely shipped off from hence to the fleet, and other places, and took him with me to Woolwich and Deptford, where by business I have been hindered a great while of going, did a very great deal of business, and home, and thereby promised fine creed, and he and my wife, Mercer and I, by coach, to take the air, and, where we had formerly been, at Hackney, did there eat some pullets we carried with us, and some things of the house, and after a game or two at shuffleboard, home, and creed lay with me, but being sleepy he had no mind to talk about business, which indeed I intended, by inviting him to lie with me, but I would not force it on him, and so to bed he and I, and to sleep, being the first time I have been so much at my ease, and taken so much fresh air, these many weeks or months. Sixth, 
At the office sat all the morning, where, in the absence of Sir W. Batten, Sir G. Carteret being angry about the business of tickets, spoke of Sir W. Batten for speaking some words about the signing of tickets, and called Sir W. Batten in his discourse at the table to us, the clerks being withdrawn, shit and fool, which vexed me. At noon to the change, and there set my business of lighters buying for the king, to Sir W. Warren, and I think he will do it for me to very great advantage, at which I mightily rejoiced. Home, and after a mouthful of dinner, to the office, where till six o'clock, and then to Whitehall, and there with Sir G. Carteret and my Lord Brunkard, attended the Duke of Albemarle, about the business of money. I also went to Jervis's, my barber, for my periwig, that was mending there, and there to hear that Jane is quite undone, taking the idle fellow for her husband yet not married, and lay with him several weeks that had another wife and child, and she is now going into Ireland. So called my wife at the change and home, and at my office writing letters till one o'clock in the morning, that I was ready to fall down asleep again. Great talk of a new comet, and it is certain one do now appear as bright as the late one at the best, but I have not seen it myself. Seventh. Up betimes to the Duke of Albemarle about money to be got for the navy, or else we must shut up shop. Thence to Westminster Hall, and up and down, doing not much, then to London, but to prevent Povey's dining with me, who I see is at the change, I went back again, and to Herbert's at Westminster, there sent for a bit of meat, and dined, and then to my Lord Treasurer's, and there with Sir Philip Warwick, and thence to Whitehall, in my Lord Treasurer's chamber, with Sir Philip Warwick, till dark night, about four hours talking of the business of the Navy charge, and how Sir G. Carteret do order business, keeping us in ignorance what he do with his money and also Sir Philip did shew me nakedly the king's condition for money for the navy, and he do assure me, unless the king can get some nobleman or rich money gentleman to lend him money, or to get the city to do it, it is impossible to find money. We having already, as he says, spent one year's share of the three years' tax, which comes to two million five hundred thousand pounds. Being very glad of this day's discourse in all, but that I fear I shall quite lose Sir G. Carteret, who knows that I have been privately here all this day with Sir Phil Warwick. However, I will order it so as to give him as little offence as I can. So home to my office, and then to supper, and to bed. 8th. Up and all the morning full of business at the office. At noon dined with Mr. Povey, and then to the getting some business looked over of his, and then I to my Lord Chancellor's, where to have spoke with the Duke of Albemarle, but the King and Council busy, I could not. Then to the old exchange, and there of my new pretty seamstress, bought four bands, and so home where I found my house mighty neat and clean. Then to my office late, till past twelve, and so home to bed. The French ambassadors are come incognito before their train, which will hereafter be very pompous. It is thought they come to get our king to join with the king of France in helping him against Flanders, and they to do the like to us against Holland. We have lain a good while with a good fleet at Harwich. The Dutch not said yet to be out. We, as high as we make our shoe, I am sure, are unable to set out another small fleet if this should be worsted. Whereof God send us peace, I cry. Ninth, Lord's Day. To church with my wife in the morning, in her new light-coloured silk gown, which is, with her new point, very noble. Dined at home, and in the afternoon to Fenchurch, the little church in the middle of Fenchurch Street, where are very few people, and few of any rank. Thence, after sermon, home, and in the evening, walking in the garden, my lady Penn and her daughter walked with my wife and I, and so to my house to eat with us, and very merry, and so broke up, and to bed. Tenth. Up and to the Duke of Albemarle's, and thence to Whitehall, to a committee for Tangier, where new disorder about Mr. Povey's account, that I think I shall never be settled in my business of treasure for him. Here Captain Cook met me, and did seem discontented about my boy Tom's having no time to mind his singing, nor lute, which I answered him fully in, that he desired me that I would baste his coat. So home, and to the change, and thence to the old James, to dine with Sir W. Ryder, Cutler, and Mr. Deering upon the business of hemp, and so hence to Whitehall, to have attended the King and Lord Chancellor about the debts of the Navy, and to get some money, but the meeting failed. So my Lord Brunkard took me and Sir Thomas Harvey in his coach to the park, which is very troublesome with the dust, and ne'er a great beauty there to-day but Mrs. Middleton, and so home to my office, where Mr. Warren proposed of my getting of one hundred pounds to get him a protection for a ship to go out, which I think I shall do. So home to supper, and to bed. 11th. Up and betimes to Alderman Cheverton, to treat with him about hemp, and so back to the office. At noon dined at the sun, behind the change, with Sir Edward Deering and his brother and Commissioner Pett, we having made a contract with Sir Edward this day about timber. Thence to the office, where late very busy, 
but with some trouble have also some hopes of profit too. So home to supper and to bed. Twelfth. Up and to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier, where, contrary to all expectation, my Lord Ashley, being vexed with Povey's accounts, did propose it as necessary that Povey should be still continued treasurer of Tangier till he had made up his accounts, and with such arguments as I confess, I was not prepared to answer. But by putting off of the discourse, and so, I think, brought it right again, but it troubled me so all the day after and night too, that I was not quiet, though I think it doubtful whether I shall be much the worse for it or no, if it should come to be so. Dined at home, and thence to Whitehall again, where I lose most of my time nowadays to my great trouble, charge, and loss of time and benefit, and there, after the council rose, Sir G. Carteret, my Lord Brunkard, Sir Thomas Harvey, and myself, down to my Lord Treasurer's chamber to him and the Chancellor and the Duke of Albemarle, and there I did give them a large account of the charge of the navy and want of money. But strange to see how they held up their hands, crying, What shall we do? says my Lord Treasurer. Why, what means all this, Mr. Pepys? This is true, you say. But what would you have me to do? I have given all I can for my life. Why will not people lend their money? Why will they not trust the king as well as Oliver? Why do our prizes come to nothing that yielded so much heretofore? And this was all we could get and went away without other answer, which is one of the saddest things that, at such a time as this, with the greatest action on foot that ever was in England, nothing should be minded, but let things go on of themselves do as well as they can. So home, vexed, and going to my Lady Batten's, there found a great many women with her, in her chamber Mary, my Lady Penn and her daughter among others, where my Lady Penn flung me down upon the bed, and herself and others, one after another upon me, and very merry we were, and thence I home, and called my wife with my Lady Penn to supper, and very merry as I could be, being vexed as I was. So home to bed. Thirteenth. Lay long in bed, troubled a little with wind, but not much. So to the office, and there all the morning. At noon to Sheriff Waterman's to dinner, all of us men of the office in town, and our wives, my Lady Carteret and daughters, and Ladies Batten, Penn, and my wife, etc., and very good cheer we had, and merry, music at, and after dinner, and a fellow danced a jig, but when the company begun to dance I came away, lest I should be taken out, and God knows how my wife carried herself, but I left her to try her fortune. So home, and late at the office, and then home to supper, and to bed. Fourteenth. Up and betimes to Mr. Povey, being desirous to have an end of my trouble of mind, touching my Tangier business, whether he hath any desire of accepting what my Lord Ashley offered, of his becoming treasurer again, and there I did, with a seeming most generous spirit, offer him to take it back again upon his own terms. But he did answer to me that he would not above all things in the world, at which I was for the present satisfied. But going away thence, and speaking with Creed, he puts me in doubt that the very nature of the thing will require that he be put in again, and did give me the reasons of the auditors, which I confess are so plain, that I know not how to withstand them. But he did give me most ingenious advice what to do in it, and anon my Lord Barclay, and some of the commissioners coming together, though not in a meeting, I did procure that they should order Povey's payment of his remain of accounts to me, which order, if it do pass, will put a good stop to the fastening of the thing upon me. At noon, Creed and I to a cook's shop at Charing Cross, and there dined and had much discourse, and his very good upon my business, and upon other things, among the rest upon Will Howe's dissembling with us, we discovering one to another his carriage to us, present and absent, being a very false fellow. Thence to Whitehall again, and there spent the afternoon, and then home to fetch a letter for the council, and so back to Whitehall, where walked an hour with Mr. Wren, of my Lord Chancellor's, and Mr. Ager, and then to Unthanks, and call my wife, and with her through the city to Mile End Green, and eat some cream and cakes, and so back home, and I a little at the office, and so home to supper, and to bed. This morning I was saluted with news that the fleets, ours and the Dutch, were engaged, and that the guns were heard at Walthamstow to play all yesterday, and that Captain Teddyman's legs were shot off in the Royal Catherine. But before night I hear the contrary, both by letters of my own and messengers thence, that they were all well of our side, and no enemy appears yet, and that the Royal Catherine is come to the fleet, and likely to prove as good a ship as any the King hath, of which I am heartily glad both for Christopher Pett's sake, and Captain Teddyman that is in her. 15th. Up and to Whitehall about several businesses, but chiefly to see the proposals of my warrants about Tangier under Creed, but to my trouble found them not finished. So back to the office, where all the morning busy, then home to dinner, and then all the afternoon till very late at my office, and then home to supper and to bed weary. 16th. Lord's Day. 
lay long in bed, then up into my chamber and my office, looking over some plates which I find necessary for me to understand pretty well, because of the Dutch war. Then home to dinner, where Creed dined with us, and so after dinner he and I walked to the Rolls Chapel, expecting to hear the great stilling fleet preach, but he did not, but a very sorry fellow, which vexed me. The sermon done, we parted, and I home, where I find Mr. Andrews, and by and by comes Captain Taylor, my old acquaintance at Westminster, that understands music very well and composes mighty bravely. He brought us some things of two parts to sing very hard, but that that is the worst, he is very conceited of them, and that though they are good, makes them troublesome to one, to see him every note commend and admire them. He supped with me, and a good understanding man he is, and a good scholar, and, among other things, a great antiquary, and among other things he can, as he says, show the very original charter to Worcester of King Edgar's, wherein he styles himself Rex Marium Britanniae, etc., which is the great text that Mr. Selden and others do quote, but imperfectly, and upon trust. But he hath the very original, which he says he will shew me. He gone we to bed. This night I am told that news is come of our taking of three Dutch men of war, with the loss of one of our captains. 17th. Up unto the Duke of Albemarle's, where he shewed me Mr. Coventry's letters, how three Dutch privateers are taken, in one whereof Everson's son is captain, but they have killed poor Captain Golding in the diamond. Two of them, one of thirty-two and the other of twenty-odd guns, did stand stoutly up against her, which hath forty-six, and the Yarmouth, that hath fifty-two guns, and as many more men as they, so that they did more than we could expect, not yielding till many of their men were killed. And Everson, when he was brought before the Duke of York, and was observed to be shot through the hat, answered, that he wished it had gone through his head, rather than been taken. One thing more is written, that two of our ships the other day appearing upon the coast of Holland, they presently fired their beacons round the country to give notice, and news is brought the king that the Dutch Smyrna fleet is seen upon the back of Scotland, and thereupon the king hath wrote to the duke that he do appoint a fleet to go to the northward to try to meet them coming home round, which God send. Thence to Whitehall, where the king seeing me did come to me, and calling me by name, did discourse with me about the ships in the river, and this is the first time that ever I knew the king did know me personally, so that hereafter I must not go thither, but with expectation to be questioned, and to be ready to give good answers. So home, and thence with Creed, who come to dine with me, to the old James, where we dined with Sir W. Ryder and Cutler, and by and by, being called by my wife, we all to a play, The Ghosts, at the Duke's house, but a very simple play. Thence up and down, with my wife with me, to look for Sir Phil Warwick, Mr. Creed going from me, but missed of him, and so home, and late and busy at my office, so home to supper and to bed. This day was left at my house a very neat silver watch by one Briggs, a scrivener and solicitor, at which I was angry with my wife for receiving, or at least for opening the box wherein it was, and so far witnessing our receipt of it, as to give the messenger five shillings for bringing it, but it can't be helped, and I will endeavour to do the man a kindness, he being a friend of my uncle White's. 18th. Up into Sir Philip Warwick, and walked with him an hour with great delight in the park, about Sir G. Carteret's accounts, and the endeavours that he hath made to bring Sir G. Carteret to show his accounts, and let the world see what he receives and what he pays. Thence home to the office, where I find Sir J. Minnes come home from Chatham, and Sir W. Batten, both this morning from Harwich, where they have been these seven or eight days. At noon with my wife and Mr. Moore by water to Chelsea about my privy seal for Tangier, but my Lord Privy Seal was gone abroad, and so we, without going out of the boat, forced to return, and found him not at Whitehall. So I to Sir Philip Warwick, and with him to my Lord Treasurer, who signed my commission for Tangier Treasurer, and the docket of my Privy Seal, for the monies to be paid to me. Thence to Whitehall to Mr. Moore again, and not finding my Lord, I home, taking my wife and woman up, at unthanks. Late at my office, then to supper and to bed. 19th. Up by five o'clock and by water to Whitehall, and there took coach and with Mr. Moore to Chelsea, where, after all my fears what doubts and difficulties my Lord Privy Seal would make at my Tangier Privy Seal, he did pass it at first reading, without my speaking with him, and then called me in and was very civil to me. I passed my time in contemplating, before I was called in, the picture of my Lord's son's lady, a most beautiful woman, and most like to Mrs. Butler, thence very much joyed to London back again, and found out Mr. Povey, told him this, and then went and left my privy seal at my Lord Treasurer's, 
and so to the change and thence to trinity house where a great dinner of captain crisp who is made an elder brother and so being very pleasant at dinner away home creed with me and there met povey and we to gresham college where we saw some experiments upon a hen a dog and a cat of the florence poison the first it made for a time drunk but it come to itself again quickly the second it made vomit mightily but no other hurt the third i did not stay to see the effect of it being taken out by povey he and i walked below together he giving me most exceeding discouragements in the getting of money whether by design or no i know not for i am now come to think him a most cunning fellow in most things he do but his accounts and made it plain to me that money will be hard to get and that it is to be feared backwell hath a design in it to get the thing forced upon himself this put me into a cruel melancholy to think i may lose what i have had so near my hand but yet something may be hoped for which to-morrow will shew he gone creed and i together a great while consulting what to do in this case and after all i left him to do what he thought fit in his discourse to-morrow with my lord ashley so home and in my way met with mr warren from whom my hopes i fear will fail of what i hope for by my getting him a protection but all these troubles will if not be over yet we shall see the worst of there in a day or two so to my office and thence to supper and my head aching betimes that is by ten or eleven o'clock to bed twentieth up and all the morning busy at the office at noon dined and mr povey by agreement with me where his boldness with mercer poor innocent wench did make both her and me blush to think how he were able to debauch a poor girl if he had opportunity at a dish or two of plain meat of his own choice after dinner comes creed and then andrews where want of money to andrews the main discourse and at last in confidence of creed's judgment i am resolved to spare him four or five hundred pounds of what lies by me upon the security of some tallies this went against my heart to begin but when obtaining mr creed to join with me we do resolve to assist mr andrews then anon we parted and i to my office where late and then home to supper and to bed this night i am told the first play is played in whitehall noon hall which is now turned to a house of playing i had a great mind but could not go to see it twenty first up into my office about business anon comes creed and povey and we treat about the business of our lending money creed and i upon a tally for the satisfying of andrews and did conclude it as in papers is expressed and as i am glad to have an opportunity of having ten per cent for my money so i am as glad that the sum i begin this trade with is no more than three hundred and fifty pounds we all dined at andrew's charge at the sun behind the change a good dinner the worst dress that ever i eat any then home and there found kate joyce and harmon come to see us with them after long talk abroad by coach a tour in the fields and drunk at islington it being very pleasant the dust being laid by a little rain and so home very well pleased with this day's work so after a while at my office to supper and to bed this day we hear that the duke and the fleet are sailed yesterday pray god go along with them that they have good speed in the beginning of their work twenty second up and mr caesar my boy's lute master being come betimes to teach him i did speak with him seriously about the boy what my mind was if he did not look after his lute and singing that i would turn him away which i hope will do some good upon the boy all the morning busy at the office at noon dined at home and then to the office again very busy till very late and so home to supper and to bed my wife making great preparation to go to court to chapel to-morrow this day i have news from mr coventry that the fleet has sailed yesterday from harwich to the coast of holland to see what the dutch will do god go along with them twenty third lord's day mr povey according to promise sent his coach betimes and i carried my wife and her woman to whitehall chapel and set them in the organ loft and i having left her on trust went to the harp and ball and there drank also and entertained myself in talk with a maid of the house a pretty maid and very modest thence to the chapel and heard the famous young stillingfleet whom i knew at cambridge and is now newly admitted one of the king's chaplains and was presented they say to my lord treasurer for st andrew's hoban where he is now minister with these words that they the bishops of canterbury london and another believed he is the ablest young man to preach the gospel of any since the apostles he did make the most plain honest good grave sermon in the most unconcerned and easy yet substantial manner that ever i heard in my life upon the words of samuel to the people fear the lord in truth with all your heart and remember the great things that he hath done for you it being proper to this day the day of the king's coronation thence to mr povey's where mightily treated and creed with us but lord 
to see how povey overdoes everything in commending it do make it nauseous to me and was not by reason of my large praise of his house over acceptable to my wife thence after dinner creed and we by coach took the air in the fields beyond st pancras it raining now and then which it seems is most welcome weather and then all to my house where comes mr hill andrews and captain taylor and good music but at supper to hear the arguments we had against taylor concerning a corant he saying that the law of a dancing corant is to have every bar to end in a pricked crotchet and quaver which i did deny was very strange it proceeded till i vexed him but all parted friends for creed and i to laugh at when he was gone after supper creed and i together to bed in mercer's bed and so to sleep twenty fourth up and with creed in sir w batten's coach to whitehall sir w batten and i to the duke of albemarle were very busy then i to creed's chamber where i received with much ado my two orders about receiving povey's monies and answering his credits and it is strange how he will preserve his constant humour of delaying all business that comes before him thence he and i to london to my office and back again to my lady sandwiches to dinner where my wife by agreement after dinner alone my lady told me with the prettiest kind of doubtfulness whether it would be fit for her with respect to creed to do it that is in the world that creed had broke his desire to her of being a servant to mrs betty pickering and placed it upon encouragement which he had from some discourse of her ladyship commending of her virtues to him which poor lady she meant most innocently she did give him a cold answer but not so severe as it ought to have been and it seems as the lady since to my lady confesses he had wrote a letter to her which she answered slightly and was resolved to contemn any motion of his therein my lady takes the thing very ill as it is fit she should but i advise her to stop all future occasions of the world's taking notice of his coming thither so often as of late he hath done but to think that he should have this devilish presumption to aim at a lady so near to my lord is strange both for his modesty and discretion thence to the cockpit and there walked an hour with my lord duke of albemarle alone in his garden where he expressed in great words his opinion of me that i was the right hand of the navy here nobody but i taking any care of anything therein so that he should not know what could be done without me at which i was from him not a little proud thence to a committee of tangier where because not a quorum little was done and so away to my wife creed with me at mrs pierce's who continues very pretty and is now great with child i had not seen her a great while thence by coach to my lord treasurer's but could not speak with sir phil warwick so by coach with my wife and mercer to the park but the king being there and i nowadays being doubtful of being seen in any pleasure did part from the tour and away out of the park to knightsbridge and there eat and drank in the coach and so home and after a while at my office home to supper and to bed having got a great cold i think by my pulling off my periwig so often twenty fifth at the office all the morning and the like after dinner at home all the afternoon till very late and then to bed being very hoarse with a cold i did lately get with leaving off my periwig this afternoon w pen lately come from his father in the fleet did give me an account how the fleet did sail about one hundred and three in all besides small catches they being in sight of six or seven dutch scouts and sent ships in chase of them twenty sixth up very betimes my cold continuing and my stomach sick with the buttered ale that i did drink the last night in bed which did lie upon me till i did this morning vomit it up so walked to povey's where creed met me and there i did receive the first parcel of money as treasurer of tangier and did give him my receipt for it which was about two thousand eight hundred pounds value in tallies we did also examine and settle several other things and then i away to whitehall talking with povey alone about my opinion of creed's indiscretion in looking after mrs pickering desiring him to make no more sport of it but to correct him if he finds that he continues to own any such thing this i did by my lady's desire and do intend to pursue the stop of it so to the carriers by cripplegate to see whether my mother be come to town or no i expecting her to-day but she is not come so to dinner to my lady sandwiches and there after dinner above in the dining-room did spend an hour or two with her talking again about creed's folly but strange it is that he should dare to propose this business himself of mrs pickering to my lady and to tell my lady that he did it for her virtue's sake not minding her money for he could have a wife with more but for that he did intend to depend upon her ladyship to get as much of her father and mother for her as she could and that what he did was by encouragement from discourse of her ladyship's 
He also had wrote to Mrs. Pickwing, but she did give him a slighting answer back again. But I do very much fear that Mrs. Pickwing's honour, if the world comes to take notice of it, may be wronged by it. Thence home, and all the afternoon till night at my office, then home to supper and to bed. 27th. Up and to my office, where all the morning. At noon Creed dined with me, and after dinner walked in the garden, he telling me that my Lord Treasurer now begins to be scrupulous, and will know what becomes of the twenty-six thousand pounds saved by my Lord Peterer, before he parts with any more money, which puts us into new doubts, and me into a great fear that all my cake will be dough still. But I am well prepared for it to bear it, being not clear whether it will be more for my profit to have it, or go without it, as my profits of the Navy are likely now to be. All the afternoon till late, hard at the office, then to supper and to bed. This night William Hewer is returned from Harwich, where he hath been paying off of some ships this fortnight, and went to see a good way with the fleet, which was ninety-six in company then, men of war, besides some come in, and following them since, which makes now above one hundred, whom God bless. 28th. Up by five o'clock, and by appointment with Creed by six at his chamber, expecting Povey, who come not. Thence he and I out to Sir Philip Warwick's, but being not up, we took a turn in the garden hard by. And thither comes Povey to us. After some discourse of the reason of the difficulty that Sir Philip Warwick makes in issuing a warrant for my striking of tallies, namely, the having a clear account of the twenty-six thousand pounds saved by my lord of Peterborough, we parted, and I to Sir Phil Warwick, who did give me an account of his demur, which I applied myself to remove by taking creed with me to my lord Ashley, from whom, contrary to all expectation, I received a very kind answer, just as we could have wished it, that he would satisfy my lord treasurer. Thence, very well satisfied, I home, and down the river to visit the victualling ships, where I find all out of order, and come home to dinner, and then to write a letter to the Duke of Albemarle about the victualling ships, and carried it myself to the council chamber, where it was read, and when they rose, my Lord Chancellor passing by stroked me on the head, and told me that the board had read my letter, and taken order for the punishing of the watermen, for not appearing on board the ships. And so did the King afterwards, who do now know me so well, that he never sees me, but he speaks to me about our navy business. Then got my Lord Ashley to my Lord Treasurer below in his chamber, and there removed the scruple, and by and by brought Mr. Sherwin to Sir Philip Warwick, and did the like, and so home, and after a while at my office, to bed. Twenty ninth, All the morning busy at the office. In the afternoon to my Lord Treasurer's, and there got my Lord Treasurer to sign the warrant for my striking of tallies, and so doing many jobs in my way home and their late writing letters, being troubled in my mind to hear that Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes do take notice that I am nowadays much from the office upon no office business, which vexes me, and will make me mind my business the better, I hope in God. But what troubles me more is that I do omit to write as I should do to Mr. Coventry, which I must not do, though this night I minded it so little as to sleep in the middle of my letter to him, and committed forty blots and blurs in my letter to him, but of this I hope never more to be guilty, if I have not already given him sufficient offence. So, late home, and to bed. 30th, Lord's Day. Up into my office alone all the morning, making up my monthly accounts, which, though it hath been very intricate, and very great disbursements and receipts and odd reckonings, yet I differed not from the truth, viz., between my first computing what my profit ought to be, and then what my cash and debts do really make me worth, not above ten shillings, which is very much, and I do much value myself upon the account, and herein I with great joy find myself to have gained this month above one hundred pounds clear, and in the whole to be worth above fourteen hundred pounds, the greatest sum I ever yet was worth. Thence home to dinner, and there find poor Mr. Spong walking at my door, where he hath knocked, and being told I was at the office, stayed modestly there walking because of disturbing me, which methinks was one of the most modest acts, of a man that hath no need of being so to me, that ever I knew in my life. He dined with me, and then after dinner to my closet, where abundance of mighty pretty discourse, wherein, in a word, I find him the man of the world that hath of his own ingenuity, obtained the most in most things, being withal no scholar. He gone, I took boat, and down to Woolwich and Deptford, and made it late home, and so to supper and to bed. Thus I end this month in great content as to my estate and gettings, in much trouble as to the pains I have taken, and the rubs I expect yet to meet with, about the business of Tangier. The fleet, with about one hundred and six ships upon the coast of Holland, in sight of the Dutch, within the Texel. Great fears of the sickness here in the city, it being said that two or three houses are already shut up. God preserve us all. End of April May of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665, by Samuel Pepys. May, 1665. May 1st. Up and to Mr. Povey's, and by his bedside talked a good while. Among other things, he do much insist, I perceive, upon the difficulty of getting of money, and would fain have me to concur in the thinking of some other way of disposing of the place of treasurer to one Mr. Bell, but I did seem slight of it, and resolved to try to do the best, or to give it up. Thence to the Duke of Albemarle, where I was sorry to find myself to come a little late, and so home, and at noon going to the change I met my Lord Brunkard, Sir Robert Murray, Dean Wilkins, and Mr. Hook, going by coach to Colonel Blunt's to dinner. So they stopped and took me with them. Landed at the Tower Wharf, and thence by water to Greenwich, and there coaches met us, and to his house, a very stately site for situation and brave plantations, and among others a vineyard, the first that ever I did see. No extraordinary dinner, nor any other entertainment good, but only after dinner, to the trial of some experiments about making of coaches easy, and several we tried, but one did prove mighty easy, not here for me to describe, but the whole body of the coach lies upon one long spring, and we all, one after another, rid in it, and it is very fine and likely to take. These experiments were the intent of their coming, and pretty they are. Thence back by coach to Greenwich, and in his pleasure boat to Deptford, and there stopped and into Mr. Evelyn's, which is a most beautiful place, but it being dark and late, I stayed not. But Dean Wilkins and Mr. Hook and I walked to Redriff, and noble discourse all day long did please me, and it being late did take them to my house to drink, and did give them some sweetmeats, and then sent them with a lantern home, two worthy persons as are in England, I think, or the world. So to my Lady Batten, where my wife is to-night, and so after some merry talk, home and to bed. Second. Up and to the office all day, where sat late, and then to the office again, and by and by Sir W. Batten, and my lady, and my wife, and I, by appointment yesterday, my lady Pen failed us, who ought to have been with us, to the Rhenish wine-house at the steel-yard, and there eat a couple of lobsters and some prawns, and pretty merry, especially to see us four together, while my wife and my lady did never intend ever to be together again, after a year's distance between one another. Hither, by and by, comes Sir Richard Ford, and also Mrs. Esther, that lived formerly with my lady Batten, now well married to a priest, come to see my lady, thence toward evening home, and to my office, where late, and then home to supper, and to bed. Third, up betimes, and walked to Sir Phil Warwick's, where a long time with him in his chamber alone, talking of Sir G. Carteret's business, and the abuses he puts on the nation by his bad payments to both our vexations, but no hope of remedy for aught I see. Thence to my Lord Ashley, to a committee of Tangier, for my Lord Rutherford's accounts, and that done, we to my Lord Treasurer's, where I did receive my Lord's warrant to Sir R. Long, for drawing a warrant for my striking of tallies. So to the inn again by Cripplegate, expecting my mother's coming to town, but she is not come this week neither, the coach being too full. So to the change, and thence home to dinner, and so out to Gresham College, and saw a cat killed with the Duke of Florence's poison, and saw it proved that the oil of tobacco, drawn by one of the society, do the same effect, and is judged to be the same thing with the poison both in colour and smell and effect. I saw also an abortive child preserved fresh in spirits of salt. Thence parted, and to Whitehall to the council chamber about an order touching the navy, are being empowered to commit seamen or masters that do not, being hired or pressed, follow their work. But they could give us none. So a little vexed at that, because I put in the memorial to the Duke of Albemarle alone under my own hand, home, and after some time at the office, home to bed. My Lord Chief Justice Hyde did die suddenly this week, a day or two ago, of an apoplexy. Fourth up and to the office where we sat busy all the morning at noon home to dinner and then to the office again all day till almost midnight and then weary home to supper and to bed fifth up betimes and by water to westminster there to speak the first time with sir robert long to give him my privy seal and my lord treasurer's order for tangier tallies he received me kindly enough thence home by water and presently down to woolwich and back to blackwall and there viewed the breach in order to a mast dock and so to Deptford to the Globe, where my Lord Brunkard, Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Batten, and Commissioner Pett were at dinner, having been at the breach also. But they find it will be too great charge to make use of it. After dinner to Mr. Evelyn's, he being abroad, we walked in his garden, 
and a lovely noble ground he hath indeed and among other rarities a hive of bees so as being hived in glass you may see the bees making their honey and combs mighty pleasantly thence home and i by and by to mr povis to see him who is yet in his chamber not well and thence by his advice to one lovett's a varnisher to see his manner of new varnish but found not him at home but his wife a very beautiful woman who shewed me much variety of admirable work and is in order to my having of some papers fitted with his lines for my use for tables and the like i know not whether i was more pleased with the thing or that i was shewed it by her but resolved i am to have some made so home to my office late and then to supper and to bed my wife tells me that she hears that my poor aunt james hath had her breast cut off here in town her breast having long been out of order this day after i had suffered my own hair to grow long in order to wearing it i find the convenience of periwigs is so great that i have cut off all short again and will keep to periwigs sixth up and all day at the office but a little at dinner and there late till past twelve so home to bed pleased as i always am after i have read a great deal of work it being very satisfactory to me seventh lord's day up and to church with my wife home and dined after dinner come mr andrews and spent the afternoon with me about our tangier business of the victuals and then parted and after sermon comes mr hill and a gentleman a friend of his one mr scott that sings well also and then comes mr andrews and we all sung and supped and then to sing again and pass the sunday very pleasantly and soberly and so i to my office a little and then home to prayers and to bed yesterday begun my wife to learn to limb of one brown which mr hill helps her to and by her beginning upon some eyes i think she will do very fine things and i shall take great delight in it eighth up very betimes and did much business before i went out with several persons among others captain taylor who would leave the management of most of his business now he is going to harwich upon me and if i can get money by it which i believe it will i shall take some of it upon me thence with sir w batten to the duke of albemarle's and there did much business and then to the change and thence off with sir w warren to an ordinary where we dined and sat talking of most useful discourse till five in the afternoon and then home and very busy till late and so home and to bed ninth up betimes and to my business at the office where all the morning at noon comes mrs thea turner and dines with us and my wife's painting-master stayed and dined and i take great pleasure in thinking that my wife will really come to something in that business here dined also llewellyn so after dinner to my office and there very busy till almost midnight and so home to supper and to bed this day we have news of eight ships being taken by some of ours going into the texel they are two men of war that convoyed them running in they come from about ireland round to the north tenth up betimes and abroad to the cockpit where the duke did give sir w batten and me an account of the late taking of eight ships and of his intent to come back to the gun fleet with the fleet presently which creates us much work and haste therein against the fleet comes so to mr povey and after discourse with him home and thence to the guard in southwark there to get some soldiers by the duke's order to go keep pressmen on board our ships so to the change and did much business and then home to dinner and there find my poor mother come out of the country to-day in good health and i am glad to see her but my business which i am sorry for keeps me from paying the respect i ought to her at her first coming she being grown very weak in her judgment and doting again in her discourse through age and some trouble in her family i left her and my wife to go abroad to buy something and then i to my office in the evening by appointment to sir w warren and mr deering at a tavern hard by with intent to do some good upon their agreement in a great bargain of planks so home to my office again and then to supper and to bed my mother being in bed already eleventh up betimes and at the office all the morning at home dined and then to the office all day till late at night and then home to supper weary with business and to bed twelfth up betimes and find myself disappointed in my receiving presently of my fifty pounds i hoped for sure of mr warren upon the benefit of my press warrant but he promises to make it good so by water to the exchequer and there up and down through all the officers to strike my tallies for seventeen thousand five hundred pounds which methinks is so great a testimony of the goodness of god to me that i from a mean clerk there should come to strike tallies myself for that sum and in the authority that i do now is a very stupendous mercy to me i shall have them struck to-morrow but to see how every little fellow looks after his fees and to get what he can for everything is a strange consideration 
the king's fees that he must pay himself for this seventeen thousand five hundred pounds coming to above a hundred pounds thence called my wife at unthanks to the new exchange and elsewhere to buy a lace band for me but we did not buy but i find it so necessary to have some handsome clothes that i cannot but lay out some money thereupon to the change and thence to my watchmaker where he has put it in order and a good and brave piece it is and he tells me worth fourteen pounds which is a greater present than i valued it so home to dinner and after dinner come several people among others my cousin thomas pepys of hatcham to receive some money of my lord sandwiches and there i paid him what was due to him upon my uncle's score but contrary to my expectation did get him to sign and seal to my sale of lands for payment of debts so that now i reckon myself in better condition by one hundred pounds in my content than i was before when i was liable to be called to an account and others after me by my uncle thomas or his children for every foot of land we had sold before this i reckon a great good fortune in the getting of this done he gone come mr povey dr twiston and mr lawson about settling my security in the paying of the four thousand pounds ordered to sir j lawson so a little abroad and then home and late at my office and closet settling this day's disordering of my papers then to supper and to bed thirteenth up and all day in some little gruntings of pain as i used to have from wind arising i think from my fasting so long and want of exercise and i think going so hot in clothes the weather being hot and the same clothes i wore all winter to the change after office and received my watch from the watchmaker and a very fine one it is given me by briggs the scrivener home to dinner and then i abroad to the attorney-general about advice upon the act for land carriage which he desired not to give me before i had received the king's and council's order therein going home bespoke the king's works will cost me fifty shillings i believe so home and late at my office but lord to see how much of my old folly and childishness hangs upon me still that i cannot forbear carrying my watch in my hand in the coach all this afternoon and seeing what o'clock it is one hundred times and i am apt to think with myself how could i be so long without one though i remember since i had one and found it a trouble and resolved to carry one no more about me while i lived so home to supper and to bed being troubled at a letter from mr cholmley from tangier wherein he do advise me how people are at work to overthrow our victualling business by which i shall lose three hundred pounds per annum i am much obliged to him for this secret kindness and concerned to repay it him in his own concernments and look after this fourteenth lord's day up and with my wife to church it being whitsunday my wife very fine in a new yellow bird's eye hood as the fashion is now we had a most sorry sermon so home to dinner my mother having her new suit brought home which makes her very fine after dinner my wife and she and mercer to thomas pepys's wife's christening of his first child and i took a coach and to wanstead the house where sir h mildmay died and now sir robert brooks lives having bought it of the duke of york it being forfeited to him a fine seat but an old-fashioned house and being not full of people looks desolately thence to walthamstow where failing at the old place sir w batten by and by come home i walking up and down the house and garden with my lady very pleasantly then to supper very merry and then back by coach by dark night i all the afternoon in the coach reading the treasonous book of the court of king james printed a great while ago and worth reading though ill intended as soon as i come home upon a letter from the duke of albemarle i took boat at about twelve at night and down the river in a galley my boy and i down to the hope and so up again sleeping and waking with great pleasure my business to call upon every one of fifteenth our victualling ships to set them a-going and so home and after dinner to the king's playhouse all alone and saw love's mistress some pretty things and good variety in it but no or little fancy in it thence to the duke of albemarle to give him account of my day's works where he shewed me letters from sir g downing of four days date that the dutch are come out and joined well manned and resolved to board our best ships and fight for certain they will thence to the swan at herbert's and there the company of sarah a little while and so away and called at the harp and ball where the maid mary is very formosa but lord to see in what readiness i am upon the expiring of my vows this day to begin to run into all my pleasures and neglect of business thence home and being sleepy to bed sixteenth up betimes and to the duke of albemarle with an account of my yesterday's actions in writing so back to the office where all the morning very busy after dinner by coach to see and speak with mr povey and after a little discourse back again home 
were busy upon letters till past twelve at night, and so home to supper and to bed, weary. Seventeenth. Up and by appointment to a meeting of Sir John Lawson and Mr. Chomley's attorney, and Mr. Povey at the Swan Tavern at Westminster, to settle their business about my being secured in the payment of money to Sir J. Lawson in the other's absence. Thence at Langford's, where I never was since my brother died there, I find my wife and Mercer having with him agreed upon two rich silk suits for me, which is fit for me to have. But yet the money is too much, I doubt, to lay out altogether. But it is done, and so let it be, it being the expense of the world that I can the best bear with, and the worst spare. Thence home, and after dinner to the office, where late, and so home to supper and to bed. Sir J. Minnes and I had an angry bout this afternoon with Commissioner Pett about his neglecting his duty, and absenting himself unknown to us from his place at Chatham. But a most false man I every day find him more and more, and in this very full of equivocation. The fleet we doubt not come to Harwich by this time. Sir W. Batten is gone down this day thither, and the Duchess of York went down yesterday to meet the Duke. 18th. Up, and with Sir J. Minnes to the Duke of Albemarle, where we did much business, and I with good content to myself. Among other things we did examine Nixon and Stainsby about their late running from two Dutchmen, for which they are committed to a vessel to carry them to the fleet to be tried, a most foul and handsome thing as ever was heard for playing cowardice on Nixon's part. Thence with the Duke of Albemarle in his coach to my Lord Treasurer, and there was before the King, whoever now calls me by my name, and Lord Chancellor and many other great lords, discoursing about insuring of some of the King's goods, wherein the king accepted of my motion that we should, and so away, well pleased. To the office and dined, and then to the office again, and abroad to speak with Sir G. Carteret. But, Lord, to see how frail a man I am, subject to my vanities, that can hardly forbear, though pressed with never so much business, my pursuing of pleasure, but home I got, and there very busy, very late. Among other things, consulting with Mr. Andrews about our Tangier business, wherein we are like to meet with some trouble, and my lord Bellasses endeavour to supplant us, which vexes my mind. But, however, our undertaking is so honourable that we shall stand a tug for it, I think. So home to supper and to bed. 19th. Up into Whitehall, where the committee for Tangier met, and there, though the case as to the merit of it was most plain and most of the company favourable to our business, yet it was with much ado that I got the business not carried fully against us, but put off to another day, my lord Arlington being the great man in it and I was sorry to be found arguing so greatly against him. The business, I believe, will in the end be carried against us, and the whole business fall. I must therefore endeavour the most I can to get money another way. It vexed me to see Creed so hot against it, but I cannot much blame him, having never declared to him my being concerned in it. But that that troubles me most is my Lord Arlington calls to me privately, and asks me whether I had ever said to anybody that I desired to leave this employment, having not time to look after it. I told him no, for that the thing being settled it will not require much time to look after it. He told me then he would do me right to the king, for he had been told so, which I desired him to do. And by and by he called me to him again, and asked me whether I had no friend about the duke, asking me, I making a stand, whether Mr. Coventry was not my friend. I told him I had received many friendships from him. He then advised me to procure that the duke would in his next letter write to him to continue me in my place, and remove any obstruction, which I told him I would, and thanked him. So parted, vexed at the first, and amazed at this business, of my Lord Arlington's. Thence to the exchequer, and there got my tallies for seventeen thousand five hundred pounds, the first payment I ever had out of the exchequer, and at the leg spent fourteen shillings upon my old acquaintance, some of them the clerks, and away home with my tallies in a coach, fearful every step of having one of them fall out or snatch from me. Being come home, I, much troubled, out again by coach, for company taking Sir W. Warren with me, intending to have spoke to my Lord Arlington to have known the bottom of it, but missed him. And afterwards, discoursing the thing as a confidant to Sir W. Warren, he did give me several good hints and principles not to do anything suddenly, but consult my pillow upon that and every great thing of my life, before I resolve anything in it. Away back home, and not being fit for business, I took my wife and Mercer down by water to Greenwich at eight at night, it being very fine and cool, and moonshine after it. Mighty pleasant passage it was. They eat a cake or two, and so home by ten or eleven at night, and then to bed, my mind not settled what to think. Twentieth. Up into my office, where busy all the morning. At noon dined at home, and to my office, very busy. Twenty-first. 
till past one lord's day in the morning writing letters to the fleet and elsewhere and my mind eased of much business home to bed and slept till late so up and this day is brought home one of my new silk suits the plain one but very rich camelot and noble i tried it and it pleases me but did not wear it being i would not go out to-day to church so laid it by and my mind changed thinking to go see my lady sandwich and i did go a little way but stopped and returned home to dinner after dinner up to my chamber to settle my tangier accounts and then to my office there to do the like with other papers in the evening home to supper and to bed twenty second up and down to the ships which now are hindered from going down to the fleet to our great sorrow and shame with their provisions the wind being against them so to the duke of albemarle and thence down by water to deptford it being trinity monday and so the day of choosing the master of trinity house for the next year where to my great content i find that contrary to the practice and design of sir w batten to break the rule and custom of the company in choosing their masters by succession he would have brought in sir w rider or sir w pen over the head of hurlaston who is a knave too besides i believe the younger brothers did all oppose it against the elder and with great heat did carry it for hurlston which i know will vex him to the heart thence the election being over to church where an idle sermon from that conceited fellow dr britton saving that his advice to unity and laying aside all envy and enmity among them was very apposite thence walked to redriff and so to the trinity house and a great dinner as is usual and so to my office where busy all the afternoon till late and then home to bed being much troubled in mind for several things first for the condition of the fleet for lack of provisions the blame this office lies under and the shame that they deserve to have brought upon them for the ships not being gone out of the river and then for my business of tangier which is not settled and lastly for fear that i am not observed to have attended the office business of late as much as i ought to do though there has been nothing but my attendance on tangier that has occasioned my absence and that of late not much twenty third up and at the office busy all the morning at noon dined alone my wife and mother being gone by invitation to dine with my mother's old servant mr cordery who made them very welcome so to mr povis where after a little discourse about his business i home again and late at the office busy late comes sir arthur ingram to my office to tell me that by letters from amsterdam of the twenty eighth of this month their style the dutch fleet being about one hundred men of war besides fire-ships etc did set out upon the twenty-third and twenty-fourth instant being divided into seven squadrons viz one general obdam two cottonar of rotterdam three trump four schram of horn five stillingworth of friesland six everson seven one other not named of zealand twenty-fourth up and by four o'clock in the morning and with w hewer there till twelve without intermission putting some papers in order thence to the coffee-house with creed where i have not been a great while where all the news is of the dutch being gone out and of the plague growing upon us in this town and of remedies against it some saying one thing some another so home to dinner and after dinner creed and i to colville's thinking to shew him all the respect we could by obliging him in carrying him five tallies of five thousand pounds to secure him for so much credit he has formerly given povey to tangier but he like an impertinent fool cavils at it but most ignorantly that ever i heard man in my life at last mr viner by chance comes who i find a very moderate man but could not persuade the fool to reason but brought away the tallies again and so vexed to my office where late and then home to my supper and to bed twenty fifth up into the office where all the morning at noon dined at home and then to the office all the afternoon busy till almost twelve at night and then home to supper and to bed twenty sixth up at four o'clock and all the morning in my office with w hewer finishing my papers that were so long out of order and at noon to my booksellers and there bespoke a book or two and so home to dinner where creed dined with me and he and i afterwards to alderman backwell's to try him about supplying us with money which he denied at first and last also saving that he spoke a little fairer at the end than before but the truth is i do fear i shall have a great deal of trouble in getting of money thence home and in the evening by water to the duke of albemarle whom i found mightily off the hooks that the ships are not gone out of the river which vex me to see insomuch that i am afeard that we must expect some change or addition of new officers brought upon us so that i must from this time forward resolve to make myself appear eminently serviceable in attending at my office duly and nowhere else which makes me wish with all my heart that i had never anything to do with this business of tangier after a while at my office home to supper vexed and to bed 
27th, up and to the office, where all the morning. At noon dined at home, and then to my office again, where late, and so to bed, with my mind full of fears for the business of this office, and troubled with that of Tangier, concerning which Mr. Povey was with me, but do give me little help, but more reason of being troubled, so that were it not for our Plymouth business, I would be glad to be rid of it. 28th, Lord's Day. By water to the Duke of Albemarle, where I hear that Nixon is condemned to be shot to death for his cowardice by a council of war. Went to chapel and heard a little music, and there met with Creed, and with him a little while walking, and to Wilkinson's for me to drink, being troubled with wind, and at noon to Sir Philip Warwick's to dinner, where abundance of company come in unexpectedly. And here I saw one pretty piece of household stuff, as the company increaseth, to put a larger leaf upon an oval table. After dinner much good discourse with Sir Philip, who I find, I think, a most pious, good man, and a professor of a philosophical manner of life and principles like Epictetus, whom he cites in many things. Thence to my Lady Sandwich's, where, to my shame, I had not been a great while before. Here, upon my telling her a story of my Lord Rochester's running away on Friday night last with Mrs. Mallet, the great beauty and fortune of the North, who had supped at Whitehall with Mrs. Stewart, and was going home to her lodgings with her grandfather, my Lord Haley, by coach, and was at Charing Cross seized on by both horse and footman, and forcibly taken from him, and put into a coach with six horses, and two women provided to receive her, and carried away. Upon immediate pursuit, my Lord of Rochester, for whom the King had spoke to the lady often, but with no success, was taken at Uxbridge, but the lady is not yet heard of, and the King mighty angry, and the Lord sent to the tower. Hereupon my lady did confess to me as a great secret, her being concerned in this story. For if this match breaks between my Lord Rochester and her, then, by the consent of all her friends, my Lord Hinchingbrook stands fair, and is invited for her. She is worth, and will be at her mother's death, who keeps but a little from her, two thousand five hundred pounds per annum. Pray God give a good success to it. But my poor lady, who is afeard of the sickness, and resolved to be gone into the country, is forced to stay in town a day or two, or three, about it, to see the event of it. Then to home, and to see my Lady Penn, where my wife and I were shown a fine rarity, of fishes kept in a glass of water, that will live so for ever, and finely marked they are, being foreign. So to supper at home, and to bed, after many people being with me about business, among others the two Bellamys about their old debt due to them from the King for their victualling business, out of which I hope to get some money. Twenty-ninth. Lay long in bed, being in some little pain of the wind colic, then up and to the Duke of Albemarle, and so to the Swan, and there drank at Herbert's, and so by coach home, it being kept a great holiday through the city, for the birth and restoration of the King. To my office, where I stood by, and saw Simpson the joiner do several things, little jobs, to the rendering of my closet handsome, and the setting up of some neat plates, that Burston has for my money made me, and so home to dinner. And then with my wife, mother, and Mercer in one boat, and I in another, down to Woolwich. I walking from Greenwich, the others going to and fro upon the water till my coming back, having done but little business. So home and to supper, and weary to bed. We have everywhere taken some prizes. Our merchants have good luck to come home safe, colliers from the north, and some straitsmen just now. And our Hambram ships, of whom we were so much afeard, are safe in Hambra. Our fleet resolved to sail out again from Harwich in a day or two. Thirtieth. Lay long, and very busy all the morning, at noon to the change, and thence to dinner to Sir G. Carteret's, to talk upon the business of insuring our goods upon the Hambra ships. Here a very fine, neat French dinner, without much cost, we being all alone with my lady, and one of the house with her. Thence home and wrote letters, and then in the evening by coach, with my wife and mother and Mercer, our usual tour by coach, and eat at the old house at Islington. But, Lord, to see how my mother found herself talk upon every object to think of old stories. Here I met with one that tells me that Jack Cole, my old schoolfellow, is dead and buried lately of a consumption, who was a great crony of mine. So back again home, and there to my closet to write letters. Here to my great trouble that our Hambra ships, valued of the king's goods and the merchants, though but little of the former, to two hundred thousand pounds, are lost. By and by, about eleven at night, called into the garden by my lady Penn and daughter, and there walked with them and my wife till almost twelve, and so in and closed my letters, and home to bed. 31st. Up and to my office, and to Westminster, doing business till noon, and then to the change, where great the noise and trouble of having our Hambra ships lost, and that very much placed upon Mr. Coventry's forgetting to give notice to them of the going away of our fleet from the coast of Holland. But all without reason, for he did. But the merchants not being ready, stayed longer than the time ordered for the convoy to stay, which was ten days. 
thence home with creed and mr moore to dinner anon we broke up and creed and i to discourse about our tangier matters of money which vexed me so to gresham college stayed a very little while and away and i home busy and busy late at the end of the month about my month's accounts but by the addition of tangier it is rendered more intricate and so which i have not done these twelve months nor would willingly have done now failed of having it done but i will do it as soon as i can so weary and sleepy to bed i endeavoured but missed of seeing sir thomas ingram at westminster so went to houseman's the painter who i intend shall draw my wife but he was not within but i saw several very good pictures of the diary of samuel pepys sixteen sixty five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the diary of samuel pepys sixteen sixty five by samuel pepys june sixteen sixty five june first up into the office where sat all the morning at noon to the change and there did some business and home to dinner with a creed comes and after dinner i put on my new silk camelot suit the best that ever i wore in my life the suit costing me above twenty four pounds in this i went with creed to goldsmith's hall to the burial of sir thomas viner which hall and haberdashers also were so full of people that we were fain for ease and coolness to go forth to paternoster row to choose a silk to make me a plain ordinary suit that done we walked to cornhill and there mr cade stood in the balcony and saw all the funeral which was with the blue-coat boys and old men all the aldermen and lord mayor etc and the number of the company very great the greatest i ever did see for a tavern hither come up to us dr allen and then mr povey and mr fox the show being over and my discourse with mr povey i took coach and to westminster hall where i took the fairest flower and by coach to tothill fields for the air till it was dark i light and in with the fairest flower to eat a cake and there did do as much as was safe with my flower and that was enough on my part broke up and away without any notice and after delivering the rose where it should be i to the temple and light and come to the middle door and there took another coach and so home to write letters but very few god knows being by my pleasure made to forget everything that is the coachman that carried us cannot know me again nor the people at the house where we were home to bed certain news being come that our fleet is in sight of the dutch ships second lay troubled in mine a bed a good while thinking of my tangier and victualling business which i doubt will fall up unto the duke of albemarle but missed him thence to the harp and ball and to westminster hall where i visited the flowers in each place and so met with mr creed and he and i to mrs croft's to drink and did but saw not her daughter burroughs i away home and there dined and did business in the afternoon went with my tallies made a fair end with colville and viner delivering them five thousand pound tallies to each and very quietly had credit given me upon other tallies of mr colville for two thousand pounds and good words for more and of mr viner too thence to visit the duke of albemarle and thence my lady sandwich and lord crew thence home and there met an express from sir w batten at harwich that the fleet is all sailed from sole bay having spied the dutch fleet at sea and that if the calms hinder not they must needs now be engaged with them another letter also come to me from mr hayter committed by the council this afternoon to the gatehouse upon the misfortune of having his name used by one without his knowledge or privity for the receiving of some powder that he had bought up to court about these two and for the former was led up to my lady castlemaine's lodgings where the king and she and others were at supper and there i read the letter and returned and then to sir g carteret about hayter and shall have him released to-morrow upon my giving bail for his appearance which i have promised to do sir g carteret did go on purpose to the king to ask this and it was granted so home at past twelve almost one o'clock in the morning to my office till past two and then home to supper and to bed third up into whitehall where sir g carteret did go with me to secretary morris and prevailed with him to let mr hayter be released upon bail for his appearance so i at a loss how to get another besides myself and got mr hunt who did patiently stay with me all the morning at secretary morris's chamber mr hayter being sent for with his keeper and at noon comes in the secretary and upon entering into recognizances he for two hundred pounds and mr hunt and i for one hundred pounds each for his appearance upon demand he was released it costing him i think above three pounds i thence home vexed to be kept from the office all the morning which i had not been in many months before if not some years at home to dinner and all the afternoon at the office where late at night and much business done then home to supper and to bed all this day by all people upon the river 
and almost everywhere else hereabout were heard the guns, our two fleets were certain being engaged, which was confirmed by letters from Harwich, but nothing particular, and all our hearts full of concernment for the Duke, and I particularly for my Lord Sandwich and Mr. Coventry, after his Royal Highness. Fourth, Sunday. Up and at my chamber all the forenoon, at evening my accounts, which I could not do sooner for the last month, and blessed be God, and worth fourteen hundred pounds odd money, something more than ever I was yet in the world. Dined very well at noon, and then to my office, and there, and in the garden, discoursed with several people about business. Among others, Mr. Howell, the turner, who did give me so good a discourse about the practices of the paymaster J. Fenn, that I thought fit to recollect all when he was gone, and have entered it down to be for ever remembered. Thence to my chamber again, to settle my Tangier accounts against to-morrow, and some other things, and with great joy ended them, and so to supper, where a good fowl and tansy, and so to bed. News being come that our fleet is pursuing the Dutch, who either by cunning, or by being worsted, do give ground, but nothing more for certain. Late to bed upon my papers being quite finished. Fifth. Up very betimes to look some other papers, and then to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier, where I offered my accounts with great acceptation, and so had some good words and honour by it, and one or two things done to my content in my business of treasurer but I do clearly see that we shall lose our business of victualling, Sir Thomas Ingram undertaking that it shall be done by persons there as cheap as we do it, and give the seamen their full allowance and themselves give good security here for performance of contract, upon which terms there is no opposing it. This would trouble me, but that I hope, when that fails, to spend my time to some good advantage other ways, and so shall permit it all to God Almighty's pleasure. Then same to dinner, after change, where great talk of the Dutch being fled, and we in pursuit of them, and that our ship charity is lost upon our captains wilkinson and lieutenants yielding but of this there is no certainty save the report of some of the sick men of the charity turned adrift in a boat out of the charity and taken up and brought on shore yesterday to sole bay and the news hereof brought by sir henry fulton home to dinner and creed with me then he and i down to deptford did some business and back again at night he home and i to my office and so to supper and to bed this morning i had great discourse with my lord barclay about mr hater towards whom from a great passion reproaching him with being a fanatic and dangerous for me to keep i did bring him to be mighty calm and to ask me pardons for what he had thought of him and to desire me to ask his pardon of hater himself for the ill words he did give him the other day alone at whitehall which was that he had always thought him a man that was no good friend to the king but did never think it would break out in a thing of this nature and did advise him to declare his innocence to the council and pray for his examination and vindication of which i shall consider and say no more but remember one compliment that in great kindness to me he did give me, extolling my care and diligence, that he did love me heartily for my own sake, and more that he did will me whatsoever I thought for Mr. Coventry's sake. For though the world did think them enemies, and to have an ill aspect one to another, yet he did love him with all his heart. Which was a strange manner of noble compliment, confessing his owning me as a confidant and favourite of Mr. Coventry's. Sixth waked in the morning before four o'clock with great pain to piss and great pain in pissing by having i think drank too great a draught of cold drink before going to bed but by and by to sleep again and then rose and to the office we are very busy all the morning and at noon to dinner with sir g carteret to his house with all our board where a good pasty and brave discourse but our great fear was some fresh news of the fleet but not from the fleet all being said to be well and beaten the dutch but i do not give much belief to it and indeed the news comes from sir w batten at harwich and writ so simply that we all made good mirth of it thence to the office where upon sir g carteret's accounts to my great vexation there being nothing done by the controller to write the king therein i thence to my office and wrote letters all the afternoon and in the evening by coach to sir phil warwick's about my tangier business to get money and so to my lady sandwiches who poor lady expects every hour to hear of my lord but in the best temper neither confident nor troubled with fear that i ever did see in my life she tells me my lord rochester is now declaredly out of hopes of mrs mallet and now she is to receive notice in a day or two how the king stands inclined to the giving leave for my lord hinchingbrook to look after her and that being done to bring it to an end shortly then to my coach home and to my office a little and so before twelve o'clock home and to bed seventh this morning my wife and mother rose about two o'clock and with mercer mary the boy and w hewer as they had designed took boat and down to refresh themselves on the water to gravesend lay till seven o'clock then up and to the office upon sir g carteret's accounts again we are very busy thence abroad and to the change no news of certainty being yet come from the fleet thence to the dolphin tavern where sir j minnes lord brunkard sir thomas harvey and myself dined 
upon Sir G. Carteret's charge, and very merry we were, Sir Thomas Harvey being a very droll. Thence to the office, and meeting Creed, away with him to my Lord Treasurer's, there thinking to have met the goldsmiths at Whitehall, but did not, and so appointed another time for my Lord to speak to them to advance us some money. Thence, it being the hottest day that ever I felt in my life, and it is confessed so by all other people the hottest they ever knew in England in the beginning of June, we to the new exchange, and there drunk way, with much entreaty getting it for our money, and they would not be entreated to let us have one glass more. So to a quarter, and to Foxhall, to the Spring Garden, and there walked an hour or two with great pleasure, saving our minds ill at ease concerning the fleet and my Lord Sandwich, that we have no news of them, and ill reports run up and down of his being killed, but without ground. Here stayed pleasantly walking and spending but sixpence till nine at night, and then by water to Whitehall, and there I stopped to hear news of the fleet, but none come, which is strange, and so by water home, where weary with walking, and with the mighty heat of the weather, and for my wife's not coming home, I staying walking in the garden till twelve at night, when it begun to lighten exceedingly through the greatness of the heat. Then despairing of her coming home, I to bed. This day, much against my will, I did in Drury Lane see two or three houses marked with a red cross upon the doors, and Lord have mercy upon us, writ there, which was a sad sight to me, being the first of the kind that to my remembrance I ever saw. It put me into an ill conception of myself and my smell, so that I was forced to buy some roll tobacco to smell to and chaw, which took away the apprehension. 8th. About five o'clock, my wife come home, it having lightened all night hard, and one great shower of rain. She come and lay upon the bed, I up and to the office, where all the morning, alone at home to dinner, my wife, mother, and Mercer dining at W. Joyce's, I giving her a caution to go round by the half-moon to his house, because of the plague. I to my Lord Treasurer's, by appointment of Sir Thomas Ingram's, to meet the goldsmiths, where I met with the great news at last newly come, brought by Bab May from the Duke of York, that we have totally routed the Dutch, that the Duke himself, the Prince, my Lord Sandwich, and Mr. Coventry are all well, which did put me into such joy that I forgot almost all other thoughts. The particulars I shall set down by and by. By and by comes Alderman Maynell and Mr. Viner, and there my Lord Treasurer did entreat them to furnish me with money upon my tallies, Sir Philip Warwick before my Lord declaring the King's changing of the hand from Mr. Povey to me, whom he called a very sober person, and one whom the Lord Treasurer would own in all things that I should concern myself with them in the business of money. They did at present declare they could not part with money at present. My Lord did press them very hard, and I hope upon their considering we shall get some of them. Thence with great joy to the cockpit, where the Duke of Albemarle, like a man out of himself with content, you told me all. And by and by comes a letter from Mr. Coventry's own hand to him, which he never opened, which was a strange thing, but did give it me to open and read, and consider what was fit for our office to do in it, and leave the letter with Sir W. Clark, which upon such a time and occasion was a strange piece of indifference, hardly pardonable. I copied out the letter, and did also take minutes out of Sir W. Clark's other letters, and the sum of the news is, Victory over the Dutch, June 3rd, 1665. This day they engaged, the Dutch neglecting greatly the opportunity of the wind they had of us, by which they lost the benefit of their fire-ships. The Earl of Falmouth, Muscury, and Mr. Richard Boyle killed on board the Duke ship, the Royal Charles, with one shot, their blood and brains flying in the Duke's face, and the head of Mr. Boyle striking down the Duke, as some say. Earl of Marlborough, Portland, Rear Admiral Sampson, to Prince Rupert, killed, and Captain Kirby and Abelson. Sir John Lawson wounded on the knee, hath had some bones taken out, and is likely to be well again. Upon receiving the herd, he sent to the Duke for another to command the Royal Oak. The Duke sent Jordan out of the St. George, who did brave things in her. Captain Ger Smith of the Mary was second to the Duke, and stepped between him and Captain Seaton of the Urania, seventy-six guns and four hundred men, who had sworn to board the Duke. Killed him two hundred men, and took the ship, himself losing ninety-nine men, and never an officer saved but himself and lieutenant. His master indeed is saved, with his leg cut off. Admiral Opdam blown up, Trump killed, and said by Holmes. All the rest of the admirals, as they say, but Everson, whom they dare not trust for his affection to the Prince of Orange, are killed, we having taken and sunk, as is believed, about twenty-four of their best ships, killed and taken near eight or ten thousand men, and lost, we think, not above seven hundred. A greater victory never known in the world. They are all fled. Some forty-three got into the Texel, and others elsewhere, and be in pursuit of the rest. Thence with my heart full of joy, home, and to my office a little. Then to my Lady Penn's, where they are all joyed, and not a little puffed up at the good success of their father. And good service indeed is said to have been done by him. 
had a great bonfire at the gate, and I with my Lady Penn's people and others to Mrs. Turner's great room, and then down into the street. I did give the boys four shillings among them, and mighty merry. So home to bed, with my heart at great rest and quiet, saving that the consideration of the victory is too great for me presently to comprehend. Ninth. Lay long in bed, my head aching with too much thoughts, I think, last night. Up into Whitehall, and my Lord Treasurer's, to Sir Phil Warwick, about Tangier business, and in my way met with Mr. Moore, who eases me in one point wherein I was troubled, which was that I heard of nothing said or done by my Lord Sandwich. But he tells me that Mr. Cowling, my Lord Chamberlain's secretary, did hear the King say that my Lord Sandwich had done nobly and worthily. The King, it seems, is much troubled at the fall of my Lord of Falmouth, but I do not meet with any man else that so much as wishes him alive again, the world conceiving him a man of too much pleasure to do the King any good, or offer any good office to him. But I hear of all hands he is confessed to have been a man of great honour, that did show it in this his going with the Duke, the most that ever any man did. Home, where my people busy to make ready a supper, against night for some guests, in lieu of my stone feast. At noon, eat a small dinner at home, and so abroad to buy several things, and among others with my tailor to buy a silk suit, which though I had one lately, yet I do, for joy of the good news we have lately had of our victory over the Dutch, which makes me willing to spare myself something extraordinary in clothes, and after long resolution of having nothing but black, I did buy a coloured silk ferrandin. So to the old exchange, and there at my pretty seamstresses, bought a pair of stockings of her husband, and so home, where by and by comes Mr. Honeywood, and Mrs. Wilde, and Roger Pepys, and after long time spent, Mrs. Turner, Thee, and Joyce. We had a very good venison pasty, this being instead of my stone feast the last march, and very merry we were, and the more I know, the more I like Mr. Honeywood's conversation. So after a good supper they parted, walking to the change for a coach, and I with them to see them there. So home and to bed, glad it was over. Tenth. Lay long in bed, and then up and at the office all the morning. At noon dined at home, and then to the office, busy all the afternoon. In the evening home to supper, and there to my great trouble, hear that the plague is come into the city, though it hath these three or four weeks since its beginning been wholly out of the city. But where should it begin but in my good friend and neighbour's Dr. Burnett in Fenchurch Street, which in both points troubles me mightily. To the office to finish my letters, and then home to bed, being troubled at the sickness. My head filled also with other business enough, and particularly how to put my things and estate in order, in case it should please God to call me away, which God dispose of to his glory. 11th. Lord's Day. Up and expected long a new suit, but coming not, dressed myself in my late new black silk camelot suit, and when fully ready, comes my new one of coloured ferrandin, which my wife puts me out of love with, which vexes me, but I think it is only my not being used to wear colours which makes it look a little unusual upon me. To my chamber, and there spent the morning reading. At noon, by invitation, comes my two cousin Joyce's and their wives, my aunt James and he cousin Harmon, his wife being ill. I had a good dinner for them, and as merry as I could be in such company. They being gone, I out of doors a little, to shew forsooth my new suit, and back again, and in going I saw poor Dr. Burnett's door shut, but he hath I here gained great good will among his neighbours, for he discovered it himself first, and caused himself to be shut up of his own accord, which was very handsome. In the evening comes Mr. Andrews and his wife and Mr. Hill, and stayed and played and sung and supped, most excellent pretty company, so pleasant, ingenious, and harmless, I cannot desire better. They gone, we to bed, my mind in great present ease. Twelfth. Up and in my yesterday's new suit to the Duke of Albemarle, and after a turn in Whitehall, and then in Westminster Hall, returned, and with my tailor bought some gold lace for my sleeve hands in Paternoster Row. So home to dinner, and then to the office, and down the river to Deptford, and then back again, and to my Lord Treasurer's and up and down to look after my Tangier business, and so home to my office, then to supper and to bed. The Duke of York is sent for last night, and expected to be here to-morrow. Thirteenth. Up and to the office, where all the morning doing business. At noon with Sir G. Carteret to my Lord Mayor's to dinner, where much company in a little room, and though a good, yet no extraordinary table. His name, Sir John Lawrence, whose father, a very ordinary old man, sat there at table, but it seems a very rich man. Here were at table three Sir Richard Browns, viz. he of the council, a clerk, and the alderman, and his son. And there was a little grandson, also Richard, who will hereafter be Sir Richard Brown. The alderman did here openly tell him boasting, how he had, only upon suspicion of disturbances, if there had been any bad news from sea, clapped up several persons that he was afeard of, and that he had several times done the like, and would do, and take no bail where he saw it unsafe for the king. 
but by and by he said that he was now sued in the exchequer by a man for false imprisonment that he had upon the same score imprisoned while he was mayor four years ago and asked advice upon it i told him i believed there was none and told my story of field at which he was troubled and said that it was then unsafe for any man to serve the king and i believe knows not what to do therein but that sir richard brown of the council advised him to speak with my lord chancellor about it my lord mayor very respectful to me and so i after dinner away and found sir j minnes ready with his coach and four horses at our office gate for him and me to go out of town to meet the duke of york coming from harwich to-night and so as far as ilford and their light by and by comes to us sir john shaw and mr neale that married the rich widow gold upon the same errand after eating a dish of cream we took coach again hearing nothing of the duke and away home a most pleasant evening and road and so to my office where after my letters wrote to supper and to bed all our discourse in our way was sir j minnes telling me passages of the late kings and his fathers which i was mightily pleased to hear for information though the pride of some persons and vice of most was but a sad story to tell how that brought the whole kingdom and king to ruin fourteenth up into sir phil warwick's and other places about tangier business but to little purpose among others to my lord treasurer's though to speak with him and waited in the lobby three long hours for to speak with him to the trial of my utmost patience but missed him at last and forced to go home without it which may teach me how i make others wait home to dinner and stayed mr hater with me and after dinner drew up a petition for mr hater to present to the council about his troublesome business of powder desiring a trial that his absence may be vindicated and so to whitehall but it was not proper to present it to-day here i met with mr cowling who observed to me how he finds everybody silent in the praise of my lord sandwich to set up the duke and the prince but that the duke did both to the king and my lord chancellor write abundantly of my lord's courage and service and i this day met with a letter of captain ferrers wherein he tells us my lord was with his ship in all the heat of the day and did most worthily met with creed and he and i to westminster and there saw my lord marlborough brought to be buried several lords of the council carrying him and with the herald in some state thence vexed in my mind to think that i do so little in my tangier business and so home and after supper to bed fifteenth up and put on my new stuff suit with close knees which becomes me most nobly as my wife says at the office all day at noon put on my first laced band all lace and to kate joyce's to dinner where my mother wife and abundance of their friends and good usage thence wife and mercer and i to the old exchange and there bought two lace bands more one of my seamstress whom my wife concurs with me to be a pretty woman so down to deptford and woolwich my boy and i at woolwich discourse with mr sheldon about my bringing my wife down for a month or two to his house which he approves of and i think will be very convenient so late back and to the office wrote letters and so home to supper and to bed this day the news-book upon mr moore's showing lestrange captain ferrers letter did do my lord sandwich great right as to the late victory the duke of york not yet come to town the town grows very sickly and people to be afeard of it there dying this last week of the plague a hundred and twelve from forty-three the week before whereof but one in fenshaw street and one in broad street by the treasurer's office sixteenth up into the office where i set hard to business but was informed that the duke of york is come and hath appointed us to attend him this afternoon so after dinner and doing some business at the office i to whitehall where the court is full of the duke and his courtiers returned from sea all fat and lusty and ruddy by being in the sun i kissed his hands and we waited all the afternoon by and by saw mr coventry which rejoiced my very heart anon he and i from all the rest of the company walked into the matted gallery where after many expressions of love we fell to talk of business among other things how my lord sandwich both in his counsels and personal service hath done most honourably and serviceably sir j lawson is come to greenwich but his wound in his knee yet very bad jonas poole in the vanguard did basely so as to be or will be turned out of his ship captain holmes expecting upon sansom's death to be made rear admiral to the prince but harman is put in hath delivered up to the duke his commission which the duke took and tore he it seems had bid the prince who first told him of holmes's intention that he should dissuade him from it for that he was resolved to take it if he offered it yet holmes would do it like a rash proud coxcomb but he is rich and hath it seemed sought an occasion of leaving the service several of our captains have done ill the great ships are the ships do the business they quite deadening the enemy they run away upon sight of the prince it is strange to see how people do already slight sir william barclay my lord fitzharding's brother who three months since was the delight of the court captain smith of the mary the duke talks mightily of and some great thing will be done for him 
strange to hear how the dutch do relate as the duke says that they are the conquerors and bonfires are made in dunkirk in their behalf though a clearer victory can never be expected mr coventry thinks they cannot have lost less than six thousand men and we not dead above two hundred and wounded about four hundred in all about six hundred thence home and to my office till past twelve and then home to supper and to bed my wife and mother not being yet come home from w hewer's chamber who treats my mother to-night captain grovel the duke told us this day hath done the basest thing at lowestoff in hearing of the guns and could not as others be got out but stayed there for which he will be tried and is reckoned a prating coxcomb and of no courage seventeenth my wife come to bed about one in the morning i up and abroad about tangier business then back to the office where we sat and at noon home to dinner and then abroad to mr povis after i and mr andrews had been with mr ball and one major strange who looks after the getting of money for tallies and is helping mr andrews i had much discourse with ball and it may be he may prove a necessary man for our turns with mr povey i spoke very freely my indifference as to my place of treasurer being so much troubled in it which he took with much seeming trouble that i should think of letting go so lightly the place but if the place can't be held i will so hearing that my lord treasurer was gone out of town with his family because of the sickness i returned home without staying there and at the office find sir w pen come home who looks very well and i am gladder to see him than otherwise i should be because of my hearing so well of him for his serviceableness in this late great action to the office late and then home to bed it struck me very deep this afternoon going with a hackney coach from my lord treasurer's down holborn the coachman i found to drive easily and easily at last stood still and come down hardly able to stand and told me that he was suddenly struck very sick and almost blind he could not see so i light and went into another coach with a sad heart for the poor man and trouble for myself lest he should have been struck with the plague being at the end of the town that i took him up but god have mercy upon us all sir john lawson i hear is worse than yesterday the king went to see him to-day most kindly it seems his wound is not very bad but he hath a fever a thrush and a hiccup all three together which are it seems very bad symptoms eighteenth lord's day up into church where sir w pen was the first time since he come from sea after the battle mr mills made a sorry sermon to prove that there was a world to come after this home and dined and then to my chamber where all the afternoon and on comes mr andrews to see and sing with me but mr hill not coming and having business we soon parted there coming mr povey and creed to discourse about our tangier business of money they gone i hear sir w batten and my lady are returned from harwich i went to see them and it is pretty to see how we appear kind one to another though neither of us care tuppence one for another home to supper and there coming a hasty letter from commissioner pett for pressing of some caucus as i would ever on his majesty's service with all speed i made a warrant presently and issued it so to my office a little and then home to bed nineteenth up into whitehall with sir w batten calling at my lord ashley's but to no purpose by the way he being not up and there had our usual meeting before the duke with the officers of the ordnance with us which in some respects i think will be the better for us for dispatch sake thence home to the change and dined alone my wife gone to her mother's after dinner to my little new goldsmith's whose wife indeed is one of the prettiest modest black women that ever i saw i paid for a dozen of silver salt six pounds fourteen shillings sixpence thence with sir w pen from the office down to greenwich to see sir j lawson who is better but continues ill his hiccup not being yet gone could have little discourse with him so thence home and to supper a while to the office my head and mind mightily vexed to see the multitude of papers and business before me and so little time to do it in so to bed twentieth thanksgiving day for victory over the dutch up into the office were very busy alone all the morning till church time and there heard a mean sorry sermon of mr mills then to the dolphin tavern where all the officers of the navy met with the commissioners of the ordnance by agreement and dined where good music at my direction our club share come to thirty-four shillings a man nine of us thence after dinner to whitehall with sir w barclay in his coach and so walked to herbert's and there spent a little time thence by water to vauxhall and there walked an hour alone observing the several humours of the citizens that were there this holiday pulling of cherries and god knows what and so home to my office where late my wife not being come home with my mother who have been this day all abroad upon the water my mother being to go out of town speedily so i home and to supper and to bed my wife come home when i come from the office this day i inform myself that there died four or five at westminster of the plague in one alley in several houses upon sunday last bell alley over against the palace gate 
yet people do think that the number will be fewer in the town than it was the last week. The Dutch are come out again with twenty sail under Bankert, suppose gone to the northward to meet their East India fleet. 21st. Up and very busy all the morning. At noon with Creed to the excise office, where I find our tallies will not be money in less than sixteen months, which is a sad thing for the king to pay all that interest for every penny he spends, and which is strange, the goldsmiths with whom I spoke do declare that they will not be moved to part with money upon the increase of their consideration of ten per cent, which they have, and therefore desire I would not move in it, and indeed the consequence would be very ill to the king, and have its ill consequences follow us through all the king's revenue. Home, and my uncle White and aunt James dine with me, my mother being to go away to-morrow. So to Whitehall, and there, before and after, counsel discourse with Sir Thomas Ingram about our ill case as to Tangier for money. He hath got the king to appoint a meeting on Friday, which I hope will put an end one way or other to my pain. So homewards, and to the cross-keys at Cripplegate, who I find all the town almost going out of town, the coaches and wagons being all full of people, going into the country. Here I had some of the company of the tapster's wife a while, and so home to my office, and then home to supper, and to bed. 22nd. Up pretty betimes, and in great pain whether to send my mother into the country to-day or no. I hearing by my people that she, poor wretch, hath a mind to stay a little longer, and I cannot blame her, considering what a life she will through her own folly lead when she comes home again, unlike the pleasure and liberty she hath had here. At last I resolved to put it to her, and she agreed to go, so I would not oppose it, because of the sickness in the town, and my intentions of removing my wife. So I did give her money, and took a kind leave of her, she, poor wretch, desiring that I would forgive my brother John, but I refused it to her, which troubled her poor soul. But I did it in kind words, and so let the discourse go off, she leaving me, though, in a great deal of sorrow. So I to my office, and left my wife and people to see her out of time, and I at the office all the morning. At noon my wife tells me that she is with much ado gone, and I pray God bless her. But it seems she was to the last unwilling to go, but would not say so, but put it off till she lost her place in the coach, and was fain to ride in the wagon part. After dinner to the office again till night, very busy, and so home, not very late, to supper, and to bed. 23rd. Up into Whitehall to a committee for Tangier, where His Royal Highness was. Our great design was to state to them the true condition of this committee for want of money, the want whereof was so great as to need some sudden help, and it was with some content resolved to see it supplied and means proposed towards the doing of it. At this committee unknown to me comes my Lord of Sandwich, who, it seems, come to town last night. After the committee was up, my Lord Sandwich did take me aside, and we walked an hour alone together in the robe chamber, the door shut, telling me how much the Duke and Mr. Coventry did, both in the fleet and here, make of him, and that in some opposition to the Prince, and as a more private message he told me that he hath been with them both when they have made sport of the prince and laughed at him yet that all the discourse of the town and the printed relation should not give him one word of honour my lord thinks mighty strange he assuring me that though by accident the prince was in the van at the beginning of the fight for the first pass yet all the rest of the day my lord was in the van and continued so that notwithstanding all this noise of the prince he had hardly a shot in his side nor a man killed whereas he hath above thirty in her hull and not one mast hole nor yard, but the most battered ship of the fleet, and lost most men, saving Captain Smith of the Mary. That the most the Duke did was almost out of gunshot, but that, indeed, the Duke did come up to my lord's rescue, after he had a great while fought with four of them. How poorly Sir John Lawson performed, notwithstanding all that was said of him, and how his ship turned out of the way, while Sir J. Lawson himself was upon the deck, to the endangering of the whole fleet. It therefore troubles my lord that Mr. Coventry should not mention a word of him in his relation. I did in answer offer that I was sure the relation was not compiled by Mr. Coventry, but by Lestrange, out of several letters, as I could witness, and that Mr. Coventry's letter that he did give the Duke of Albemarle did give him as much right as the Prince, for I myself read it first and then copied it out, which I promised to show my lord, with which he was somewhat satisfied. From that discourse my lord did begin to tell me how much he was concerned to dispose of his children, and would have my advice and help, and propounded to match my lady Jemima to Sir G. Carteret's eldest son, which I approved of, and did undertake the speaking with him about it as from myself, which my lord liked. So parted, with my head full of care about this business. Thence home to the change, and so to dinner, and thence by coach to Mr. Povis. Thence by appointment with him and Creed to one Mr. Finch, one of the commissioners for the excise, to be informed about some things of the excise, in order to our settling matters therein better for us, for our Tangier business. I find him a very discreet, grave person. 
Thence well satisfied, I agreed to Mr. Fox at Whitehall to speak with him about the same matter, and having some pretty satisfaction from him also, he and I took boat and to Vauxhall, where we spent two or three hours talking of several matters very soberly and contentfully to me, which, with the air and pleasure of the garden, was a great refreshment to me, and methinks that which we ought to joy ourselves in. Thence back to Whitehall, where we parted, and I to my lord, to receive his further direction about his proposal this morning, wherein I did that I should first by another hand break my intentions to Sir G. Carteret. I pitched upon Dr. Clark, which my lord liked, and so I endeavoured but in vain to find him out to-night. So home by Hackney Coach, which is become a very dangerous passage nowadays, the sickness increasing mightily, and to bed. 24th, Midsummer Day. Up very betimes, by six, and at Dr. Clark's at Westminster by seven of the clock, having overnight by a note acquainted him with my intention of coming, and there I, in the best manner I could, broke my errand about a match between Sir G. Carteret's eldest son and my Lord Sandwich's eldest daughter, which he, as I knew he would, took with great content, and we both agreed that my lord and he, being both men relating to the sea, under a kind aspect of his majesty, already good friends, and both virtuous and good families, their alliance might be of good use to us, and he did undertake to find out Sir George this morning, and put the business in execution. So being both well pleased with the proposition, I saw his niece there, and made her sing me two or three songs very prettily, and so home to the office, where to my great trouble I found Mr. Coventry and the board met before I come. I excused my late coming by having been on the river about office business. So to business all the morning. At noon Captain Ferrers and Mr. Moore dined with me, the former of them the first time I saw him since his coming from sea, who did give me the best conversation in general, and as good an account of the particular service of the Prince and my Lord of Sandwich in the late sea-fight, that I could desire. After dinner they parted. So I to Whitehall, where I with Creed and Povey, attended my Lord Treasurer, and did prevail with him to let us have an assignment for fifteen or twenty thousand pounds, which I hope will do our business for Tangier. So to Dr. Clark, and there found that he had broke the business to Sir G. Carteret, and that he takes the thing mighty well. Then I to Sir G. Carteret, at his chamber, and in the best manner I could, and most obligingly, moved the business. He received it with great respect and content, and thanks to me, and promised that he would do what he could possibly for his son, to render him fit for my lord's daughter, and shewed great kindness to me, and sense of my kindness to him herein. Sir William Penn told me this day, that Mr. Coventry is to be sworn a privy councillor, at which my soul is glad. So home, and to my letters by the post, and so home to supper, and bed. 25th, Lord's Day. Up, and several people about business come to me by appointment relating to the office. Then I to my closet about my Tangier papers. At noon dined, and then I abroad by water, it raining hard. Thinking to have gone down to Woolwich, but I did not, but back through bridge to Whitehall, where, after I had again visited Sir G. Carteret, and received his, and now his lady's, full content in my proposal, I went to my Lord Sandwich, and having told him how Sir G. Carteret received it, he did direct me to return to Sir G. Carteret, and give him thanks for his kind reception of this offer, and that he would the next day be willing to enter discourse with him about the business, which message I did presently do, and so left the business with great joy to both sides. My Lord, I perceive, intends to give five thousand pounds with her, and expects about eight hundred pounds per annum jointure. So by water home, and to supper and bed, being weary with long walking at court, but had a psalm or two with my boy and mercer before bed, which pleased me mightily. This night Sir G. Carter had told me with great kindness that the order of the council did run for the making of Hayter and Whitfield incapable of any serving the king again, but that he had stopped the entry of it, which he told me with great kindness, but the thing troubles me. After dinner, before I went to Whitehall, I went down to Greenwich by water, thinking to have visited Sir J. Lawson, where, when I come, I find that he is dead, and died this morning, at which I was much surprised, and indeed the nation hath a great loss, though I cannot, without dissembling, say that I am sorry for it, for he was a man never kind to me at all. Being at Whitehall, I visited Mr. Coventry, who, among other talk, entered about the great question now in the house, about the Duke's going to sea again, about which the whole house is divided. He did concur with me that for the Duke's honour and safety it were best, after so great a service and victory and danger, not to go again, and above all, that the life of the Duke cannot but be a security to the Crown. If he were away, it be more easy to attempt anything upon the King, but how the fleet will be governed without him, the Prince being a man of no government and severe in counsel, that no ordinary man can offer any advice against his, saying truly that it had been better he had gone to Guinea, 
and that were he away it were easy to say how matters might be ordered my lord sandwich being a man of temper and judgment as much as any man he ever knew and that upon good observation he said this and that his temper must correct the princess but i perceive he is much troubled what will be the event of the question and so i left him twenty sixth up and to whitehall with sir j minnes and to the committee of tangier where my lord treasurer was the first and only time he ever was there and did promise us fifteen thousand pounds for tangier and no more which will be short but if i can pay mr andrews all his money i care for no more and the bills of exchange thence with mr povey and creed below to a new chamber of mr povey's very pretty and there discourse about his business not to his content but with the most advantage i could to him and creed also did the like thence with creed to the king's head and there dined with him at the ordinary and good sport with one mr nichols a prating coxcomb that would be thought a poet but would not be got to repeat any of his verses thence i home and there find my wife's brother and his wife a pretty little modest woman where they dined with my wife he did come to desire my assistance for a living and upon his good promises of care and that it should be no burden to me i did say and promise i would think of finding something for him and the rather because his wife seems a pretty discreet young thing and humble and he above all things desirous to do something to maintain her telling me sad stories of what she endured with him in holland and i hope it will not be burdensome so down by water to woolwich walking to and again from greenwich thither and back again my business being to speak again with sheldon who desires and expects my wife coming thither to spend the summer and upon second thoughts i do agree that it will be a good place for her and me too so weary home and to my office a while till almost midnight and so to bed the plague increases mightily i this day seeing a house at a bitmaker's over against st clement's church in the open street shut up which is a sad sight twenty seventh up and to the office where all the morning at noon dined by chance at my lady batten's and they sent for my wife and there was my lady pen and peg very merry and so i to my office again where till twelve o'clock at night and so home to supper and to bed twenty eighth sir j minnes carried me and my wife to whitehall and thence his coach along with my wife where she would there after attending the duke to discourse of the navy we did not kiss his hand nor do i think for all their pretence of going away to-morrow yet i believe they will not go for good and all but i did take my leave of sir william coventry who it seems was knighted and sworn a privy councillor two days since who with his old kindness treated me and i believe i shall ever find him a noble friend thence by water to blackfriars and so to paul's churchyard and bespoke several books and so home and there dined my man william giving me a lobster sent in by my old maid sarah this morning i met with sir g carteret who tells me how all things proceed between my lord sandwich and himself to full content and both sides depend upon having the match finished presently and professed great kindness to me and said that now we were something akin i am mightily both with respect to myself and much more of my lord's family glad of this alliance after dinner to whitehall thinking to speak with my lord ashley but failed and i whiled away some time in westminster hall against he did come in my way observing several plague houses in king street and near the palace here i hear mrs martin is gone out of town and that her husband an idle fellow is since come out of france as he pretends but i believe not that he hath been i was fearful of going to any house but i did to the swan and thence to whitehall giving the waterman a shilling because a young fellow and belonging to the plymouth thence by coach to several places and so home and all the evening with sir j minnes and all the women of the house excepting my lady batten late in the garden chatting at twelve o'clock home to supper and to bed my lord sandwich is gone towards the sea to-day it being a sudden resolution i having taken no leave of him twenty ninth up and by water to whitehall where the court full of waggons and people ready to go out of town to the harp and ball and there drank and talked with mary she telling me in discourse that she lived lately at my neighbour's mr knightley which made me forbear further discourse this end of the town every day grows very bad of the plague the mortality bill is come to two hundred and sixty-seven which is about ninety more than the last and of these but four in the city which is a great blessing to us thence to creed and with him up and down about tangier business to no purpose took leave again of mr coventry though i hope the duke has not gone to stay and so do others too so home calling at somerset house where all are packing up to the queen mother setting out for france this day to drink bourbon water this year she being in a consumption and intends not to come till winter come twelve months so by coach home we are at the office all the morning and at noon mrs hunt dined with us very merry and she a very good woman to the office we are busy a while putting some things in my office in order and then to letters till night about ten o'clock home the days being sensibly shorter 
before I have once kept a summer's day by shutting up office by daylight. But my life hath been still as it was in winter almost. But I will for a month try what I can do by daylight. So home to supper and to bed. 30th. Up into Whitehall to the Duke of Albemarle, who I find at Secretary Bennett's, there being now no other great statesman, I think, but my Lord Chancellor in town. I received several commands from them, among others, to provide some bread and cheese for the garrison at Guernsey, which they promised to see me paid for. So to the change, and home to dinner. In the afternoon I down to Woolwich, and after me my wife and Mercer, whom I led to Mr. Sheldon's to see his house, and I find it a very pretty place for them to be at. So I back again, walking both forward and backward, and left my wife to come by water. I straight to Whitehall, late, to Secretary Bennett's, to give him an account of the business I received from him to-day and there stayed weary and sleepy till past twelve at night, then writ my mind to him, and so back by water and in the dark, and against tide shot the bridge, groping with their pole for the way, which troubled me before I got through. So home, about one or two o'clock in the morning, my family at a great loss what was become of me. To supper and to bed. Thus this book of two years ends. Myself and family in good health, consisting of myself and wife, Mercer, her woman, Mary, Alice and Susan, our maids, and Tom, my boy in a sickly time of the plague going on. Having upon my hands the troublesome care of the treasury of Tangier, with great sums drawn upon me, and nothing to pay them with, also the business of the office great, consideration of removing my wife to Woolwich, she lately busy in learning to paint, with great pleasure and success. All other things well, especially a new interest I am making, by a match in hand between the eldest son of Sir G. Carteret and my Lady Jemima Montague. The Duke of York gone down to the fleet, but all suppose not with intent to stay there, as it is not fit all men conceive, he should. July of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665, by Samuel Pepys. July, 1665. July 1st, 1665. Called up betimes, though weary and sleepy by appointment by Mr. Povey and Colonel Norwood, to discourse about some payments of Tangier. They gone, I to the office, and there sat all the morning. At noon dined at home, and then to the Duke of Albemarle's by appointment, to give him an account of some disorder in the yard at Portsmouth, by workmen's going away of their own accord for lack of money, to get work of haymaking, or anything else to earn themselves bread. Thence to Westminster, where I hear the sickness increases greatly, and to the harp and ball with Mary talking, who tells me simply her losing of her first love in the country in Wales, and coming up hither unknown to her friends, and it seems Dr. Williams do pretend love to her, and I have found him there several times, thence by coach and late at the office, and so to bed, sad at the news that seven or eight houses in Basinghall Street are shut up of the plague. Second Sunday. Up and all the morning dressing my closet at the office with my plates very neatly, and a fine place now it is, and will be a pleasure to sit in, though I thank God I needed none before. At noon dined at home, and after dinner to my accounts and cast them up, and find that though I have spent above ninety pounds this month, yet I have saved seventeen pounds, and am worth in all above one thousand four hundred and fifty pounds, for which the Lord be praised. In the evening my Lady Penn and daughter come to see, and supped with us, then a messenger about business of the office from Sir G. Carteret at Chatham, and by word of mouth did send me word that the business between my Lord and him is fully agreed on, and is mightily liked of by the King and the Duke of York, and that he sent me this word with great joy. They gone, we to bed. I hear this night that Sir J. Lawson was buried late last night at St. Dunstan's by us, without any company at all, and that the condition of his family is but very poor, which I could be contented to be sorry for, though he never was the man that ever obliged me by word or deed. Third, up and by water with Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnis to Whitehall, to the Duke of Albemarle, where, after a little business, we parted, and I to the harp and ball, and there stayed a while talking to Mary, and so home to dinner. After dinner to the Duke of Albemarle's again, and so to the Swan, and there demeurer un peu de temps qu'on la fille, and so to the harp and ball, and alone demeurer un peu de temps, besoin là, and so away home, and late at the office about letters, and so home, resolving from this night forwards to close all my letters if possible, and end all my business at the office by daylight, and I shall go near to do it and put all my affairs in the world in good order, the season growing so sickly, that it is much to be feared how a man can escape having a share with others in it, for which the good Lord God bless me, or to be fitted to receive it. So after supper to bed, and mightily troubled in my sleep all night with dreams of Jack Cole, my old schoolfellow lately dead, 
who was born at the same time with me, and we reckoned our fortunes pretty equal. God fit me for his condition. Fourth. Up and sat at the office all the morning, at noon to the change, and thence to the dolphin, where a good dinner, at the cost of one Mr. Osbaston, who lost a wager to Sir W. Batten, Sir W. Ryder, and Sir R. Ford, a good while since, and now it is spent. The wager was that ten of our ships should not have a fight with ten of the enemies before Michaelmas. Here was other very good company, and merry, and at last in come Mr. Buckworth, a very fine gentleman, and proves to be a Huntingdonshire man. Thence to my office, and there all the afternoon till night, and so home to settle some accounts of Tangier and other papers. I hear this day the Duke and Prince Rupert are both come back from sea, and neither of them go back again. The latter I much wonder at, but it seems the town reports so, and I am very glad of it. This morning I did a good piece of work with Sir W. Warren, ending the business of the lotteries, wherein, honestly, I think I shall get above a hundred pounds. Bankert, it seems, is come home with the little fleet he hath been abroad with, without doing anything, so that there is nobody of an enemy at sea. We are in great hopes of meeting with the Dutch East India fleet, which is mighty rich, or with De Reuter, who is so also. Sir Richard Ford told me this day at table a fine account, how the Dutch were like to have been mastered by the present Prince of Orange. His father to be besieged in Amsterdam, having drawn an army of foot into the town, and horse near to the town by night, within three miles of the town, and they never knew of it, but by chance the Hamburg post in the night fell among the horse, and heard their design, and knowing the way, it being very dark and rainy, better than they, went from them, and did give notice to the town before the others could reach the town, and so were saved. It seems this De Witt and another family, the Beckarts, were among the chief of the families that were enemies to the prince, and were afterwards suppressed by the prince, and continued so till he was, as they say, poisoned, and then they turned all again, as it was, against the young prince, and have so carried it to this day, it being about twelve and fourteen years, and a wit in the head of them. Fifth. Up and advised about sending of my wife's bedding and things to Woolwich, in order to her removal thither. So to the office, where all the morning till noon, and so to the change, and thence home to dinner. In the afternoon I abroad to St. James's, and there with Mr. Coventry a good while, and understand how matters are ordered in the fleet, that is, my Lord Sandwich goes Admiral, under him Sir G. Askew and Sir T. Teddyman, Vice-Admiral, Sir W. Penn, and under him Sir W. Barclay and Sir Joss Jordan, Rear Admiral Sir Thomas Allen, and under him Sir Christopher Mings, and Captain Harmon. We talked in general of business of the Navy, among others how he had lately spoken to Sir G. Carteret, and professed great resolution of friendship with him and reconciliation, and resolves to make it good as well as he can, though it troubles him, he tells me, that something will come before him wherein he must give him offence, but I do find upon the whole that Mr. Coventry do not listen to these complaints of money, with a readiness and resolvedness to remedy that he used to do, and I think if he begins to draw in, it is high time for me to do so too. From thence walked round to Whitehall, the part being quite locked up, and I observed a house shut up this day in the Pall Mall, where heretofore in Cromwell's time we young men used to keep our weekly clubs. And so to Whitehall to Sir G. Carteret, who is come this day from Chatham, and mighty glad he is to see me, and begun to talk of our great business of the match, which goes on as fast as possible. But for convenience we took water and over to his coach to Lambeth, by which we went to Deptford all the way talking, first how matters are quite concluded with all possible content between my lord and him, and signed and sealed, so that my lady Sandwich is to come thither to-morrow or next day, and the young lady is sent for, and all likely to be ended between them in a very little while, with mighty joy on both sides, and the king, duke, lord chancellor, and all mightily pleased. Thence to news, wherein I find that Sir G. Carteret do now take all my Lord Sandwich's business to heart, and makes it the same with his own. He tells me how at Chatham it was proposed to my Lord Sandwich to be joined with the Prince in the command of the fleet, which he was most willing to. But when it come to the Prince, he was quite against it, saying there could be no government, but that it would be better to have two fleets, and neither under the command of the other, which he would not agree to. So the king was not pleased, but without any unkindness did order the fleet to be ordered as above as to the admirals and commands, so the prince is come up, and Sir G. Carteret, I remember, had this word thence. That, says he, by this means, though the king told him that it would be but for this expedition, yet I believe we shall keep him out for altogether. He tells me how my lord was much troubled at Sir W. Penn's being ordered forth, as it seems he is, to go to Sol Bay, and with the best fleet he can to go forth and no notice taken of my Lord Sandwich going after him, and having the command over him. But after some discourse Mr. Coventry did satisfy, as he says, my Lord, so as they parted friends both in that point, and upon the other wherein I know my Lord was troubled, 
and which Mr. Coventry did speak to him of first, thinking that my lord might justly take offence at his not being mentioned in the relation of the fight in the news-book, and did clear all to my lord how little he was concerned in it, and therewith my lord also satisfied, which I am mightily glad of, because I should take it a very great misfortune to me to have them to, to differ above all the persons in the world. Being come to Deptford, my lady not being within, we parted, and I by water to Woolwich, where I found my wife come, and her two maids, and very prettily accommodated they will be. And I left them going to supper, grieved in my heart to part with my wife, being worse by much without her, though some trouble there is in having the care of a family at home in this plague time. And so took leave, and I in one boat, and W. Hewer in another, home, very late, first against tide, we having walked in the dark to Greenwich, late home and to bed, very lonely. Sixth, up and forth to give order to my pretty grocer's wife's house, who, her husband tells me, is going this day for the summer into the country. I bespoke some sugar, etc., for my father, and so home to the office, where all the morning. At noon dined at home, and then by water to Whitehall to Sir G. Carteret about money for the office. A sad thought, for in a little while all must go to rack, winter coming on apace, when a great sum must be ready to pay part of the fleet, and so far we are from it that we have not enough to stop the mouths of poor people and their hands from falling about our ears here almost in the office. God give a good end to it. Sir G. Carteret told me one considerable thing. Alderman Backwell is ordered abroad upon some private score with a great sum of money, wherein I was instrumental the other day in shipping him away. It seems some of his creditors have taken notice of it, and he was like to be broke yesterday in his absence, Sir G. Carteret telling me that the king and the kingdom must as good as fall with that man at this time, and that he was forced to get four thousand pounds himself to answer Backwell's people's occasions. Or he must have broke, but committed this to me as a great secret, and which I am heartily sorry to hear. Then, so after a little merry discourse of our marrying business, I parted, and by coach to several places, among others to see my lord Brunkert, who is not well, but was at rest when I come. I could not see him, nor had much mind, one of the great houses within two doors of him being shut up, and, Lord, the number of houses visited, which this day I observed through the town quite round in my way by Long Lane and London Wall. So home to the office, and thence to Sir W. Batten, and spent the evening at supper, and among other discourse the rashness of Sir John Lawson, for breeding up his daughter so high and proud, refusing a man of great interest, Sir W. Barclay, to match her with a melancholy fellow, Colonel Norton's son, of no interest nor good nature nor generosity at all, giving her six thousand pounds, when the other would have taken her with two. When he himself knew that he was not worth the money himself in all the world, he did give her that portion, and is since dead, and left his wife and two daughters beggars, and the other gone away with six thousand pounds and no content in it, through the ill qualities of her father-in-law and husband, who, it seems, though a pretty woman, contracted for her as if he had been buying a horse, and, worst of all, is now of no use to serve the mother and two little sisters in any stead at court, whereas the other might have done what he would for her. So here is an end of this family's pride, which, with good care, might have been what they would, and done well. Thence, weary of this discourse, as the act of the greatest rashness that ever I heard of in all my little conversation, we parted, and I home to bed. Sir W. Penn, it seems, sailed last night from Sol Bay with about sixty sail of ship, and my Lord Sandwich and the Prince, and some others, it seems, going after them to overtake them, for I am sure my Lord Sandwich will do all possible to overtake them, and will be troubled to the heart if he do it not. Seventh. Up, and having set my neighbour, Mr. Hudson, wine-coopers, at work, drawing out a tears of wine for the sending of some of it to my wife, I abroad, only taking notice to what a condition it hath pleased God to bring me, that at this time I have two tierces of claret, two quarter casks of canary, and a smaller vessel of sack, a vessel of tent, another of Malaga, and another of white wine, all in my wine-cellar together, which I believe none of my friends of my name now alive ever had of his own at one time. To Westminster, and there with Mr. Povey and Creed, talking of our Tangier business, and by and by I drew Creed aside, and acquainted him with what Sir G. Carteret did tell me about Backwell the other day, because he hath money of his in his hands. So home, taking some new books, five pounds worth, home to my great content. At home all the day after, busy. Some excellent discourse and advice of Sir W. Warren's in the afternoon. At night home to look over my new books, and so late to bed. Eighth. All day very diligent at the office. Ended my letters by nine at night, and then fitted myself to go down to Woolwich to my wife, which I did, calling at Sir G. Carteret's at Deptford, and there hear that my lady Sandwich is come, but not very well. By twelve o'clock to Woolwich, found my wife asleep in bed. But strange to think what a fine night I had down, but before I had been one minute on shore, the mightiest storm come of wind and rain, 
that almost could be, for a quarter of an hour, and so left, I to bed, being the first time I come to her lodgings, and there lodged well. Ninth, Lord's Day, very pleasant with her and among my people, while she made her ready, and about ten o'clock by water to Sir G. Carteret, and there find my lady in her chamber not very well, but looks the worse almost that ever I did see her in my life. It seems her drinking of the water at Tunbridge did almost kill her, before she could with most violent physic get it out of her body again. We are received with most extraordinary kindness by my lady Carteret, and her children, and dined most nobly. Sir G. Carteret went to court this morning. After dinner I took occasion to have much discourse with Mr. Phil Carteret, and find him a very modest man, and I think verily of mighty good nature and pretty understanding. He did give me a good account of the fight with the Dutch. My lady Sandwich dined in her chamber. About three o'clock I, leaving my wife there, took boat and home, and there shifted myself into my black silk suit, and having promised Harmon yesterday, I to his house, which I find very mean, and mean company. His wife very ill, I could not see her. Here I, with her father and Kate Joyce, who was also very ill, were godfathers and godmother to his boy, and was christened Will. Mr. Meryton christened him. The most observable thing I found there to my content was to hear him and his clerk tell me that in this parish of Mitchell's Cornhill, one of the middlemost parishes, and a great one of the town, there hath, notwithstanding this sickliness, been buried of any disease, man, woman, or child, not one for thirteen months last past, which is very strange, and the like in a good degree in most other parishes, I hear, saving only of the plague in them, but in this neither the plague nor any other disease. So back again home, and reshifted myself, and so down to my Lady Carteret's, where mighty merry, and great pleasantness between my Lady Sandwich and the young ladies, and me, and all of us mighty merry, there never having been in the world sure a greater business of general content than this match proposed between Mr. Carteret and my Lady Jemima. But withal it is mighty pretty to think how my poor Lady Sandwich, between her and me, is doubtful whether her daughter will like of it or no, and how troubled she is for fear of it which I do not fear at all, and desire her not to do it, but her fear is the most discreet and pretty that ever I did see. Late here, and then my wife and I, with most hearty kindness from my lady Carteret, by boat to Woolwich, come thither about twelve at night, and so to bed. 10th. Up, oh, and with great pleasure, looking over a nest of puppies, of Mr. Sheldon's, with which my wife is most extraordinary pleased, and one of them is promised her. Anon I took my leave, and away by water to the Duke of Albemarle's where he tells me that I must be at Hampton Court anon. So I home to look over my Tangier papers, and, having a coach of Mr. Povey's attending me, by appointment, in order to my coming to dine at his country house at Brainford, where he and his family is, I went, and Mr. Tasper with me therein, it being a pretty chariot, but most inconvenient as to the horses throwing dust and dirt into one's eyes and upon one's clothes. There I stayed a quarter of an hour, Creed being there, and being able to do little business, but the less the better. Creed rode before, and Mr. Povey and I after him in the chariot, and I was set down by him at the park pale, where one of his saddle-horses was ready for me, he himself not daring to come into the house or be seen, because that a servant of his, out of his horse, happened to be sick, but is not yet dead, but was never suffered to come into his house after he was ill. But this opportunity was taken to injure Povey, and most horribly he is abused by some persons hereupon, and his fortune, I believe, quite broke but that he hath a good heart to bear, or a cunning one to conceal his evil. There I met with Sir W. Coventry, and by and by was heard by my Lord Chancellor and Treasurer about our Tangier money, and my Lord Treasurer had ordered me to forbear meddling with the fifteen thousand pounds he offered me the other day, but upon opening the case to them they did offer it again, and so I think I shall have it, but my Lord General must give his consent in it, this money having been promised to him, and he very angry at the proposal. Here, though I have not been in many years, yet I lack time to stay, besides that it is, I perceive, an unpleasing thing to be at court, everybody being fearful one of another, and also sad, inquiring after the plague, so that I stole away by my horse to Kingston, and there with trouble was forced to press two sturdy rogues to carry me to London, and met at the waterside with Mr. Charnock, Sir Philip Warwick's clerk, who had been in company and was quite foxed. I took him with me in my boat, and so away to Richmond, and there by night walked with him to Mortlake, a very pretty walk, and there stayed a good while, now and then talking and sporting with Nan the servant, who says she is a seaman's wife, and at last bade good night. Eleventh. And so all night down by water, a most pleasant passage, and come thither by two o'clock, and so walked from the old swan home, and there to bed to my will, being very weary, and he lodging at my desire in my house. At six o'clock up and to Westminster, 
where and all the town besides i hear the plague increases and it being too soon to go to the duke of albemarle i to the harp and ball and there made a bargain with mary to go forth with me in the afternoon which she with much ado consented to so i to the duke of albemarle's and there with much ado did get his consent in part to my having the money promised for tangier and the other part did not concur so being displeased with this i back to the office and there sat alone a while doing business and then by a solemn invitation to the trinity house where a great dinner and company captain dobbin's feast for elder brother but i broke up before the dinner half over and by water to the harp and ball and then had mary meet me at the new exchange and there took coach and i with great pleasure took the air to highgate and thence to hampstead much pleased with her company pretty and innocent and had what pleasure almost i would with her and so at night weary and sweaty it being very hot beyond bearing we back again and i set her down in st martin's lane and so i to the evening change and there hear all the town full that ostend is delivered to us and that alderman backwell did go with fifty thousand pounds to that purpose but the truth of it i do not know but something i believe there is extraordinary in his going so to the office where i did what i could as to letters and so away to bed shifting myself and taking some venice treacle feeling myself out of order and thence to bed to sleep twelfth after doing what business i could in the morning it being a solemn fast day for the plague growing upon us i took boat and down to deptford where i stood with great pleasure an hour or two by my lady sandwich's bedside talking to her she lying prettily in bed of my lady jemima's being from my lady pickering's when our letters come to that place she being at my lord montague's about em. the truth is i had received letters of it two days ago but had dropped them and was in a very extraordinary strait what to do for them or what account to give my lady but sent to every place i sent to mortlake where i had been the night before and there they were found which with mighty joy comes safe to me but all ending with satisfaction to my lady and me though i find my lady carteret not much pleased with this delay and principally because of the plague which renders it unsafe to stay long at deptford i eat a bit my lady carteret being the most kind lady in the world and so took boat and a fresh boat at the tar and so up the river against tide all the way i having lost it by staying prating to and with my lady and from before one made it seven ere we got to hampton court and when i come there all business was over saving my finding mr coventry at his chamber and with him a good while about several businesses at his chamber and so took leave and away to my boat and all night upon the water staying a while with nan at mortlake very much pleased and merry with her and so on homeward and come home by two o'clock shooting the bridge at that time of night and so to bed where i find will is not he staying at woolwich to come with my wife to dinner to-morrow to my lady carteret's heard mr williamson repeat at hampton court to-day how the king of france hath lately set out a most high arrest against the pope which is reckoned very lofty and high thirteenth lay long being sleepy and then up to the office my lord brunker after his sickness being come to the office and did what business there was and so i by water at night late to sir g carteret's but there being no oars to carry me i was fain to call a sculler that had a gentleman already in it and he proved a man of love to music and he and i sung together the way down with great pleasure and an instant extraordinary to be met with there come to dinner they having dined but my lady caused something to be brought for me and i dined well and mighty merry especially my lady slaining and i about eating of cream and brown bread which she loves as much as i thence after long discourse with them and my lady alone i and my wife who by agreement met here took leave and i saw my wife a little way down it troubling me that this absence makes us a little strange instead of more fond and so parted and i home to some letters and then home to bed above seven hundred died of the plague this week fourteenth up and all the morning at the exchequer endeavouring to strike tallies for money for tangier and mightily vexed to see how people attend there some out of town and others drowsy and to others it was late so that the king's business suffers ten times more than all their service is worth so i am put off to to-morrow thence to the old exchange by water and there bespoke two fine shirts of my pretty seamstress who she tells me serves jack fenn upon the change all the news is that guns have been heard and that news is come by a dane that my lord was in view of de Reuter, and that since his parting from my lord of sandwich he hath heard guns but little of it do i think true so home to dinner where povey by agreement and after dinner we to talk of our tangier matters about keeping our profit at the pay and victualling of the garrison if the present undertakers should leave it wherein i did not nor will do anything unworthy me and any just man 
but they being resolved to quit it it is fit i should suffer mr povey to do what he can with mr gordon about it to our profit thence to the discoursing of putting some sums of money in order and tallies which we did pretty well so he in the evening gone i by water to sir g carteret's and there find my lady sandwich and her buying things for my lady jem's wedding and my lady jem is beyond expectation come to dagenham where mr carteret is to go to visit her to-morrow and my proposal of waiting on him he being to go alone to all persons strangers to him was well accepted and so i go with him but lord to see how kind my lady carteret is to her sends her most rich jewels and provides bedding and things of all sorts most richly for her which makes my lady and me out of our wits almost to see the kindness she cheats us all with as if they would buy the young lady thence away home and foreseeing my being abroad two days did sit up late making of letters ready against to-morrow and other things and so to bed to be up betimes by the help of a larum watch which by chance i borrowed of my watchmaker to-day while my own is mending fifteenth up and after all business done though late i to deptford but before i went out of the office saw the young bagwell's wife return but could not stay to speak to her though i had a great mind to it and also another great lady as to fine clothes did attend there to have a ticket signed which i did do taking her through the garden to my office where i signed it and had a salute of her and so i away by boat to redriff and thence walked and after dinner at sir g carteret's where they stayed till almost three o'clock for me and anon took boat mr carteret and i to the ferry place at greenwich and there stayed an hour crossing the water to and again to get our coach and horses over and by and by set out and so toward dagenham's but lord what silly discourse we had by the way as to love matters he being the most awkward man i ever met with in my life as to that business thither we come by that time it begun to be dark and were kindly received by lady wright and my lord crew and to discourse they went my lord discoursing with him asking of him questions of travel which he answered well enough in a few words but nothing to the lady from him at all to supper and after supper to talk again he yet taking no notice of the lady my lord would have had me have consented to leaving the young people together to-night to begin their amours his stay being but to be little but i advised against it lest the lady might be too much surprised so they led him up to his chamber where i stayed a little to know how he liked the lady which he told me he did mightily but lord in the dullest insipid manner that ever lover did so i bid him good-night and down to prayers with my lord crew's family and after prayers my lord and lady wright and i to consult what to do and it was agreed at last to have them go to church together as the family used to do though his lameness was a great objection against it but at last my lady jem sent me word by my lady wright that it would be better to do just as they used to do before his coming and therefore she desired to go to church which was yielded then too sixteen lord's day i up having lain with mr moore in the chaplain's chamber and having trimmed myself down to mr carteret and he being ready we down and walked in the gallery an hour or two it being a most noble and pretty house that ever for the bigness i saw here i taught him what to do to take the lady always by the hand to lead her and telling him that i would find opportunity to leave them two together he should make these and these compliments and also take a time to do the like to lord crew and lady wright after i had instructed him which he thanked me for owning that he needed my teaching him my lord crew come down and family the young lady among the rest and so by coaches to church four miles off where a pretty good sermon and a declaration of penitence of a man that had undergone the church's censure for his wicked life thence back again by coach mr carteret having not had the confidence to take his lady once by the hand coming or going which i told him of when we come home and he will hereafter do it so to dinner my lord excellent discourse then to walk in the gallery and to sit down by and by my lady wright and i go out and then my lord crew he not by design and lastly my lady crew come out and left the young people together and a little pretty daughter of my lady wright's most innocently come out after it and shut the door too as if she had done it poor child by inspiration which made us without have good sport to laugh at they together an hour and by and by church time whither he led her into the coach and into the church and so at church all the afternoon several handsome ladies at church but it was most extraordinary hot that ever i knew it so home again and to walk in the gardens where we left the young couple a second time and my lady wright and i to walk together who to my trouble tells me that my lady jem must have something done to her body by scott before she can be married and therefore care must be had to send him also that some more new clothes must of necessity be made her which and other things i took care of 
Anon to supper, an excellent discourse and dispute between my Lord Crewe and the chaplain, who is a good scholar, but a nonconformist. Here this evening I spoke with Mrs. Carter, my old acquaintance, that hath lived with my lady these twelve or thirteen years. The sum of all whose discourse and others for her is, that I would get her a good husband, which I have promised, but know not when I shall perform. After Mr. Carter was carried to his chamber, we to prayers again, and then to bed. 17th. Up, all of us, and to billiards, my lady Wright, Mr. Carter, myself, and everybody. By and by the young couple left together. Anon to dinner, and after dinner Mr. Carter took my advice about giving to the servants, and I let him to give ten pounds among them, which he did, by leaving it to the chief manservant, Mr. Meadows, to do for him. Before we went, I took my lady Gem apart, and would know how she liked this gentleman, and whether she was under any difficulty concerning him. She blushed and hid her face a while, but at last I forced her to tell me. She answered that she could readily obey what her father and mother had done, which was all she could say, or I expect. So anon I took leave, and for London. But, Lord, to see, among other things, how all these great people here are feared of London, being doubtful of anything that comes from thence, or that hath lately been there, that I was forced to say that I lived wholly at Woolwich. In our way, Mr. Carteret did give me mighty thanks for my care and pains for him, and is mightily pleased, though the truth is my Lady Gem hath carried herself with mighty discretion and gravity, not being forward at all in any degree, but mighty serious in her answers to him, as by what he says, and I observed, I collect. To London to my office, and there took letters from the office, where all well, and so to the bridge, and there he and I took boat, and to Deptford, where mighty welcome, and brought the good news of all being pleased to them. Mighty mirth at my giving them an account of all, but the young man could not be got to say one word before me or my lady sandwich of his adventures. But by what he afterwards related to his father and mother and sisters, he gives an account that pleases them mightily. Here Sir G. Carteret would have me lie all night, which I did most nobly, better than ever I did in my life, Sir G. Carteret being mighty kind to me, leading me to my chamber, and all their care now is to have the business ended, and they have reason, because the sickness puts all out of order, and they cannot safely stay where they are. Eighteenth. Up and to the office, where all the morning, and so to my house, and eat a bit of victuals, and so to the change, where a little business, and a very thin exchange, and so walked through London to the temple, where I took water for Westminster to the Duke of Albemarle to wait on him, and so to Westminster Hall, and there paid for my news books, and did give Mrs. Mitchell, who is going out of town because of the sickness, and her husband, a pint of wine, and so Sir W. Warren, coming to me by appointment, we away by water home, by the way discoursing about the project I have of getting some money, and doing the king good service too, about the mast dock at Woolwich, which I fear will never be done if I do not go about it. After dispatching letters at the office, I by water down to Deptford, where I stayed a little while, and by water to my wife, whom I have not seen six or five days, and there supped with her, and mighty pleasant, and saw with content her drawings, and so to bed, mighty merry. I was much troubled this day to hear at Westminster how the officers do bury the dead in the open Tuttle fields, pretending want of room elsewhere, whereas the new chapel churchyard was walled in at the public charge in the last plague time, merely for want of room, and now none, but such as are able to pay dear for it, can be buried there. 19th. Up and to the office, and thence presently to the exchequer, and there with much trouble got my tallies, and afterwards took Mr. Faulkner, Spicer, and another or two to the leg, and there give them a dinner. And so with my tallies, and about thirty dozen of bags, which it seems are my due, having paid the fees as if I had received the money, I away home, and after a little stay, down my water to Deptford, where I find all full of joy, and preparing to go to Dagenham's to-morrow. To supper, and after supper, to talk without end. Very late I went away, it raining, but I had a design pour aller à la femme de Baguel, and did so. So away about twelve, and it raining hard, I back to Sir G. Carteret, and there called up the page, and to bed there, being all in a most violent sweat. Twentieth. Up in a boat among other people to the tower, and there to the office, where we sat all the morning. So down to Deptford, and there dined, and after dinner saw my Lady Sandwich and Mr. Carteret and his two sisters over the water, going to Dagenham's, and my Lady Carteret towards Cranbourne. So all the company broke up in most extraordinary joy, wherein I am mighty contented that I have had the good fortune to be so instrumental, and I think it will be of good use to me. So walk to Redriff, where I hear the sickness is, and indeed is scattered almost everywhere, there dying 1,089 of the plague this week. My Lady Carteret did this day give me a bottle of plague water home with me. So home to write letters late, and then home to bed, 
where I have not lain these three or four nights. I received yesterday a letter from my Lord Sandwich, giving me thanks for my care about their marriage business, and desiring it to be dispatched, that no disappointment may happen therein, which I will help on all I can. This afternoon I waited on the Duke of Albemarle, and so to Mrs. Croft's, where I found and saluted Mrs. Burroughs, who is a very pretty woman for a mother of so many children. But, Lord, to see how the plague spreads, it being now all over King Street at the Axe and next door to it, and in other places. 21st. Up and abroad to the goldsmiths, to see what money I could get upon my present tallies upon the advance of the excise, and I hope I shall get ten thousand pounds. I went also and had them entered at the excise office. Alderman Backwell is at sea. Sir R. Viner come to town but this morning. So Colville was the only man I could yet speak with all to get any money off. Met with Mr. Povey, and I with him, and dined at the Custom House Tavern, there to talk of our Tangier business, and Stockdale and Hewitt with us. So abroad to several places, among others to Anthony Joyce's, and there broke to him my desire to have Paul married to Harmon, whose wife, poor woman, is lately dead, to my trouble, I loving her very much, and he will consider it. So home and late at my chamber, setting some papers in order, the plague growing very raging, and my apprehensions of it great. So very late to bed. 22nd. As soon as up, I among my goldsmiths, Sir Robert Viner and Colville, and there got ten thousand pounds of my new tallies accepted, and so I made it my work to find out Mr. Mervyn, and sent for others to come with their bills of exchange, as Captain Hewitt, etc., and sent for Mr. Jackson, but he was not in town. So all the morning at the office, and after dinner, which was very late, I to Sir Arvinus, by his invitation in the morning, and got near five thousand more accepted, and so from this day the whole, or near fifteen thousand pounds, lies upon interest. Thence I by water to Westminster, and the Duke of Albemarle being gone to dinner to my Lord of Canterbury's, I thither, and there walked and viewed the new hall, a new old-fashioned hall, as much as possible, begun, and means left for the ending of it, by Bishop Juxon. Not coming proper to speak with him, I to Vauxhall, where to the Spring Garden, but I do not see one guest there, the town being so empty of anybody to come thither. Only while I was there, a poor woman come to scold with the master of the house that a kinswoman, I think, of hers, that was newly dead of the plague, might be buried in the churchyard, for, for her part, she should not be buried in the commons, as they said she should. Back to Whitehall, and by and by comes the Duke of Albemarle, and there, after a little discourse, I by coach home, not meeting with but two coaches, and but two carts from Whitehall, to my own house, that I could observe, and the streets mighty thin of people. I met this noon with Dr. Burnett, who told me, and I find in the news-book this week that he posted upon the change, that whoever did spread the report that, instead of the plague, his servant was by him killed, it was forgery, and shewed me the acknowledgment of the master of the pest-house, that his servant died of a bubo on his right groin, and two spots on his right thigh, which is the plague. To my office, where late writing letters, and getting myself prepared with business for Hampton Court to-morrow and so having caused a good pullet to be got for my supper, all alone, I very late to bed. All the news is great, that we must of necessity fall out with France, for he will side with the Dutch against us. That Alderman Backwell is gone over, which indeed he is, with money, and that Ostend is in our present possession. But it is strange to see how poor Alderman Backwell is like to be put to it in his absence, Mr. Shaw, his right hand, being ill. And the Alderman's absence gives doubts to people, and I perceive they are in great straits for money, besides what Sir G. Carter had told me about fourteen days ago. Our fleet under my Lord Sandwich being about the latitude fifty-five, which is a great secret, to the northward of the Texel. So to bed very late. In my way I called upon Sir W. Turner, and at Mr. Shellcross's, but he was not at home, having left his bill with Sir W. Turner, that so I may prove I did what I could, as soon as I had money to answer all bills. 23rd. Lord's Day. Up very betimes, called by Mr. Cutler by appointment, and with him in his coach and four horses over London Bridge to Kingston, a very pleasant journey, and at Hampton Court by nine o'clock, and in our way very good and various discourse, as he is a man, that though I think he be a knave, as the world thinks him, yet a man of great experience, and worthy to be heard discourse. When we come there, we to Sir W. Coventry's chamber, and there discourse long with him, he and I alone, the others being gone away, and so walked together through the garden to the house, where we parted. 
i observing with a little trouble that he is too great now to expect too much familiarity with and i find he do not mind me as he used to do but when i reflect upon him and his business i cannot think much of it for i do not observe anything but the same great kindness from him i followed the king to chapel and there hear a good sermon and after sermon with my lord arlington sir thomas ingram and others spoke to the duke about tangier but not to much purpose i was not invited any whither to dinner though a stranger which did also trouble me but yet i must remember it is a court and indeed where most are strangers but however cutler carried me to mr marriott's the housekeeper and there we had a very good dinner and good company among others lily the painter thence to the council chamber where in a back room i sat all the afternoon but the council began late to sit and spent most of the time upon morisco's tar business they sat long and i forced to follow sir thomas ingram the duke and others so that when i got free and come to look for cutler he was gone with his coach without leaving any word with anybody to tell me so so that i was forced with great trouble to walk up and down looking of him and at last forced to get a boat to carry me to kingston and there after eating a bit at a neat inn which pleased me well i took boat and slept all the way without intermission from thence to queenhive where it being about two o'clock too late and too soon to go home to bed i lay and slept till about four twenty fourth and then up and home and there dressed myself and by appointment to deptford to sir g carteret's between six and seven o'clock where i found him and my lady almost ready and by and by went over to the ferry and took coach and six horses nobly for dagenham's himself and lady and their little daughter Luison, and myself in the coach where when we come we were bravely entertained and spent the day most pleasantly with the young ladies and i so merry as never more only for want of sleep and drinking of strong beer had a room in one of my eyes which troubled me much here with great content all the day as i think i ever passed a day in my life because of the contentfulness of our errand and the nobleness of the company and our manner of going but i find mr carteret yet as backward almost in his caresses as he was the first day at night about seven o'clock took coach again but lord to see in what a pleasant humour sir g carteret hath been both coming and going so light so fond so merry so boyish so much content he takes in this business it is one of the greatest wonders i ever saw in my mind but once in serious discourse he did say that if he knew his son to be a debauchee as many and most are nowadays about the court he would tell it and my lady jem should not have him and so enlarged both he and she about the baseness and looseness of the court and told several stories of the duke of monmouth and richmond and some great person my lord of ormond's second son married to a lady of extraordinary quality fit and that might have been made a wife for the king himself about six months since that this great person hath given the pox to and discoursed how much this would oblige the kingdom if the king would banish some of these great persons publicly from the court and wished it with all their hearts we set out so late that it grew dark so as we doubted the losing of our way and a long time it was or seemed before we could get to the water-side and that about eleven at night where when we come all merry only my eye troubled me as i said we found no ferry-boat was there nor no oars to carry us to deptford however afterwards oars was called from the other side at greenwich but when it come a frolic being mighty merry took us and there we would sleep all night in the coach in the isle of dogs so we did there being now with us my lady scott and with great pleasure drew up the glasses and slept till daylight and then some victuals and wine being brought us we ate a bit and so up and took boat merry as might be and when come to sir g carteret's there all to bed twenty fifth our good humour in everybody continuing and there i slept till seven o'clock then up and to the office well refreshed my eye only troubling me which by keeping a little covered with my handkerchief and washing now and then with cold water grew better by night at noon to the change which was very thin and thence homeward and was called in by mr rawlinson with whom i dined and some good company very harmlessly merry but sad the story of the plague in the city it growing mightily this day my lord brunker did give me mr grant's book upon the bills of mortality new printed and enlarged thence to my office a while full of business and thence by coach to the duke of albemarle's not meeting one coach going nor coming from my house thither and back again which is very strange one of my chief errands was to speak to sir w clark about my wife's brother who importunes me and i doubt he do want mightily but i can do little for him there as to employment in the army and out of my purse i dare not for fear of a precedent and letting him come often to me is troublesome and dangerous too he living in the dangerous part of the town 
but I will do what I can possibly for him, and as soon as I can. Mightily troubled all this afternoon with masters coming to me about bills of exchange, and my signing them upon my goldsmiths, but I did send for them all, and hope to ease myself this week of all the clamour. These two or three days Mr. Shaw at Alderman Backhall's hath lain sick, like to die, and is feared will not live a day to an end. At night home and to bed, my head full of business, and among others, this day come a letter to me from Paris for my Lord Hinchingbrook, about his coming over, and I have sent this night an order from the Duke of Albemarle for a ship of thirty-six guns to go to Calais to fetch him. 26th up and after doing a little business down to deptford with sir w batten and there left him and i to greenwich to the park where i hear the king and duke are come by water this morn from hampton court they asked me several questions the king mightily pleased with his new buildings there i followed them to castle ship in building and there met sir w batten and thence to sir g carteret's where all the morning with them they not having any but the duke of monmouth and sir w killigrew and one gentleman and a page more great variety of talk and was often led to speak to the king and duke by and by they to dinner and all to dinner and sat down to the king saving myself which though i could not in modesty expect yet god forgive my pride i was sorry i was there that sir w batten should say that he could sit down where i could not though he had twenty times more reason than i but this was my pride and folly i down and walked with mr castle who told me the design of ford and rider to oppose and do all the hurt they can to captain taylor in his new ship the london and how it comes and that they are a couple of false persons which i believe and withal that he himself is a knave too down to woolwich and there i just saw and kissed my wife and saw some of her painting which is very curious and away again to the king and back again with him in the barge hearing him and the duke talk and seeing and observing their manner of discourse and god forgive me though i admire them with all the duty possible yet the more a man considers and observes them the less he finds of difference between them and other men though blessed be god they are both princes of great nobleness and spirits the barge put me into another boat that come to our side mr holder with a bag of gold to the duke and so they away and i home to the office the duke of monmouth is the most skittish leaping gallant that ever i saw always in action vaulting or leaping or clambering Thence mighty full of the honour of this day, I took coach and to Kate Joyce's, but she not within, but spoke with Antony, who tells me he likes well of my proposal for Paul to Harmon, but I fear that less than five hundred pounds will not be taken, and that I shall not be able to give, though I did not say so to him. After a little other discourse and the sad news of the death of so many in the parish of the plague, forty last night, the bell always going, I back to the exchange, where I went up and sat talking with my beauty, Mrs. Batelier, a great while who is indeed one of the finest women I ever saw in my life. After buying some small matter, I home, and there to the office, and saw Sir J. Minnes, now come from Portsmouth. I home to set my journal for these four days in order, they being four days of as great content and honour and pleasure to me, as ever I hope to live or desire or think anybody else can live. For methinks if a man would but reflect upon this, and think that all these things are ordered by God Almighty to make me contented, and even this very marriage now on foot is one of the things intended to find me content in in my life and matter of mirth methinks it should make one mightily more satisfied in the world than he is this day poor robin shaw at backwell's died and backwell himself now in flanders the king himself asked about shaw and being told he was dead said he was very sorry for it the sickness has got into our parish this week and is got indeed everywhere so that i begin to think of setting things in order which i pray god enable me to put both as to soul and body twenty seventh called up at four o'clock up and to my preparing some papers for hampton court and so by water to foxhall and there mr gordon's coach took me up and by and by i took up him and so both thither a brave morning to ride in and good discourse with him among others he begun with me to speak of the tangier vitellers resigning their employment and his willingness to come on of which i was glad and took the opportunity to answer him with all kindness and promise of assistance. He told me a while since my Lord Barclay did speak of it to him, and yesterday a message from Sir Thomas Ingram. When I come to Hampton Court, I find Sir T. Ingram and Creed ready with papers signed for the putting of Mr. Gordon in, upon a resignation signed to by Lanyon and sent to Sir Thomas Ingram. At this I was surprised, but yet was glad, and so it passed, but with respect enough to those that are in, at least without anything ill taken from it. I got another order signed about the boats, which I think I should get something by. So dispatch all my business, having assurance of continuance of all hearty love from Sir W. Coventry, 
and so we stayed and saw the king and queen set out towards salisbury and after them the duke and duchess whose hands i did kiss and it was the first time i did ever or did see anybody else kiss her hand and it was a most fine white and fat hand but it was pretty to see the young pretty ladies dressed like men in velvet coats caps with ribbons and with lace bands just like men only the duchess herself it did not become they gone we with great content took coach again and hungry come to clapham about one o'clock and creed thereto before us where a good dinner the house having dined and so to walk up and down in the gardens mighty pleasant by and by comes by promise to me sir g carteret and viewed the house above and below and sat and drank there and i had a little opportunity to kiss and spend some time with the ladies above his daughter a buxom lass and his sister fissant a serious lady and a little daughter of hers that begins to sing prettily thence with mighty pleasure with sir g carteret by coach with great discourse of kindness with him to my lord sandwich and to me also and i every day see more good by the alliance almost at deptford i light and walked over to halfway house and so home in my way being shown my cousin patience's house which seems at distance a pretty house at home met the weekly bill where above one thousand increased in the bill and of them in all about one thousand seven hundred of the plague which hath made the officers this day resolve of sitting at deptford which puts me to some consideration what to do therefore home to think and consider of everything about it and without determining anything eat a little supper and to bed full of the pleasure of these six or seven last days twenty eighth up betimes and down to deptford where after a little discourse with sir g carteret who is much displeased with the order of our officers yesterday to remove the office to deptford pretending other things but to be sure it is with regard to his own house which is much because his family is going away i am glad i was not at the order-making and so i will endeavour to alter it set out with my lady all alone with her with six horses to dagenham's going by water to the ferry and a pleasant going and good discourse and when there very merry and the young couple now well acquainted but lord to see in what fear all the people here do live would make one mad they are feared of us that come to them insomuch that i am troubled at it and wish myself away but some cause they have for the chaplain with whom but a week or two ago we were here mighty high disputing is since fallen into a fever and dead being gone hence to a friend's a good way off a sober and a healthful man these considerations make us all hasten the marriage and resolve it upon monday next which is three days before we intended it mighty merry all of us and in the evening with full content took coach again and home by daylight with great pleasure and thence i down to woolwich where i find my wife well and after drinking and talking a little we to bed twenty ninth up betimes and after viewing some of my wife's pictures which now she is come to do very finely to my great satisfaction beyond what i could ever look for i went away and by water to the office where nobody to meet me but busy all the morning at noon to dinner where i hear that my will is come in thither and laid down upon my bed ill of the headache which put me into extraordinary fear and i studied all i could to get him out of the house and sent my people to work to do it without discouraging him and myself went forth to the old exchange to pay my fair batelier for some linen and took leave of her they breaking up shop for a while and so by coach to kate joyce's and there used all the vehemence and rhetoric i could to get her husband to let her go down to brampton but i could not prevail with him he urging some simple reasons but most that of profit minding the house and the distance if either of them should be ill however i did my best and more than i had a mind to do but that i saw him so resolved against it while she was mightily troubled at it at last he yielded she should go to windsor to some friends there so i took my leave of them believing that it is great odds that we ever all see one another again for i dare not go any more to that end of the town so home and to writing of letters hard and then at night home and fell to my tangier papers till late and then to bed in some ease of mind that will is gone to his lodging and that he is likely to do well it being only the headache thirtieth lord's day up and in my nightgown cap and neckcloth undressed all day long lost not a minute but in my chamber setting my tangier accounts to rights which i did by night to my very heart's content not only that it is done but i find everything right and even beyond what after so long neglecting them i did hope for the lord of heaven be praised for it will was with me to-day and is very well again it was a sad noise to hear our bell to toll and ring so often to-day either for deaths or burials i think five or six times at night weary with my day's work but full of joy at my having done it i to bed being to rise betimes to-morrow to go to the wedding at dagenham's so to bed fearing that i have got some cold sitting in my loose garments all this day thirty-first up and very betimes by six o'clock at deptford and there find sir g carteret and my lady ready to go i being in my new coloured silk suit 
and coat trimmed with gold buttons and gold broad lace round my hands very rich and fine by water to the ferry where when we come no coach there and tide of herb so far spent as the horse-boat could not get off on the other side the river to bring away the coach so we were fain to stay there in the unlucky isle of dogs in a chill place the morning cool and wind fresh above two if not three hours to our great discontent yet being upon a pleasant errand and seeing that it could not be helped we did bear it very patiently and it was worth my observing i thought as ever anything to see how upon these two scores sir g carteret the most passionate man in the world and that was in greatest haste to be gone did bear with it and very pleasant all the while at least not troubled much so as to fret and storm at it anon the coach comes in the meantime there coming a news thither with his horse to go over that told us he did come from islington this morning and that proctor the vintner of the mitre in wood street and his son are dead this morning there of the plague he having laid out abundance of money there and was the greatest vintner for some time in london for great entertainments we fearing the canonical hour would be passed before we got thither did with a great deal of unwillingness send away the license and wedding-ring so that when we come though we drove hard with six horses yet we found them gone from home and going towards the church met them coming from church which troubled us but however that trouble was soon over hearing it was well done they being both in their old clothes my lord crew giving her there being three coachfuls of them the young lady mighty sad which troubled me but yet i think it was only her gravity in a little greater degree than usual all saluted her but i did not till my lady sandwich did ask me whether i had saluted her or no so to dinner and very merry we were but yet in such a sober way as never almost any wedding was in so great families but it was much better after dinner company divided some to cards others to talk my lady sandwich and i up to settle accounts and pay her some money and mighty kind she is to me and would fain have had me gone down for company with her to hinchingbrook but for my life i cannot at night to supper and so to talk and which methought was the most extraordinary thing all of us to prayers as usual and the young bride and bridegroom too and so after prayers soberly to bed only i got into the bridegroom's chamber while he undressed himself and there was very merry till he was called to the bride's chamber and into bed they went i kissed the bride in bed and so the curtains drawn with the greatest gravity that could be and so good night but the modesty and gravity of this business was so decent that it was to me indeed ten times more delightful than if it had been twenty times more merry and jovial whereas i feared i must have sat up all night we did here all get good beds and i lay in the same i did before with mr brisbane who is a good scholar and sober man and we lay in bed getting him to give me an account of home which is the most delightful talk a man can have of any traveller and so to sleep my eyes much troubled already with the change of my drink thus i ended this month with the greatest joy that ever i did any in my life because i have spent the greatest part of it with abundance of joy and honour and pleasant journeys and brave entertainments and without cost of money and at last lived to see the business ended with great content on all sides this evening with mr brisbane speaking of enchantments and spells i telling him some of my charms he told me this of his own knowledge at bordeaux in france the words these voici encore mot roid comme un baston froid comme marbre léger comme un esprit le vent tu nom de jésus christ he saw four little girls very young ones all kneeling each of them upon one knee and one began the first line whispering in the ear of the next and the second to the third and the third to the fourth and she to the first then the first began the second line and so round quite through and putting each one finger only to a boy that lay flat upon his back on the ground as if he was dead at the end of the words they did with their four fingers raise this boy as high as they could reach and he being there and wondering at it as also being afeard to see it for they would have had him to have bore a part in saying the words in the room of one of the little girls that were so young that they could hardly make her learn to repeat the words did for fear there might be some slate used in it by the boy or that the boy might be light call the cook of the house a very lusty fellow as sir g carteret's cook who is very big and they did raise him in just the same manner this is one of the strangest things i ever heard but he tells it me of his own knowledge and i do heartily believe it to be true i inquired of him whether they were protestant or catholic girls and he told me they were protestant which made it the more strange to me thus we end this month as i said after the greatest glut of content that ever i had only under some difficulty because of the plague which grows mightily upon us the last week being about seventeen hundred or eighteen hundred of the plague my lord sandwich at sea with a fleet of about a hundred sail to the northward expecting de reuter or the dutch east india fleet my lord hinchingbrook coming over from france and will meet his sister at scots hall myself having obliged both these families in this business very much as both my lady and sir g carteret and his lady do confess exceedingly and the latter do also now call me cousin 
which I am glad of. So God preserve us all, friends long, and continue health among us. August of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665, by Samuel Pepys. August, 1665. August 1st. Slept and lay long, then up, and my lord, crew, and Sir G. Carteret being gone abroad, I first to see the bridegroom and bride, and found them both up, and he gone to dress himself, both red in the face, and well enough pleased this morning with their night's lodging. Thence down, and Mr. Brisbane and I to billiards. Anon come my lord and Sir G. Carteret in, who have been looking abroad and visiting some farms that Sir G. Carteret hath thereabouts, and, among other things, report the greatest stories of the bigness of the calves they find there, ready to sell to the butchers, as big, they say, as little cows, and that they do give them a piece of chalk to lick, which they hold makes them white in the flesh within. Very merry at dinner, and so to talk and laugh after dinner, and up and down, some to one place, some to another, full of content on all sides. Anon about five o'clock Sir G. Carteret and his lady and I took coach, with the greatest joy and kindness that could be from the two families, or that ever I saw with so much appearance, and I believe reality, in all my life. Drove hard home, and it was night ere we got to Deptford, where, with much kindness from them to me, I left them, and home to the office, where I find all well, and being weary and sleepy, it being very late, I to bed. Second. Up, it being a public fast, as being the first Wednesday of the month, for the plague, I within doors all day, and upon my monthly accounts late, and there to my great joy settled almost all my private matters of money in my books clearly, and allowing myself several sums which I had hitherto not reckoned myself sure of, because I would not be over-sure of anything, though with reason I might do it, I did find myself really worth nineteen hundred pounds, for which the great God of heaven and earth be praised. At night to the office to write a few letters, and so home to bed, after fitting myself for to-morrow's journey. Third. Up and betimes to Deptford, to Sir G. Carteret's, where, not liking the horse that had been hired by Mr. Youthwaite for me, I did desire Sir G. Carteret to let me ride his new forty-pound horse, which he did, and so I left my hackney behind, and so after staying a good while in their bedchamber while they were dressing themselves, discoursing merrily, I parted unto the ferry, where I was forced to stay a great while before I could get my horse brought over, and then mounted and rode very finely to Dagenham's. All the way, people, citizens, walking to and again, to inquire how the plague is in the city this week, by the bill, which by chance at Greenwich I had heard was two thousand and twenty of the plague, and three thousand and odd of all diseases, but methought it was a sad question to be so often asked me. Coming to Dagenham's, I there met our company coming out of the house, having stayed as long as they could for me, so I let them go a little before, and went and took leave of my lady sandwich, good woman who seems very sensible of my service in this late business, and having her directions in some things, among others, to get Sir G. Carteret and my lord to settle the portion, and what Sir G. Carteret is to settle, into land, soon as may be, she not liking that it should lie long undone, for fear of death on either side. So took leave of her, and then down to the buttery, and eat a piece of cold venison pie, and drank, and took some bread and cheese in my hand, and so mounted after them, Mr. Marr very kindly staying to lead me the way. By and by met my Lord Crewe returning, after having accompanied them a little way, and so after them, Mr. Marr telling me by the way how a maid-servant of Mr. John Wright's, who lives thereabouts, falling sick of the plague, and a nurse appointed to look to her, who, being once absent, the maid got out of the house at the window and ran away. The nurse coming and knocking, and having no answer, believed she was dead, and went and told Mr. Wright so, who, and his lady, were in great strait what to do to get her buried. At last resolved to go to Burntwood hard by, being in the parish, and there get people to do it, but they would not. So he went home full of trouble, and in the way met the wench walking over the common, which frighted him worse than before, and was forced to send people to take her, which he did, and they got one of the pest-coaches and put her into it to carry her to a pest-house. And passing in a narrow lane, Sir Anthony Brown, with his brother and some friends in the coach, met this coach with the curtains drawn close. The brother being a young man, and believing there might be some lady in it that would not be seen, and the way being narrow, he thrust his head out of his own into her coach, and to look, and there saw somebody look very ill, and in a sick dress, and stunk mightily, which the coachman also cried out upon. And presently they come up to some people that stood looking after it, and told our gallants that it was a maid of Mr. Wright's carried away sick of the plague, which put the young gentleman into a fright had almost cost him his life, 
but is now well again i overtaking our young people light and into the coach to them were mighty merry all the way and anon come to the block-house over against gravesend where we stayed a great while in a little drinking-house sent back our coaches to dagenham's i by and by by boat to gravesend where no news of sir g carter had come yet so back again and fetched them all over but the two saddle-horses that were to go with us which could not be brought over in the horse-boat the wind and tide being against us without towing so we had some difference with some watermen who would not tow them over under twenty shillings whereupon i swore to send one of them to sea and will do it anon some others come to me and did it for ten shillings by and by comes sir g carteret and so we set out for chatham in my way overtaking some company wherein was a lady very pretty riding singly her husband in company with her we fell into talk and i read a copy of verses which her husband showed me and he discommended but the lady commended and i read them so as to make the husband turn to commend them by and by he and i fell into acquaintance having known me formerly at the exchequer his name is noakes over against bow church he was servant to alderman dashwood we promised to meet if ever we come both to london again and at parting i had a fair salute on horseback in rochester streets of the lady and so parted come to chatham mighty merry and anon to supper it being near nine o'clock ere we come thither my lady carteret come thither in a coach by herself before us great mind they have to buy a little hackney that i rode on from greenwich for a woman's horse mighty merry and after supper all being withdrawn sir g carteret did take an opportunity to speak with much value and kindness to me which is of great joy to me so anon to bed mr brisbane and i together to my content fourth up at five o'clock and by six walked out alone with my lady slanning to the dockyard where walked up and down and so to mr pett's who led us into his garden and there the lady the best humoured woman in the world and a devout woman i having spied her on her knees half an hour this morning in her chamber clambered up to the top of the banqueting-house to gather nuts and mighty merry and so walked back again through the new rope-house which is very useful and so to the hill-house to breakfast and mighty merry then they took coach and sir g carteret kissed me himself heartily and my lady several times with great kindness and then the young ladies and so with much joy bad god be with you and an end i think it will be to my mirth for a great while it having been the passage of my whole life the most pleasing for the time considering the quality and nature of the business and my noble usage in the doing of it and very many fine journeys entertainments and great company i returned into the house for a while to do business there with commissioner pett and there with the officers of the chest where i saw more of sir w batten's business than ever i did before for whereas he did own once under his hand to them that he was accountable for twenty two hundred pounds of which he had yet paid but sixteen hundred pounds he writes them a letter lately that he hath but about fifty pounds left that is due to the chest but i will do something in it and that speedily that being done i took horse and mr barrow with me bore me company to gravesend discoursing of his business wherein i vexed him and he me i seeing his frowardness but yet that he is in my conscience a very honest man and some good things he told me which i shall remember to the king's advantage there i took boat alone and the tide being against me landed at blackwall and walked to wapping captain bowed whom i met with talking with me all the way who is a sober man so home and found all things well and letters from dover that my lord hinchingbroke is arrived at dover and would be at scott's hall this night where the whole company will meet i wish myself with them after writing a few letters i took boat and down to woolwich very late and there found my wife and her woman upon the quay hearing a fellow in a barge that lay by fiddle so i to them and in very merry and to bed i sleepy and weary fifth in the morning up and my wife showed me several things of her doing especially one fine woman's persian head mighty finely done beyond what i could expect of her and so away by water having ordered in the yard six or eight bargemen to be whipped who had last night stolen some of the king's cordage from out of the yard i to deptford and there by agreement met with my lord brunker and there we kept our office he and i and did what there was to do and at noon parted to meet at the office next week sir w warren and i then did walk through the rain to halfway house and there i eat a piece of boiled beef and he and i talked over several businesses among others our design upon the mast stock which i hope to compass and get two or three hundred pounds by thence to redriff where we parted and i home where busy all the afternoon stepped to colville's to set right a business of money where he told me that for certain de reuter is come home with all his fleet which is very ill news considering the charge we have been at in keeping a fleet to the northward so long besides the great expectation of snapping him wherein my lord sandwich will i doubt suffer some dishonour 
I am told also of a great riot upon Thursday last in Cheapside. Colonel Danvers, a delinquent, having been taken, and in his way to the tower was rescued from the captain of the guard and carried away, only one of the rescuers being taken. I am told also that the Duke of Buckingham is dead, but I know not of a certainty. So home and very late at letters, and then home to supper and to bed. Sixth, Lord's Day. Dressed and had my head combed by my little girl, to whom I confess que je sum demasiado kind, nuper ponendo, mes mains en su de choses de son breast, mais il faut que je leave it, lest it bring me to alcum major inconvenience. So to my business in my chamber, look over and settling more of my papers than I could the two last days I have spent about them. In the evening, it raining hard, down to Woolwich, where, after some little talk, to bed. Seventh up and with great pleasure looking over my wife's pictures, and then to see my lady Penn, whom I have not seen since her coming hither. And after being a little merry with her, she went forth, and I stayed there talking with Mrs. Pegg and looking over her pictures, and commended them. But, Lord, so far short of my wife's, there's no comparison. Thence to my wife, and there spent, talking till noon, when, by appointment, Mr. Andrews come out of the country to speak with me about their Tangier business. And so, having done with him and dined, I home by water, where by appointment I met Dr. Twisden, Mr. Povey, Mr. Lawson, and Stockdale, about settling their business of money. But such confusion I never met with, nor could anything be agreed on, but parted like a company of fools. I vexed to lose so much time and pains to no purpose. They gone comes Rayner, the boatmaker, about some business, and brings a piece of plate with him, which I refuse to take of him, thinking indeed that the poor man hath no reason nor encouragement from our dealings with him to give any of us any presents. He gone, there comes Llewellyn, about Mr. Deering's business of plank, to have the contract perfected, and offers me twenty pieces in gold, as Deering had done some time since himself, but I both then and now refused it, resolving not to be bribed to dispatch business, but will have it done, however, out of hand forthwith. So he gone, I to supper, and to bed. Eighth. Up and to the office, where all the morning we sat. At noon I home to dinner alone, and after dinner Bagwell's wife waited at the door, and went with me to my office. So parted, and I to Sir W. Batten's, and there sat the most of the afternoon, talking and drinking too much with my Lord Brunker, Sir G. Smith, G. Cock, and others very merry. I drunk a little mixed, but yet more than I should do. So to my office a little, and then to the Duke of Albemarle's about some business. The streets mighty empty all the way, now even in London, which is a sad sight. And to Westminster Hall, where talking, hearing very sad stories from Mrs. Mumford, among others, of Mrs. Mitchell's son's family, and poor Will that used to sell us ale at the hall door, his wife and three children died, all, I think, in a day. So home through the city again, wishing I may have taken no ill in going, but I will go, I think, no more thither. Late at the office, and then home to supper, having taken a pullet home with me, and then to bed. The news of De Reuter's coming home is certain, and told to the great disadvantage of our fleet, and the praise of De Reuter but it cannot be helped, nor do I know what to say to it. Ninth, Up betimes to my office, where Tom Hater, to the writing of letters with me, which have for a good while been in arrear, and we close at it all day till night. Only made a little step out for half an hour in the morning to the exchequer about striking of tallies, but no good done therein, people being most out of town. At noon, T. Hater dined with me, and so at it all the afternoon. At night, home and supped, and after reading a little in Cowley's poems, my head being disturbed with overmuch business to-day, I to bed. Tenth. Up betimes, and called upon early by my she-cousin Porter, the turner's wife, to tell me that her husband was carried to the tower for buying of some of the king's powder, and would have my help, but I could give her none, not daring any more to appear in the business, having too much trouble lately therein. By and by to the office, where we sat all the morning, in great trouble to see the bill this week rise so high, to above four thousand in all, and of them above three thousand of the plague, and an odd story of Alderman Benson's stumbling at night over a dead corpse in the street, and going home and telling his wife, she at the fright, being with child, fell sick, and died of the plague. We sat late, and then by invitation, I, Lord Brunker, Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Batten, and I, to Sir G. Smith's to dinner, where very good company and good cheer. Captain Cock was there, and Jack Fenn, but to our great wonder, Alderman Bence, and tells us that not a word of all this is true and others said so too, but by his own story his wife hath been ill, and he feigned to leave his house, and comes not to her, which continuing a trouble to me all the time I was there. Thence to the office, and after writing letters, home, to draw over anew my will, 
which I had bound myself by oath to dispatch by to-morrow night, the town growing so unhealthy that a man cannot depend upon living two days to an end. So having done something of it, I to bed. Eleventh. Up and all day long, finishing and writing over my will twice, for my father and my wife, only in the morning a pleasant rencontre happened, in having a young married woman brought me by her father, old Delks, that carries pins always in his mouth, to get her husband off that he should not go to sea. Une contre pouvait avoir done any cause comme else, but I did nothing, sine baiser her. After they were gone, my mind run upon having them call back again, and I sent a messenger to Blackwall, but he failed. So I lost my expectation. I to the exchequer, about striking new tallies, and I find the exchequer by proclamation removing to none such. Back again, and at my papers, and putting up my books into chests, and settling my house and all things in the best and speediest order I can, lest it should please God to take me away, or force me to leave my house. Late up at it, and weary and full of wind, finding perfectly that so long as I keep myself in company at meals, and do there eat lustily, which I cannot do alone, having no love to eating, but my mind runs upon my business, I am as well as can be, but when I come to be alone I do not eat in time, nor enough, nor with any good heart, and I immediately begin to be full of wind, which brings my pain, till I come to fill my belly a days again, then am presently well. Twelfth. The office now not sitting, but only hereafter on Thursday, said the office, I within all the morning about my papers, and setting things still in order, and also much time in settling matters with Dr. Twiston. At noon I am sent for by Sir G. Carteret to meet him and my Lord Hinchingbrook at Deptford, but my Lord did not come thither, he having crossed the river at Gravesend to Dagenham's, whither I dare not follow him, they being afeard of me. But Sir G. Carteret says, he is a most sweet youth in every circumstance. Sir G. Carteret being in haste of going to the Duke of Albemarle and the Archbishop, he was pettish, and so I could not fasten any discourse, but take another time. So he gone, I down to Greenwich, and sent away the besom, thinking to go with my wife to-night to come back again to-morrow night to the Sovereign at the Bouy, off the Nore. Coming back to Deptford, old Bagwell walked a little way with me, and would have me into his daughter's. And there, he being gone, Dor ego had my volonté de suhisa. Eat and drank and away home, and after a little at the office to my chamber to put more things still in order, and late to bed. The people die so, that now it seems they are fain to carry the dead to be buried by daylight, the night's not sufficing to do it in. And my Lord Mayor commands people to be within at nine at night all, as they say, that the sick may have liberty to go abroad for air. There is one also dead out of one of our ships at Deptford, which troubles us mightily, the Providence fire-ship, which was just fitted to go to sea. But they tell me to-day no more sick on board, and this day W. Bottom tells me that one is dead at Woolwich, not far from the rope-yard. I am told, too, that a wife of one of the grooms at court is dead at Salisbury, so that the King and Queen are speedily to be all gone to Milton. God preserve us. Thirteenth, Lord's Day. Up betimes and to my chamber, it being a very wet day all day, and glad am I that we did not go by water to see the Sovereign to-day, as I intended, clearing all matters in packing up my papers and books, and giving instructions in writing to my executors, thereby perfecting the whole business of my will, to my very great joy, so that I shall be in much better state of soul, I hope, if it should please the Lord to call me away this sickly time. At night to read, being weary with this day's great work, and then after supper to bed, to rise betimes to-morrow, and to bed with a mind as free as to the business of the world, as if I were not worth a hundred pounds in the whole world, everything being evened under my hand in my books and papers. And upon the whole I find myself worth, besides Brampton Estate, the sum of two thousand one hundred and sixty-four pounds, for which the Lord be praised. Fourteenth. Up, and my mind being at mighty ease from the dispatch of my business so much yesterday, I down to Deptford to Sir G. Carteret, where with him a great while, and a great deal of private talk concerning my Lord Sandwiches and his matters, and chiefly of the latter, I giving him great deal of advice about the necessity of his having caution concerning Fen, and the many ways there are of his being abused by any man in his place, and why he should not bring his son in to look after his business, and more, to be a commissioner of the navy, which he listened to and liked, and told me how much the king was his good master, and was sure not to deny him that, or anything else greater than that. And I find him a very cunning man, whatever at other times he seems to be, and among other things he told me he was not for the fanfaroon, to make a show with a great title, as he might have had long since, but the main thing to get an estate, and another thing speaking of minding of business. By God, says he, I will, and have already almost brought it to that pass, that the king shall not be able to whip a cat, but I must be at the tail of it. 
meaning so necessary he is, and the king and my lord treasurer and all do confess it, which, while I mind my business, is my own case in this office of the navy, and I hope shall be more if God give me life and health. Thence by agreement to Sir J. Minnes' lodgings, where I found my lord Brunker, and so by water to the ferry, and there took Sir W. Batten's coach that was sent for us, and to Sir W. Batten's were very merry, good cheer, and up and down the garden with great content to me, and after dinner beat Captain Cock at billiards, one about eight shillings of him, and my lord Brunker. So in the evening after, much pleasure back again, and I by water to Woolwich, where supped with my wife, and then to bed betimes, because of rising to-morrow at four of the clock, in order to the going out with Sir G. Carteret toward Cranbourne to my lord Hinchingbrook in his way to court. This night I did present my wife with the diamond ring, a while since given me by Mr. Dick Vines's brother, for helping him to be a purser, valued at about ten pounds, the first thing of that nature I did ever give her. Great fears we have that the plague will be a great bill this week. Fifteenth. Up by four o'clock, and walked to Greenwich, where called at Captain Cox, and to his chamber, he being in bed, where something put my last night's dream into my head, which I think is the best that ever was dreamt, which was that I had my Lady Castlemaine in my arms, and was admitted to use all the dalliance I desired with her, and then dreamt that this could not be awake, but that it was only a dream, but that, since it was a dream, and that I took so much real pleasure in it, what a happy thing it would be if, when we are in our graves, as Shakespeare resembles it, we could dream, and dream but such dreams as this, that then we should not need to be so fearful of death as we are this plague-time. Here I hear that news is brought Sir G. Carteret, that my Lord Hinchingbrook is not well, and so cannot meet us at Cranbourne to-night. So I to Sir G. Carteret's, and there was sorry with him for our disappointment. So we have put off our meeting there till Saturday next. Here I stayed talking with Sir G. Carteret, he being mighty free with me in his business, and among other things hath ordered Ryder and Cutler to put into my hands copper to the value of five thousand pounds, which Sir G. Carteret's share it seems come to in it which is to raise part of the money he is to lay out for a purchase for my lady Jemima. Thence he and I to Sir J. Minnes, by invitation, where Sir W. Batten and my lady and my lord Brunker, and all of us dined upon a venison pasty and other good meat, but nothing well dressed. But my pleasure lay in getting some bill signed by Sir G. Carteret, and promise of present payment from Mr. Fenn, which do rejoice my heart, it being one of the heaviest things I had upon me, that so much of the little I have should lie, viz. near a thousand pounds, in the king's hands. Here very merry, and, Sir G. Carteret being gone presently after dinner, to Captain Cox, and there merry, and so broke up, and I by water to the Duke of Albemarle, with whom I spoke a great deal in private, they being designed to send a fleet of ships privately to the Straits. No news yet from our fleet, which is much wondered at, but the Duke says for certain, guns have been heard to the northward very much. It was dark before I could get home, and so land at churchyard stairs, where, to my great trouble, I met a dead corpse of the plague, in the narrow alley just bringing down a little pair of stairs. But I thank God I was not much disturbed at it. However, I shall beware of being late abroad again. Sixteenth. Up, and after doing some necessary business about my accounts at home, to the office, and there with Mr. Hayter wrote letters, and I did deliver to him my last will, one part of it to deliver to my wife when I am dead. Thence to the exchange, where I have not been a great while. But, Lord, how sad a sight it is to see the streets empty of people, and very few upon the change, jealous of every door that one sees shut up, lest it should be the plague, and about us two shops in three, if not more, generally shut up. From the change to Sir G. Smith's with Mr. Fenn, to whom I am nowadays very complaisant, he being under payment of my bills to me, and some other sums at my desire, which he readily do. Mighty Mary with Captain Cock and Fenn at Sir G. Smith's, and a brave dinner. But I think Cock is the greatest epicure that is, eats and drinks with the greatest pleasure and liberty that ever man did. Very contrary news to-day upon the change, some that our fleet hath taken some of the Dutch East India ships, others that we did attack it at Bergen and were repulsed, others that our fleet is in great danger after this attack by meeting with the great body now gone out of Holland, almost one hundred sail of men of war. Everybody is at a great loss, and nobody can tell. Thence among the goldsmiths to get some money, and so home, settling some new money matters, and to my great joy have got home five hundred pounds more of the money due to me, and got some more money to help Andrew's first advanced. This day I had the ill news from Dagenham's that my poor lord of Hinchingbrook, his indisposition is turned to the smallpox, poor gentleman, that he should be come from France so soon to fall sick, and of that disease too, 
when he should be gone to see a fine lady his mistress. I am most heartily sorry for it. So late, setting papers to rights, and so home to bed. 17th. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and at noon dined together upon some victuals I had prepared at Sir W. Batten's upon the King's charge, and after dinner, I having dispatched some business and set things in order at home, we down to the water and by boat to Greenwich, to the Besan Yacht, where Sir W. Batten, Sir J. Minnes, my Lord Brunker, and myself, with some servants, among others Mr. Carcass, my Lord's clerk, a very civil gentleman, embarked in the yacht, and down we went most pleasantly, and noble discourse I had with my Lord Brunker, who is a most excellent person. Short of Gravesend, it grew calm, and so we come to an anchor, and to supper mighty merry, and after it, being moonshine, we out of the cabin to laugh and talk, and then, as we grew sleepy, went in, and upon velvet cushions of the kings that belonged to the yacht, fell to sleep, which we all did pretty well till three or four of the clock, having risen in the night to look for a new comet, which is said to have lately shone, but we could see no such thing. 18th. Up about five o'clock, and dressed ourselves, and to sail again down to the sovereign, at the boy of the Nore, a noble ship, now rigged and fitted and manned. We did not stay long, but to inquire after her readiness, and thence to Sheerness, where we walked up and down, laying out the ground to be taken in for a yard to lay provisions for cleaning and repairing of ships, and a most proper place it is for the purpose. Thence with great pleasure up the Medway, our yacht contending with Commissioner Petts, wherein he met us from Chatham, and he had the best of it. Here I come by, but had not tide enough to stop at Quimbra, and with mighty pleasure spent the day in doing all and seeing these places, which I had never done before. So to the hill-house at Chatham, and there dined, and after dinner spent some time discoursing of business, among others arguing with the commissioner about his proposing the laying out so much money upon Sheerness, unless it be to the slighting of Chatham Yard, for it is much a better place than Chatham, which, however, the king is not at present in purse to do, though it were to be wished he were. Thence in Commissioner Pett's coach, leaving them there, I late in the dark to Gravesend, where great is the plague, and I trouble to stay there so long for the tide. At ten at night, having supped, I took boat alone, and slept well all the way to the tower dock about three o'clock in the morning, so knocked up my people, and to bed. Nineteenth. Slept till eight o'clock, and then up and met with letters from the King and Lord Arlington for the removal of our office to Greenwich. I also wrote letters, and made myself ready to go to Sir G. Cartwright at Windsor, and having borrowed a horse of Mr. Blackborough, sent him to wait for me at the Duke of Albemarle's door, when, on a sudden, a letter comes to us from the Duke of Albemarle to tell us that the fleet is all come back to Sol Bay, and are presently to be dispatched back again, whereupon I presently by water to the Duke of Albemarle to know what news, and there I saw a letter from my Lord Sandwich to the Duke of Albemarle, and also from Sir W. Coventry and Captain Teddyman, how my lord having commanded Teddyman with twenty-two ships, of which but fifteen could get thither, and of those fifteen but eight or nine could come up to play, to go to Bergen, where, after several messages to and fro from the governor of the castle, urging that Teddyman ought not to come thither with more than five ships, and desiring time to think of it, all the while he suffering the Dutch ships to land their guns to their best advantage, Teddyman, on the second pretence, began to play at the Dutch ships, whereof ten East India men, and in three hours' time, the town and castle without any provocation playing on our ships, they did cut all our cables. So as the wind being off the land did force us to go out and rendered our fire ships useless, without doing anything but what hurt, of course, our guns must have done them, we having lost five commanders besides Mr. Edward Montague and Mr. Wyndham. Our fleet is come home to our great grief with not above five weeks dry and six days wet provisions, however must out again, and the Duke hath ordered the Sovereign and all other ships ready to go out to the fleet to strengthen them. This news troubles us all, but cannot be helped. Having read all this news, and received commands of the Duke with great content, he giving me the words which to my great joy he hath several times said to me, that his greatest reliance is upon me. And my Lord Craven also did come out to talk with me, and told me that I am in mighty esteem with the Duke, for which I bless God. Home, and having given my fellow officers an account hereof, to Chatham, and wrote other letters, I by water to Charing Cross to the post-house, and there the people tell me they are shut up, and so I went to the new post-house, and there got a guide and horses to Hounslow, where I was mightily taken with a little girl, the daughter of the master of the house, Betty Guysby, which, if she lives, will make a great beauty. Here I met with a fine fellow, who, while I stayed for my horses, did inquire news, but I could not make him remember Bergen in Norway, in six or seven times telling, so ignorant he was. 
So to Staines, and there by this time it was dark night, and got a guide who lost his way in the forest, till by help of the moon, which recompenses me for all the pains I ever took about studying of her motions, I led my guide into the way back again, and so we made a man rise that kept a gate, and so he carried us to Cranbourne, where in the dark I perceive an old house, new building, with a great deal of rubbish, and was fain to go up a ladder to Sir G. Carteret's chamber. And there in his bed I sat down and told him all my bad news, which troubled him mightily. But yet we were very merry, and made the best of it, and being myself weary did take leave, and after having spoken with Mr. Fenn in bed, I to bed in my lady's chamber that she used to lie in, and where the Duchess of York that now is, was born. So to sleep, being very well but weary, and the better by having carried with me a bottle of strong water, whereof now and then a sip did me good. 20th. Lord's Day. Sir G. Carter had come, and walked by my bedside half an hour, talking and telling me how my lord is in this unblameable, in all this ill success, he having followed orders, and that all ought to be imputed to the falseness of the King of Denmark, who, he told me as a secret, had promised to deliver up the Dutch ships to us, and we expected no less, and swears it will, and will easily, be the ruin of him and his kingdom, if we fall out with him, as we must in honour do, but that all that can be, must be to get the fleet out again to intercept De Witt, who certainly will be coming home with the East India ships, he being gone thither. He being gone, I up and with Fenn, being ready to walk forth to see the place, and I find it to be a very noble seat in a noble forest, with the noblest prospect towards Windsor, and round about over many counties, that can be desired, but otherwise a very melancholy place, and little variety save only trees. I had thoughts of going home by water, and of seeing Windsor Chapel and Castle, but finding at my coming in that Sir G. Carteret did prevent me in speaking for my sudden return to look after business, I did presently eat a bit off the spit about ten o'clock, and so took course for Staines, and thence to Brainford to Mr. Povey's, the weather being very pleasant to ride in. Mr. Povey not being at home, I lost my labour, only eat and drank there with his lady, and told my bad news, and here the plague is round about them there. So away to Brainford, and there at the inn that goes down to the waterside, I light and paid off my post-horses, and so slipped on my shoes, and laid my things by, the tide not serving, and to church, where a dull sermon, and many Londoners. After church to my inn, and eat and drank, and so about seven o'clock by water, and got between nine and ten to Queenhive, very dark. And I could not get my waterman to go elsewhere for fear of the plague. Thence, with a lantern, in great fear of meeting of dead corpses, carried to be buried, but, blessed be God, met none, but did see now and then a link, which is the mark of them, at a distance. So got safe home about ten o'clock, my people not all abed, and after supper I weary to bed. 21st. Called up by message from Lord Brunker and the rest of my fellows, that they will meet me at the Duke of Albemarle's this morning. So I up, and weary, however, got thither before them, and spoke with my lord, and with him and other gentlemen to walk in the park, where I perceive he spends much of his time, having no whither else to go. And here I hear him speak of some presbyter people that he caused to be apprehended yesterday at a private meeting in Covent Garden, which he would have released upon paying five pounds per man to the poor, but it was answered they would not pay anything. So he ordered them to another prison from the guard. By and by comes my fellow officers, and the duke walked in, and to counsel with us, and that being done, we departed, and Sir W. Batten and I to the office, where, after I had done a little business, I to his house to dinner, whither comes Captain Cock, for whose epicurism a dish of partridges was sent for, and still gives me reason to think is the greatest epicure in the world. Thence after dinner, I by water to Sir W. Warren's, and with him two hours, talking of things to his and my profit, and particularly good advice from him what used to make of Sir G. Carteret's kindness to me, and my interest in him, with exceeding good cautions for me not using it too much, nor obliging him to fear by prying into his secrets, which it were easy for me to do. Thence to my Lord Brunker at Greenwich, and Sir J. Minnes by appointment, to look after the lodgings appointed for us there for our office, which do by no means please me, they being in the heart of all the labourers and workmen there, which makes it as unsafe as to be, I think, at London. Mr. Hugh May, who is a most ingenuous man, did show us the lodgings, and his acquaintance I am desirous of. Thence walked, it being now dark, to Sir J. Minnes, and there stayed at the door talking with him an hour, while messengers went to get a boat for me to carry me to Woolwich, but all to no purpose. So I was forced to walk it in the dark at ten o'clock at night, with Sir J. Minnes George with me, 
being mightily troubled for fear of the dogs at Coombe Farm, and more for fear of rogues by the way, and yet more because of the plague which is there, which is very strange, it being a single house all alone from the town, but it seems they used to admit beggars for their own safety to lie in their barns, and they brought it to them. But I bless God I got about eleven of the clock well to my wife, and giving four shillings in recompense to George, I to my wife, and having first viewed her last piece of drawing since I saw her, which is seven or eight days, which pleases me beyond anything in the world, to bed, with great content, but weary. 22nd. Up, and after much pleasant talk, and being importuned by my wife and her two maids, which are both good wenches, for me to buy a necklace of pearl for her, and I promising to give her one of sixty pounds in two years at furthest, and in less if she pleases me in her painting, I went away and walked to Greenwich, in my way seeing a coffin with a dead body therein, dead of the plague, lying in an open close belonging to Coombe Farm, which was carried out last night, and the parish have not appointed anybody to bury it, but only set a watch there day and night, that nobody should go thither or come thence, which is a most cruel thing, this disease making us more cruel to one another than if we are dogs. So to the king's house, and there met my lord Brunker and Sir J. Minnes, and to our lodgings again that are appointed for us, which do please me better to-day than last night, and are set a-doing. Thence I to Deptford, where by appointment I find Mr. Andrews come, and to the Globe, where we dined together, and did much business as to our Plymouth gentlemen. And after a good dinner and good discourse, he being a very good man, I think verily, we parted, and I to the King's yard, walked up and down, and by and by out at the back gate, and there saw the Bagwell's wife's mother and daughter, and went to them, and went into the daughter's house with the mother, and fakiebam le cose che ego tenebam a mind to, con el. And drinking and talking, by and by away, and so walked to Redriff, troubled to go through the little lane where the plague is, but did, and took water and home, where all well. But Mr. Andrews not coming to even accounts as I expected, with relation to something of my own profit, I was vexed that I could not settle to business, but home to my vial, though in the evening he did come to my satisfaction. So after supper, he being gone first, I to settle my journal, and to bed. 23rd. Up. And whereas I had appointed Mr. Hayter and Will to come betimes to the office, to meet me about business there, I was called upon as soon as ready by Mr. Andrews to my great content, and he and I to our Tangier accounts, where I settled, to my great joy, all my accounts with him, and, which is more, cleared for my service to the contractors since the last sum I received of them, two hundred and twenty-two pounds thirteen shillings profit to myself, and received the money actually in the afternoon. After he was gone comes by a pretence of mine yesterday, old Delks the waterman, with his daughter Robins, and several times to and again, he leaving her with me, about the getting of his son Robins off, who was pressed yesterday again. All the afternoon at my office mighty busy writing letters, and received a very kind and good one from my Lord Sandwich of his arrival with the fleet at Sol Bay, and the joy he has at my last news he met with of the marriage of my Lady Jemima. And he tells me more, the good news that all our ships, which were in such danger that nobody would insure upon them from the Eastland, were all safe arrived, which I am sure is a great piece of good luck, being in much more danger than those of Hamburg, which were lost and their value much greater at this time to us. At night home, much contented with this day's work, and being at home alone looking over my papers, comes a neighbour of ours hard by to speak with me about business of the office. One Mr. Fuller, a great merchant, but not my acquaintance, but he come drunk, and would have had me gone and drunk with him at home, or have let him send for wine hither, but I would do neither, nor offered him any, but after some sorry discourse parted, and I up to my chamber and to bed. 24th. Up betimes to my office, where my clerk's with me, and very busy all the morning writing letters. At noon down to Sir J. Minnes and Lord Brunker to Greenwich, to sign some of the treasurer's books, and there dined very well, and thence to look upon our rooms again at the King's house, which are not yet ready for us. So home and late writing letters, and so, weary with business, home to supper and to bed. 25th. Up betimes to the office, and there, as well as all the afternoon, saving a little dinner-time, all alone till late at night writing letters and doing business, that I may get beforehand with my business again, which hath run behind a great while, and then home to supper and to bed. This day I am told that Dr. Burnett, my physician, is this morning dead of the plague, 
which is strange, his man dying so long ago, and his house this month open again, now himself dead, poor unfortunate man. 26. Up betimes, and prepared to my great satisfaction an account for the board of my office disbursements, which I had suffered to run on to almost a hundred and twenty pounds. That done, I down by water to Greenwich, where we met the first day my Lord Brunker, Sir J. Minnes, and I, and I think we shall do well there, and begin very auspiciously to me by having my account above said passed, and put into a way of having it presently paid. When we rose, I find Mr. Andrews and Mr. Yeebsley, who is just come from Plymouth, at the door, and we walked together toward my Lord Brunker's, talking about their business, Yeebsley being come up on purpose to discourse with me about it, and finished all in a quarter of an hour, and is gone again. I perceive they have some inclination to be going on with their victualling business for a while longer before they resign it to Mr. Gordon, and I am well contented, for it brings me very good profit with certainty, yet with much care and some pains. We parted at my Lord Brunker's door, where I went in, having never been there before, and there he made a noble entertainment for Sir J. Minnes, myself, and Captain Cock, none else saving some painted lady that dined there, I know not who she is. But very merry we were and after dinner into the garden, and to see his and her chamber where some good pictures, and a very handsome young woman for my lady's woman. Then I by water home, in my way seeing a man taken up dead out of the hold of a small cat that lay at Deptford. I doubt it might be the plague which, with the thought of Dr. Burnett, did something disturb me, so that I did not what I intended, and should have done at the office as to business, but home sooner than ordinary, and after supper to read melancholy alone, and then to bed." 27th lord's day very well in the morning and up into my chamber all the morning to put my things and papers yet more in order and so to dinner thence all the afternoon at my office till late making up my papers and letters there into a good condition of order and so home to supper and after reading a good while in the king's works which is a noble book to bed twenty eighth up and being ready i out to mr colville the goldsmith's having not for some days been in the streets but now how few people I see, and those looking like people that had taken leave of the world. I there, and made even all accounts in the world between him and I, in a very good condition, and I would have done the like with Sir Robert Viner, but he is out of town, the sickness being everywhere thereabouts. I to the exchange, and I think there was not fifty people upon it, and but few more like to be, as they told me, Sir G. Smith and others. Thus I think to take our dear to-day of the London streets, unless it be to go again to Viner's, home to dinner, and there W. Hewer brings me a hundred and nineteen pounds he hath received for my office disbursements, so that I think I have eighteen hundred pounds and more in the house, and blessed be God, no money out but what I can very well command, and that but very little, which is much the best posture I ever was in in my life, both as to the quantity and the certainty I have of the money I am worth, having most of it in my own hand. But then this is a trouble to me what to do with it, being myself this day going to be wholly at Woolwich. But for the present I am resolved to venture it in an iron chest, at least for a while. In the afternoon I sent down my boy to Woolwich, with some things before me, in order to my line there for good and all, and so I followed him. Just now comes news that the fleet is gone, or going this day, out again, for which God be praised. And my Lord Sandwich hath done himself great right in it, in getting so soon out again. I pray God he may meet the enemy. Towards the evening, just as I was fitting myself, comes W. Hewer, and shows me a letter which Mercer had wrote to her mother about a great difference between my wife and her yesterday, and that my wife will have her go away presently. This, together with my natural jealousy that some bad thing or other may be in the way, did trouble me exceedingly, so as I was in a doubt whether to go thither or no, but having fitted myself and my things, I did go, and by night got thither, where I met my wife walking to the waterside with her painter, Mr. Brown, and her maids. There I met Commissioner Pett and my Lord Brunker, and the lady at his house had been there to-day to see her. Commissioner Pett stayed a very little while, and so I to supper with my wife and Mr. Sheldon, and so to bed with great pleasure. Twenty-ninth. In the morning waking, among other discourse, my wife began to tell me the difference between her and Mercer, and that it was only from restraining her to gad abroad to some Frenchmen that were in the town, which I do not wholly yet in part believe, and for my quiet would not inquire into it. So rose and dressed myself, and away by land, walking a good way, 
then remembered that I had promised Commissioner Pett to go with him in his coach, and therefore I went back again to him, and so by his coach to Greenwich, and called at Sir Theophilus Biddulph's, a sober, discreet man, to discourse of the preventing of the plague in Greenwich and Woolwich and Deptford, where in every place it begins to grow very great. We appointed another meeting, and so walked together to Greenwich, and there parted, and Pett and I to the office, where all the morning, and after office done, I to Sir J. Minnes, and dined with him, and thence to Deptford, thinking to have seen Bagwell, but did not, and so straight to Redriff and home, and late at my business to dispatch away letters, and then home to bed, which I did not intend, but to have stayed for altogether at Woolwich, but I made a shift for a bed for Tom, whose bed is gone to Woolwich, and so to bed. 30th. Up betimes, and to my business of settling my house and papers, and then abroad and met with Hadley, our clerk, who, upon my asking how the play goes, he told me it increases much, and much in our parish, for, says he, there died nine this week, though I have returned but six, which is a very ill practice, and makes me think it is so in other places, and therefore the plague much greater than people take it to be. Thence, as I intended, to Sir R. Viner's, and there found not Mr. Lewis ready for me, so I went forth and walked towards Moorfields to see, God forbid my presumption, whether I could see any dead corpse going to the grave, but, as God would have it, did not. But, Lord, how everybody's looks and discourse in the street is of death, and nothing else, and few people going up and down, that the town is like a place distressed and forsaken. After one turn there, back to Viner's, and there found my business ready for me, and evened all reckonings with them to this day to my great content. So home, and all day till very late at night, setting my tangier and private accounts in order, which I did in both, and in the latter to my great joy do find myself yet in the much best condition that ever I was in, finding myself worth two thousand one hundred and eighty pounds and odd, besides plate and goods, which I value at two hundred and fifty pounds more, which is a very great blessing to me. The Lord make me thankful, and of this at this day above eighteen hundred pounds in cash in my house, which speaks but little out of my hands in desperate condition. But this is very troublesome to have in my house at this time. So late to bed, well pleased with my accounts, but weary of being so long at them. 31st. Up, and after putting several things in order to my removal, to Woolwich. The plague having a great increase this week, beyond all expectation of almost two thousand, making the general bill seven thousand odd one hundred, and the plague above six thousand. I down by appointment to Greenwich to our office, where I did some business, and there dined with our company and Sir W. Borman, and Sir Theophilus Biddulph at Mr. Borman's, where a good venison pasty, and after a good merry dinner I to my office, and there late writing letters, and then to Woolwich by water, where pleasant with my wife and people, and after supper to bed. Thus this month ends with great sadness upon the public, through the greatness of the plague everywhere through the kingdom almost, every day sadder and sadder news of its increase. In the city died this week 7,496, and of them 6,102 of the plague. But it is feared that the true number of the dead this week is near 10,000, partly from the poor that cannot be taken notice of through the greatness of the number, and partly from the Quakers and others that will not have any bell ring for them. Our fleet gone out to find the Dutch, we having about 100 sail in our fleet, and in them the sovereign one, so that it is a better fleet than the former with the Duke was. All our fears that the Dutch should be got in before them, which would be a very great sorrow to the public, and to me particularly, for my Lord Samage's sake. A great deal of money being spent, and the kingdom not in a condition to spare, nor a parliament without much difficulty to meet to give more. And to that, to have it said, what hath been done by our late fleets. As to myself, I am very well, only in fear of the plague, and as much of an ague by being forced to go early and late to Woolwich, and my family to lie there continually. My late gettings have been very great to my great content, and I am likely to have yet a few more profitable jobs in a little while, for which Tangier and Sir W. Warren I am wholly obliged to. September of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665, by Samuel Pepys. September, 1665. September 1st. Up and to visit my Lady Penn and her daughter at the rope-yard, where I did breakfast with them, and sat chatting a good while. 
then to my lodging at mr sheldon's where i met captain cock and eat a little bit of dinner and with him to greenwich by water having good discourse with him by the way after being at greenwich a little while i to london to my house there put many more things in order for my total remove sending away my girl susan and other goods down to woolwich and i by water to the duke of albemarle and thence home late by water at the duke of albemarle's i overheard some examinations of the late plot that is discoursed of and a great deal of do there is about it among other discourses i heard read in the presence of the duke an examination and discourse of sir philip howard's with one of the plotting party in many places these words being then said sir p howard if you so come over to the king and be faithful to him you shall be maintained and be set up with a horse and arms and i know not what and then said such a one yes i will be true to the king but damn me said sir philip will you so and so and thus i believe twelve times sir p howard answered him a damn me which was a fine way of rhetoric to persuade a quaker or anabaptist from his persuasion and this was read in the hearing of sir p howard before the duke and twenty more officers and they make sport of it only without any reproach or he being anything ashamed of it but it ended i remember at last but such a one the plotter did at last bid them remember that he had not told them what king he would be faithful to second this morning i wrote letters to mr hill and andrews to come to dine with me to-morrow and then i to the office where busy and thence to dine with sir j minnes where merry but only that sir j minnes who hath lately lost two coach horses dead in the stable has a third now a dying after dinner i to deptford and there took occasion to entra la casa de la gunaica de ma minusier and did what i had a mind to greenwich where wrote some letters and home in pretty good time third lord's day up and put on my coloured silk suit very fine and my new periwig bought a good while since but durst not wear because the plague was in westminster when i bought it and it is a wonder what will be the fashion after the plague is done as to periwigs for nobody will dare to buy any hair for fear of the infection that it had been cut off of the heads of people dead of the plague before church time comes mr hill mr andrews failing because he was to receive the sacrament and to church where a sorry dull parson and so home and most excellent company with mr hill and discourse of music i took my lady pen home and her daughter peg and mary we were and after dinner i made my wife show them her pictures which did mad peg pen who learns of the same man and cannot do so well after dinner left them and i by water to greenwich where much ado to be suffered to come into the town because of the sickness for fear i should come from london till i told them who i was so up to the church where at the door i find captain cock in my lord brunker's coach and he come out and walked with me in the churchyard till the church was done talking of the ill government of our kingdom nobody setting to heart the business of the kingdom but everybody minding their particular profit or pleasures the king himself minding nothing but his ease and so we let things go to rack this arose upon considering what we shall do for money when the fleet comes in and more if the fleet should not meet with the dutch which will put a disgrace upon the king's actions so as the parliament and kingdom will have the less mind to give more money besides so bad an account of the last money we fear will be given not half of it being spent as it ought to be upon the navy besides it is said that at this day our lord treasurer cannot tell what the profit of chimney money is what it comes to per annum nor looks whether that or any other part of the revenue be duly gathered as it ought the very money that should pay the city the two hundred thousand pounds they lent the king being all gathered and in the hands of the receiver and hath been long and yet not brought up to pay the city whereas we are coming to borrow four or five hundred thousand more of the city which will never be lent as is to be feared church being done my lord brunker sir j minnes and i up to the vestry at the desire of the justices of the peace sir theo biddulph and sir w borman and alderman hooker in order to the doing something for the keeping of the plague from growing but lord to consider the madness of the people of the town who will because they are forbid come in crowds along with the dead corpse to see them buried but we agreed on some orders for the prevention thereof among other stories one was very passionate methought of a complaint brought against a man in the town for taking a child from london from an infected house alderman hooker told us it was the child of a very able citizen in gracious street a saddler who had buried all the rest of his children of the plague and himself and wife now being shut up and in despair of escaping did desire only to save the life of this little child and so prevailed to have it received stark naked into the arms of a friend 
who brought it, having put it into new fresh clothes, to Greenwich, where upon hearing the story we did agree it should be permitted to be received and kept in the town. Thence with my Lord Brunker to Captain Cox, where we mighty merry and supped, and very late I by water to Woolwich, in great apprehensions of an egg. Here was my Lord Brunker's lady of pleasure, who I perceive goes everywhere with him, and he, I find, is obliged to carry her, and make all the courtship to her that can be. Fourth, writing letters all the morning, among others to my Lady Carteret, the first I have wrote to her, telling her the state of the city as to health and other sorrowful stories, and thence after dinner to Greenwich, to Sir J. Minnes, who I found my Lord Brunker, and having stayed our hour for the justices by agreement. The time being past, we to walk in the park with Mr. Hammond and Turner, and there eat some fruit out of the King's Garden, and walked in the park, and so back to Sir J. Minnes, and thence walked home, my Lord Brunker giving me a very neat cane to walk with. But it troubled me to pass by Coombe Farm, where about twenty-one people have died of the plague, and three or four days since I saw a dead corpse in a coffin lie in the clothes, unburied, and a watch is constantly kept there night and day to keep the people in, the plague making us cruel as dogs one to another. Fifth. Up and walked with some captains and others talking to me to Greenwich, they crying out upon Captain Teddyman's management of the business of Bergen, that he stayed treating too long while he saw the Dutch fitting themselves, and that at first he might have taken every ship and done what he would with them. How true I cannot tell. Here we sat very late, and for want of money, which lies heavy upon us, did nothing of business almost. Thence home with my Lord Brunker to dinner, were very merry with him and his doxy. After dinner comes Colonel Blunt in his new chariot made with springs, as that was of wicker, wherein a while since we rode at his house. And he hath rode, he says, now this journey many miles in it with one horse, and out drives any coach, and out goes any horse, and so easy, he says. So, for curiosity, I went into it to try it, and up the hill to the heath, and over the cart ruts, and found it pretty well, but not so easy as he pretends and so back again, and took leave of my lord, and drove myself in the chariot to the office, and there ended my letters, and home pretty betimes, and there found W. Penn, and he stayed supper with us, and mighty merry, talking of his travels, and the French humours, etc., and so parted, and to bed. Sixth. Busy all the morning, writing letters to several, so to dinner, to London, to pack up more things thence, and there I looked into the street, and saw fires burning in the street, as it is through the whole city, by the Lord Mayor's order. Thence by water to the Duke of Albemarle's, all the way fires on each side of the Thames, and strange to see in broad daylight two or three burials upon the bankside, one at the very heels of another, doubtless all of the plague, and yet at least forty or fifty people going along with every one of them. The Duke mighty pleasant with me, telling me that he is certainly informed that the Dutch were not come home upon the first instant, and so he hopes our fleet may meet with them, and here to my great joy I got him to sign bills for the several sums I have paid on Tangier business by his single letter, and so now I can get more hands to them. This was a great joy to me. Home to Woolwich, late by water, found wife in bed, and yet late as it was to write letters in order to my rising betimes to go to Povey to-morrow. So to bed, my wife asking me to-night about a letter of hers I should find, which indeed Mary did the other day give me, as if she had found it in my bed, thinking it had been mine brought to her from a man without name, owning great kindness to her, and I know not what. But looking it over seriously, and seeing it bad sense and ill writ, I did believe it to be her brother's, and so had flung it away. But finding her now concerned at it, and vexed with Mary about it, it did trouble me. But I would take no notice of it to-night, but fell to sleep, as if angry. 7th. Up by five of the clock, mighty full of fear of an egg, but was obliged to go and so by water, wrapping myself up warm, to the tower, and there sent for the weekly bill, and find 8,252 dead in all, and of them 6,878 of the plague, which is a most dreadful number, and shows reason to fear that the plague hath got that hold, that it will yet continue among us. Thence to Brainford, reading the villain, a pretty good play, all the way. There a coach of Mr. Povey stood ready for me, and he at his house ready to come in, and so we together merrily to Swakely, Sir Arviner's, a very pleasant place, bought by him of Sir James Harrington's lady. He took us up and down with great respect, and showed us all his house and grounds, and it is a place not very modern in the garden or house, but the most uniform in all that ever I saw, and some things to excess. Pretty to see over the screen of the hall, 
put up by Sir J. Harrington, a long Parliament man, and the King's head, and my Lord of Essex on one side, and Fairfax on the other, and upon the other side of the screen the parson of the parish, and the lord of the manor, and his sisters. The window-cases, door-cases, and chimneys of all the house are marble. He showed me a black boy that he had, that died of a consumption, and being dead he caused him to be dried in an oven, and lies there entire in a box. By and by to dinner, where his lady I find yet handsome, but hath been a very handsome woman, now is old, hath brought him near one hundred thousand pounds, and now he lives no man in England in greater plenty, and commands both king and council with his credit he gives them. Here was a fine lady, a merchant's wife, at dinner with us, and who should be here in the quality of a woman, but Mrs. Worship's daughter, Dr. Clark's niece. And after dinner Sir Robert led us up to his long gallery, very fine, above stairs, and better or such furniture I never did see, and there Mrs. Worship did give us three or four very good songs, and sings very neatly, to my great delight. After all this, and ending the chief business to my content about getting a promise of some money of him, we took leave, being exceedingly well treated here, and a most pleasant journey we had back, Povey and I, and his company most excellent in anything but business, he here giving me an account of as many persons at court as I had a mind or thought of inquiring after. He tells me by a letter he showed me that the king is not, nor hath been of late, very well, but quite out of humour, and, as some think, in a consumption, and weary of everything. He showed me my Lord Arlington's house that he was born in, in a town called Harlington, and so carried me through a most pleasant country to Brainford, and there put me into my boat, and good night. So I wrapped myself warm, and by water got to Woolwich, about one in the morning, my wife and all in bed. Eighth. Waked, and fell in talk with my wife about the letter, and she satisfied me that she did not know from whence it come, but believed it might be from her cousin Frank Moore, lately come out of France. The truth is the thing I think cannot have much in it, and being unwilling, being in other things so much at ease, to vex myself in a strange place at a melancholy time, passed all by, and were presently friends. Up, and several with me about business. Anon comes my Lord Brunker, as I expected, and we to the inquiring into the business of the late desertion of the shipwrights from work, who had left us for three days together for want of money and upon this all the morning, and brought it to a pretty good issue, that they, we believe, will come to-morrow to work. To dinner, having but a mean one, yet sufficient for him, and he well enough pleased, besides that I do not desire to vie entertainments with him or any else. Here was Captain Cock also, and Mr. Waith. We stayed together talking upon one business or other all the afternoon. In the evening my Lord Brunker, hearing that Mr. Ackworth's clerk, the Dutchman who writes and draws so well, was transcribing a book of rates and our ships for Captain Millet, a gallant of his mistress's. We sent for him for it. He would not deliver it, but said it was his mistress's, and had delivered it to her. At last we were forced to send to her for it. She would come herself, and indeed the book was a very neat one, and worth keeping as a rarity, but we did think fit, and though much against my will, to cancel all that he had finished of it, and did give her the rest, which vexed her, and she bore it discreetly enough, but with a cruel deal of malicious rancour in her looks. I must confess I would have persuaded her to have let us have it to the office, and it may be the board would not have censured too hardly of it. But my intent was to have had it as a record for the office. But she foresaw what would be the end of it, and so desired it might rather be cancelled, which was a plaguy deal of spite. My Lord Brunker being gone, and company, and she also. Afterwards I took my wife and people, and walked into the fields about a while till night, and then home, and so to sing a little, and then to bed. I was in great trouble all this day for my boy Tom, who went to Greenwich yesterday by my order, and come not home till to-night for fear of the plague. But he did come home to-night, saying he stayed last night by Mr. Hayter's advice, hoping to have me called as I come home with my boat to come along with me. Ninth. Up and walked to Greenwich. And there we sat and dispatched a good deal of business I had a mind to. At noon, by invitation to my Lord Brunkers, all of us, to dinner, we a good venison pasty, a mighty merry. Here was Sir W. Doyley, lately come from Ipswich about the sick and wounded, and Mr. Evelyn, and Captain Cock. My wife also was sent for by my Lord Brunker, by Cock, and was here. After dinner my Lord and his mistress would see her home again, it being a most cursed rainy afternoon, having had none a great while before, and I, forced to go to the office on foot through all the rain, was almost wet to my skin, and spoiled my silk breeches almost. Rained all the afternoon and evening, so, as my letters being done, 
I was forced to get a bed at Captain Cox, where I find Sir W. Doyley, and he and Evelyn at supper, and I with them full of discourse of the neglect of our masters, the great officers of state, about all business, and especially that of money, having now some thousands prisoners, kept to no purpose at a great charge, and no money provided almost for the doing of it. We fell to talk largely of the want of some person's understanding to look after businesses, but all goes to rack. For, says Captain Cock, my Lord Treasurer, he minds his ease, and let things go how they will. If he can have his eight thousand pounds per annum, and a game at Lombre, he is well. My Lord Chancellor, he minds getting of money, and nothing else, and my Lord Ashley will rob the devil and the altar, but he will get money if it be to be got. But that that put us into this great melancholy was news brought to-day, which Captain Cock reports, as a certain truth, that all the Dutch fleet, men of war, and merchant East India ships, are got every one in from Bergen the third of this month, Sunday last, which will make us all ridiculous. The fleet come home with shame to require a great deal of money, which is not to be had, to discharge many men that must get the plague then, or continue at greater charge on shipboard, nothing done by them to encourage the Parliament to give money, nor the kingdom able to spare any money if they would, at this time of the plague, so that, as things look at present, the whole state must come to ruin. Full of these melancholy thoughts, to bed, where, though I lay the softest I ever did in my life, with a down bed, after the Danish manner upon me, yet I slept very ill, chiefly through the thoughts of my Lord Sandwich's concernment in all this ill success at sea. Tenth, Lord's Day. Walked home, being forced thereto by one of my watermen, falling sick yesterday, and it was God's great mercy I did not go by water with them yesterday, for he fell sick on Saturday night, and it is to be feared of the plague. So I sent him away to London with his fellow, but another boat come to me this morning, whom I sent to Blackwall for Mr. Andrews. I walked to Woolwich, and there find Mr. Hill, and he and I all the morning at music, and a song he hath set of three parts, methinks very good. And on comes Mr. Andrews, though it be a very ill day. And so after dinner we to music, and sang till about four or five o'clock, it blowing very hard, and now and then raining, and wind and tide being against us. Andrews and I took leave, and walked to Greenwich. My wife, before I come out, telling me the ill news, that she hears that her father is very ill, and then I told her I feared of the plague, for that the house is shut up. And so she much troubled, she did desire me to send them something, and I said I would, and will do so. But before I come out, there happened news to come to me by an express from Mr. Coventry, telling me the most happy news of my Lord Sandwich's meeting with part of the Dutch, his taking two of their East India ships, and six or seven others, and very good prizes, and that he is in search of the rest of the fleet, which he hopes to find upon the well-bank, with the loss only of the Hector, poor Captain Cuttle. This news do so overjoy me, that I know not what to say enough to express it. But the better to do it, I did walk to Greenwich, and there, sending away Mr. Andrews, I to Captain Cox, where I find my Lord Brunker and his mistress, and Sir J. Minnes, where we supped, there was also Sir W. Doyley and Mr. Evelyn, but the receipt of this news did put us all into such an ecstasy of joy, that it inspired into Sir J. Minnes and Mr. Evelyn such a spirit of mirth, that in all my life I never met with so merry a two hours as our company this night was. Among other humours, Mr. Evelyn's repeating of some verses made up of nothing but the various acceptations of may and can, and doing it so aptly upon occasion of something of that nature, and so fast, did make us all die almost with laughing, and did so stop the mouth of Sir J. Minnes in the middle of all his mirth, and in a thing agreeing with his own manner of genius, that I never saw any man so outdone in all my life. And Sir J. Minnes' mirth, too, to see himself outdone, was the crown of all our mirth. In this humour we sat till about ten at night, and so my lord and his mistress home, and we to bed, it being one of the times of my life wherein I was the fullest of true sense of joy. Eleventh. Up and walked to the office, there to do some business till ten of the clock, and then by agreement my lord, Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Doyley, and I took boat, and over to the ferry, where Sir W. Batten's coach was ready for us, and to Walthamstow drove merrily, excellent merry discourse in the way, and most upon our last night's revels. There come we were very merry, and a good plain venison dinner, after dinner to billiards, where I won an angel, and among other sports we were merry with my pretending to have a warrant to Sir W. Hicks, who was there, and was out of humour with Sir W. Doyley's having lately got a warrant for a leash of bucks, of which we were now eating one, which vexed him, and at last would compound with me to give my Lord Brunker half a buck now, 
and me a doe for it a while hence when the season comes in which we agreed to and had held but that we fear sir w doyley did betray our design which spoiled all however my lady batten invited herself to dine with him this week and she invited us all to dine with her there which we agreed to only to vex him he being the most niggardly fellow it seems in the world full of good victuals and mirth we set homeward in the evening and very merry all the way so to greenwich where when come i find my lord rutherford and creed come from court and among other things have brought me several orders for money to pay for tangier and among the rest seven thousand pounds and more to this lord which is an excellent thing to consider that though they can do nothing else they can give away the king's money upon their progress i did give him the best answer i could to pay him with tallies and that is all they could get from me i was not in humour to spend much time with them but walked a little before sir jaminus door and then took leave and i by water to woolwich where with my wife to a game at tables and to bed twelfth up and walked to the office where we sat late and thence to dinner home with sir j minnes and so to the office where writing letters and home in the evening where my wife shews me a letter from her brother speaking of their father's being ill like to die which god forgive me did not trouble me so much as it should though i was indeed sorry for it i did presently resolve to send him something in a letter from my wife viz twenty shillings so to bed thirteenth up and walked to greenwich taking pleasure to walk with my minute watch in my hand by which i am come now to see the distances of my way from woolwich to greenwich and do find myself to come within two minutes constantly to the same place at the end of each quarter of an hour here we rendezvoused at captain cox and there eat oysters and so to my lord brunker sir j minnes and i took boat and in my lord's coach to sir w hicks's whither by and by my lady batten and sir william comes it is a good seat with a fair grove of trees by it and the remains of a good garden but so let to run to ruin both house and everything in and about it so ill furnished and miserably looked after i never did see in all my life not so much as a latch to his dining-room door which saved him nothing for the wind blowing into the room for want thereof flung down a great bow pot that stood upon the side-table and that fell upon some venice glasses and did him a crown's worth of hurt he did give us the meanest dinner of beef shoulder and umbles of venison which he takes away from the keeper of the forest and a few pigeons and all in the meanest manner that ever i did see to the basest degree after dinner we officers of the navy stepped aside to read some letters and consider some business and so in again i was only pleased at a very fine picture of the queen mother when she was young by van dyke a very good picture and a lovely sweet face thence in the afternoon home and landing at greenwich i saw mr penn walking my way so we walked together and for discourse i put him into talk of france when he took delight to tell me of his observations some good some impertinent and all ill told but it served for want of better and so to my house where i find my wife abroad and hath been all this day nobody knows where which troubled me it being late and a cold evening so being invited to his mother's to supper we took mrs barbara who was mighty finely dressed and in my lady's coach which we met going for my wife we thither and there after some discourse went to supper by and by comes my wife and mercer and had been with captain cock all day he coming and taking her out to go see his boy at school at bromley and brought her home again with great respect here pretty merry only i had no stomach having dined late to eat after supper mr penn and i fell to discourse about some words in a french song my wife was saying d'un air tout interdict wherein i lay twenty to one against him which he would not agree with me though i know myself in the right as to the sense of the word and almost angry we were and were an hour and more upon the dispute till at last broke up not satisfied and so home in their coach and so to bed h russell did this day deliver my twenty shillings to my wife's father or mother but has not yet told us how they do fourteenth up and walked to greenwich and there fitted myself in several businesses to go to london where i have not been now a pretty while but before i went from the office news is brought by word of mouth that letters are now just now brought from the fleet of our taking a great many more of the dutch fleet in which i did never more plainly see my command of my temper in my not admitting myself to receive any kind of joy from it till i had heard the certainty of it and therefore went by water directly to the duke of albemarle where i find a letter of the lathe from sole bay from my lord sandwich of the fleet's meeting with about eighteen more of the dutch fleet and his taking of most of them and the messenger says they had taken three after the letter was wrote and sealed which being twenty-one and the fourteen took the other day 
is forty-five sail, some of which are good, and others rich ships, which is so great a cause of joy in us all, that my lord and everybody is highly joyed thereat. And having taken a copy of my lord's letter, I away back again to the bear at the bridge foot, being full of wind and out of order, and there called for a biscuit and a piece of cheese and gill of sack, being forced to walk over the bridge toward the change, and the plague being all thereabouts. Here my news was highly welcome, and I did wonder to see the change so full, I believe two hundred people, but not a man or merchant of any fashion, but plain men all, and, Lord, to see how I did endeavour all I could to talk with as few as I could, there being now no observation of shutting up of houses infected, that, to be sure, we do converse and meet with people that have the plague upon them. I to Sir Robert Vinus, where my main business was about settling the business of de Busti's five thousand pound tallies, which I did for the present to enable me to have some money, and so home, buying some things for my wife in the way. So home, and put up several things to carry to Woolwich, and upon serious thoughts I am advised by W. Griffin to let my money and plate rest there, as being as safe as any place, nobody imagining that people would leave money in their houses now, when all their families are gone. So, for the present that being my opinion, I did leave them there still. But, Lord, to see the trouble that it puts a man to, to keep safe, what with pain a man hath been getting together, and there is good reason for it. Down to the office, and there wrote letters, to and again, about this good news of our victory, and so by water home late, where, when I come home, I spent some thoughts upon the occurrences of this day, giving matter for as much content on one hand, and melancholy on another, as any day in all my life. For the first, the finding of my money and plate, and all safe at London, and speeding in my business of money this day. The hearing of this good news to such excess, after so great a despair of my lord's doing anything this year, adding to that the decrease of five hundred and more, which is the first decrease we have yet had in the sickness since it begun, and great hopes that the next week it will be greater. Then on the other side, my finding that though the bill in general is abated, yet the city within the walls is increased, and likely to continue so, and is close to our house there. My meeting dead corpses of the plague, carried to be buried close to me at noonday through the city in Fenchurch Street, to see a person sick of the sores carried close by me by Grace Church in a hackney coach, my finding the Angel Tavern at the lower end of Tower Hill shut up, and more than that, the alehouse at the Tower Stairs, and more than that, the person was then dying of the plague when I was last there, a little while ago, at night, to write a short letter there, and I overheard the mistress of the house sadly saying to her husband, somebody was very ill, but did not think it was of the plague, to hear that poor pain my waiter hath buried a child and is dying himself, to hear that a labourer I sent but the other day to Dagenham's to know how they did there is dead of the plague, and that one of my own watermen that carried me daily fell sick as soon as he had landed me on Friday morning last, when I had been all night upon the water, and I believe he did get his infection that day at Brainford, and is now dead of the plague, to hear that Captain Lambert and Cuttle are killed in the taking these ships, and that Mr. Sidney Montague is sick of a desperate fever at my Lady Carteret's at Scott's Hall, to hear that Mr. Lewis hath another daughter sick, and lastly that both my servants, W. Hewer and Tom Edwards, have lost their fathers, both in St. Sepulchre's parish of the plague this week, do put me into great apprehensions of melancholy, and with good reason. But I put off the thoughts of sadness as much as I can, and the rather to keep my wife in good heart, and family also. After supper, having eat nothing all this day, upon a fine tench of Mr. Sheldon's taking, we to bed. Fifteenth. Up, it being a cold, misting morning, and so by water to the office, where very busy upon several businesses. At noon got the messenger, Marlow, to get me a piece of bread and butter and cheese, and a bottle of beer and ale, and so I went not out of the office, but dined off that, and my boy Tom, but the rest of my clerks went home to dinner. Then to my business again, and by and by sent my waterman to see how Sir W. Warren do, who is sick, and for which I have reason to be very sorry, he being the friend I have got most by, of most friends in England, but the king, who returns me that he is pretty well again, his disease being an ague. I by water to Deptford, thinking to have seen my valentine, but I could not, and so come back again, and to the office, where a little business, and thence with Captain Cock, and there drank a cup of good drink, which I am fain to allow myself during this plague time, by advice of all, and not contrary to my oath, my physician being dead, and surgeon out of the way, whose advice I am obliged to take. And so by water home, and eat my supper, and to bed, 
being in much pain to think what i shall do this winter time for go every day to woolwich i cannot without endangering my life and staying from my wife at greenwich is not handsome sixteenth up and walk to greenwich reading a play and to the office where i find sir jamin is gone to the fleet like a doting fool to do no good but proclaim himself an ass for no service he can do there nor inform my lord who is coming thither to the boy of the nor in anything worth his knowledge at noon to dinner to my lord brunker where sir w batten and his lady come by invitation and very merry we were only that the discourse of the likelihood of the increase of the plague this week makes us a little sad but then again the thoughts of the late prizes make us glad after dinner by appointment comes mr andrews and he and i walking alone in the garden talking of our tangier business and i endeavoured by the by to offer some encouragements for their continuing in the business which he seemed to take hold of and the truth is my profit is so much concerned that i could wish they would and would take pains to ease them in the business of money as much as was possible he being gone after i had ordered him two thousand pounds and he paid me my quantum out of it i also walked to the office and there to my business but find myself through the unfitness of my place to write in and my coming from great dinners and drinking wine that i am not in the good temper of doing business nowadays that i used to be and ought still to be at night to captain cox meaning to lie there it being late and he not being at home i walked to him to my lord brunker's and there stayed a while they being at tables and so by and by parted and walked to his house and after a mess of good broth to bed in great pleasure his company being most excellent seventeenth lord's day up and before i went out of my chamber did draw a music scale in order to my having it at any time ready in my hand to turn to for exercise for i have a great mind in this vacation to perfect myself in my scale in order to my practising of composition and so that being done i downstairs and there find captain cock under the barber's hands the barber that did heretofore trim commissioner pet and with whom i have been he offered to come this day after dinner with his violin to play me a set of lyre airs upon it which i was glad of hoping to be merry thereby being ready we to church where a company of fine people to church and a fine church and very good sermon mr plume being a very excellent scholar and preacher coming out of the church i met mrs pierce whom i was ashamed to see having not been with her since my coming to town but promised to visit her thence with captain cock in his coach home to dinner whither comes by invitation my lord brunker and his mistress and very good company we were but in dinner-time comes sir j minnes from the fleet like a simple weak man having nothing to say of what he hath done there but tells of what value he imagines the prizes to be and that my lord sandwich is well and mightily concerned to hear that i was well but this did put me upon a desire of going thither and moving of it to my lord we presently agreed upon it to go this very tide we two and captain cock so everybody prepared to fit himself for his journey and i walked to woolwich to trim and shift myself and by the time i was ready they come down in the bison yacht and so i aboard and my boy tom and there very merrily we sailed to below gravesend and there come to anchor for all night and supped and talked and with much pleasure at last settled ourselves to sleep having very good lodging upon cushions in the cabin eighteenth by break of day we come to within sight of the fleet which was a very fine thing to behold being above one hundred ships great and small with the flagships of each squadron distinguished by their several flags on their main fore or mizzen masts among others the sovereign charles and prince in the last of which my lord sandwich was when we called by her side his lordship was not stirring so we come to anchor a little below his ship thinking to have rowed on board him but the wind and tide were so strong against us that we could not get up to him no though rowed by a boat of the princess that come to us to tow us up at last however he brought us within a little way and then they flung out a rope to us from the prince and so come on board but with great trouble and time and patience it being very cold we find my lord newly up in his nightgown very well he received us kindly telling us the state of the fleet lacking provisions having no beer at all nor have had most of them these three weeks or month and but few days dry provisions and indeed he tells us that he believes no fleet was ever set to sea in so ill condition of provision as this was when it went out last he did inform us in the business of bergen so as to let us see how the judgment of the world is not to be depended on in things they know not it being a place just wide enough and not so much hardly for ships to go through to it the yard-arms sticking in the very rocks 
he do not upon his best inquiry find reason to accept against any part of the management of the business by Teddyman, he having stayed treating no longer than during the night whilst he was fitting himself to fight bringing his ship abreast and not a quarter of an hour longer as is said nor could more ships have been brought to play as is thought nor could men be landed there being ten thousand men effectively always in arms of the danes nor says he could we expect more from the dane than he did it being impossible to set fire on the ships but it must burn the town but that wherein the dane did amiss is that he did assist them the dutch all the while while he was treating with us while he should have been neutral to us both but however he did demand but the treaty of us which is that we should not come with more than five ships a flag of truce is said and confessed by my lord that he believes it was hung out but while they did hang it out they did shoot at us so that it was not either seen perhaps or fit to cease upon sight of it while they continued actually in action against us but the main thing my lord wonders at and condemns the dane for is that the blockhead who is so much in debt to the hollander having now a treasure more by much than all his crown was worth and that which would for ever have beggared the hollanders should not take this time to break with the hollander and thereby paid his debt which must have been forgiven him and got the greatest treasure into his hands that ever was together in the world by and by my lord took me aside to discourse of his private matters who was very free with me touching the ill condition of the fleet that it hath been in and the good fortune that he hath had and nothing else that these prizes are to be imputed to he also talked with me about mr coventry's dealing with him in sending sir w pen away before him which was not fair nor kind but that he hath mastered and cajoled sir w pen that he hath been able to do nothing in the fleet but been obedient to him but withal tells me he is a man that is but of very mean parts and a fellow not to be lived with so false and base he is which i know well enough to be very true and did as i had formerly done give my lord my knowledge of him by and by was called a council of war on board when comes sir w pen there and sir christopher mings sir edward sprague sir joss jordan sir thomas teddyman and sir roger cuttons and so the necessity of the fleet for victuals clothes and money was discoursed but by the discourse there of all but my lord that is to say the counterfeit grave nonsense of sir w pen and the poor mean discourse of the rest methinks i saw how the government and management of the greatest business of the three nations is committed to very ordinary heads saving my lord and in effect is only upon him who is able to do what he pleases with them they not having the meanest degree of reason to be able to oppose anything that he says and so i fear it is ordered but like all the rest of the king's public affairs the council being up they most of them went away only sir w pen who stayed to dine there and did so but the wind being high the ship though the motion of it was hardly discernible to the eye did make me sick so as i could not eat anything almost after dinner cock did pray me to help him to five hundred pounds of w howe who is deputy treasurer wherein my lord brunker and i am to be concerned and i did ask it my lord and he did consent to have us furnished with five hundred pounds and i did get it paid to sir roger cuttons and mr pierce in part for above one thousand pounds worth of goods mace nutmeg cinnamon and cloves and he tells us we may hope to get fifteen hundred pounds by it which god send great spoil i hear there hath been of the two east india ships and that yet they will come in to the king very rich so that i hope this journey will be worth a hundred pounds to me after having paid this money we took leave of my lord and so to our yacht again having seen many of my friends there among others i hear that w howe will grow very rich by this last business and grows very proud and insolent by it but it is what i ever expected i hear by everybody how much my poor lord of sandwich was concerned for me during my silence a while lest i had been dead of the plague in this sickly time no sooner come into the yacht though overjoyed with the good work we have done to-day but i was overcome with sea-sickness so that i began to spew soundly and so continued a good while till at last i went into the cabin and shutting my eyes my trouble did cease that i fell asleep which continued till we come into chatham river where the water was smooth and then i rose and was very well and the tide coming to be against us we did land before we come to chatham and walked a mile having very good discourse by the way it being dark and it beginning to rain just as we got thither at commissioner pett's we did eat and drink very well and very merry we were and about ten at night it being moonshine and very cold we set out his coach carrying us and so all night travelled to greenwich we sometimes sleeping a little and then talking and laughing by the way and with much pleasure but that it was very horrible cold that i was afeard of an egg a pretty passage was that the coach stood of a sudden and the coachman come down 
and the horses stirring, he cried, Hold! which waked me, and the coachman standing at the boot to do something or other, and crying, Hold! I did wake of a sudden, and not knowing who he was, nor thinking of the coachman between sleeping and waking, I did take up the heart to take him by the shoulder, thinking verily he had been a thief. But when I waked, I found my cowardly heart to discover a fear within me, and that I should never have done it if I had been awake. 19. About four or five of the clock, we come to Greenwich, and having first set down my Lord Brunker, Cock and I went to his house, it being light, and there, to our great trouble, we being sleepy and cold, we met with the ill news that his boy Jack was gone to bed sick, which put Captain Cock and me also into much trouble, the boy, as they told us, complaining of his head most, which is a bad sign, it seems. So they presently betook themselves to consult whither and how to remove him. However, I thought it not fit for me to discover too much fear to go away, nor had I any place to go to. So to bed I went, and slept till ten of the clock, and then comes Captain Cock to wake me, and tell me that his boy was well again. With great joy I heard the news, and he told it, so I up and to the office where we did a little, and but a little business. At noon by invitation to my Lord Brunker's, where we stayed till four of the clock for my Lady Batten, and she not then coming, we to dinner, and pretty merry, but disordered by her making us stay so long. After dinner I to the office, and there wrote letters, and did business till night, and then to Sir J. Minnes's, where I find my Lady Batten come, and she and my Lord Brunker and his mistress, and the whole houseful there, at cards. But by and by my Lord Brunker goes away, and others of the company, and when I expected Sir J. Minnes and his sister should have stayed, to have made Sir W. Batten and Lady Sup, I find they go up in snuff to bed, without taking any manner of leave of them, but left them with Mr. Borman. The reason of this I could not presently learn, but anon I hear it is that Sir J. Minnes did expect and intend them a supper, but they, without respect to him, did first apply themselves to Borman, which makes all this great feud. However, I stayed and there supped, all of us being in great disorder from this, and more from Cock's boy being ill, where my Lady Batten and Sir W. Batten did come to town with an intent to lodge, and I was forced to go seek a lodging, which my W. Hewer did get me, viz. his own chamber in the town, whither I went and found it a very fine room, and there lay most excellently. 20th. Called up by Captain Cock, who was last night put into great trouble upon his boys being rather worse than better, upon which he removed him out of his house to his stable, who told me that to my comfort his boy was now as well as ever he was in his life. So I up, and after being trimmed, the first time I have been touched by a barber these twelve months, I think, and more, went to Sir J. Minnes's, where I find all out of order still, they having not seen one another till by and by Sir J. Minnes and Sir W. Batten met, to go into my Lord Brunker's coach, and so we four to Lambeth, and thence to the Duke of Albemarle, to inform him what we have done as to the fleet, which is very little, and to receive his direction. But, Lord, what a sad time it is to see no boats upon the river, and grass grows all up and down Whitehall Court, and nobody but poor wretches in the streets. And which is worst of all, the Duke showed us the number of the plague this week, brought in the last night from the Lord Mayor, that it is increased about six hundred more than the last, which is quite contrary to all our hopes and expectations, from the coldness of the late season, for the whole general number is eight thousand two hundred and ninety-seven, and of them the plague seven thousand one hundred and sixty-five, which is more in the whole by above fifty than the biggest bill yet, which is very grievous to us all. I find here a design in my Lord Brunker and Captain Cock, to have had my Lord Brunker chosen as one of us, to have been sent aboard one of the East Indiamen, and Captain Cock as a merchant to be joined with him, and Sir J. Minnes for the other, and Sir G. Smith to be joined with him. But I did order it so that my Lord Brunker and Sir J. Minnes were ordered, but I did stop the merchants to be added, which would have been a most pernicious thing to the King, I am sure. In this I did, I think, a very good office, though I cannot acquit myself from some envy of mine in the business, to have the profitable business done by another hand, while I lay wholly employed in the trouble of the office. Thence back again by my lord's coach to my lord Brunker's house, where I find my lady Batten, who is become very great with Mrs. Williams, my lord Brunker's hall. And there we dined, and were mighty merry. After dinner I to the office, there to write letters, to fit myself for a journey to-morrow to none such to the exchequer by appointment. That being done, I to Sir J. Minnes, where I find Sir W. Batten and his lady gone home to Walthamstow, in great snuff as to Sir J. Minnes, but yet with some necessity, hearing that a maid-servant of theirs is taken ill. 
Here I stayed and resolved of my going in my Lord Brunker's coach, which he would have me to take, though himself cannot go with me as he intended, and so to my last night's lodging, to bed, very weary. 21st. Up between five and six o'clock, and by the time I was ready, my Lord's coach comes for me, and taking Will Hewer with me, who is all in mourning for his father, who is lately dead of the plague, as my boy Tom's is also, I set out, and took about a hundred pounds with me to pay the fees there, and so rode in some fear of robbing. When I come thither, I find only Mr. Ward, who led me to Burgess's bedside, and Spices, who, watching of the house, as it is their turns every night, did lie long in bed to-day, and I find nothing at all done in my business, which vexed me. But not seeing how to help it, I did walk up and down with Mr. Ward to see the house, and by and by Spicer and Mr. Falconbridge come to me, and he and I to a town near by, Yo, there drink, and set up my horses, and also bespoke a dinner, and while that is dressing went with Spicer and walked up and down the house and park, and a fine place it hath heretofore been, and a fine prospect about the house. A great walk of an elm and a walnut set one after another in order, and all the house on the outside filled with figures of stories, and good painting of Rubens or Holbein's doing. And one great thing is, that most of the house is covered, I mean the posts, and quarters in the walls, covered with lead and gilded. I walked into the ruined garden, and there found a plain little girl, kinswoman of Mr. Falconbridge, to sing very finely by the ear only, but a fine way of singing, and if I come ever to like a girl again, I shall think of getting her. Thence to the town, and there Spicer, Woodruff, and W. Bowyer, and I dined together, and a friend of Spicer's, and a good dinner I had for them. Falconbridge dined somewhere else, by appointment. Strange to see how young W. Bowyer looks at forty-one years. One would not take him for twenty-four or more, and is one of the greatest wonders I ever did see. After dinner, about four of the clock, we broke up, and I took coach and home, in fear for the money I had with me, but that this friend of Spicer's, one of the Duke's guard, did ride along the best part of the way with us. I got to my Lord Brunker's before night, and there I sat and supped with him and his mistress, and Cock, whose boy is yet ill. Thence, after losing a crown betting at tables, we walked home, Cock seeing me at my new lodging, where I went to bed. All my work this day in the coach, going and coming, was to refresh myself in my music scale, which I would fain have perfecter than ever I had yet. 22nd. Up betimes and to the office, meaning to have entered my last five or six days' journal, but was called away by my Lord Brunker and Sir J. Minnes, and to Blackwall, there to look after the storehouses in order to the laying of goods out of the East India ships, when they shall be unloaden. That being done, we into Johnson's house, and were much made of, eating and drinking. But here it is observable what he tells us, that in digging his late dock, he did twelve foot underground find perfect trees over-covered with earth, nut trees, with the branches and the very nuts upon them, some of whose nuts he showed us, their shells black with age and their kernel upon opening decayed, but their shell perfectly hard as ever, and a yew tree he showed us, upon which he says the very ivy was taken up whole about it, which upon cutting with an adze we found to be rather harder than the living tree usually is. They say very much, but I do not know how hard a yew tree naturally is. The arms, they say, were taken up at first hole about the body, which is very strange. Thence away by water, and I walked with my Lord Brunker home, and there at dinner comes a letter from my Lord Sandwich, to tell me that he would this day be at Woolwich, and desired me to meet him. Which fear he might have lain in Sir Jamin's pocket a while, he sending it me, did give my Lord Brunker, his mistress, and I occasion to talk of him, as the most unfit man for business in the world. Though at last afterwards I found that he was not in this faulty, but hereby I have got a clear evidence of my Lord Brunker's opinion of him. My Lord Brunker presently ordered his coach to be ready, and we to Woolwich, and my Lord Sandwich not being come, we took a boat, and about a mile off met him in his catch, and boarded him, and come up with him, and after making a little halt at my house, which I ordered, to have my wife see him, we all together by coach to Mr. Borman's, where Sir J. Minnes did receive him very handsomely, and there he is to lie and Sir J. Minnes did give him on the sudden a very handsome supper and brave discourse, my Lord Brunker and Captain Cock and Captain Herbert being there with myself. Here my Lord did witness great respect to me and very kind expressions, and by other occasions from one thing to another did take notice how I was overjoyed at first to see the King's letter to his Lordship, 
and told them how i did kiss it and that whatever he was i did always love the king this my lord brunker did take such notice of as that he could not forbear kissing me before my lord professing his finding occasion every day more and more to love me and captain cock has since of himself taken notice of that speech of my lord then concerning me and may be of good use to me among other discourse concerning long life sir jamin is saying that his great-grandfather was alive in edward the fifth's time my lord sandwich did tell us how few there have been of his family since king harry the eighth that is to say the then chief justice and his son the lord montague who was father to sir sidney who was his father and yet what is more wonderful he did assure us from the mouth of my lord montague himself that in king james's time when he had a mind to get the king to cut off the entail of some land which was given in harry the eighth's time to the family with the remainder in the crown he did answer the king in showing how unlikely it was that ever it could revert to the crown but that it would be a present convenience to him and did show that at that time there were four thousand persons derived from the very body of the chief justice it seems the number of daughters in the family having been very great and they too had most of them many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren this he tells as a most known and certain truth after supper my lord brunker took his leave and i also did mine taking captain herbert home to my lodging to lie with me who did mighty seriously inquire after who was that in the black dress with my wife yesterday and would not believe that it was my wife's maid mercer but it was she twenty third up unto my lord sandwich who did advise alone with me how far he might trust captain cock in the business of the prize goods my lord telling me that he hath taken into his hands two or three thousand pounds value of them it being a good way he says to get money and afterwards to get the king's allowance thereof it being easier he observes to keep money when got of the king than to get it when it is too late i advised him not to trust cock too far and did therefore offer him ready money for a thousand pounds or two which he listens to and do agree to which is great joy to me hoping thereby to get something thence by coach to lambeth his lordship and all our office and mr evelyn to the duke of albemarle where after the compliment with my lord very kind we sat down to consult of the disposing and supporting of the fleet with victuals and money and for the sick men and prisoners and i did propose the taking out some goods out of the prizes to the value of ten thousand pounds which was accorded to and an order drawn up and signed by the duke and my lord done in the best manner i can and referred to my lord brunker and sir j minnes but what inconveniences may arise from it i do not yet see but fear there may be many here we dined and i did hear my lord craven whisper as he is mightily possessed with a good opinion of me much to my advantage which my good lord did second and anon my lord craven did speak publicly of me to the duke in the hearing of all the rest and the duke did say something of the like advantage to me i believe not much to the satisfaction of my brethren but i was mightily joyed at it thence took leave leaving my lord sandwich to go visit the bishop of canterbury and i and sir w batten down to the tower where he went further by water and i home and among other things took out all my gold to carry along with me to-night with captain cock down to the fleet being a hundred and eighty pounds and more hoping to lay out that and a great deal more to good advantage thence down to greenwich to the office and there wrote several letters and so to my lord sandwich and mighty merry and he mighty kind to me in the face of all saying much in my favour and after supper i took leave and with captain cock set out in the yacht about ten o'clock at night and after some discourse and drinking a little my mind full of what we are going about and jealous of cock's outdoing me so to sleep upon beds brought by cock on board mighty handsome and never slept better than upon this bed upon the floor in the cabin twenty fourth lord's day waked and up and drank and then to discourse and then being about greys and a very calm curious morning we took our wherry and to the fishermen and bought a great deal of fine fish and to Gray's End to white's and had part of it dressed and in the meantime we to walk about a mile from the town and so back again and there after breakfast one of our watermen told us he had heard of a bargain of clothes for us and we went to a blind alehouse at the further end wretched dirty seamen who of the town to a couple of poor wretches had got together about thirty-seven pounds of clothes and to ten of nutmegs and we bought them of them the first at five shillings sixpence per pound and the latter at four shillings and paid them in gold but lord to see how silly these men are in the selling of it and easily to be persuaded almost to anything offering a bag to us to pass as twenty pounds of clothes which upon weighing proved twenty-five pounds but it would never have been allowed by my conscience to have wronged the poor wretches who told us how dangerously they had got some and dearly paid for the rest of these goods this being done we with great content herein on board again and there captain cock and i to discourse of our business but he will not yet be open to me nor am i to him till i hear what he will say and do with sir roger cuttance 
However, this discourse did do me good, and got me a copy of the agreement made the other day on board for the parcel of Mr. Pierce and Sir Roger Cuttons. But this great parcel is of my Lord Savage's. By and by to dinner about three o'clock, and then I in the cabin to writing down my journal for these last seven days to my great content. It having pleased God that in this sad time of the plague everything else has conspired to my happiness and pleasure more for these last three months than in all my life before in so little time. God long preserve it, and make me thankful for it. After finishing my journal, then to discourse and to read, and then to supper and to bed, my mind not being at full ease, having not fully satisfied myself how Captain Cock will deal with me as to the share of the profits. 25th. Found ourselves come to the fleet, and so aboard the Prince. And there, after a good while in discourse, we did agree a bargain of five thousand pounds with Sir Roger Cuttons for my Lord Sandwich for silk, cinnamon, nutmegs, and indigo and I was near signing to an undertaking for the payment of the whole sum, but I did by chance escape it, having since, upon second thoughts, great cause to be glad of it, reflecting upon the craft and not good condition, it may be, of Captain Cock. I could get no trifles for my wife. And on to dinner, and thence in great haste to make a short visit to Sir W. Penn, where I found them and his lady and daughter and many commanders at dinner. Among others, Sir G. Askew, of whom, whatever the matter is, the world is silent altogether. But a very pretty dinner there was, and after dinner Sir W. Penn made a bargain with Cock for ten bales of silk, at sixteen shillings per pound, which, as Cock says, will be a good pennyworth. And so away to the Prince, and presently comes my lord on board from Greenwich, with whom, after a little discourse about his trusting of Cock, we parted and to our yacht. But it being calm, we to make haste, took our wary toward Chatham. But it growing dark, we were put to great difficulties, our simple yet confident waterman, not knowing a step of the way and we found ourselves to go backward and forward, which in the dark night and a wild place did vex us mightily. At last we got a fisher-boy by chance, and took him into the boat, and being an odd kind of boy did vex us too, for he would not answer us aloud when we spoke to him, but did carry us safe thither, though with a mistake or two. But I wonder they were not more. In our way I was surprised, and so were we all, at the strange nature of the sea-water in a dark night, that it seemed like fire upon every stroke of the oar, and, they say, is a sign of wind. We went to the Crown Inn at Rochester, and there to supper, and made ourselves merry with our poor fisher-boy, who told us he had not been in a bed in the whole seven years since he came to Prentice, and hath two or three more years to serve. After eating something, we in our clothes, to bed. 26th. Up by five o'clock, and got post-horses, and so set out for Greenwich, calling and drinking at Dartford. Being come to Greenwich, and shifting myself, I to the office. From whence by and by my Lord Brunker and Sir J. Minnes set out toward Erith, to take charge of the two East India ships, which I had a hand in contriving for the King's service, and may do myself a good office too thereby. I to dinner with Mr. Wright, to his father-in-law in Greenwich, one of the most silly, harmless, prating old men that ever I heard in my life. Cree dined with me, and among other discourses got of me a promise of half that he could get my Lord Rutherford to give me, upon clearing his business, which should not be less, he says, than fifty pounds for my half, which is a good thing, though cunningly got of him. By and by, Llewellyn comes, and I hope to get something of Deering shortly. They being gone, Mr. Wright and I went into the garden to discourse with much trouble, for fear of losing all the profit and principle of what we have laid out in buying of prize goods, and therefore puts me upon thoughts of flinging up my interest, but yet I shall take good advice first. Thence to the office, and after some letters, down to Woolwich, where I have not lain with my wife these eight days, I think, or more. After supper, and telling her my mind in my trouble, in what I have done as to buying of these goods, we to bed. 27th. Up and saw and admired my wife's picture of our Saviour, now finished, which is very pretty. So by water to Greenwich, where with Creed and Lord Rutherford, and there my lord told me that he would give me a hundred pounds for my pains, which pleased me well, though Creed, like a cunning rogue, hath got a promise of half of it from me. We to the King's Head, the great music-house, the first time I was ever there, and had a good breakfast, and thence parted, I being much troubled to hear from Creed that he was told at Salisbury, that I am come to be a great swearer and drinker, though I know the contrary. But, Lord, to see how my late little drinking of wine is taken notice of by envious men to my disadvantage. I thence to Captain Cox, and he not yet come from town, to Mr. Evelyn's, where much company, and thence in his coach with him to the Duke of Albemarle, by Lambeth, who was in a mighty pleasant humour. There the Duke tells us that the Dutch do stay abroad, and our fleet must go out again, or to be ready to do so. 
Here we got several things ordered as we desired for the relief of the prisoners and sick and wounded men. Here I saw this week's bill of mortality, wherein, blessed be God, there is above eighteen hundred decrease, being the first considerable decrease we have had. Back again the same way, and had most excellent discourse of Mr. Evelyn, touching all manner of learning, wherein I find him a very fine gentleman, and particularly of painting, in which he tells me the beautiful Mrs. Middleton is rare, and his own wife do brave things. He brought me to the office, whither comes unexpectedly Captain Cock, who hath brought one parcel of our goods by wagons, and at first resolved to have lodged them at our office, but then the thoughts of its being the king's house altered our resolution, and so put them at his friend's, Mr. Glanville's, and there they are safe. Would the rest of them were so too? In discourse we come to mention my profit, and he offers me five hundred pounds clear, and I demand six hundred pounds for my certain profit. We part to-night, and I lie there at Mr. Glanville's house, there being none there but a maid-servant and a young man, being in some pain, partly from not knowing what to do in this business, having a mind to be at a certainty in my profit, and partly through his having Jack sick still, and his blackamoor now also fallen sick. So he being gone, I to bed. 28th. Up, and being mightily pleased with my night's lodging, drank a cup of beer, and went out to my office, and there did some business. And so took boat and down to Woolwich, having first made a visit to Madam Williams, who is going down to my Lord Brunker, and there dined, and then fitted my papers and money and everything else for a journey to Nonsuch to-morrow. That being done, I walked to Greenwich, and there to the office pretty late, expecting Captain Cox coming, which he did, and so with me to my new lodging, and there I chose rather to lie because of my interest in the goods that we have brought there to lie. But the people were abed, so we knocked them up, and so I to bed, and in the night was mightily troubled with a looseness, I suppose from some fresh damp linen that I put on this night, and feeling for a chamber-pot there was none, I having called the maid up out of her bed, she had forgot, I suppose, to put one there, so I was forced in this strange house to rise and shit in the chimney twice, and so to bed, and was very well again, and twenty-ninth, to sleep till five o'clock, when it is now very dark, and then rose, being called up by order by Mr. Marlowe, and so up and dressed myself, and by and by comes Mr. Lashmore on horseback, and I had my horse I borrowed of Mr. Gilthrop, Sir W. Batten's clerk, brought to me, and so we set out and rode hard, and was at none such by about eight o'clock, a very fine journey, and a fine day. There I come just about chapel time, and so I went to chapel with them, and thence to the several officers about my tallies, which I find done, but strung for sums not to my purpose, and so was forced to get them to promise me to have them cut into other sums. But, Lord, what a do I had to persuade the dull fellows to it, especially Mr. Warder, master of the Pells, and yet without any manner of reason for their scruple. But at last I did, and so left my tallies there against another day, and so walked to Yule, and there did spend a piece upon them having a whole house full, and much mirth by a sister of the mistress of the house, an old maid lately married to a lieutenant of a company that quarters there. And much pleasant discourse we had, and dinner being done, we to horse again, and come to Greenwich before night. And so to my lodging, and there being a little weary, sat down, and fell to order some of my pocket papers. And then comes Captain Cock, and after a great deal of discourse with him seriously upon the disorders of our state through lack of men to mind the public business, and to understand it, we broke up sitting up talking very late. We spoke a little of my late business propounded of taking profit for my money laid out for these goods, but he finds I rise in my demand, he offering me still five hundred pounds certain. So we did give it over, and I to bed. I hear for certain this night upon the road that Sir Martin Noel is this day dead of the plague in London, where he hath lain sick of it these eight days. Thirtieth. Up into the office, where busy all the morning, and at noon with Sir W. Batten, to Colonel Cleggett to dinner, being invited, where a very pretty dinner, to my full content, and very merry. The great burden we have upon us at this time at the office, is the providing for prisoners and sick men that are recovered, they lying before our office doors all night and all day, poor wretches. Having been on shore, the captains won't receive them on board, and other ships we have not to put them on, nor money to pay them off, or provide for them. God remove this difficulty. This made us followed all the way to this gentleman's house, and there I waited for our coming out after dinner. Here they come Llewellyn to me, and would force me to take Mr. Deering's twenty pieces in gold. He did offer me a good while since, which I did, yet really and sincerely against my will and content, I seeing him a man not likely to do well in his business, nor I to reap any comfort in having to do with, and be beholden to, a man that minds more his pleasure and company than his business. Thence mighty merry, and much pleased with the dinner and company, and they with me, I parted, and there was set upon by the poor wretches, whom I did give good words and some little money to, and the poor people went away like lambs, 
and in good earnest are not to be censured if their necessities drive them to bad courses of stealing or the like, while they lack wherewith to live. Thence to the office, and there wrote a letter or two, and dispatched a little business, and then to Captain Cox, where I find Mr. Temple, the fat blade, Sir Robert Viner's chief man, and we three and two companions of his in the evening, by agreement, took ship in the besom, and the tide carried us no further than Woolwich, about eight at night. And so I on shore to my wife, and there to my great trouble find my wife out of order. And she took me downstairs, and there alone did tell me her falling out with both her maids, and particularly Mary. And how Mary had to her teeth told her she would tell me of something that should stop her mouth, and words of that sense, which I suspect may be about Brown. But my wife praised me to call it to examination, and this, I being of myself jealous, do make me mightily out of temper, and seeing it not fit to enter into the dispute did passionately go away, thinking to go on board again. But when I come to the stairs I considered the besom would not go till the next ebb, and it was best to lie in a good bed, and, it may be, get myself into a better humour by being with my wife. So I back again and to bed, and having otherwise so many reasons to rejoice and hopes of good profit, besides considering the ill that trouble of mind and melancholy may in this sickly time bring a family into, and that if the difference were never so great it is not a time to put away servants, I was resolved to salve up the business rather than stir in it, and so become pleasant with my wife and to bed, minding nothing of this difference. So to sleep with a good deal of content, and saving only this night and a day or two about the same business a month or six weeks ago, I do end this month with the greatest content, and may say that these last three months, for joy, health, and profit, have been much the greatest that ever I received in all my life, in only twelve months almost, in my life, having nothing upon me but the consideration of the sickliness of the season during this great plague to mortify me, for all which the Lord God be praised. October of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665 by Samuel Pepys. October, 1665. October 1st, Lord's Day. Called up about four of the clock, and so dressed myself, and so on board the besom, and there finding all my company asleep, I would not wake them. But it beginning to be break of day, I did stay upon the deck walking, and then into the master's cabin, and there laid and slept a little, and so at last was waked by Captain Cox calling of me, and so I turned out, and then to chat and talk and laugh, and mighty merry. We spent most of the morning talking and reading of the siege of Rhodes, which is certainly the more I read it, the more I think so, the best poem that ever was wrote. We breakfasted betimes, and come to the fleet about two of the clock in the afternoon, having a fine day and a fine wind. My lord received us mighty kindly, and after discourse with us in general, left us to our business, and he to his officers, having called a council of war. We in the meantime settling our papers with Mr. Pierce and everybody else, and by and by with Captain Cuttons. Anon called down to my lord, and there with him till supper, talking and discourse, among other things, to my great joy, he did assure me that he had wrote to the king and duke about these prize goods, and told me that they did approve of what he had done, and that he would own what he had done, and would have me to tell all the world so, and did under his hand give Cock and me his certificate of our bargains, and giving us full power of disposal of what we have so bought. This do ease my mind of all my fear, and makes my heart lighter by a hundred pounds than it was before. He did discourse to us of the Dutch fleet being abroad, eighty-five of them still, and are now at the Texel, he believes, in expectation of our Eastland ships coming home with masts and hemp, and our loaden Hamburgh ships going to Hamburgh. He discourse against them that would have us yield to no conditions but conquest over the Dutch, and seems to believe that the Dutch will call for the protection of the King of France and come under his power, which were to be wished they might be brought to do under ours by fair means, and to that end would have all Dutch men and families that would come hither and settled to be declared denizens and my lord did whisper to me alone that things here must break in pieces, nobody minding anything but every man his own business of profit or pleasure, and the king some little designs of his own, and that certainly the kingdom could not stand in this condition long, which I fear and believe is very true. So to supper, and there my lord, the kindest man to me, before all the table talking of me to my advantage, and with tenderness too, that it overjoyed me. So after supper, Captain Cock and I, and Temple, on board the besom, and there to cards for a while, and then to read again in roads, and so to sleep. But, Lord, the mirth which it caused me to be waked in the night by their snoring round about me, I did laugh till I was ready to burst, and waked one of the two companions of Temple, who could not a good while tell where he was that he heard one laugh so, till he recollected himself, and I told him what it was at, and so to sleep again, 
though still snoring. Second, we having sailed all night, and I do wonder how they in the dark could find the way, we got by morning to Gillingham, and thence all walked to Chatham, and there with Commissioner Pett viewed the yard, and, among other things, a team of four horses come close by us, he being with me, drawing a piece of timber that I am confident one man could easily have carried upon his back. I made the horses be taken away, and a man or two to take the timber away with their hands. This the Commissioner did see, but said nothing, but I think had cause to be ashamed of. We walked, he and I, and Cock, to the hill-house, where we find Sir W. Penn in bed, and there much talk and much dissembling of kindness from him. But he is a false rogue, and I shall not trust him. But my being there did procure his consent to have his silk carried away before the money received, which he would not have done for Cock, I am sure. Thence to Rochester, walked to the Crown, and while dinner was getting ready, I did there walk to visit the old castle ruins, which hath been a noble place, and there going up I did upon the stairs overtake three pretty maids or women, and took them up with me, and I did baiser sur mouche, et toucher le main, and next to my great pleasure. But, Lord, to see what a dreadful thing it is to look down the precipices, for it did fright me mightily, and hinder me of much pleasure which I would have made to myself in the company of these three, if it had not been for that. The place hath been very noble and great and strong in former ages. So to walk up and down the cathedral, and thence to the crown, whither Mr. Fowler, the mayor of the town, was come in his gown, and is a very reverend magistrate. After I had eat a bit, not staying to eat with them, I went away, and so took horses and to Gravesend, and there stayed not, but got a boat, the sickness being very much in the town still, and so called on board my Lord Brunker and Sir John Minnes, on board one of the East India men at Erith and do find them full of envious complaints for the pillaging of the ships. But I did pacify them, and discoursed about making money of some of the goods, and do hope to be the better by it honestly. So took leave, Madam Williams being here also with my lord, and about eight o'clock got to Woolwich, and there supped, and mighty pleasant with my wife, who is, for aught I see, all friends with her maids, and so, in great joy and content, to bed. Third. Up and to my great content, visited betimes by Mr. Woolley, my uncle White's cousin, who comes to see what work I have for him about these East India goods. And I do find that this fellow might have been of great use, and hereafter may be of very great use to me, in this trade of prize goods, and glad I am fully of his coming hither. While I dressed myself, and afterwards in walking to Greenwich, we did discourse over all the business of the prize goods, and he puts me in hopes I may get some money in what I have done, but not so much as I expected, but that I may hereafter do more. We have laid a design of getting more, and are to talk again of it a few days hence. To the office, where nobody to meet me, Sir W. Batten being the only man, and he gone this day to meet to adjourn the Parliament to Oxford. Anon by appointment comes one to tell me my Lord Rutherford is come, so I to the King's head to him, where I find his lady, a fine young Scotch lady, pretty handsome and plain. My wife also, and Mercer, by and by comes, Creed bringing them, and so presently to dinner and very merry and after to even our accounts and I to give him tallies, where he do allow me a hundred pounds, of which to my grief the rogue creed has trepanned me out of fifty pounds. But I do foresee a way how it may be I may get a greater sum of my lord to his content by getting him allowance of interest upon his tallies. That being done, and some music and other diversions, at last away goes my lord and lady, and I sent my wife to visit Mrs. Pierce. And so I to my office, where wrote important letters to the court, and at night, Creed having clownishly left my wife, I to Mrs. Pierce's, and brought her and Mrs. Pierce to the king's head, and there spent a piece upon a supper for her, and mighty merry and pretty discourse, she being as pretty as ever, most of our mirth being upon my cousin, meaning my Lord Brunker's ugly mistress, whom he calls cousin, and to my trouble she tells me that the fine Mrs. Middleton is noted for carrying about her body a continued sour base smell, that is very offensive, especially if she be a little hot. Here some bad music to close the night, and so away, and all of us saw Mrs. Bell Pierce, as pretty as ever she was almost, home, and so walked to Will's lodging where I used to lie, and there made shift for a bed for Mercer, and mighty pleasantly to bed. This night I hear that of our two watermen that used to carry our letters, and were well on Saturday last, one is dead, and the other dying sick of the plague. The plague, though decreasing elsewhere, yet being greater about the tower and thereabouts. Fourth. Up and to my office, where Mr. Andrews comes, and reckoning with him, I get sixty-four pounds of him. By and by comes Mr. Gordon, and reckoning with him, he gives me sixty pounds in his account, which is a great mercy to me. Then both of them met, and discoursed the business of the first man's resigning, and the other's taking up the business of the victualling of Tangier. 
and I do not think that I shall be able to do as well under Mr. Gordon as under these men, or within a little as to profit and less care upon me. Thence to the king's head to dinner, where we three and Creed and my wife and her woman dined mighty merry and sat long talking, and so in the afternoon broke up, and I led my wife to our lodging again, and I to the office where did much business, and so to my wife. This night comes Sir George Smith to see me at the office, and tells me how the plague is decreased this week, seven hundred and forty, for which God be praised, but that it increases at our end of the town still, and says how all the town is full of Captain Cox being in some ill condition about prize goods, his goods being taken from him, and I know not what. But though this troubles me to have it said, and that it is likely to be a business in Parliament, yet I am not much concerned at it, because yet I believe this news is all false, for he would have wrote to me sure about it. Being come to my wife at our lodging, I did go to bed, and left my wife with her people to laugh and dance, and I to sleep. Fifth. Lay long in bed, talking, among other things, of my sister Paul, and my wife of herself is very willing that I should give her four hundred pounds to her portion, and would have her married soon as we could, but this great sickness time do make it unfit to send for her up. I brought to the office, and thence to the Duke of Albemarle, all my way reading a book of Mr. Evelyn's translating, and sending me as a present, about directions for gathering a library. But the book is above my reach, but his epistle to my Lord Chancellor is a very fine piece. When I come to the Duke it was about the victuals business, to put it into other hands, or more hands, which I do advise in, but I hope to do myself a job of work in it. So I walked through Westminster to my old house the Swan, and there did pass some time with Sarah, and so down my water to Deptford, and there to my Valentine. Round about and next door on every side is the plague, but I did not value it. But there did what I would con ill, and so away to Mr. Evelyn's, to discourse of our confounded business of prisoners and sick and wounded seamen, wherein he and we are so much put out of order. And here he showed me his gardens, which are for variety of evergreens and hedge of holly, the finest things I ever saw in my life. Thence in his coach to Greenwich, and there to my office, all the way having fine discourse of trees and the nature of vegetables. And so to write letters, I very late to Sir W. Coventry of great concernment, and so to my last night's lodging, but my wife is gone home to Woolwich. The bill, bless me God, is less this week by seven hundred and forty of what it was the last week. Being come to my lodging, I got something to eat, having eat little all the day, and so to bed, having this night renewed my promises of observing my vows as I used to do. For I find that, since I left them off, my mind is run a wool-gathering, and my business neglected. Sick. Up, and having sent for Mr. Gordon, he come to me, and he and I largely discourse the business of his victualling, in order to the adding of partners to him, or other ways of altering it, wherein I find him ready to do anything the king would have him do. So he and I took his coach, and to Lambeth, and to the Duke of Albemarle about it, and so back again, where he left me, in our way discoursing of the business, and contracting a great friendship with him. And I find he is a man most worthy to be made a friend, being very honest and grateful, and in the freedom of our discourse he did tell me his opinion and knowledge of Sir W. Penn to be, what I know him to be, as false a man as ever was born, for so it seems he hath been to him. He did also tell me, discoursing how things are governed as to the king's treasure, that, having occasion for money in the country, he did offer Alderman Maynell to pay him down money here, to be paid by the receiver in some county in the country, upon whom Maynell had assignments, in whose hands the money also lay ready. But Maynell refused it, saying that he could have his money when he would, and had rather it should lie where it do than receive it here in town this sickly time, where he hath no occasion for it. But now the evil is that he hath lent this money upon tallies which are become payable, but he finds that nobody looks after it, how long the money is unpaid, and whether it lies dead in the receiver's hands or no. So the king he pays Maynell ten per cent, while the money lies in his receiver's hands to no purpose but the benefit of the receiver. I to dinner to the king's head with Mr. Woolley, who is come to instruct me in the business of my goods, but gives me not so good comfort as I thought I should have had. But, however, it will be well worth my time, though not above two or three hundred pounds. He gone, I to my office, were very busy drawing up a letter by way of discourse to the Duke of Albemarle, about my conception how the business of the victualling should be ordered, wherein I have taken great pains, and I think have hit the right, if they will but follow it. At this very late, and so home to our lodgings, to bed. 7th. Up and to the office, along with Mr. Child, whom I sent for to discourse about the victualling business, who will not come into partnership, no more will Captain Beckford, but I do find him a mighty understanding man, and one I will keep a knowledge of. Did business, though not much, at the office, because of the horrible crowd and lamentable moan of the poor seamen, 
that lie starving in the streets for lack of money, which do trouble and perplex me to the heart, and more at noon when we were to go through them, for then a whole hundred of them followed us, some cursing, some swearing, and some praying to us. And that that made me more troubled was a letter come this afternoon from the Duke of Albemarle, signifying the Dutch to be in sight with eighty sail, yesterday morning, off of Sol Bay, coming right into the bay. God knows what they will and may do to us, we having no force abroad able to oppose them, but to be sacrificed to them. Here comes Sir W. Ryder to me, whom I sent for about the victualling business also, but he neither will not come into partnership, but desires to be of the commission, if there be one. Thence back the back way to my office, where very late, very busy. But most of all, when at night, come two wagons from Rochester, with more goods from Captain Cock, and in housing them at Mr. Tooker's lodgings, come two of the Custom House to seize them, and did seize them, but I showed them my transier. However, after some hot and angry words, we locked them up, and sealed up the key, and did give it to the constable to keep till Monday, and so parted. But, Lord, to think how the poor constable come to me in the dark going home, sir, says he, I have the key, and if you would have me do any service for you, send for me betimes to-morrow morning, and I will do what you would have me. Whether the fellow do this out of kindness or knavery, I cannot tell, but it is pretty to observe. Talking with him in the highway, come close by the bearers with the dead corpse of the plague. But, Lord, to see what custom is, that I am come almost to think nothing of it. So to my lodging, and there with Mr. Hayter and Will, ending a business of the state of the last six months charge of the navy, which we bring to a million pounds and above, and I think we do not enlarge much in it, if anything. So to bed. 8th. Lord's Day. Up, and after being trimmed to the office, whither I, upon a letter from the Duke of Albemarle to me, to order as many ships forth out of the river as I can presently, to join to meet the Dutch. Having ordered all the captains of the ships in the river to come to me, I did some business with them, and so to Captain Cox to dinner, he being in the country. But here his brother Solomon was, and for guests, myself, Sir G. Smith, and a very fine lady, one Mrs. Pennington, and two more gentlemen. But both before and after dinner, most witty discourse with this lady, who is a very fine witty lady, one of the best I ever heard speak, and indifferent handsome. There after dinner, an hour or two, and so to the office, where ended my business with the captains, and I think of twenty-two ships we shall make shift to get out seven, God help us, men being sick or provisions lacking, and so to write letters to Sir Phil Warwick, Sir W. Coventry, and Sir G. Carteret to court, about the last six months' accounts, and sent away by an express to-night. This day I hear the Pope is dead, and one said that the news is that the King of France is stabbed, but that the former is very true, which will do great things, sure, as to the troubling of that part of the world, the King of Spain being so lately dead. And one thing more, Sir Martin Knowles' lady is dead with grief, for the death of her husband and nothing else, as they say, in the world. But it seems nobody can make anything of his estate, whether he be dead worth anything or no, he having dealt in so many things, public and private, as nobody can understand whereabouts his estate is, which is the fate of these great dealers at everything. So after my business being done, I home to my lodging and to bed. Ninth. Up, my head full of business, and called upon also by Sir John Shaw, to whom I did give a civil answer about our prize goods, that all his dues as one of the farmers of the customs are paid, and showed him our transier, with which he was satisfied, and parted, ordering his servants to see the weight of them. I to the office, and there found an order for my coming presently to the Duke of Albemarle, and what should it be but to tell me that, if my Lord Sandwich do not come to town, he do resolve to go with the fleet to see himself, the Dutch, as he thinks, being in the Downs, and so desired me to get a pleasure-boat for to take him in to-morrow morning, and do many other things, and with a great liking of me, and my management especially, as that coxcomb my Lord Craven do tell me, and I perceive it, and I am sure take pains enough to deserve it. Thence away, and to the office at London, where I did some business about my money and private accounts, and there eat a bit of goose of Mr. Griffin's, and so by water, it raining most miserably to Greenwich, calling on several vessels in my passage. Being come there, I hear another seizure hath been made of our goods by one Captain Fisher, that hath been at Chatham by warrant of the Duke of Albemarle, and is come in my absence to Tooker's and viewed them, demanding the key of the constable, and so sealed up the door. I to the house, but there being no officers nor constable could do nothing, but back to my office full of trouble about this, and there late about business, vexed to see myself fall into this trouble and concernment, in a thing that I want instruction from my Lord Sandwich, whether I should appear in it or no. And so home to bed, having spent two hours, I and my boy, and Mr. Glanville's removing of faggots to make room to remove our goods to. But when done, I thought it not fit to use it. 
the news of the killing of the king of france is wholly untrue and they say that of the pope too tenth up and receive a stop from the duke of albemarle of setting out any more ships or providing a pleasure boat for himself which i am glad of and do see what i thought yesterday that this resolution of his was a sudden one and silly by and by comes captain cox jacob to tell me that he is come from chatham this morning and that there are four wagons of goods at hand coming to town which troubles me i directed him to bring them to his master's house but before i could send him away to bring them thither news is brought me that they are seized on in the town by this captain fisher and they will carry them to another place so i to them and found our four wagons in the street stopped by the church by this fisher and company and one hundred or two hundred people in the streets gazing i did give them good words and made modest desires of carrying the goods to captain cox but they would have them to a house of their hiring where in a barn the goods were laid i had transiers to show for all and the tale was right and there i spent all the morning seeing this done at which fisher was vexed that i would not let it be done by anybody else for the merchant and that i must needs be concerned therein which i did not think fit to own so that being done i left the goods to be watched by men on their part and ours and so to the office by noon whither by and by comes captain cock whom i had with great care sent for by express the last night and so i with him to his house and there eat a bit and so by coach to lambeth and i took occasion first to go to the duke of albemarle to acquaint him with something of what had been done this morning in behalf of a friend absent which did give a good entrance and prevented their possessing the duke with anything of evil of me by their report and by and by in comes captain cock and tells his whole story so an order was made for the putting him in possession upon giving security to be accountable for the goods which for the present did satisfy us and so away giving Locke that drew the order a piece lord to see how unhappily a man may fall into a necessity of bribing people to do him right in a thing wherein he hath done nothing but fair and bought dear so to the office there to write my letters and cock comes to tell me that fisher is come to him and that he doubts not to cajole fisher and his companion and make them friends with drink and a bribe this night comes sir christopher mings to town and i went to see him and by and by he being then out of the town comes to see me he is newly come from court and carries direction for the making a show of getting out the fleet again to go fight the dutch but that it will end in a fleet of twenty good sailing frigates to go to the northward or southward and that will be all i inquired but he would not be to know that he had heard anything at oxford about the business of the prize goods which i did suspect but he being gone and on comes cock and tells me that he hath been with him a great while and that he finds him sullen and speaking very high what disrespect he had received of my lord saying that he hath walked three or four hours together at that earl's cabin door for audience and could not be received which if true i am sorry for he tells me that sir g askew says that he did from the beginning declare against these prize goods and would not receive his dividend and that he and sir w pen are at odds about it and that he fears mings hath been doing ill offices to my lord i did to-night give my lord an account of all this and so home and to bed eleventh up and so in my chamber stayed all the morning doing something toward my tangier accounts for the stating of them and also comes up my landlady mrs clark to make an agreement for the time to come and i for the having room enough and to keep out strangers and to have a place to retreat to for my wife if the sickness should come to woolwich i am contented to pay dear so for three rooms and a dining-room and for linen and bread and beer and butter at nights and mornings i am to give her five pounds ten shillings per month and i wrote and we signed to an agreement by and by comes cock to tell me that fisher and his fellow were last night mightily satisfied and promised old friendship but this morning he finds them to have new tricks and shall be troubled with them so he being to go down to erith with them this afternoon about giving security i advise him to let them go by land and so he and i having eat something at his house by water to erith but they got thither before us and there we met mr seymour one of the commissioners for prizes and a parliament man and he was mighty high and had now seized our goods on their behalf and he mighty imperiously would have all forfeited and i know not what i thought i was in the right in a thing i said and spoke somewhat earnestly so we took up one another very smartly for which i was sorry afterwards shewing thereby myself too much concerned but nothing passed that i valued at all but i could not but think it odd that a parliament man in a serious discourse before such persons as we and my lord brunker and sir john minnes should quote hudibras as being the book i doubt he hath read most they i doubt will stand hard for high security and cock would have had me bound with him for his appearing but i did stagger at it besides seymour do stop the doing it at all till he has been with the duke of albemarle so there will be another demur it growing late and i having something to do at home took my leave alone leaving cock there for all night and so against tide and in the dark and very cold weather to woolwich where we had appointed to keep the night merrily 
and so by captain cock's coach had brought a very pretty child a daughter of one mrs tooker's next door to my lodging and so she and a daughter and kinsman of mrs pett's made up a fine company at my lodgings at woolwich where my wife and mercer and mrs barbara danced a mighty merry we were but especially at mercer's dancing a jig which she does the best i ever did see having the most natural way of it and keeps time the most perfectly i ever did see this night is kept in lieu of yesterday for my wedding day of ten years for which god be praised being now in an extreme good condition of health and estate and honour and a way of getting more money though at this hour under some discomposure rather than damage about some prize goods that i have bought off the fleet in partnership with captain cock and for the discourse about the world concerning my lord sandwich that he hath done a thing so bad and indeed it must needs have been a very rash act and the rather because of a parliament now newly met to give money and will have some account of what hath already been spent besides the precedent for a general to take what prizes he pleases and the giving a pretence to take away much more than he intended and all will lie upon him and not giving to all the commanders as well as the flags he displeases all them and offends even some of them thinking others to be better served than themselves and lastly puts himself out of a power of begging anything again a great while of the king having danced with my people as long as i saw fit to sit up i to bed and left them to do what they would i forgot that we had w hewer there and tom and golding my barber at greenwich for our fiddler to whom i did give ten shillings twelfth called up before day and so i dressed myself and down it being horrid cold by water to my lord brunker's ship who advised me to do so and it was civilly to show me what the king had commanded about the prize goods to examine most severely all that had been done in the taking out any with or without order without respect to my lord sandwich at all and that he had been doing of it and find him examining one man and i do find that extreme ill use was made of my lord's order for they did toss and tumble and spoil and break things in whole to a great loss and shame to come at the fine goods and did take a man that knows where the fine goods were and did this over and over again for many days sir w barclay being the chief hand that did it but others did the like at other times and they did say in doing it that my lord sandwich's back was broad enough to bear it having learned as much as i could which was that the king and duke were very severe in this point whatever order they before had given my lord in approbation of what he had done and that all will come out and the king see by the entries at the custom-house what all do amount to that had been taken and so i took leave and by water very cold and to woolwich where it was now noon and so i stayed dinner and talking part of the afternoon and then by coach captain cox to greenwich taking the young lady home and so to cock and he tells me that he hath cajoled with seymour who will be our friend but that above all seymour tells him that my lord duke did shew him to-day an order from court for having all respect paid to the earl of sandwich and what goods had been delivered by his order which do overjoy us and that to-morrow our goods shall be weighed and he doubts not possession to-morrow or next day being overjoyed at this i to write my letters and at it very late good news this week that there are about six hundred less dead of the plague than the last so home to bed thirteenth lay long and this morning comes sir Ger smith to see me in his way to court and a good man he is and one that i must keep fair with and will it being i perceive my interest to have kindness with the commanders so to the office and there very busy till about noon comes sir w warren and he goes and gets a bit of meat ready at the king's head for us and i by and by thither and we dine together and i am not pleased with him about a little business of tangier that i put to him to do for me but however the hurt is not much and his other matters of profit to me continue very likely to be good here we spent till two o'clock and so i set him on shore and i by water to the duke of albemarle where i find him with lord craven and lieutenant of the tower about him among other things talking of ships to get of the king to fetch coals for the poor of the city which is a good work but lord to hear the silly talk between these three great people yet i have no reason to find fault the duke and lord craven being my very great friends here did the business i come about and so back home by water and there cock comes to me and tells me that he is come to an understanding with fisher and that he must give him a hundred pounds and that he shall have his goods in possession to-morrow they being all weighed to-day which pleases me very well this day the duke tells me that there is no news heard of the dutch what they do or where they are but believes that they are all gone home for none of our spies can give us any tidings of them cock is fain to keep these people fisher and his fellow company night and day to keep them friends almost and great troubles withal my head is full of settling the victualling business also that i may make some profit out of it which i hope justly to do to the king's advantage to-night comes sir j banks to me upon my letter to discourse it with him 
and he did give me the advice I have taken almost as fully as if I had been directed by him what to write. The business also of my Tangier accounts to be sent to court is upon my hands in great haste. Besides all my own proper accounts are in great disorder, having been neglected now above a month, which grieves me, but it could not be settled sooner. These together, and the fear of the sickness and providing for my family, do fill my head very full, besides the infinite business of the office, and nobody here to look after it but myself. So late from my office to my lodgings, and to bed. Fourteenth. Up and to the office, where mighty busy, especially with Mr. Gordon, with whom I shall, I think, have much to do, and by and by comes the lieutenant of the tower by my invitation yesterday, but I had got nothing for him. It is to discourse about the coal ships. So he went away to Sheriff Hooker's, and I stayed at the office till he sent for me at noon to dinner, I very hungry. When I come to the sheriff's, he was not there, nor in many other places, nor could find him at all. So was forced to come to the office and get a bit of meat from the tavern, and so to my business. By and by comes the lieutenant, and reproaches me with my not treating him as I ought, but all in jest. He, it seemed, dined with Mr. Adrian May. Very late writing letters at the office, and much satisfied to hear from Captain Cock that he had got possession of some of his goods to his own house, and expected to have all to-night. The town, I hear, is full of talk that there are great differences in the fleet among the great commanders, and that Minx at Oxford did impeach my lord of something. I think about these goods, but this is but talk. But my heart and head to-night is full of the victualling business, being overjoyed and proud at my success in my proposal about it, it being read before the King, Duke, and the Cabal, with complete applause and satisfaction. This Sir G. Carteret and Sir W. Coventry both writ me, besides Sir W. Coventry's letter to the Duke of Albemarle, which I read yesterday, and I hope to find my profit in it also. So late home, to bed. 15th. Lord's Day. Up, and while I stayed for the barber, tried to compose a duo of counterpoint, and I think it will do very well, it being by Mr. Birkinshaw's rule. By and by, by appointment, comes Mr. Povey's coach, and, more than I expected, him himself, to fetch me to Brainford. So he and I immediately set out, having drunk a draught of mulled sack, and so rode most nobly, in his most pretty and best contrived chariot in the world, with many new conveniences, his never having till now, within a day or two, been yet finished. Our discourse upon Tangier business, want of money, and then of public miscarriages, nobody minding the public, but everybody himself and his lusts. Anon we come to his house, and there I eat a bit, and so with fresh horses, his noble fine horses, the best confessedly in England, the king having none such, he sent me to Sir Robert Viner's, whom I met coming just from church, and so, after having spent half an hour almost looking upon the horses with some gentlemen that were in company, he and I into his garden to discourse of money. But none is to be had, he confessing himself in great straits, and I believe it. Having this answer, and that I could not get better, we fell to public talk, and to think how the fleet and seamen will be paid, which he protests he do not think it possible to compass, as the world is now. No money got by trade, nor the persons that have it by them in the city to be come at. The Parliament, it seems, have voted the King one million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, at fifty thousand pounds per month, tax for the war, and voted to assist the King against the Dutch, and all that shall adhere to them, and thanks to be given him for his care of the Duke of York, which last is a very popular vote on the Duke's behalf. He tells me how the taxes of the last assessment, which should have been in good part gathered, are not yet laid, and that even in part of the city of London, and the chimney money comes almost to nothing, nor anything else looked after. Having done this, I parted, my mind not eased by any money, but only that I had done my part to the King's service. And so, in a very pleasant evening, back to Mr. Povey's, and there supped, and after supper to talk and to sing, his man Dutton's wife singing very pleasantly, a mighty fat woman, and I wrote out one song from her, and pricked the tune, both very pretty. But I did never hear one sing with so much pleasure to herself as this lady do, relishing it to her very heart, which was mighty pleasant. Sixteenth. Up about seven o'clock, and after drinking, and I observing Mr. Povey's being mightily mortified in his eating and drinking, and coaches and horses, he desiring to sell his best, and everything else, his furniture of his house, he walked with me to Sion, and there I took water. In our way he discoursing of the wantonness of the court, and how it minds nothing else, and I saying that that would leave the king shortly if he did not leave it, he told me no, for the king do spend most of his time in feeling and kissing them naked, but this lechery will never leave him. Here I took boat, leaving him there, and down to the tower, where I hear the Duke of Albemarle is, and I to Lombard Street, but can get no money. So upon the exchange, which is very empty, God knows, and but mean people there. The news for certain that the Dutch are come with their fleet before Margate, and some men were endeavouring to come on shore when the post come away, perhaps to steal some sheep. But, Lord, 
how colville talks of the business of public revenue like a madman and yet i doubt all true that nobody minds it but that the king and kingdom must speedily be undone and rails at my lord about the prizes but i think knows not my relation to him here i endeavoured to satisfy all i could people about bills of exchange from tangier but it is only with good words for money i have not nor can get god knows what will become of all the king's matters in a little time for he runs in debt every day and nothing to pay them looked after thence i walked to the tower but lord how empty the streets are and melancholy so many poor sick people in the streets full of sores and so many sad stories overheard as i walk everybody talking of this dead and that man sick and so many in this place and so many in that and they tell me that in westminster there is never a physician and but one apothecary left all being dead but that there are great hopes of a great decrease this week god send it at the tower found my lord duke and duchess at dinner so i sat down and much good cheer the lieutenant and his lady and several officers with the duke but lord to hear the silly talk that was there would make one mad the duke having none almost but fools about him much of their talk about the dutch coming on shore which they believe they may some of them have been and steal sheep and speak all in reproach of them in whose hands the fleet is but lord help him there is something will hinder him and all the world in going to sea which is want of victuals for we have not wherewith to answer our service and how much better it would have been if the duke's advice had been taken for the fleet to have gone presently out but god help the king while no better counsels are given and what is given no better taken thence after dinner receiving many commands from the duke i to our office on the hill and there did a little business and to colville's again and so took quarter at the tower and there met with captain cock and he down with me to greenwich i having received letters from my lord sandwich to-day speaking very high about the prize goods that he would have us to fear nobody but be very confident in what we have done and not to confess any fault or doubt of what he hath done for the king hath allowed it and do now confirm it and sent orders as he says for nothing to be disturbed that his lordship hath ordered therein as to the division of the goods to the fleet which do comfort us but my lord writes to me that both he and i may hence learn by what we see in this business but that which pleases me best is that cock tells me that he now understands that fisher was set on in this business by the design of some of the duke of albemarle's people walkup and others who lent him money to set him out in it and he has spent high who now curse him for a rogue to take a hundred pounds when he might have had as well fifteen hundred pounds and they are mightily fallen out about it which in due time shall be discovered but that now that troubles me afresh is after i am got to the office at greenwich that some new troubles are come and captain cock's house is beset before and behind with guards and more i do fear they may come to my office here to search for cock's goods and find some small things of my clerks so i assisted them in helping to remove their small trade but by and by i am told that it is only the custom-house men who came to seize the things that did lie at mr glanville's for which they did never yet see our transeer nor did know of them till to-day so that my fear is now over for a transeer is ready for them cock did get a great many of his goods to london to-day to the still-yard which place however is now shut up of the plague but i was there and we now make no bones of it much talk there is of the chancellor's speech and the king's at the parliament's meeting which are very well liked and that we shall certainly by their speeches fall out with france at this time together with the dutch which will find us work late at the office entering my journal for eight days past the greatness of my business hindering me of late to put it down daily but i have done it now very true and particularly and hereafter will i hope be able to fall into my old way of doing it daily so to my lodging and there had a good pullet to my supper and so to bed it being very cold again god be thanked for it seventeenth up and all day long busy at the office mighty busy only stepped to my lodging and had a fowl for my dinner and at night my wife and mercer comes to me which trouble me a little because i am to be mighty busy to-morrow all day seriously about my accounts so late from my office to her and supped and so to bed eighteenth up and after some pleasant discourse with my wife though my head full of business i out and left her to go home and myself to the office and thence by water to the duke of albemarle's and so back again and find my wife gone so to the chamber at my lodgings and to the making of my accounts up of tangier which i did with great difficulty finding the difference between short and long reckonings where i have had occasion to mix my monies as i have of late done my tangier treasure upon other occasions and other monies upon that however i was at it late and did it pretty perfectly and so after eating something to bed my mind eased of a great deal of figures and castings nineteenth up into my accounts again and stated them very clear and fair and at noon dined at my lodgings with mr hayter and w hewer at table with me 
i being come to an agreement yesterday with my landlady for six pounds per month for so many rooms for myself them and my wife are made when she shall come and to pay besides for my diet after dinner i did give them my accounts and letters to write against i went to the duke of albemarle's this evening which i did and among other things spoke to him for my wife's brother balty to be of his guard which he kindly answered that he should my business of the victualling goes on as i would have it and now my head is full how to make some profit of it to myself or people to that end when i came home i wrote a letter to mr coventry offering myself to be the surveyor-general and am apt to think he will assist me in it but i do not set my heart much on it though it would be a good help so back to my office and there till past one before i could get all these letters and papers copied out which vexed me but so sent them away without hopes of saving the post and so to my lodging to bed twentieth up and had my last night's letters brought back to me which troubles me because of my accounts lest they should be asked for before they come which i abhor be more ready to give than they can be to demand them so i sent away an express to oxford with them and another to portsmouth with a copy of my letter to mr coventry about my victualling business for fear he should be gone from oxford as he intended thither so busy all the morning and at noon to cock and dined there he and i alone vexed that we are not rid of all our trouble about our goods but it is almost over and in the afternoon to my lodging and there spent the whole afternoon and evening with mr hayter discoursing of the business of the office where he tells me that among others thomas wilson do now and then seem to hint that i do take too much business upon me more than i can do and that therefore some do lie undone this i confess to my trouble is true but it arises from my being forced to take so much on me more than is my proper task to undertake but for this at last i did advise to him to take another clerk if he thinks fit i will take care to have him paid i discoursed also much with him about persons fit to be put into the victualling business and such as i could spare something out of their salaries for them but without trouble i cannot i see well do it because thomas wilson must have the refusal of the best place which is london of two hundred pounds per annum which i did intend for tooker and to get fifty pounds out of it as a help to mr hayter however i will try to do something of this kind for them having done discourse with him late i to enter my tangier accounts fair and so to supper and to bed twenty first up into my office where busy all the morning and then with my two clerks home to dinner and so back again to the office and there very late very busy and so home to supper and to bed twenty second lord's day up and after ready and going to captain cox where i find we are a little further safe in some part of our goods i to church in my way was meeting with some letters which made me resolve to go after church to my lord duke of albemarle's so after sermon i took cox chariot and to lambeth but in going and getting over the water and through whitehall i spent so much time the duke had almost dined however fresh meat was brought for me to his table and there i dined and full of discourse and very kind here they are again talking of the prizes and my lord duke did speak very broad that my lord sandwich and pen should do what they would and answer for themselves for his part he would lay all before the king here he tells me the dutch ambassador at oxford is clapped up but since i hear it is not true thence back again it being evening before i could get home and there cock not being within i and mr solomon to mr glanville's and there we found cock and sat and supped and was mighty merry with only madam pennington who is a fine witty lady here we spent the evening late with great mirth and so home and to bed twenty third up and after doing some business i down by water calling to see my wife with whom very merry for ten minutes and so to erith where my lord brunker and i kept the office and dispatched some business by appointment on the besom among other things about the slop sellers who have trusted us so long they are not able nor can be expected to trust us further and i fear this winter the fleet will be undone by that particular thence on board the east india ship where my lord brunker had provided a great dinner and thither comes by and by sir john minnes and before him sir w warren and anon a perspective glass maker of whom we every one bought a pocket glass but i am troubled with the much talk and conceitedness of mrs williams and her impudence in case she be not married to my lord they are getting themselves ready to deliver the goods all out to the east india company who are to have the goods in their possession and to advance two-thirds of the moderate value thereof and sell them as well as they can and the king to give them six per cent for the use of the money they shall so advance by this means the company will not suffer by the king's goods bringing down the price of their own thence in the evening back again with sir w warren and captain taylor in my boat and the latter went with me to the office and there he and i reckoned and i perceive i shall get a hundred pounds profit by my services of late to him which is a very good thing thence to my lodging where i find my lord rutherford of which i was glad 
We supped together and sat up late, he being a mighty wanton man with a daughter-in-law of my landlady's, a pretty conceited woman, big with child, and he would be handling her breasts, which she coyly refused. But they gone, my lord and I, to business, and he would have me forbear paying Alderman Backwell the money ordered him, which I, in hopes to advantage myself, shall forbear. But do not think that my lord will do anything gratefully more to me than he hath done, nor that I shall get anything as I pretended by helping him to interest for his last seven thousand seven hundred pounds, which I could do, and do him a courtesy too. Discourse being done, he to bed in my chamber, and I to another in the house. 24th. Lay long, having a cold. Then to my lord, and sent him going to Oxford, and I to my office, whither comes Sir William Batten, now newly from Oxford. I can gather nothing from him about my lord Sandwich about the business of the prizes, he being close. But he shewed me a bill which hath been read in the house, making all breaking of bulk for the time to come felony. But it is a foolish act, and will do no great matter, only is calculated to my lord Sandwich's case. He shewed me also a good letter printed from the Bishop of Munster to the States of Holland, shewing the state of their case. Here we did some business, and so broke up, and I to Cock, where Mr. Evelyn was, to dinner, and there merry, yet vexed again at public matters, and to see how little heed is had to the prisoners and sick and wounded. Thence to my office, and no sooner there, but to my great surprise, am told that my Lord Sandwich is come to town, so I presently to Borman's, where he is, and there found him. He mighty kind to me, but no opportunity of discourse private yet, which he tells me he must have with me. Only his business is sudden to go to the fleet to get out a few ships to drive away the Dutch. I left him in discourse with Sir W. Batten and others, and myself to the office till about ten at night, and so, letters being done, I to him again to Captain Cox, where he supped, and lies, and never saw him more merry, and here is Charles Herbert, who the king hath lately knighted. My lord, to my great content, did tell me before them, that never anything was read to the king and council, all the chief ministers of state being there, as my letter about the victualling was, and no more said upon it than a most thorough consent to every word was said and directed, that it be pursued and practised. After much mirth, and my lord having travelled all night last night, he to bed, and we all parted, I home. 25th. Up and to my lord Sandwich's, where several commanders, of whom I took the state of all their ships, and of all could find not above four capable of going out. The truth is, the want of victuals being the whole overthrow of this year, both at sea, and now at the Nore, here, and Portsmouth, where all the fleet lies. By and by comes down my lord, and then he and I and are together alone upon private discourse. He tells me that Mr. Coventry and he are not reconciled, but declared enemies, the only occasion of it being, he tells me, his ill usage from him about the first fight, wherein he had no right done him, which, methinks, is a poor occasion, for in my conscience that was no design of Coventry's. But, however, when I asked my lord whether it were not best, though with some condescension, to be friends with him, he told me it was not possible, and so I stopped. He tells me, as very private, that there are great factions at the court between the King's party and the Duke of York's, and that the King, which is a strange difficulty, do favour my Lord in opposition to the Duke's party. That my Lord Chancellor being, to be sure, the patron of the Duke's, it is a mystery whence it should be that Mr. Coventry is looked upon by him as an enemy to him, that if he had a mind himself to be out of this employment, as Mr. Coventry he believes wishes, and himself and I do incline to wish it also, in many respects, yet he believes he shall not be able, because of the king, who will keep him in on purpose, in opposition to the other party. That Prince Rupert and he are all possible friends in the world, that Coventry hath aggravated this business of the prizes, though never so great plundering in the world as while the duke and he were at sea, and in Sir John Lawson's time he could take and pillage, and then sink a whole ship in the straits, and Coventry say nothing to it. That my Lord Arlington is his fast friend, that the Chancellor is cold to him, and, though I told him that I in the world do take my Lord Chancellor in his speech the other day, to have said as much as could be wished, yet he thinks he did not. That my Lord Chancellor do from hence begin to be cold to him, because of his seeing him and Arlington so great, that nothing at court is minded but faction and pleasure, and nothing intended of general good to the kingdom by anybody heartily, so that he believes with me in a little time confusion will certainly come over all the nation." He told me how a design was carried on a while ago for the Duke of York to raise an army in the north, and to be the general of it, and all this without the knowledge or advice of the Duke of Albemarle, which when he come to know he was so vexed, they were fain to let it fall, to content him, that his matching with the family of Sir G. Carteret do make the difference greater between Coventry and him, they being enemies, that the Chancellor did, as everybody else, speak well of me the other day, but yet was, at the committee for Tangier, angry that I should offer to suffer a bill of exchange to be protested. 
so my lord did bid me take heed for that i might easily suppose i could not want enemies no more than others in all he speaks with the greatest trust and love and confidence in what i say or do that a man can do after this discourse ended we sat down to dinner and mighty merry among other things at the bill brought into the house to make it felony to break bulk which as my lord says well will make that no prizes shall be taken or if taken shall be sunk after plundering and the act for the method of gathering this last one million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds now voted and how paid wherein are several strange imperfections after dinner my lord by a catch down to erith where the besom was it blowing these last two days and now both night and day very hard southwardly so that it has certainly drove the dutch off the coast my lord being gone i to the office and there find captain ferrers who tells me his wife is come to town to see him having not seen him since fifteen weeks ago at his first going to sea last she is now at a tavern and stays all night so i was obliged to give him my house and chamber to lie in which he with great modesty and after much force took and so i got mr evelyn's coach to carry her thither and the coach coming back i with mr evelyn to deptford where a little while with him doing a little business and so in his coach back again to my lodgings and there sat with mrs ferrers two hours and with my little girl mistress frances took her and very pleasant and on the captain comes and then to supper very merry and so i led them to bed and so to bed myself having seen my pretty little girl home first at the next door twenty sixth up and leaving my guests to make themselves ready i to the office and thither come sir Jer smith and sir christopher mings to see me being just come from portsmouth and going down to the fleet here i sat and talked to them a good while and then parted only sir christopher mings and i together by water to the tower and i find him a very witty well-spoken fellow and mighty free to tell his parentage being a shoemaker's son to whom he is now going and i to the change where i hear how the french have taken two and sunk one of our merchantmen in the straits and carried the ships to toulon so that there is no expectation but we must fall out with them the change pretty full and the town begins to be lively again though the streets very empty and most shops shut so back again i and took boat and called for sir christopher mings at st catherine's who was followed with some ordinary friends of which he says he is proud and so down to greenwich the wind furious high and we with our sail up till i made it be taken down i took him it being three o'clock to my lodgings and did give him a good dinner and so parted he being pretty close to me as to any business of the fleet knowing me to be a servant of my lord sandwiches he gone i to the office till night and then they come and tell me my wife is come to town so i to her vexed at her coming but it was upon innocent business so i was pleased and made her stay captain ferris and his lady being yet there and so i left them to dance and i to the office till past nine at night and so to them and there saw them dance very prettily the captain and his wife my wife and mrs barbary and mercer and my landlady's daughter and then little mistress frances took her and her mother a pretty woman come to see my wife and on to supper and then to dance again golding being our fiddler who plays very well and all tunes till past twelve at night and then we broke up and every one to bed we made shift for all our company mrs tooker being gone twenty seventh up and after some pleasant discourse with my wife i out leaving her and mrs ferrers there and i to captain cox there to do some business and then away with cock in his coach through kent street a miserable wretched poor place people sitting sick and muffled up with plasters at every four or five doors so to the change and thence i by water to the duke of albemarle's and there much company but i stayed and dined and he makes mighty much of me and here he tells us the dutch are gone and have lost above a hundred and sixty cables and anchors through the last foul weather here he proposed to me from mr coventry as i had desired of mr coventry that i should be surveyor-general of the victualling business which i accepted but indeed the terms in which mr coventry proposes it for me are the most obliging that ever i could expect from any man and more it saying me to be the fittest man in england and that he is sure if i will undertake i will perform it and that it will be also a very desirable thing that i might have this encouragement my encouragement in the navy alone being in no wise proportionable to my pains or deserts this added to the letter i had three days since from mr southern signifying that the duke of york had in his master's absence opened my letter and commanded him to tell me that he did approve of my being the surveyor-general do make me joyful beyond myself that i cannot express it to see that as i do take pain so god blesses me and hath sent me masters that do observe that i take pains after having done here i back by water unto london and there met with captain cox coach again and i went in it to greenwich and then sent my wife in it to woolwich and i to the office and thence home late with captain taylor and he and i settled all accounts between us 
and I do find that I do get above a hundred and twenty-nine pounds of him for my services for him within these six months. At it till almost one in the morning, and after supper he away and I to bed, mightily satisfied in all this, and in a resolution I have taken to-night with Mr. Hayter to propose the port of London for the victualling business for Thomas Wilson, by which it will be better done, and I at more ease, in case he should grumble. So to bed. 28th. Up and sent for Thomas Wilson, and broke the victualling business to him, and he is mightily contented, and so am I that I have bestowed it on him, and so I to Mr. Borman's, where Sir W. Batten is, to tell him what I had proposed to Thomas Wilson, and the news also I have this morning from Sir W. Clark, which is, that notwithstanding all the care the Duke of Albemarle hath taken about the putting the East India prize goods into the East India Company's hands, and my Lord Brunker and Sir J. Minnes having laden out a great part of the goods, an order is come from court to stop all, and to have the goods delivered to the sub-commissioners of prizes, at which I am glad, because it do vex this simple weak man, and we shall have a little reparation for the disgrace my Lord Sandwich has had in it. He tells me also that the Parliament hath given the Duke of York a hundred and twenty thousand pounds, to be paid him after the one million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds is gathered upon the tax which they have now given the King. He tells me that the Dutch have lately launched sixteen new ships, all which is great news, thence by horseback with Mr. Dean to Erith, and so aboard my Lord Brunker, and dined, and very merry with him, and good discourse between them about shipbuilding, and after dinner and a little pleasant discourse, we away and by horse back again to Greenwich, and there I to the office very late, offering my persons for all the victualling posts much to my satisfaction. Also much other business I did to my mind, and so weary home to my lodging, and there, after eating and drinking a little, I to bed. The king and court, they say, have now finally resolved to spend nothing upon clothes, but what is of the growth of England, which, if observed, will be very pleasing to the people, and very good for them. Twenty ninth, Lord's Day. Up and being ready, set out with Captain Cock in his coach toward Erith, Mr. Dean riding along with us, where we dined and were very merry. After dinner we fell to discourse about the Dutch, Cock undertaking to prove that they were able to wage war with us three years together, which, though it may be true, yet, not being satisfied with his arguments, my lord and I did oppose the strength of his arguments, which brought us to a great heat, he being a conceited man, but of no logic in his head at all, which made my lord and I mirth. And on we parted and back again, we hardly having a word all the way, he being so vexed at our not yielding to his persuasion. I was set down at Woolwich Town End, and walked through the town in the dark, it being now night. But in the street did overtake and almost run upon two women crying and carrying a man's coffin between them. I suppose the husband of one of them, which methinks is a sad thing. Being come to Sheldon's, I find my people in the dark in the dining-room, merry and laughing, and, I thought, sporting one with another, which, God help me, raised my jealousy presently. Come in the dark, and one of them touching me, which afterward I found was Susan, made them shriek, and so went out upstairs, leaving them to light a candle and to run out. I went out, and was very vexed, till I found my wife was gone with Mr. Hill and Mercer this day, to see me at Greenwich, and these people were at supper, and the candle on a sudden falling out of the candlestick, which I saw as I come through the yard, and Mrs. Barbary being there, I was well at ease again, and so bethought myself what to do, whether to go to Greenwich or stay there, at last go I would, and so with a lantern, and three or four people with me, among others Mr. Brown, who was there, would go. I walked with a lantern, and discoursed with him about painting, and the several sorts of it. I came in good time to Greenwich, where I found Mr. Hill with my wife, and very glad I was to see him, to supper, and discourse of music, and so to bed. I lying with him talking till midnight about Birkenshaw's music rules, which I did to his great satisfaction inform him in, and so to sleep. Thirtieth. Up into my office about business, at noon to dinner, and after some discourse of music, he and I to the office a while, and he to get Mr. Coleman, if he can, against night. By and by I back again home, and there find him returned with Mr. Coleman, his wife being ill, and Mr. Lanier, with whom, with their lute, we had excellent company and good singing till midnight, and a good supper I did give them. But Coleman's voice is quite spoiled, and when he begins to be drunk he is excellent company, but afterward troublesome and impertinent. Lanier sings in a melancholy method very well, and a sober man he seems to be. They being gone, we to bed. Captain Ferrers coming this day from my lord is forced to lodge here, and I put him to Mr. Hill. 31st. Up into the office, Captain Ferrers going back betimes to my lord. I to the office, where Sir W. Batten met me, and did tell me that Captain Cox Black was dead of the plague, which I had heard of before, but took no notice. By and by Captain Cox come to the office, and Sir W. Batten and I did send to him that he would either forbear the office, or forbear going to his own office. 
However, meeting yesterday the searchers with their rods in their hands coming from Captain Cock's house, I did overhear them say that the fellow did not die of the plague, but he had, I know, been ill a good while, and I am told that his boy Jack is also ill. At noon home to dinner, and then to the office again, leaving Mr. Hill, if he can, to get Mrs. Coleman at night. About nine at night I come home, and there find Mrs. Pierce come, and little Fran took her, and Mr. Hill, and other people, a great many dancing, and anon comes Mrs. Coleman with her husband, and Lanier. The dancing ended, and to sing, which Mrs. Coleman do very finely, though her voice is decayed as to strength, but mighty sweet, though soft, and a pleasant jolly woman, and in mighty good humour was to-night. Among other things, Lanier did, at the request of Mr. Hill, bring two or three the finest prints for my wife to see that ever I did see in all my life. But for singing, among other things, we got Mrs. Coleman to sing part of the opera, though she won't own that ever she did get any of it without book in order to the stage, but above all her counterfeiting of Captain Cook's part, in his reproaching his man with cowardice, base slave, etc., she do it most excellently. At it till past midnight, and then broke up and to bed, Hill and I together again, and being very sleepy we had little discourse as we had the other night. Thus we end the month merrily, and the more for that, after some fears that the plague would have increased again this week, I hear for certain that there is above four hundred less, the whole number being one thousand three hundred and eighty-eight, and of them of the plague one thousand and thirty-one. Want of money in the navy puts everything out of order, men grow mutinous, and nobody here to mind the business of the navy but myself. At least Sir W. Batten, for the few days he has been here, do nothing. I, in great hopes of my place of surveyor-general of the Vittling, which will bring me three hundred pounds per annum. End of October November of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1665, by Samuel Pepys. November, 1665. November 1st. Lay very long in bed, discoursing with Mr. Hill of most things of a man's life, and how little merit do prevail in the world, but only favour, and that for myself chance without merit brought me in, and that diligence only keeps me so, and will, living as I do among so many lazy people, that the diligent man becomes necessary, that they cannot do anything without him, and so told him of my late business of the victualling, and what cares I am in to keep myself having to do with people of so different factions at court, and yet must be fair with them all, which was very pleasant discourse for me to tell, as well as he seemed to take it, for him to hear. At last up, and it being a very foul day for rain, and a hideous wind, yet having promised I would go by water to Erith, and bearing sail was in danger of oversetting, but ordered them take down their sail, and so cold and wet got thither, as they had ended their dinner. However, I dined well, and after dinner all on shore, my Lord Brunker with us, to Mrs. Williams' lodgings, and Sir W. Batten, Sir Edmund Pooley, and others. And there, it being my lord's birthday, had every one a green ribbon tied in our hats very foolishly, and methinks mighty disgracefully for my lord to have his folly so open to all the world with this woman. But by and by Sir W. Batten and I took coach, and home to Borman, and so going home by the back side I saw Captain Cock lighting out of his coach, having been at Erith also with her, but not on board, and so he would come along with me to my lodging, and there sat and supped and talked with us. But we were angry a little a while about our message to him the other day, about bidding him keep from the office, or his own office, because of his black dying. I owned it, and the reason of it, and would have been glad he had been out of the house, but I could not bid him go, and so supped, and after much other talk of the sad condition and state of the king's matters, we broke up, and my friend and I to bed. This night coming with Sir W. Batten into Greenwich, we called upon Colonel Cleggett, who tells us for certain that the King of Denmark hath declared to stand for the King of England, but since I hear it is wholly false. Second up left my wife and to the office and there to my great content sir w warren come to me to settle the business of the tangier boats wherein i shall get above a hundred pounds besides a hundred pounds which he gives me in the paying for them out of his own purse he gone i home to my lodgings to dinner and there comes captain wagers newly returned from the straits who puts me in great fear for our last ships that went to tangier with provisions that they will be taken a brave stout fellow this captain is and i think very honest to the office again after dinner and there late writing letters and then about eight at night set out from my office and fitting myself at my lodgings intended to have gone this night in a catch down to the fleet but calling in my way at sir j minnes's who is come up from erith about something about the prizes they persuaded me not to go till the morning 
it being a horrible dark and a windy night. So I back to my lodging and to bed. Third, was called up about four o'clock, and in the dark by lantern took boat, and to the ketch and set sail, sleeping a little in the cabin till day, and then up and fell to reading of Mr. Evelyn's book about painting, which is a very pretty book. Carrying good victuals and Tom with me, I to breakfast about nine o'clock, and then to read again and come to the fleet about twelve, where I found my lord, the prince being gone in, on board the Royal James, Sir Thomas Allen, commander, and with my lord an hour alone discoursing what was my chief and only errand, about what was advisable for his lordship to do in this state of things, himself being under the Duke of York's and Mr. Coventry's envy, and a great many more, and likely never to do anything honourably, but he shall be envied, and the honour taken as much as can be from it. His absence lessens his interest at court, and what is worst, we never able to set out a fleet fit for him to command, or if out, to keep them out, or fit them to do any great thing, or if that were so, yet nobody at home minds him, or his condition when he is abroad, and lastly the whole affairs of state looking as if they would all on a sudden break in pieces, and then what a sad thing it would be for him to be out of the way. My lord did concur in everything, and thanked me infinitely for my visit and counsel, telling me that in everything he concurs, but puts a query, what if the king will not think himself safe, if any man should go but him? How he should go off then? To that I had no answer ready, but the making the king see that he may be of as good use to him here, while another goes forth. But for that I am not able to say much. We after this talked of some other little things, and so to dinner, where my lord infinitely kind to me, and after dinner I rose and left him with some commanders at the table taking tobacco, and I took the besom back with me, and with a brave gale in tide reached up that night to the hope, taking great pleasure in learning the seamen's manner of singing when they sound the depths, and then to supper and to sleep, which I did most excellently all night, it being a horrible foul night for wind and rain. Fourth. They sailed from midnight, and come to Greenwich about five o'clock in the morning. I, however, lay till about seven or eight, and so to my office, my head a little aching, partly for want of natural rest, partly having so much business to do to-day, and partly from the news I hear that one of the little boys at my lodging is not well, and they suspect, by their sending for plaster and fume, that it may be the plague. So I sent Mr. Hayter and W. Hewer to speak with the mother, but they returned to me, satisfied that there is no hurt nor danger, but the boy is well, and offers to be searched. However, I was resolved myself to abstain coming thither for a while. Sir so W. Batten and myself at the office all the morning, at noon with him to dinner at Borman's, where Mr. Seymour with us, who is a most conceited fellow, and not over much in him. Here Sir W. Batten told us, which I had not heard before, that the last sitting day his cloak was taken from Mingo, he going home to dinner, and that he was beaten by the seaman, and swears he will come to Greenwich, but no more to the office till he can sit safe. After dinner I to the office, and there late, and much trouble to have a hundred seamen all the afternoon there, swearing below, and cursing us, and breaking the glass windows, and swear they will pull the house down on Tuesday next. I sent word of this to court, but nothing will help it but money and a rope. Late at night to Mr. Glanville's, there to lie for a night or two, and to bed. Fifth. Lord's Day. Up, and after being trimmed, by boat to the cockpit, where I heard the Duke of Albemarle's chaplain make a simple sermon. Among other things, reproaching the imperfection of human learning, he cried, All our physicians cannot tell what an egg is, and all our arithmetic is not able to number the days of a man, which, God knows, is not the fault of arithmetic, but that our understandings reach not the thing. To dinner were a great deal of silly discourse, but the worst is I hear that the plague increases much at Lambeth, St. Martin's, and Westminster, and fear it will all over the city. Then I to the Swan, thinking to have seen Sarah, but she was at church, and so I by water to Deptford, and there made a visit to Mr. Evelyn, who, among other things, showed me most excellent painting in little, in distemper, Indian ink, water colours, graving, and above all the whole secret of mezzo tinto, and the manner of it, which is very pretty, and good things done with it. He read to me very much also of his discourse, he hath been many years, and now is about, about gardenage, which will be a most noble and pleasant piece. He read me part of a play or two of his making, very good, but not as he conceits them, I think, to be. He showed me his hortus hyomalis, leaves laid up in a book of several plants kept dry, which preserve colour, however, and look very finely, better than any herbal. In fine, a most excellent person he is, 
and must be allowed a little for a little conceitedness, but he may well be so, being a man so much above others. He read me, though with too much gusto, some little poems of his own, that were not transcendent, yet one or two very pretty epigrams, among others of a lady looking in at a grate and being pecked at by an eagle that was there. Here comes in, in the middle of our discourse, Captain Cock, as drunk as a dog, but could stand and talk and laugh. He did so joy himself in a brave woman that he had been with all the afternoon, and who should it be but my Lady Robinson? But very troublesome he is with his noise and talk and laughing, though very pleasant. With him in his coach to Mr. Glanville's, where he sat with Mrs. Pennington and myself a good while, talking of this fine woman again, and then went away. Then the lady and I, to very serious discourse, and among other things, of what a bonny lass my Lady Robinson is, who is reported to be kind to the prisoners, and has said to Sir G. Smith, who is her great crony, Look, there is a pretty man, I would be content to break a commandment with him, and such loose expressions she will have often. After an hour's talk we to bed, the lady mightily troubled about a pretty little bitch she hath, which is very sick, and will eat nothing. And the worst was, I could hear her in her chamber bemoaning the bitch, and by and by taking her into bed with her. The bitch pissed and shit a bed, and she was fain to rise, and had coals out of my chamber to dry the bed again. This night I had a letter that Sir G. Carter would be in town to-morrow, which did much surprise me. Sixth. Up into my office, where busy all the morning, and then to dinner to Captain Cox with Mr. Evelyn, where very merry, only vexed after dinner to stay too long for our coach. At last, however, to Lambeth, and thence the cockpit, where we found Sir G. Carteret come, and in with the Duke and the East India Company about settling the business of the prizes, and they have gone through with it. Then they broke up, and Sir G. Carteret come out, and thence through the garden to the water-side, and by water I with him in his boat, down with Captain Cock to his house at Greenwich. And while supper was getting ready, Sir G. Carteret and I did walk an hour in the garden before the house, talking of my Lord Sandwich's business, what enemies he hath, and how they have endeavoured to bespatter him, and particularly about his leaving of thirty ships of the enemy, when Penn would have gone, and my lord called him back again, which is most false. However, he says, it was purposed by some hotheads in the House of Commons, at the same time when they voted a present to the Duke of York, to have voted ten thousand pounds to the prince, and half a crown to my lord of Sandwich, but nothing come of it. But for all this the king is most firm to my lord, and so is my lord Chancellor, and my lord Arlington, the prince in appearance, kind, the Duke of York silent, says no hurt, but admits others to say it in his hearing, Sir W. Penn, the falsest rascal that ever was in the world, and that this afternoon the Duke of Albemarle did tell him that Penn was a very cowardly rogue, and one that hath brought all these roguish fanatic captains into the fleet, and swears he should never go out with the fleet again. That Sir W. Coventry is most kind to Penn still, and says nothing nor do anything openly to the prejudice of my lord. He agrees with me that it is impossible for the king to set out a fleet again the next year, and that he fears all will come to ruin, there being no money in prospect but these prizes, which will bring, it may be, twenty thousand pounds, but that will signify nothing in the world for it. That this late act of Parliament for bringing the money into the exchequer, and making of it payable out there, intended as a prejudice to him, and will be his convenience hereafter, and ruin the king's business. And so I fear it will." and do wonder Sir W. Coventry would be led by Sir G. Downing to persuade the King and Duke to have it so, before they had thoroughly weighed all circumstances. That for my Lord the King has said to him lately that I was an excellent officer, and that my Lord Chancellor do he thinks love and esteem of me as well as he do of any man in England that he hath no more acquaintance with. So having done and received from me the sad news that we are like to have no money here a great while, not even of the very prizes, I set up my rest in giving up the king's service to be ruined, and so into supper, where pretty merry, and after supper late to Mr. Glanville's and Sir G. Carteret to bed. I also to bed, it being very late. Seventh. Up and to Sir G. Carteret, and with him, he being very passionate to be gone, without staying a minute for breakfast, to the Duke of Albemarle's, and I with him by water and with Fen, but among other things, Lord, to see how he wondered to see the river so empty of boats, nobody working at the custom-house keys, and how fearful he is, and vexed that his man, holding a wine-glass in his hand for him to drink out of, did cover his hands, it being a cold, windy, rainy morning, under the waterman's coat, though he brought the waterman from six or seven miles up the river, too. Nay, he carried this glass with him for his man to let him drink out of at the Duke of Albemarle's, where he intended to dine, 
though this he did to prevent sluttery for for the same reason he carried a napkin with him to captain cox making him believe that he should eat with foul linen here he with the duke walked a good while in the park and i with fen but cannot gather that he intends to stay with us nor thinks anything at all of ever paying one farthing of money more to us here let what will come of it thence in and sir w batten comes in by and by and so staying till noon and there being a great deal of company there sir w batten and i took leave of the duke and sir g carteret there being no good to be done more for money and so over the river and by coach to greenwich where at bormans we dined it being late thence my head being full of business and mind out of order for thinking of the effects which will arise from the want of money i made an end of my letters by eight o'clock and so to my lodging and there spent the evening till midnight talking with mrs pennington who is a very discreet understanding lady and very pretty discourse we had and great variety and she tells me with great sorrow her bitch is dead this morning died in her bed so broke up and to bed eighth up and to the office where busy among other things to look my warrants for the settling of the victualling business the warrants being come to me for the surveyors of the ports and that for me also to be surveyor general i did discourse largely with tom wilson about it and doubt not to make it a good service to the king as well as the king gives us very good salaries it being a fast day all people were at church and the office quiet so i did much business and at noon adventured to my old lodging and there eat but i am not yet well satisfied not seeing of christopher though they say he is abroad thence after dinner to the office again and thence am sent for to the king's head by my lord rutherford who since i can hope for no more convenience from him his business is troublesome to me and therefore i did leave him as soon as i could and by water to deptford and there did order my matters so walking up and down the fields till it was dark night that j'allais à la maison of my valentine and there je faisais whatever je voudrais avec her and about eight at night did take water being glad i was out of the town for the plague it seems rages there more than ever and so to my lodgings where my lord had got a supper and the mistress of the house and her daughters and here stayed mrs pierce to speak with me about her husband's business and i made her sup with us and then at night my lord and i walked with her home and so back again my lord and i ended all we had to say as to his business overnight and so i took leave and went again to mr glanville's and so to bed it being very late ninth up and did give the servant something at mr glanville's and so took leave meaning to lie to-night at my own lodging to my office where busy with mr gordon running over the victualling business and he is mightily pleased that this course is taking and seems sensible of my favour and promises kindness to me at noon by water to the king's head at deptford where captain taylor invites sir w batten and sir john robinson who come in with a great deal of company from hunting and brought in a hare alive and a great many silly stories they tell of their sport which pleases them mightily and me not at all such is the different sense of pleasure in mankind and others upon the score of a survey of his new ship and strange to see how a good dinner and feasting reconciles everybody sir w batten and sir j robinson being now as kind to him and report well of his ship and proceedings and promise money and sir w batten is a solicitor for him but it is a strange thing to observe they being the greatest enemies he had and yet i believe hath in the world in their hearts thence after dinner stole away and to my office where did a great deal of business till midnight and then to mrs clark's to lodge again and going home w hewitt did tell me my wife will be here to-morrow and hath put away mary which vexes me to the heart i cannot help it though it may be a folly in me and when i think seriously on it i think my wife means no ill design in it or if she do i am a fool to be troubled at it since i cannot help it the bill of mortality to all our griefs is increased three hundred and ninety nine this week and the increase generally through the whole city and suburbs which makes us all sad tenth up and entered all my journals since the twenty eighth of october having every day's passages well in my head though it troubles me to remember it and which i was forced to being kept from my lodging where my books and papers are for several days so to my office where till two or three o'clock busy before i could go to my lodging to dinner then did it and to my office again in the evening news is brought me my wife is come so i to her and with her spent the evening but with no great pleasure i being vexed about her putting away of mary in my absence but yet i took no notice of it at all but fell into other discourse and she told me having herself been this day at my house at london which was boldly done to see mary have her things that mr harrington our neighbour an east country merchant is dead at epsom of the plague 
and that another neighbour of ours, Mr. Holworthy, a very able man, is also dead by a fall in the country from his horse, his foot hanging in the stirrup, and his brains beat out. Here we sat talking, and after supper to bed. 11th. I up and to the office, leaving my wife in bed, and there till noon, then to dinner and back again to the office, my wife going to Woolwich again, and I staying very late at my office, and so home to bed. 12th. Lord's Day. Up and invited by Captain Cock to dinner. So after being ready I went to him, and there he and I and Mr. Yard, one of the Guinea Company, dined together and very merry. After dinner I by water to the Duke of Albemarle, and there had a little discourse and business with him, chiefly to receive his commands about pilots to be got for our Hambro ships, going now at this time of the year convoy to the merchant ships, that have lain at great pain and charged some three, some four months at Harwich for a convoy. They hope here the plague will be less this week. Then back by water to Captain Cox, and there he and I spent a great deal of the evening, as we had done, of the day, reading and discoursing over part of Mr. Stillingfleet's Origine Sacre, wherein many things are very good and some frivolous. Then by and by he and I to Mrs. Pennington's, but she was gone to bed. So we back and walked a while, and then to his house and to supper, and then broke up, and I home to my lodging to bed. Thirteenth. Up into my office, where busy all the morning, and at noon to Captain Cox to dinner, as we had appointed, in order to settle our business of accounts. But here came in an alderman, a merchant, a very merry man, and we dined, and he being gone, after dinner Cock and I walked into the garden, and there, after a little discourse, he did undertake under his hand to secure me in five hundred pounds profit, for my share of the profit of what we have bought of the prize goods. We agreed upon the terms, which were easier on my side than I expected, and so with extraordinary inward joy we parted till the evening. So I to the office, and among other business prepared a deed for him to sign and seal to me about our agreement, which at night I got him to come and sign and seal. And so he and I to Glanville's, and there he and I sat talking and playing with Mrs. Pennington, whom we found undressed in her smock and petticoats by the fireside. And there we drank and laughed, and she willingly suffered me to put my hand in her bosom very wantonly, and keep it there long, which methought was very strange, and I looked upon myself as a man mightily deceived in a lady, for I could not have thought she could have suffered it, by her former discourse with me, so modest she seemed, and I know not what. We stayed here late, and so home, after he and I had walked till past midnight, a bright moonshine, clear cool night, before his door by the water, and so I home after one of the clock. Fourteenth. Called up by break of day by Captain Cock, by agreement, and he and I in his coach through Kent Street, a sad place through the plague, people sitting sick and with plasters about them in the street begging, to Viners and Colville's about money business, and so to my house, and there I took three hundred pounds in order to the carrying it down to my Lord Sandwich, in part of the money I am to pay for Captain Cock by our agreement. So I took it down, and down I went to Greenwich to my office and there sat busy till noon, and so home to dinner, and thence to the office again, and by and by to the Duke of Albemarle's, by water late, where I find he had remembered that I had appointed to come to him this day about money, which I excused not doing sooner, but I see a dull fellow as he is, do sometimes remember what another thinks he mindeth not. My business was about getting money of the East India Company, but, Lord, to see how the Duke himself magnifies himself in what he had done with the company, and my lord craven what the king could have done without my lord duke and a deal of stir but most mightily what a brave fellow i am by by water it raining hard and so to the office and stopped my going as i intended to the boy of the nor and great reason i had to rejoice at it for it proved the night of as great a storm as was almost ever remembered later at the office and so home to bed this day calling at mr rawlinson's to know how all did there i hear that my pretty grocer's wife mrs beversham over the way there, her husband is lately dead of the plague at Bow, which I am sorry for, for fear of losing her neighbourhood. 15th. Up and all the morning at the office, busy, and at noon to the King's Head Tavern, where all the Trinity House dined to-day, to choose a new master in the room of Hurlstone, that is dead, and Captain Crisp is chosen. But, Lord, to see how Sir W. Batten governs all and tramples upon Hurlstone, but I am confident the company will grow the worse for that man's death for now Batten, and in him a lazy, corrupted, doting rogue, will have all the sway there. After dinner, who comes in but my lady Batten, and a troop of a dozen women almost, and expected, as I found afterward, to be made mighty much of, but nobody minded them, 
but the best jest was that when they saw themselves not regarded they would go away and it was horrible foul weather and my lady batten walking through the dirty lane with new spick and span white shoes she dropped one of her galoshes in the dirt where it stuck and she forced to go home without one at which she was horribly vexed and i led her and after vexing her a little more in mirth i parted and to glanville's where i knew sir john robinson sir g smith and captain cock were gone and there with the company of mrs pennington whose father i hear was one of the court of justice and died prisoner of the stone in the tower i made them against their resolutions to stay from hour to hour till it was almost midnight and a furious dark and rainy and windy stormy night and which was best i with drinking small beer made them all drunk drinking wine at which sir john robinson made great sport but they being gone the lady and i very civilly sat an hour by the fireside observing the folly of this robinson that makes it his work to praise himself and all he say and do like a heavy-headed coxcomb the plague blessed be god is decreased four hundred making the whole this week but thirteen hundred and odd for which the lord be praised sixteenth up and fitted myself for my journey down to the fleet and sending my money and boy down by water to erith i borrowed a horse of mr borman's son and after having sat an hour laughing with my lady batten and mrs turner and eat and drank with them i took horse and rode to erith where after making a little visit to madam williams who did give me information of w howe's having bought eight bags of precious stones taken from about the dutch vice-admiral's neck of which there were eight diamonds which cost him sixty thousand pounds sterling in india and hoped to have made two thousand pounds here for them and that this is told by one that sold him one of the bags which hath nothing but rubies in it which he had for thirty-five shillings and that it will be proved he hath made a hundred and twenty-five pounds of one stone that he bought this she desired and i resolved i would give my lord sandwich notice of so i on board my lord brunker and there he and said mempuli carried me down into the hold of the india ship and there did show me the greatest wealth lying confusion that a man can see in the world pepper scattered through every chink you trod upon it and in cloves and nutmegs i walked above the knees whole rooms full and silk in bales and boxes of copper plate one of which i saw opened having seen this which was as noble a sight as ever i saw in my life i away on board the other ship in despair to get the pleasure boat of the gentlemen there to carry me to the fleet they were mr ashburnham and colonel wyndham but pleading the king's business they did presently agree i should have it so i presently on board and got under sail and had a good bed by the shift of wyndham's and so seventeenth sailed all night and got down to quimborough water where all the great ships are now come and there on board my lord and was soon received with great content and after some little discourse he and i on board sir w penn and there held a council of war about many wants of the fleet but chiefly how to get slops and victuals for the fleet now going out to convoy our hambrough ships that have been so long detained for four or five months for want of convoy which we did accommodate one way or other and so after much chat sir w penn did give us a very good and neat dinner and better i think than ever i did see at his own house at home in my life and so was the other i eat with him after dinner much talk and about other things he and i about his money for his prize goods wherein i did give him a cool answer but so as we did not disagree in words much and so let that fall and so followed my lord sandwich who was gone a little before me on board the royal james and there spent an hour my lord playing upon the guitar which he now commends above all music in the world because it is bass enough for a single voice and is so portable and manageable without much trouble that being done i got my lord to be alone and so i fell to acquaint him with w howe's business which he had before heard a little of from captain cock but made no great matter of it but now he do and resolves nothing less than to lay him by the heels and seize on all he hath saying that for this year or two he hath observed him so proud and conceited he could not endure him but though i was not at all displeased with it yet i prayed him to forbear doing anything therein till he heard from me again about it and i had made more inquiry into the truth of it which she agreed to then we fell to public discourse wherein was principally this he cleared it to me beyond all doubt that coventry is his enemy and has been long so so that i am over that and my lord told it me upon my proposal of a friendship between them which he says is impossible and methinks that my lord's displeasure about the report in print of the first fight was not of his making but i perceive my lord cannot forget it nor the other think he can i shewed him how advisable it were upon almost any terms for him to get quite off the sea employment he answers me again that he agrees to it but thinks the king will not let him go off 
he tells me he lacks now my lord orrery to solicit it for him who is very great with the king as an infinite secret my lord tells me the factions are high between the king and the duke and all the court are in an uproar with their loose amours the duke of york being in love desperately with mrs stuart nay that the duchess herself is fallen in love with her new master of the horse one harry sidney and another harry Savile, so that god knows what will be the end of it and that the duke is not so obsequious as he used to be but very high of late and would be glad to be in the head of an army as general and that it is said that he do propose to go and command under the king of spain in flanders that his amours to mrs stuart are told the king so that all is like to be naught among them that he knows that the duke of york do give leave to have him spoken slightly of in his own hearing and doth not oppose it and told me from what time he hath observed this to begin so that upon the whole my lord do concur to wish with all his heart that he could with any honour get from off the employment after he had given thanks to me for my kind visit and good counsel on which he seems to set much by i left him and so away to my besan again and there to read in a pretty french book la nouvelle allegorique upon the strife between rhetoric and its enemies very pleasant so after supper to sleep and sailed all night and came to erith before break of day eighteenth about nine of the clock i went on shore there calling by the way only to look upon my lord brunker to give mrs williams an account of her matters and so hired an ill-favoured horse and away to greenwich to my lodgings where i hear how rude the soldiers have been in my absence swearing what they would do with me which troubled me but however after eating a bit i to the office and there very late writing letters and so home and to bed nineteenth lord's day up and after being trimmed alone by water to erith all the way with my song-book singing of mr laws's long recitative song in the beginning of his book being come there on board my lord brunker i find captain cock and other company the lady not well and mighty merry we were sir edmund pooley being very merry and a right english gentleman and one of the discontented cavaliers that think their loyalty is not considered after dinner all on shore to my lady williams and there drank and talked but lord the most impertinent bold woman with my lord that ever i did see i did give her an account again of my business with my lord touching w howe and she did give me some more information about it and examination taken about it and so we parted and i took boat and to woolwich where we found my wife not well of them and i out of humour begun to dislike her painting the last things not pleasing me so well as the former but i blame myself for my being so little complaisant so without eating or drinking there being no wine which vexed me too we walked with the lantern to greenwich and eat something at his house and so home to bed twentieth up before day and wrote some letters to go to my lord among others that about w howe which i believe will turn him out and so took horse for none such with two men with me and the ways very bad and the weather worse for wind and rain but we got in good time thither and i did get my tallies got ready and thence with as many as could go to yule and there dined very well and i saw my best a very well favoured country lass there and after being very merry and having spent a piece i took horse and by another way met with a very good road but it rained hard and blew but got home very well here i find mr deering come to trouble me about business which i soon dispatched and parted he telling me that llewellyn hath been dead this fortnight of the plague in st martin's lane which much surprised me twenty first up into the office where all the morning doing business and at noon home to dinner and quickly back again to the office were very busy all the evening and late sent a long discourse to mr coventry by his desire about the regulating of the method of our payment of bills in the navy which will be very good though it may be he did aim principally at striking at sir g carteret so weary but pleased with this business being over i home to supper and to bed twenty second up and by water to the duke of albemarle and there did some little business but most to shew myself and mightily i am yet in his and lord craven's books and thence to the swan and there drank and so down to the bridge and so to the change where spoke with many people and about a great deal of business which kept me late i heard this day that mr harrington is not dead of the plague as we believed at which i was very glad but most of all to hear that the plague is come very low that is the whole under a thousand and the plague six hundred and odd and great hopes of a further decrease because of this day's being a very exceeding hard frost and continues freezing this day the first of the oxford gazettes come out which is very pretty full of news 
and no folly in it, wrote by Williamson, fear that our Hamburg ships at last cannot go because of the great frost, which we believe it is there, nor are our ships cleared at the pillow, which will keep them there too all this winter, I fear. From the change, which is pretty full again, I to my office, and there took some things, and so by water to my lodging at Greenwich and dined, and then to the office a while, and at night home to my lodgings, and took T. Wilson and T. Hater with me, and there spent the evening till midnight discoursing and settling of our victualling business, that thereby I might draw up instructions for the surveyors, and that we might be doing something to earn our money. This done, I laid to bed. Among other things it pleased me to have it demonstrated that a purser without professed cheating is a professed loser, twice as much as he gets. 23rd. Up betimes, and so being trimmed, I to get papers ready against Sir H. Chumley come to me by appointment, he being newly come over from Tangier. He did by and by come, and we settled all matters about his money, and he is a most satisfied man in me, and do declare his resolution to give me two hundred per annum. It continuing to be a great frost, which gives us hope for a perfect cure of the plague, he and I to walk in the park, and there discoursed with grief of the calamity of the times, how the king's service is performed, and how Tangier is governed by a man who, though honourable, yet do mind his ways of getting and little else compared, which will never make the place flourish. I brought him, and had a good dinner for him, and there come by chance Captain Cuttons, who tells me how W. Howe is laid by the heels, and confined to the royal Catherine, and his things all seized, and how also for a quarrel, which indeed the other night my lord told me, Captain Ferrers, having cut all over the back of another of my lord's servants, is parted from my lord. I sent for little Mrs. Francis Tooker, and after they were gone I sat dallying with her an hour, doing what I would with my hands about her, and a very pretty creature it is. So in the evening to the office, where late writing letters, and at my lodging later writing for the last twelve days my journal, and so to bed. Great expectation what mischief more the French will do us, for we must fall out. We, in extraordinary lack of money, and everything else, to go to sea next year. My Lord Sandwich is gone from the fleet yesterday, toward Oxford. 24th. Up, and after doing some business at the office, I to London, and there in my way, at my old oyster shop in Gracious Street, bought two barrels of my fine woman of the shop, who is alive after all the plague, which now is the first observation or inquiry we make at London concerning everybody we knew before it. So to the change, we are very busy with several people, and mightily glad to see the change so full, and hopes of another abatement still the next week. Off the change I went home with Sir G. Smith to dinner, sending for one of my barrels of oysters, which were good, though come from Colchester, where the plague hath been so much. Here a very brave dinner, though no invitation, and, Lord, to see how I am treated, that come from so mean a beginning, is matter of wonder to me. But it is God's great mercy to me, and his blessing upon my taking pains and being punctual in my dealings. After dinner, Captain Cock and I, about some business, and then with my other barrel of oysters, home to Greenwich, sent them my water to Mrs. Pennington, while he and I landed, and visited Mr. Evelyn, where most excellent discourse with him. Among other things, he showed me a ledger of a treasurer of the navy, his great-grandfather, just one hundred years old, which I seem mighty fond of, and he did present me with it, which I take as a great rarity, and he hopes to find me more, older than it. He also shewed us several letters of the old Lord of Leicester's in Queen Elizabeth's time, under the very handwriting of Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary, Queen of Scots, and others, very venerable names. But, Lord, how poorly methinks they wrote in those days, and in what plain, uncut paper! Thence, Cock having sent for his coach, we to Mrs. Pennington, and there sat and talked and eat our oysters with great pleasure, and so home to my lodging late, and to bed. 25th. Up and busy at the office all day long, saving dinner time, and in the afternoon also very late at my office, and so home to bed. All our business is now about our Hambro fleet, whether it can go or no this year, the weather being set in frosty, and the whole stay being for want of pilots now, which I have wrote to the Trinity House about, but have so poor an account from them, that I did acquaint Sir W. Coventry with it this post. 26th. Lord's Day. Up, though very late abed, yet before day, to dress myself to go toward Erith, which I would do by land, it being a horrible cold frost to go by water, so borrowed two horses of Mr. Howell and his friend, and with much ado set out after my horses being frosted, which I know not what it means to this day, and my boy having lost one of my spurs and stockings, carrying them to the smith's, but I borrowed a stocking, and so got up, and Mr. Tooker with me, and rode to Erith, and there on board my Lord Brunker met Sir W. Warren upon his business, among others, and did a great deal, 
Sir J. Minnes, as God would have it, not being there to hinder us with his impertinences. Business done, we to dinner very merry. There being there Sir Edmund Pooley, a very worthy gentleman. They are now come to the copper boxes in the prizes, and hope to have ended all this week. After dinner took leave, and on shore to Madam Williams, to give her an account of my lord's letter to me about how, who he has clapped by the heels on suspicion of having the jewels, and she did give me my lord Brunker's examination of the fellow, that declares his having them, and so away, Sir W. Warren riding with me, and the way being very bad, that is, hard and slippery by reason of the frost, so we could not come to pass Woolwich till night. However, having a great mind to have gone to the Duke of Albemarle, I endeavoured to have gone further, but the night come on, and no going, so I light and sent my horse by Tooker, and returned on foot to my wife at Woolwich, where I found, as I had directed, a good dinner to be made against to-morrow, and invited guests in the yard, meaning to be merry, in order to her taking leave, for she intends to come in a day or two to me for altogether. But here, they tell me, one of the houses behind them is infected, and I was fain to stand there a great while to have their back door opened, but they could not, having locked them fast, against any passing through so was forced to pass by them again, close to their sick-beds, which they were removing out of the house, which troubled me. So I made them uninvite their guests, and to resolve of coming all away to me to-morrow. And I walked with a lantern, weary as I was, to Greenwich. But it was a fine walk, it being a hard frost, and so to Captain Cox. But he, I found, had sent for me to come to him to Mrs. Pennington's, and there I went. And we were very merry, and supped, and Cox being sleepy, he went away betimes. I stayed alone, talking and playing with her, till past midnight, she suffering me whatever ego voulez avec ses mamille. Much pleased with her company, we parted, and I home to bed at past one, all people being in bed, thinking I would have stayed out of town all night. 27th. Up, and being to go to wait on the Duke of Albemarle, who is to go out of town to Oxford to-morrow, and I being unwilling to go by water, it being bitter cold, walked it with my landlady's little boy Christopher to Lambeth, it being a very fine walk, and calling at half the way, and drank, and so to the Duke of Albemarle, who is visited by everybody against his going, and mighty kind to me, and upon my desiring his grace to give me his kind word to the Duke of York, if any occasion there were of speaking of me, he told me he had reason to do so, for there had been nothing done in the navy without me. His going, I hear, is upon putting the sea business into order, and, as some say, and people of his own family, that he is agog to go to sea himself the next year. Here I met with a letter from Sir G. Carteret, who is come to Cranbourne, that he will be here this afternoon, and desires me to be with him. So the Duke would have me dine with him. So it being not dinner-time, I to the Swan, and there found Sarah all alone in the house. So away to the Duke of Albemarle again, and there to dinner, he most exceeding kind to me, to the observation of all that are there. At dinner comes Sir G. Carteret, and dines with us. After dinner, a great deal alone with Sir G. Carteret who tells me that my lord hath received still worse and worse usage from some base people about the court. But the king is very kind, and the duke do not appear the contrary, and my lord chancellor swore to him, by, I will not forsake my lord of Sandwich. Our next discourse is upon this act for money, about which Sir G. Carteret comes to see what money can be got upon it. But none can be got, which pleases him the thoughts of, for, if the exchequer should succeed in this, his office would fail. But I am apt to think at this time of hurry and plague and want of trade, no money will be got upon a new way which few understand. We walked, Cock and I, through the park with him, and so we being to meet the Vice-Chamberlain to-morrow at Nonsuch, to treat with Sir Robert Long about the same business, I into London, it being dark night, by a hackney coach, the first I have durst to go in many a day, and with great pain now for fear. But it being unsafe to go by water in the dark and frosty cold, and unable being weary with my morning walk to go on foot, this was my only way. Few people yet in the streets, nor shops open, here and there twenty in a place almost, though not above five or six o'clock at night. So to Viners, and there heard of Cock, and found him at the Pope's head, drinking with Temple. I to them, where the goldsmiths do decry the new act, for money to be all brought into the exchequer and paid out thence, saying they will not advance one farthing upon it, and indeed it is their interest to say and do so. Thence Cock and I to Sir G. Smith's, it being now night, and there up to his chamber, and sat talking, and I barbing, against to-morrow and anon at nine at night, comes to us Sir G. Smith and the lieutenant of the tower. And there they sat, talking and drinking, till past midnight, and mighty merry we were, the lieutenant of the tower being in a mighty vein of singing, and he hath a very good ear and strong voice, but no manner of skill. Sir G. Smith shewed me his lady's closet, which was very fine, and after being very merry, here I lay in a noble chamber, and mighty highly treated, the first time I have lain in London a long time. Twenty-eighth. 
up before day and cock and i took a hackney coach appointed with four horses to take us up and so carried us over london bridge but there thinking of some business i did light at the foot of the bridge and by help of a candle at a stall where some payers were at work i wrote a letter to mr hater and never knew so great an instance of the usefulness of carrying pen and ink and wax about one so we the way being very bad to none such and thence to sir robert long's house a fine place and dinner time ere we got thither but we had breakfasted a little at mr gordon's he being out of town though and there borrowed dr taylor's sermons and is a most excellent book and worth my buying where i had a very good dinner and curiously dressed and here a couple of ladies kinswomen of his not handsome though but rich that knew me by report of theo turner and mighty merry we were after dinner to talk of our business the act of parliament where in short i see sir r long mighty fierce in the great good qualities of it but in that and many other things he was stiff in i think without much judgment or the judgment i expected from him and already there have evaded the necessity of bringing people into the exchequer with their bills to be paid there sir g carteret is titched at this yet resolves with me to make the best use we can of this act for the king but all our care we think will not render it as it should be he did again here alone discourse with me about my lord and is himself strongly for my lord's not going to see which i am glad to hear and did confirm him in it he tells me too that he talked last night with the duke of albemarle about my lord sandwich by the by making him sensible that it is his interest to preserve his old friends which he confessed he had reason to do for he knows that ill officers were doing of him and that he honoured my lord sandwich with all his heart after this discourse we parted and all of us broke up and we parted captain cock and i through wandsworth drank at sir alan broderick's a great friend and comrade of cock's whom he values above the world for a witty companion and i believe he is so so to vauxhall and there took boat and down to the old swan and thence to lombard street it being dark night and thence to the tower took boat and down to greenwich cock and i he home and i to the office where did a little business and then to my lodgings where my wife is come and i am well pleased with it only much trouble in those lodgings we have the mistress of the house being so deadly dear in everything we have so that we do resolve to remove home soon as we know how the plague goes this week which we hope will be a good decrease so to bed twenty ninth up my wife and i talking how to dispose of our goods and resolved upon sending our two maids alice who has been a day or two at woolwich with my wife thinking to have had a feast there and susan home so my wife after dinner did take them to london with some goods and i in the afternoon after doing other business did go also by agreement to meet captain cock and from him to sir roger cotton's about the money due from cock to him for the late prize goods wherein sir roger is troubled that he hath not payment as agreed and the other that he must pay without being secured in the quiet possession of them but some accommodation to both i think will be found but cock did tell me that several have begged so much of the king to be discovered out of stolen prize goods and so i am afeard we shall hereafter have trouble therefore i will get myself free of them as soon as i can and my money paid thence home to my house calling my wife where the poor wretch is putting things in a way to be ready for our coming home and so by water together to greenwich and so spent the night together thirtieth up and at the office all the morning at noon comes sir thomas allen and i made him dine with me and very friendly he is and a good man i think but one that professes he loves to get and to save he dined with my wife and me and mrs barbary who my wife brings along with her from woolwich for as long as she stays here in the afternoon to the office and there very late writing letters and then home my wife and people sitting up for me and after supper to bed great joy we have this week in the weekly bill it being come to five hundred and forty four in all and but three hundred and thirty three of the plague so that we are encouraged to get to london soon as we can and my father writes as great news of joy to them that he saw york's wagon go again this week to london and was full of passengers and tells me that my aunt bell hath been dead of the plague these seven weeks this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks December 